A wave smashed into the ship so hard it threatened to crumple the galleon in two, as if it were no stronger than a leaf being tossed around in the rapids. The crew were all sea-hardened with years of experience. Everyone knew their place and had been through some of the worst gales that the Seven Seas had to offer, and everyone was running scared. A flash of white, a deafening crash, and the hot crackle of electricity in the air all came and went in an instant. The bolt of lightning had struck the main sail, tearing it apart into two smoldering halves. With nothing left holding them upright, the sails gave in to the howling winds and ripped apart, flapping violently in all directions. Stephanie Everett's ducked at the pivotal moment as the tattered sail flew just inches over her head. The ship's cook behind her hadn't been so lucky. The fabric caught him square on the chest and lifted him off his feet. It would almost have been funny watching him fly off the side of the ship and into the abyss if it hadn't been for the petrified scream filling her ears. Stephanie staggered to her feet, her sneakers slipping out from underneath her on the wet decking. She pulled the string on her waterproof hood as tight as it would go and lurched this way and that towards the stern of the ship. All of her crewmates were panicking. Grown men, hardened seafarers with decades on the ocean were cowering and crying clinging on desperately to whatever parts of the ship hadn't been blown apart in the storm. Up on the rear deck, the captain stood defiant. He was shaking a fist in the air, sword bouncing loosely at his hip. Looking up at him, Stephanie suddenly felt a wave of calm. Maybe this wouldn't be doom for them. Maybe she'd live to see another day. A tentacle, the size of a bus, loomed out of the darkness and smashed down directly on top of the captain. One second he was there, the next. He was crushed. The tentacle wrapped itself around the ship and flexed. Stephanie saw the individual suckers hungrily sniffing at the wooden decking before pressing themselves into it and gripping tight. Boards splintered and cracked under the pressure. A pair of hands shoved in the back, and she went skidding across the deck as an enormous crashing sound rang out behind her. By the time she turned around, her savior had already disappeared beneath another tentacle. She could smell the beast. Its rotten, sulfurous stench filled her nostrils. There had to be some kind of escape, something she could do. Stephanie looked left and looked right, and felt the panic rise in her chest. There was nothing. Heart hammering in her chest, she looked upwards at the raindrops falling towards her and tried to be present in her dying moments. Wait a minute. Why was she dressed in normal clothes when everyone else was dressed like they were from the 1700s? The decking beneath her feet crumpled and gave way. On either side of her, the bow and the stern of the ship rose into the air, while the space between her feet splintered and snapped, leaving empty space and churning beneath it the icy ocean. She wasn't ready for this. It wasn't her time. But Stephanie's sneakers slid out from beneath her, and she fell head first, arms flailing towards her death. If you take a boat ride off the coast of the southern Sandwich Islands, you might find yourself having some bad dreams sometime over the next four months. In fact, you might find yourself having one specific bad dream, SCP-4664-1. All test subjects have reported experiencing the same nightmare, almost identically each time. They find themselves on an old sailing ship in the middle of a storm, as it is torn apart by a tentacle-waving sea monster. They all, without fail, wake up the moment before they hit the water. We all know how real our dreams can feel, but according to first-hand accounts, this dream takes it to another level of immersion. The dream is so traumatic that it can cause insomnia and paranoia in test subjects in the days following. But don't worry, this effect won't go on for long. As soon as the subject wakes up from this dream, SCP-4664 materializes in the next largest body of water. It then proceeds to make a beeline for the individual, regardless of what blocks its path. It will tear down buildings, rip open bunkers, and climb mountains in pursuit of its target. Anytime the wind whipped at the tent, even if it was little more than a gentle breeze, the D-Class jumped and cowered. They had left him here on this island by himself. He had a look around during the day, once their boat had departed. There were five trees, one long beach that went round in a big circle and connected with itself, and that was about it. They had made him wait on the boat as they put together a twin bed and pitched a tent. Two bottles of water and a tub of porridge were all he'd been left with. If they'd brought him here before, he wouldn't have minded, might have even enjoyed it. Being on death row, the idea of getting to go to a beach had been something he'd long forgotten, let alone his own private island. 
but he hadn't been right since his dream. Shaking his head, the D-Class tried to clear his thoughts from his mind. It had just been a dream, that was all. It wasn't real and it couldn't hurt him, but the sound of the ocean, gently lapping at the shore just a dozen feet away, wouldn't let him rest. It had been nighttime in his dream, and nighttime was fast approaching now. In just a few minutes, the sun would dip below the horizon, and the darkness would be there to swallow him up. They'd put an ankle bracelet on him so they'd always know where he was. It didn't offer him any comfort in the dark tent. For hours, he sat there wide awake in his tent, shaking with fear until exhaustion overcame him. His eyelids drooped, and he sank back onto his pillow, feeling his body unwillingly dipping into a rest sleep. A shadow passed over the tent, blocking out the moonlight. Wet squishing sounds surrounded him, the noises of an enormous sea monster crawling out of the ocean. The man woke with a start to see the shadow of a tentacle, the same one from his dream wrapping itself around his tent, sucking at the canvas before suddenly wrenching it into the air. The man screamed. Twenty-five meters over him was a giant squid. Thousands of tentacles whipped this way and that in the night air. It loomed over him and peered down with an eye larger than he was looking right into his soul. Taking in all of his fear and terror, this was it. The beast from his nightmares had returned to finish the job. Oh, no, 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 don't cry. It's okay, it's all okay, I promise. The voice was booming and deep, but strangely gentle and comforting. The man lowered his hand slightly and looked at the squid. It had two of its tentacles up apologetically. I am very sorry for scaring you, little guy. Looks like you got a bad case of the nightmares, huh? The more the creature spoke, the calmer the man felt. His heart was steadily slowing in his chest. His hands were trembling a little less with each passing second. There you go. How's about you just sit right there and I'll read you a bedtime story. Would that help? The D-Class felt himself nodding before he could stop himself. That voice felt familiar. It reminded him of his dad tucking him in as a little boy. He grabbed the blanket with his hands and drew it up to his chin, sitting cross-legged. The squid straightened up and cleared its throat. A flurry of tentacles appeared from behind its back, each topped with what looked like giant hand puppets. One was a boat, an old wooden sailing ship, and the others were a variety of googly-eyed sea friends. Dolphins, seahorses, whales, starfish, a fur seal, and a king penguin all dancing happily around the boat. Once upon a time, a very brave boy was having an adventure with his best friends, and there, on the boat, was a happy little puppet of himself. The D-Class grinned and clapped his hands excitedly. <laughs> they were all having an adventure on the high seas. The more he looked at the puppets, the more real they were. Before long, he wasn't watching a puppet show at all, but he was really out there sailing the seven seas with his fishy friends. He could feel the spray hitting his face as he hung from the front of the ship, one hand on a rope singing a merry shanty to himself. The dolphin leaped out of the water and did a pirouette over his head, winking as it flew past. What a day to be alive. They were having a lovely time together, laughing and frolicking until... But all of a sudden, there was a nasty puppet sneaking into the show, a yellow one, vague in shape but with countless tentacles writhing out of it. Now the D-Class wasn't feeling so carefree. His nightmare was about to happen again. His boat was going to be torn apart by giant tentacles and sink to the bottom of the ocean. The brave boy suddenly did not feel so brave. There was a meanie in the water who was coming to get him. But what the meanie did not anticipate was the power of friendship. The D-Class gritted his teeth. This time, it was different. He had his friends with him. The hand puppets all turned in unison and swam towards the monster chasing them. The giant squid performing the puppet show started to smash the puppets into each other as they fought. The penguin pecked, the seahorse kicked, and the starfish, well, the starfish was there too. Bam, crash, slam, punch, oof, and look, they won. The D-Class cheered, tears filling his eyes, as the big bad monster puppet was beaten and slunk away back to the depths, leaving him and his friends to continue their adventure on the boat. The Mimi was gone and everyone lived happily ever after. The D-Class let out a big sigh of relief and slumped back on his bed, feeling much, much happier now. Now you've got a big day tomorrow, Mr. Man, and you need some sleep ready for all your big boy activities, okay? The D-Class nodded sleepily. He was actually quite tired, come to think of it. The giant squid stroked his cheek gently as he lay down. 
The layer of slime left behind was so comforting. Nighty night, little fella. And with that, SCP-4664 dematerialized as he swam back into the ocean until the next time he was needed. SCP-4664 is a 25 meter long creature, most similar in appearance to a giant squid. It only materializes when a person experiences the nightmare known as SCP-4664-1. It is currently unknown where or if it exists outside of these instances. SCP-4664 has an abnormally large number of appendages for its size. Estimates vary, placing the number of tentacles anywhere between 5,000 and 20,000. Each tentacle terminates in a facsimile of a sea creature native to the South Sandwich Islands. It is not known what these puppets are made from, but it appears to be similar to cloth. Once SCP-4664 finds the subject, it will speak to them in their native language, comforting them and asking them not to be scared. The SCP has been found to exhibit a mild auditory hazard, as the test subject invariably does report feeling calmer almost immediately. They are then treated to a puppet show, which recounts the events of their nightmare, except SCP-4664, this time, tells a version with a happy conclusion. This appears to cure the insomnia and paranoia experienced by the test subjects, and they often revert to childlike behaviors when watching the show, making ooh and ah noises as they are immersed in the story. Once the show is over, the SCP will reassure the test subject and help them fall asleep before it steadily dematerializes, appearing to fade away. One junior researcher was identified as being particularly resistant to the effects of SCP-4664, Sarah Everett, and so she was selected to try to interview the SCP directly. The discovering of a shipwreck in the heart of SCP-4664's territory prompted a fresh wave of excitement about the research. It looked exactly like the boat from everyone's dreams. Sarah woke up from the dream the split second before she hit the water, just as she knew she would. Despite all her experience with this SCP, she couldn't quite shake the feeling that it had felt too real. Her heart was hammering in her chest as they went about preparing her to encounter the giant squid. She was stationed on the same island where they had tested on all of the D-classes before. It felt strange being on the other side of the hidden cameras, but she did her best to stay calm, waiting for the tent to be torn away from around her. Sure enough, the shadow passed in front of the moon, the tentacle gripped the fabric, and the tent was ripped from the ground. Hello there, friend. Did you have a nightmare? Why don't we put a smile on that face of yours? SCP-4664, I'm not here to listen to your story. I need to ask you some questions. SCP-4664 was taken aback, not used to meeting humans who weren't scared stiff by what they'd experienced. What was more, Sarah was resistant to its auditory hazard, so she remained alert and on the front foot the whole time. She pressed the SCP, asking it about the shipwreck they'd discovered and where the dreams were coming from. We know that you don't want to hurt people, SCP-4664, but we need to know who destroyed that boat so we can make sure they don't else, okay? The SCP was silent for a moment. It seemed to fill with a great sadness. My, my brother, my brother hurt them. He didn't like to make people happy like me. He was, um, strong when he made people scared. He used to scare me too. SCP-4664 blinked its giant eye quickly, trying to stop it from filling with tears. He told Sarah Everett about the existence of Big Cold Place near here. Their dad didn't like his brother either, so he had put him in the cold place to stop him from hurting anyone. Nobody would find him there. But one day, when the storm had happened, a boat got too close to the cold place. His brother was so angry, he had torn the ship apart. Not everyone drowned before his brother got to them. SCP-4664 had run away and hidden from what came next. His dad and brother had a big fight, something he couldn't bear to watch. He didn't want to see anyone get hurt, so he hid and closed his eyes shut. My brother was put inside the ground, inside the world. Dad put him deep down so people couldn't be afraid of him. But, but my brother didn't take all of the fear from that ship. <laughs> when, when my dad put him away, he left the fear here. Other emotions go away. Fear, it, it doesn't leave. So I want to make sure people don't get scared anymore. SCP-4664 waved his puppets half-heartedly. They all smiled down at Sarah Everett with their big googly eyes. 
She saw a huge sadness in the creature, but even stronger than that was love and hope. Thank you for your cooperation, SCP-4664. We'll make sure that he doesn't hurt anyone else. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you, friend. Squishy Human 76 was the only one left. Every other squishy human had beautiful, shiny new skin all over their bodies. They were cuddling, poking, squeezing, and tickling each other in what used to be the cafeteria. All these humans piled on top of each other, no one feeling lonely. Only Squishy Human 76 was left, huddling in the darkest corner of the facility away from everyone else. He sure was feeling lonely. Almost every inch of his wet, slippery skin was calling out to join the others, but there was one tiny problem. The pesky inch of human skin left on the top of his head. The graphs had been a massive success, with 97% body coverage with SCP-2790's skin to replace his disgusting, calloused human skin, with only a mild case of severe necrosis eating away at him. He sat in the corner in the dark on his own, stroking the patch of rotten, dying skin on the top of his head. Soon, it would be all beautiful, soft skin. He just needed the human part to finish dying. Then he slithers into the cafeteria and hug and cuddle and squeeze and poke and prod with everyone else. Then he wouldn't be so lonely. Huddling in this, where was he actually? Squishy Human 76 looked around through blurry eyes. There was a name tag on his chest. Head Researcher Hopkins, SCP Site 32. What did all those words mean? Hey boss, we've got the new SCP just shipped in. Where should we put it? Melanie Sanders looked up from her desk with a sigh. She'd been picking at the dry skin on the backs of her hands. Every single person at Site 54 was burnt out, but she was burnt out in chief. It had been such a manic year that she hadn't even realized they were due to be receiving an SCP transfer. She asked which number it was, and they informed her it was one called 2790 didn't ring any bells. She asked what class it was. The junior researcher, Millie Rogers, studied the shipping container uncertainly. It just says BFF. There's a note attached. Melanie walked over, feeling the headache pound with each step. Why did they have to have the lights so bright in this facility? She snatched the note off the side and read it. It was signed by head researcher Hopkins. She recognized the name and the signature. He was from Site 32. They'd teamed up a handful of times in the past. Dear Melanie, a gift from us to you, SCP-2790. Morale was at an all-time low at Site-32 before the arrival of this wonderful little SCP. We hope you welcome him warmly, just like we did. You'll all have the best time together. We promise. Just give him plenty of cuddles. Only one rule with this one, don't touch him. Hopkins. She realized immediately that it was obviously a trap. Melanie scrunched up the letter and threw it on the floor. She jabbed a finger at her junior and instructed her to get on the phone straight away to senior command and tell them that something weird must have happened at Site-32. Under no circumstances was anyone to touch that shipping container. Did this SCP really think she was born yesterday? Boss, I'm actually going on annual leave for a couple weeks. I don't really have time to- Melanie didn't have time to deal with this today. She'd leave it to her team to sort it out. But that evening, as Melanie was working late, she found her mouse drifting over to the SCP main list and her fingers absentmindedly typing in 2790. An adorable picture of a little squid came up right away. Even in the midst of her stress, she couldn't help but crack a smile. It was very cute, whatever it was. She would just check its containment measures, that was all. She needed to make sure that it was safely stored while it was here, raising everyone's morale. It would obviously need to go back because there was a major containment breach. But while it was here, personnel are freely invited to splash around and play with him. SCP-2790 should not be touched and must always be hand-fed. All forms of physical contact with 2790 are allowed and encouraged except touching. That seems straightforward enough, no issues there. Rub his belly while feeding him, especially while feeding him treats. He loves treats. Hug him before and after playtime. Maybe it was worth going and checking on SCP-2790. She wouldn't want him getting lonely. As soon as Melanie Saunders turned the corner into the delivery depot, her worst fears were confirmed. He must have been very lonely. The shipping container hadn't been opened. He must have been left in there all on his own all day. That simply wouldn't do. 
She opened the container up right away and saw in the shadows inside a large aquarium. Hello, little fellow. Are you all on your own? Did all those mean people not give you a cuddle? She walked closer and closer to the tank, <laughs> the darkness enveloping her. She couldn't see anything inside the tank. Maybe it was hiding? She pressed her face right up against the glass, trying her best to get a look inside. He wasn't there. A scream filled the room. Melanie turned in a flash and ran out of the container. More screams. She sprinted through the corridors following the sound and rounded a corner to see happy faces, laughing, cuddling, and playing. It was SCP-2790 surrounded by all of her best researchers. They had set up one of the Class II deepwater aquatic containment tanks, especially for their new guest. Everyone had gotten into the tank, some of them still fully dressed, others rolling up sleeves and taking off shirts to get more skin-to-skin -skin contact. Could she blame them, really? Melanie Saunders laughed along with them, flooded with relief that their new BFF wasn't lonely in there. Okay guys, I'm glad to see we're all welcoming our new special little friend. Just remember the rules. We can cuddle him, squeeze him, stroke him, give him tummy rubs to our heart's content, but no touching. Got it? They all nodded in agreement. Absolutely no touching. Then went back to patting 2790 on the head, beaming. And why wouldn't they be happy? SCP-2790 is a male Atlantic cranch squid, Teothuina megalops who is just the cutest little guy you've ever laid eyes or hands on. The Foundation first recovered him from the curio shop Curios of the World, and it is a good thing they did. Someone mean had put him in a tinted glass tank with the word ignore printed on the front. Despite the Foundation's best efforts, it had been unable to ascertain as to why anyone would want to separate SCP-2790 from everybody like that and make him feel sad. He's just the best SCP out there perfect for petting and caressing with your skin on his skin so that your skin and his skin are making contact skin to skin. Just don't touch him. In fact, he's so perfect in every single way that all personnel are actively encouraged to engage in as much physical contact with him as possible, except for touching. Anybody on their lunch break, after work, before work, or while doing work is encouraged to spend as much time as they can give as CP-2790 tummy rubs and back scratches and squishy cuddles. Foundation personnel who object to playing with SCP-2790 are to be coerced in the strictest way possible, in the interest of everyone's safety. This is because SCP-2790 can get lonely. If he gets lonely, then he escapes containment. For Melanie Saunders' team, the rate of containment breaches was far too high. 2790 was escaping at a staggering zero times per week. They needed to do something about it. Melanie, gathering the best minds in Site-54, as well as all the others in the Class II Deepwater Aquatic Containment Tank, where they stood around stroking 2790 for a very serious, important meeting. As I'm sure you all are no doubt aware, 2790 is feeling too lonely at the moment. He has breached containment zero times already this week, which is an increase from zero times a month yesterday. This just isn't acceptable. We need to come up with creative, innovative solutions to make sure that without touching him, we are maintaining as much physical contact with him as possible. Any suggestions? She gave 2790 a good belly rub for being such a good boy as she spoke. Dr. Romero piped up almost immediately, fingers intertwined with 2790's little tentacles in a cute little game. He'd been thinking about this nonstop, and he'd come to the conclusion that the correct answer here was skin. Dr. Sirnivasan agreed enthusiastically right away. Dr. Romero continued feverishly explaining, skin to skin, that's what they needed. They needed to maximize physical contact whilst avoiding any touching, so it made sense that they put their skin against 2790's skin as much as possible. He proposed skin grafts, taking skin from 2790 and grafting it onto their own bodies, so that their skin is always against his skin, forever. The more skin, the better. Skin to skin, skin on skin, skin over skin, skin under skin, skin interwoven with more skin. Melanie weighed that as an option. And you can do that without touching? The doctor nodded. So the skin grafting procedures began. At first, doctors Romero and Sirnivasan were worried about hurting 2790 in the operation, so they made sure to give it constant tickles and pats as they worked. It was all worth it to help them attain the smoothness and loveliness of his skin. 
They worked swiftly, never touching him, but constantly stroking him to make sure he knew everything was okay. There was a line of staff members waiting at the door to the operating theater, each one of them offering up their arms for the sake of making sure this adorable little guy wasn't lonely ever again. All resources and machines in the facility were immediately switched to aiding in the cloning of the skin sample taken from 2790. Before too long, they had a whole production line of beautiful soft skin for them all to not touch. 189 personnel volunteered to take part in the trial out of a possible 189 personnel at the facility, so it aligned with the average turnout for fringe experimental surgical procedures in the United States. Every single one of the volunteers had disgusting, dry, calloused, gross, disgusting skin that desperately needed to be replaced. One by one, they would enter the operating theater, scream in pain from the lack of anesthetic, which is now common practice in medicine, before striding out proudly with lovely new pink wet skin on their hands, feet, forearms, chests, or faces. Many of the patients were so pleased with the results that they immediately took their place at the back of the queue all over again to go back for more. Naturally, antibiotics and immunosuppressants were handed out to everybody who took part in the surgery, with the goal of preventing any kind of serious infection or skin rejection issues. Not that anybody could ever reject 2790, just look at him. Again, this was a roaring success. Only 87% of patients reported suffering from complications from the grafting procedure. For some unknown reason, many of their bodies were rejecting the perfect smooth new skin that was so much better than their horrible old skin. And only 70% of the patients suffered severe necrosis in their bodies as the inferior human skin around the grafting site died and began to rot away. How's that for cutting edge foundation science? Most importantly of all, there was a dramatic increase in SCP-2790's morale and indeed the morale of the whole site. Containment breaches, once rampant, had gone down from zero times per day to zero. Given the unprecedented success of the operation, Melanie Sanders herself, the proud new owner of a facial skin graft with necrosis eating away at her neck, greenlit an even greater rate of production. They were rapidly hurtling towards continuing Site-32's pilot program of sending 2790 to other sites to boost morale, but there was more work to do first. The operating theater was open 24-7 with the scalpel passed on to anybody who was around at the time, regardless of qualifications. Anybody not in the operating theater was to be in the water tank with 2790. It was paramount that this level of positive morale was maintained. The best part was now everybody had a little bit of 2790 skin. They could always be horsing around together. Researchers, agents, security, juniors, everybody piled into the tank together, cuddling, poking, squeezing, and patting one another. Just to make sure everyone was on the same page, someone had painted the words, no touching, in what looked like red paint over the tank. Morale soared, and everybody was happy. Until that junior researcher, Millie Rogers, came back from her vacation. For the first time in two weeks, somebody didn't want to be cuddled. She seemed to have developed some strange kind of phobia while she was away, quite irrational. Anytime any of the staff members would approach her, she would run away screaming and brandished improvised weapons at them. For the most part, the staff of Site 54 paid her no mind. She would occasionally bludgeon one of them to death when all they wanted was a peaceful squeeze to stave off the loneliness, but aside from that, it wasn't a big deal. They'd cut off all the phone lines, computer systems, alarms, SOS beacons, and defense systems a long time ago. None of those things related to skin or cuddles or not touching, so they had to be removed. Millie Rogers was locked in there and would eventually see how high the morale was and decided to join in. It wouldn't take too long. But Millie had a plan. Somehow resisting the harmless urge for constant physical contact with all of her co-workers, she decided that the best course of action was to terminate SCP-2790 once and for all. Maybe its adorable charm and lack of any sinister subtext would dissipate after it died. To do that, she had to be like one of them. There was only one place where SCP-2790 could be. It had breached containment zero times, so it could only be in one place, the center of the writhing, cuddling bodies in the water tank. Queuing up for the operating theater, Millie volunteered to do a graft on one of the patients in line. She couldn't recognize their face at all. All of its skin had been replaced and it smelled like death, but the name badge told her it was Dr. Romero. Millie picked up the scalpel and stood over him, hand shaking. Actually, 
She rehearsed a thousand times, but still felt nervous. I'm going to go and have one more frolic in the tank, if that's okay. Okay? That's the best thing I've ever heard! I'll join you! Millie marched through the corridors, escorted by a bizarre skin job of a man who stroked every co-worker he walked past with a sense of constant euphoric wonder. Millie stood at the edge of the tank, clutching the scalpel. She'd jump in and kill it. The others might suddenly turn on her, or the spell might break, or they could die. Who knew? The water was acrid and full of floating chunks. Nearly 200 people were living day and night in the tank as their bodies rotted. The smell was unbelievable. Millie took one more breath and dove in. She kicked and punched her way through the tangled throng of limbs. Come to think of it, their skin was remarkably soft. She wouldn't mind it so much if her hands felt like that. Focus. She kicked deeper and deeper, wrestling people out of the way in her race to get to the center of the human cocoon. Just a bit further and she'd. It was quite nice to have so much physical contact with her colleagues, come to think of it. When would they have gotten to cuddle like this before? Without so much as the dull thought, Millie's hand loosened and the scalpel sank to the floor. The arms of Melanie Sanders wrapped around her and stroked the horribly coarse skin on her face. She'd have to get that seen to, for the sake of everybody's morale. Little did she know that it would have been hopeless anyway. The SCP-2790 Good Morale Pilot Program had been extended. Earlier that day, SCP-2790 had been shipped out to another undisclosed site that was having morale issues. You see, not all SCP stories end up being horrific. Some of them are just good, heartwarming tales of caressing and skin grafting with your new BFF. Imagine this. You're a researcher with an interest in and an aptitude for marine biology. Over the years, your work has taken you far and wide to the furthest corners of the Earth's oceans. You've observed countless species of sea life, from fish and crustaceans to whales and sharks, predators and prey alike. During one of your travels, you find yourself off the coast of South Africa, monitoring the local population of sea creatures. Looking out across the water, you see a large dark shape moving below the surface. There is a shadow streaking its way towards your vessel, dark as night, speeding like a torpedo. You rush across the deck, leaning over the port side as the shape swims beneath your boat. You're certain you know what it was. After all your years studying the world beneath the waves, you know a whale shark when you see one. The largest known species of fish still in existence, the whale shark is a filter feeder, consisting on a diet of plankton and other tiny aquatic organisms. A whale shark poses absolutely no threat to humans, or rather any whale shark other than this one would impose a threat. But how could you know that? Scanning the water, you strain your eyes, trying to spot what you assumed was an ordinary whale shark swimming below. But there is nothing, no sign of it anywhere. Sighing, you think you might have missed your chance to see one in the wild. Perhaps it changed direction, instead of swimming under the boat, you tell yourself. The ship turns and starts making its way back towards the small harbor, leaving you blissfully unaware that there's an extra passenger on board. As you disembark, you notice something on the side of the boat. Emblazoned on the hull is a motif of a familiar shape, a whale shark depicted entirely in painted dots. You stare at it for a moment, intrigued by the pattern. It reminds you of a piece you once saw, an aboriginal Australian style of dot art. You're a little taken aback by the coincidence, having briefly spotted a whale shark while out at sea earlier, blissfully unaware that this painting marks your first encounter with SCP-1449, known more colloquially as the Dreamtime Whale Shark. In fact, you're so amused by seeing the whale shark earlier, only to find one painted here on the boat that it distracts you. You don't realize that the whale shark painting hadn't been on the side of the boat when you'd shipped out. Instead, you pay the crew and thank the captain for letting you hire the vessel for your research and then head off. By the time you make it back to the nearby town and settle down in after a long day on the water, the dotted painting of the whale shark has already slipped from your mind. But as you begin drifting off and everything goes dark, you're about to find out that your encounter with the Dreamtime Whale Shark is only just beginning. You've never been a heavy sleeper and rarely remember your dreams. Any that you might have seem to pass out of your head the moment you wake up or are too faint for you to acknowledge while you're sleeping. But tonight is different. Tonight you're dreaming vividly. In this dream, water surrounds you like it has your whole career. But this time, you're underneath the surface, adrift in an empty ocean, 
Nothing around you but endless blank sea. You feel something in your hand. Something smooth and moving gently like organic matter. Something alive. You find yourself gripping the tail of a whale shark, and somehow, as is often the way with dreams, you know that this is the same whale shark from earlier that day. The one that swam up to your boat and ended up sticking on the side of it as a dot art painting. SCP-1449 has this latent ability. While it normally appears as a flat, two-dimensional piece of aboriginal Australian dot art, the Dreamtime Whale Shark can shift whenever it is underwater. It still appears as a collection of painted dots in this unmistakable shape of a whale shark, but in an aquatic environment, it becomes three-dimensional. And that's what you'd seen swimming towards the boat. Not just a whale shark, but SCP-1449. Within your dream, you release the Dreamtime whale shark's tail and begin to float upwards. Breaking the surface of the water, you breathe lungfuls of fresh air. The first thing you see is land, and it's close by, close enough for you to swim to shore. Paddling through the water, you reach an island, one in a chain of small land masses, tiny continents in a shallow, unfamiliar ocean. You look back to the water, but can find no sign of SCP-1449. The Dreamtime Whale Shark has brought you here, and left you on this island, but you can only speculate as to why. There must be a reason, you insist to yourself. The dreamscape around you, it would seem, is either the creation of SCP-1449, or at the very least a side effect of falling asleep close by to where you saw the Dreamtime Whale Shark in its painted form. Whatever this place is, there must be some way to uncover an answer. It stands to reason, you think, that if you can understand what's going on, then perhaps therein lies the key to escaping this dream and waking up back in reality. The small island you find yourself on, and the others nearby, are inhabited by strange life forms. As you walk across the shore, sand clinging to your wet feet, you approach what you thought at a distance to be a group of other people. Instead, you see a group of peculiar beings. They are not quite human, but they are definitely close. The closer you walk, you notice these strange humanoid shapes huddle tighter together, their backs to you. When you try to call out to them, asking where you are or how you might return to reality, they bustle away. The wind carries the sound of their chatter towards you, and you're certain you hear them call you another one, just another traveler from afar. What you don't realize, lost in this dream environment, is that there are others like it. Pocket worlds like this one, similar but different, currently being experienced by any others asleep near SCP-1449. As you ponder what to do on the beach, the captain of the boat you hired is on a different version of the same island, watching a herd of multiple 2,000 kilo platypi being shepherded by six tattooed three meter tall humanoid figures. Meanwhile, his first mate is in another version of this dream world, learning how to hunt under the tutelage of a man called Gray the Rabbit Hunter. Each version of SCP-1449's dreamscape have separate continuities to each other. They are differing copies of the same chain of islands, with the same inhabitants, but each visited by a different traveler from afar in their sleep. Much like a lucid dream, visitors to the Dreamtime Whale Shark's worlds can interact with them, shaping and altering events in the continuity they find themselves in. Deciding to leave the beach, you elect to make your way towards higher ground to try to get a wider scope of your surroundings. Fortunately, there is a towering mountainous shape nearby, standing like dark serrated teeth against the clear horizon. You begin your dangerous trek, ascending your way up these dead, jagged hills. You're still unclear on how you got here or how to escape, but you will yourself to keep climbing knowing there must be some way to wake up from this bizarre dream. Finally reaching level ground, you take a moment to catch your breath, collecting your thoughts before advancing any further. You turn, gazing out over the landscape spreading out below and all around you. The island is small enough you can see the shore where you arrived, and the ocean flanking this landmass on all sides. In this short moment, you appreciate the beauty of this bizarre dream world for the first time. The trees sway in the gentle breeze, moving like the calm rolling of waves in the water beyond, both glistening with the warm light of the sun. While it is still true that you have no idea how or why SCP-1449 brought you here, or how to leave, you think to yourself that at least this dream environment isn't a hostile one.
Not that you'd want to be stranded there forever, but there are certainly far more unforgiving places one can dream about. A grim thought suddenly dawns on you. How long have you been here? Does time pass differently in this world to the one you're still asleep in? A sound shakes your thoughts back to your current here and now. It was a voice. You're sure of it. A voice calling out, but not to you. Traversing the dead, jagged hills, you see a figure. A person from the real world like you, not one of the local humanoids. They don't see you. They're calling out to someone in a ramshackle hut cobbled together from pieces of wood and other scraps. On the arm of the figure's dark, military-like uniform is a symbol, and you can just make out three distinct letters. S. C. P. A wooden plank that functioned as the door creaked open, revealing a second figure. The man looks disheveled, his worn clothing patched with scraps of leather and shark skin, making him look as cobbled together as his makeshift hut, like he was an extension of the small structure. You watch as the man talks to the agent, overhearing his words. Don't say anything. If you say anything, I lose my mind. You can say anything and something horrible happens, the strange man warns, talking too quickly for the Foundation agent to reply. You're a dreamer, like me. My name is Nikolai. I am the ship's seer of the Dunham and the Brotherhood of Selechostik Pudnik Skombin. The man Nikolai, he called himself, seemed distressed tripping over his words, disagreeing with himself until he starts trailing off into swearing obscenities. I'm not Nikolai, he shouts. I am Agent... Agent John? Before stumbling and cursing again. I'm sorry, I can't, can't keep the memory straight. Being this lucid for this long hurts. The dreaming fills in all the gaps. Things have always been even as they are brought into being. I've been on this cliff since the beginning of time. Just like how this place has always been here. The dream was torn away by the deaths of gods before time began. But I watched it happen five years ago. Are you following? I can barely tell the dream and reality apart anymore. My world has always been the way it is and we made it like that. We hurt the dreaming. The shark, that's how we see it. We heard it, killed it in our world, and the dream time poured out like it spilled blood, and we made this big scar here, and, and things are wrong. Fish walk and ghosts haunt the stones, and women give birth to plastic children, and the leech fields stretch out forever in the seas of human blood, and the center eats cocaine and caviar out of panda skull bowls on the crushed backs of opal mares in acres of broken glass. And it has always been like this. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it again. You're already racing back down to the dead jagged hills. The sight of the deranged Nikolai burned into your mind. A man reduced to a babbling lunatic, cast away and left alone in this strange dreamscape that SCP-1449 brought you to. But Nikolai is more than that. More than just someone driven mad by his isolation. He is a grim prophecy of what will become of you. Unless you can find a way to leave the Dreamtime Whale Sharks world. Already back on the beach, you drop down, kneeling in the wet sand as the tide washes over your knees. The how or why of SCP-1449 bringing you into this dream isn't important. All that matters to you is avoiding ending up like Nikolai. Whatever it takes, you know one thing above all else. You need to wake up. But whether you actually ever will is another question entirely. Forty years ago, a U.S. Navy exploratory vessel landed on a chain of islands in the South Atlantic, just 2,000 miles off the coast of Argentina. In other words, the middle of nowhere. Yet on this far-off set of rocks afloat in the middle of the ocean, they discovered a vast array of strange wildlife and plant species that resemble little of what they left behind on the mainland. Could this be a treasure trove of undiscovered species, they wondered. Hoping to capitalize on the discovery, a reconnaissance team of researchers was sent out to explore some of the islands on foot, and what they found did not disappoint. From endangered species of birds, to plant life and vegetation that looked like it belonged on Mars, they found a dizzying array of new and exciting examples of evolutionary oddities that would fill a library. But unfortunately, their jubilation was cut short. Attempting to collect soil samples, they dug into the ground and soon discovered that what they were standing on wasn't actually ground at all. The Navy scientists soon discovered the rocky terrain they were exploring was actually made up entirely 
of organic matter. As per the standard protocol, the SCP Foundation was forced to silence the U.S. Navy research vessel after its discovery. With the okay from the U.S. government, the ship was torpedoed and sunk to the bottom of the ocean with all hands on deck in the name of protecting the greater good of the masses. A tragedy at sea for the sake of preventing worldwide pandemonium. From there, the Foundation took over with the containment procedures of what would eventually come to be known as SCP-169, better known by its nickname, the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a biblical creature of mythical proportions, said to be able to boil the seas and create earth-ending floods with just a whip of its massive continent-spanning body. It is unclear if SCP-169 has the ability to do these things, though, given its massive size, which Foundation researchers estimate to be somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers. It's easy to see how something that big moving at any speed could be devastating for the coastal regions of the world. Although we use the word contain, it is impossible for SCP staff to ever contain something of such massive size. Surveillance and monitoring are about all we can do for now. That and hope it never wakes up and decides that we're on the menu. It was thought to be relatively smooth sailing until one incident changed everything. Dr. Hart turned off the video monitor and faced the assembled members of MTF Gamma 6, also known as the Deep Feeders, renowned for their specialization in the tracking of deep sea and oceanic anomalies. The room was dark, and each team member was sitting in shadow, but still Dr. Hart could see the seriousness on their faces. I'm sure you're wondering why I called you here at such short notice, he said. On the screen behind him, he put up a NASA satellite picture of a small set of rocky islands. You see this little island chain here? Well, it wasn't there a week ago. He paused, rubbing his forehead from lack of sleep. At 8.05 a.m. today, we recorded another auditory anomaly emitting from SCP-169. This one was much louder and longer than the one recorded in 1997 by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the one known as the Bloop. Back then, it was easy to brush off as some ice breaking off of a continental shelf and scraping against the seafloor. It's not so easy to cover up anymore. These auditory emissions from SCP-169 are beginning to grow more frequent. More than that, increased seismic activity around the archipelago on the creature's back indicates that the rate at which the creature is breathing is also up. Typically, the rate at which the creature takes what we are assuming to be a breath is once every three months. The rate has increased to once every three weeks. For as long as we've been monitoring SCP-169, it's been adrift along the southern Atlantic never moving more than a kilometer a week. That behavior is slowly beginning to change. It doesn't sound like much, but something that big even moving just a fraction of that faster means 100-foot tidal waves for the entire South American coastline. We fear the creature is showing signs of waking up. If this is true, could mean a cataclysm for the hundreds of nations around the world. Millions, hell, even billions could be wiped off the face of the Earth if this thing just flips its body too fast in the wrong direction. To put it to scale, this monster is about the size of the Caribbean, maybe even bigger as far as we know. The doctor then pulled out a decanter of whiskey and poured himself a glass, swallowing the entire pour in one go. In an appalling breach of workplace professionalism, seriously, an XK class under the world scenario is still no excuse for drinking on the job. We're talking about an extinction level event, a bona fide XK class under the world scenario. 1,000 foot tsunami waves stretching as far as the eye can see from either end of the horizon. The last time SCP-169 stirred, it created the Mediterranean. In fact, the legends of the biblical flood, Noah's Ark, the same story can be found in every civilization and culture around the world, so maybe they were onto something. It is to this end I call you all here, to save the world from the next great flood. He paused for a moment as the room took in the gravity of the situation. The more we can learn about SCP-169, the better. And right now, we know squat. For one, we've never seen just how deep the body of the creature goes, or what's under it. The pressure has been too great for our current model submarines, until now. After reinforcing our NEMA-1 deep-sea submersible with thaumaturgical runes, the integrity of its hull has increased exponentially. Your mission will be to travel as far down and as close to the creature as possible. If it breathes, then there must be gills or lungs. 
There must be some basic biological facts we need to understand if we're going to survive extinction. Our only recourse is to find a way to sedate the creature. And if that doesn't work, then... God help us all. Just 12 hours later, deep in the waters of the southern Atlantic, a massive submersible ship was diving down into the depths of the deep ocean, looking for a way to stop the end of the world. Agent Jia 6 1, a member of Deep Feeders, looked out of the massive viewing port as the ship slowly descended alongside the rocky trench that made up the body of SCP 169. Behind him was Dr. Hart, sporting a white 5 o'clock shadow and a red nose from a night of drinking to calm his nerves. The entire crew were silent in awe as the giant floodlights of the ship brushed over the barnacle-covered surfaces of the undersea mountain. They progressed slowly, reaching each milestone in depth with caution, knowing that one wrong move could destabilize the pressure in their ship. Just 6-1 murmured the word, Scales. What? asked Dr. Hart. I've been watching the patterns of the ridges as we sink down. They look like scales giant segments. It's hard to see at first because they're so covered in barnacles and sediment, but I'm sure of it. They're giant, armored scales, the way lobsters or crabs have armored exoskeletons. Interesting, the doctor said, scratching his chin. Arthropods have segmented armored bodies. This means we might be looking at some sort of evolutionary hybrid, some sort of aquatic mammal such as a whale or dolphin, but one that has developed armored segment and scales similar to that of a crustacean. The doctor crossed his arms to think. The closest thing we have on the fossil record of this magnitude is an armored fish from the Cretaceous period, but even that's way too small to compare to this. This thing has an entire ecosystem on its back. How old is it? asked the agent. Well, now that you mention it, given the impossible age of the creature, an arthropod would make sense. Lobsters and other crustaceans don't age conventionally, you see. They are effectively immortal. In fact, they actually die because they continue to grow until their bodies can't hold up their humongous size anymore. And yet, SCP-169 just kept growing. The doctor trailed off, thinking to himself. Dr. Hart, still lost in thought, turned to walk to the back of the submersible as Zhe 6-1 followed. He said as much to himself as to the agent, The creature is old. The geological survey conducted when SCP-169 was first discovered carbon dated the specimen to over 541 million years old. As you can probably surmise, that's too old for any living being. The results had to be incorrect, and yet I checked them myself more than once. The numbers do not lie. The entity predates our civilization. Hell, it predates complex life forms on this planet as we know it. From an evolutionary standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. The agent, confused, asked, Doctor, how could something so big even come into existence? Very little of our planet is actually landmass. It's a wonder we call it Earth. Most of this planet is water. We aren't looking at a creature that's on our planet, agent. We are on its planet. Just then a flurry of alarms and sensors began to go off at the bridge of the ship. The team scrambled through their stations, checking off monitors and shouting readings to each other. The ship's thermal sensors are detecting a massive rise in temperature, transmitting power to cooling systems. We have activity northwest of our location. Sonar has something big headed our way. We need to dive now! The ship lurched forward, nose first, as everyone on board held onto their seats, the restraints keeping them from falling forward. Just outside of the viewing port, Dr. Hart could see an enormous scaled appendage moving fast in their location. We need to steer the ship clear of the talons! Revert all power to the thrusters, get us out of the way! The doctor yelled. Don't you think I'm doing that? The captain shouted back. The ship jolted sideways and downwards as an immense wave of pressure came over the submersible, putting six Gs of force on its occupants. Zhe 6-1 yelped out of fear as the ship came close to crashing into what appeared to be the edge of a titanic talon the size of the Empire State Building. Following the encounter, the part of the ship bordering the reinforced glass of the viewing port began to glow bright red. It's boiling the water around us! One of the crew members cried out. It's not boiling anything, it's just cavitation due to the pressure reduction in the water. The updated runes on the ship's hull should keep us safe, we just need to cool our heads. Stay focused on the mission, bottom feeders. After several moments of holding their breaths, the crew of Nemo 1 began to relax as their pace returned to a slow descent along the side of the underwater behemoth. Before long, the vessel was no longer traveling straight down, but starting to curve under the creature, traveling north towards the theoretical head of SCP-169. 
After several hours, the ship came upon giant fissures in the rocky exterior of the creature. These massive vent-like structures appeared stiff, but slowly they opened and closed over the span of weeks. These were the respiratory organs of the organism. Clocking in at over two miles underneath the surface of the ocean, the crew carefully began entering the smaller pod-like submersibles that detached from the main ship. Je 6-1 entered his pod and strapped on the haptic gloves that would give him control of the pod's robotic arms. He and a team of three other volunteers had agreed to undergo the dangerous mission of attaching artificial chemical emission machines that could be programmed to release anesthetic gas into SCP-169's respiratory system on command remotely. The emission machines could be refueled manually whenever the contents ran out. It was an ingenious solution Dr. Hart came up with when thinking of his time studying sharks as a marine biologist. They would tag the fins of sharks by capturing them and bringing the specimens on the deck of their boat. From there, the scientist would drill a radio frequency emitter onto the fin of the shark. When he had first seen this practice as a young college student, Dr. Hart was afraid the process was harming the shark, but later he learned it was designed in a way to not be harmful to the specimen, and eventually the tag would fall off after enough data on the shark's movement was collected. Except these tags would not be falling off, he thought. They could not. For the sake of all mankind, this had to work. The doctor pressed a button on the receiver of the radio and spoke. Je 6-1, what's your status? Pressure's holding, all signs look good. Je 6-2? Pressure's holding, all good. Je 6-3, all clear, Captain. Je 6-4, there was silence. Je 6-4, do you copy? Ma'am. <clears throat> all clear, Doc, sorry, my mic was muted. On route and ready to do this thing. Dr. Hart sighed in relief and slowly reclined in his chair, watching the pods move closer to the large openings on SCP-169's side. One by one, the robotic arms used underwater torches to drill into the thick, rock-like exoskeleton of the creature, screwing in complex million-dollar equipment that was both waterproof and could withstand the immense pressure at such a depth under the ocean. As the minutes turned to hours, Dr. Hart couldn't help but feel anxiety for the safety of his crew and the success of the mission. But before long, the pods began to return one by one to the mother craft, each completing the segment of work with which they were tasked. The last pod still working was Je 6-1, whose robotic arm was in the process of rotating a large industrial-sized screw. Je 6-1 had all but finished when suddenly a low rumble could be felt shaking the larger submersible. Dr. Hart's voice came crackling over the radio. Get back to the ship now! Je 6-1, wrapped in deep focus on his task, replied, I'm just about finished, just packing up my tool belt. Leave it. Return to the ship now. That's an order. Jesus, what's wrong? It's not like this is the end of the world, said the agent, chuckling over his radio. An ear-piercing echo sent shockwaves through the depths of the ocean around the submersible. The waves rumbled with the sound of SCP-169's voice, similar to the sound of a large whale, but amplified by a million. The sound sent all the crew members falling to the floor as the ship experienced severe damage from the burst of pressure, slightly cracking the glass viewport and sending smoke flooding into the small bridge of the ship. Gas masks! shouted Dr. Hart as they all donned breathing apparatus. SCP-169 is waking up. Begin activation of the chemical emission machines. We need to sedate it now. The Leviathan is waking up. We need to stop it, shouted Dr. Hart. Just then, he looked back and noticed Je 6-1's pod was gone. Je 6-1, what's your position? Je 6-1, where are you? Sir, Sona has him drifting off deeper into the ocean behind us. He must have gotten knocked off SCP-169 by the shockwave. But Dr. Hart wouldn't have it. He didn't want any more blood on his hands. Reverse thrusters, turn us around and get to him. We're not losing anyone. But the breach in the hull! It'll hold, that's what the runes are for. The outside of the submersible began to glow a slight blue as the ship system started to come back online to full capacity, and alarm systems started to turn off and report normal pressure readings. Before long, the Nemo-1 had caught up to Je 6-1's pod and retrieved the agent, who had been knocked unconscious by the shockwave. Once the agent was back on the main ship, the doctor turned his attention back to the monitors, making sure the installations they drilled into the creature were functional. Slowly, the machines came online to full power, and the speed at which SCP-169 had been moving began to slow ever so slightly. The team all watched the viewport in silence as a steady stream of anesthetic gas was pumped into the respiratory system of the gigantic living myth in front of them. After a few moments of waiting, the doctor spoke. I think it worked. 
he said with a smile. The crew erupted in cheers as they radioed control back up on land that the mission had been a success. The message quickly reached the O5 Council, where a red alert status was de-escalated, and the O5 members withdrew from their plan of leaving the current Earth for that of an alternate universe. The whole crew began to sing and celebrate the prevention of the end of the world, as Dr. Hart simply stood in front of the massive viewport, watching the mountainous specimen slowly grow smaller in the distance as the submersible began ascending back to the world above. Zhe 6-1 came over to congratulate him, patting him on the back. We did it! He said. Loosen up! The doctor managed to laugh along in acknowledgement. That we did, he said in relief. That we did. The two watched the deep blue ocean in silence, taking in the vastness of the sea. Perhaps this would not be the end of it, but that day, they had done what the SCP Foundation did best. Kick that apocalyptic can a few miles down the road. And sometimes, in the face of the terrifying and the infinite, that's really the best you can do. Maria Delgado tumbled through the air. The furious sea wind whipped all around her. Her hair blew in her eyes, trying to shield them from the view of what was rapidly coming to hit her square in the face. An ocean as black as the night sky. She barely had a second to brace herself before. Splash. The impact and the cold knocked all the air out of her. A flurry of bubbles disappeared into the darkness as she sank further and further down, not knowing which way was up. Maria kicked frantically as her waterlogged clothes dragged her back. Her head found the surface, and she barely had a moment to gasp in half a lung full of air before a wave hit her in the side of the head, knocking her back under. Kicking and spluttering, she managed to poke her head up again and tried to wave desperately at the metal behemoth looming over her. The cruise ship that had felt so safe and warm now looked like a cliff face. The lowest window that she could see was more than 100 feet above her head. There had been music playing on the deck, but she was so far below now that she couldn't even hear it anymore. All she could hear was the rumbling of the engines and an ominous swooshing, chopping sound behind her. Maria's stomach dropped. She felt the ocean pulling at her, a current forcing her beneath the waves. She had fallen off the back of the cruise ship, and that meant the current gripping her and turning her beneath the water. She tumbled and twisted in the darkness, feeling all of the air rushing out of her lungs again. Squinting as best as she could through the stinging salt water, she saw the thing that she'd been dreading, an enormous propeller, each blade the size of her house, spinning and spinning just on the edge of her vision and gliding steadily towards her. The water was sucking her towards it, pulling her faster and faster. She'd never been a very strong swimmer, but there wasn't time to feel bad about that now. She needed to escape any way she could. Desperately lashing at the water, Maria kicked and clawed herself out of the current. She had to swim sideways as fast as she could, otherwise she didn't want to think about it. The propellers were getting closer, getting larger in the water. The awful sound of their approach didn't just shake the water around her, it shook all of the water inside of her, making her stomach turn in fear. She hadn't breathed in in a long time. Her body was going into shock from the cold. Everything around her was doing its best to drag her down to a slow, icy death, or maybe a fast, painful death, from the impact of several tons of spinning steel. Something hard and fast crunched into Maria's heel, moving so quickly that it sent her spinning through the water. The propeller had hit her. Its next revolution passed about a foot in front of her face before the turbulence of the cruise ship's wake took hold of her and threw her away. Then, all of a sudden, fresh air was hitting her face. The water had lifted her up to the surface and carried her in the foamy wake that stretched away from the cruise ship. Already, the metal juggernaut was a couple of hundred feet away from her, if she tried to swim after it, the currents in the water would only carry her further backward. Maria had no choice but to tread water and stare as the cruise ship that had once been so large and imposing above her steadily became a dot on the horizon and then disappeared entirely. Her husband had been in bed. She had just stepped out onto the deck to have some fresh air. He could sleep through anything. Chances are he wouldn't notice she was missing until he woke up in the morning, and who knew what time that would be. They were on vacation, and he hadn't set an alarm. He would probably assume that she'd gone for an early breakfast without him. Only once he'd sat down and finished his breakfast and gone back to the room to find she was still missing would he start to worry. 
By that point, she would have stopped kicking hours ago. She wasn't sure how deep the ocean was out here. How many minutes would it take for her body to sink to the bottom? Or would it take hours? Perhaps her corpse wouldn't even be halfway down to the seabed by that point. She was shivering so violently that she was struggling to keep herself above the surface. Her legs weren't kicking like they would in a pool. They were spasming and tensing up. Her clothes ballooned all around her, doing nothing but get in the way as she tried desperately to stay alive. She had no phone. It had fallen off the deck with her, now likely on its own way down to the seafloor. She had no light, not enough air in her lungs to cry for help, and no one between herself and the horizon to hear. This was it. This was how she would die. A sense of morbid curiosity filled her. What exactly was below her? Maybe there was a reef somewhere down where her corpse could lie peacefully. What she saw when she stuck her head beneath the surface was darkness, swirling and empty, and painfully cold. Except, there was something else moving down there. It looked small, smaller than she was, some kind of sea creature swimming up to meet her. Maria lifted her head, took a deep breath, and swam down towards it. It wasn't swimming like a usual fish. Its shadowy silhouette seemed to ripple and twist. As her eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness, she saw what it was. A squid, maybe a meter in length. At least she wouldn't be dying alone out here. The squid started to swim faster, approaching her quickly. At that moment, she suddenly remembered some of the things she'd heard about squids. Weren't they hunters? She had seen a nature documentary once where sperm whales had come up from the seabed with enormous gouges around their eyes from where they'd been attacked by a school of squids. Suddenly, Maria didn't want her companion anymore, but it was too late. The squid had almost reached her end. She felt her mind starting to float out of itself. Her eyes weren't focusing properly. The squid wasn't just swimming towards her, it was flashing, almost like a strobe light. Different lurid colors filled the ocean around her, and it convulsed in different colors until all of a sudden, it wasn't a small squid at all anymore. It ballooned in size, swelling and bulging all around her. Enormous tentacles unfurled themselves and whipped at the water all around her. It was 10 meters tall now, 20, 40, 70. The squid seemed to fill the whole ocean, swallowing up all of the available water and leaving her in a tiny puddle floating just a few feet away from its gnashing beak. Some of the tentacles didn't even look like tentacles anymore. They had turned into pinchers or even human-looking arms and legs, except the fingers were tipped with grotesque talons. She had to escape, had to get away. If Maria had thought she'd swum fast to get away from the cruise ship's propellers, it was nothing compared to how fast she swam now. Without care for her trembling limbs, struggling lungs, or rapidly fading consciousness, Maria knew she had to get away from this monstrosity. There was no hope for her without escape. The flashing lights felt like they were all around her. No matter which way she swam, it just felt like they were getting brighter and brighter until a pair of hands grabbed her and lifted her out of the water. Maria kicked and screamed, trying to fight the tentacles off, but they pinned her down to the deck and held her there. Voices surrounded her, bright lights shining in her face. This was how she would die. Until a shadow blocked out one of the lights, and her eyes managed to focus on something. It was a man. He was talking to her in another language, desperately trying to calm her down. Where was the squid? What had happened to it? Maria lashed out with her limbs, trying to shake herself free from the fishermen who were holding her down on the deck. She threw her gaze sideways and saw an enormous net lifting a school of fish out of the water. There were hundreds of them, all thrashing and slapping against one another. And there, poking out of the bottom of the net, was a single tentacle. Dread filled her stomach, but her body gave out on her, and she fell unconscious. All right, we run it one more time. Dr. Matthews sat at the laptop and watched the grainy CCTV footage for what felt like the hundredth time. It was footage from a fishing vessel captured off the coast of Senegal. The first 30 seconds of the clip just showed the view from the front of the boat, waves splashing here and there, but mostly darkness. Then, all of a sudden, there were two shapes moving through the water. One was a terrified woman desperately swimming towards the surface. The other shape was harder to pin down. When Matthews had first watched the video, she'd seen a colossal sea creature writhing beneath the surface. But each time that she'd watched it since, 
the creature seemed to get a bit smaller and lose some of its sting. Perhaps the shock of what she was seeing had just been wearing off. Regardless, it was time to do the mandatory checks before the latest SCP was brought into the facility. Dr. Matthews walked through the corridors of the containment facility and came to the large double doors that led into the main hangar. It had been hard to find a facility large enough to contain this SCP. They knew it was capable of reaching enormous sizes, so they had to construct an aquarium big enough to house it at its maximum size. Dr. Matthews started walking across the walkway. It hung suspended over the reinforced aquarium and would be strictly off-limits once the SCP had been moved into the facility. It was far too easy for the squid to simply grab a member of staff and pull them beneath the water. She was heading towards the control panel at the other side. The tank was 150 meters cubed, and so walking the length of it took her well over a minute. This was by far the biggest containment she'd ever been involved with in terms of scale, as well as severity. The logistics in trying to organize the containment of this squid had run into the millions of dollars, and were still going up every day. It had taken her and her research team a while to convince the board that this SCP posed a significant enough threat to warrant the investment. She needed to make sure not to screw it up. Guards stood all around the perimeter of the tank, holding B-74H harpoon guns with electrified discharge shafts. Looking down into the water, Dr. Matthews could see the 15 depth charges, all hanging at various heights throughout the tank. Each of these depth charges were wirelessly connected to a computer that monitored the integrity of the glass all around the tank. If the SCP were to make even the slightest crack in the glass, all 15 depth charges were to be set off simultaneously. She hoped that was enough to kill it. God help her if it wasn't. It would keep one entity here for study, but she had reason to believe that there were more of them all over the world. And so, preparations were in place to arm a team that could scour the oceans and eliminate any others that were found. Today was the day. SCP-252, the humbled squid, was about to arrive. The shipping container was lifted by a crane and carried to the right spot. Somewhere inside it was a large sealed tank of water holding an instance of SCP-252. They would drop the shipping container into the reinforced aquarium and let it sink all the way to the bottom, before detonating remote charges on its doors and on the sealed tank inside, allowing SCP-252 to escape and fill its new enclosure. Dr. Matthews stood with her hand shaking over the button. It was now or never. Taking a deep breath, she pressed it down firmly and watched on the security camera monitor as several puffs of bubbles rose from the container and the doors swung open. None of them could see inside the container. They just had to wait. Then, all of a sudden, a small shape darted out. It was tiny, no more than a meter in length. What had happened to the reports that this thing was 75 meters across? Dr. Matthews looked around at her co-workers in shock. She didn't expect to see a monster to unfurl itself out of the container and grow larger and larger, but all that had emerged was a tiny little black squid. But none of her colleagues looked back at her. All of them were staring wide-eyed at the security feed. Matthews glanced back and saw that the little squid was flashing various colors as it swam around, just like the CCTV footage that she had been studying for the prior few weeks. A scream filled the room and was quickly answered with another as her fellow researchers ran away from what they were seeing, terrified by the shapes on the screen. Matthews just looked back and forth in confusion. The colossal sea monster that had been reported to her wasn't there. There was just a tiny squid flashing various colors. What were all of them so afraid of? And now would she break it to her boss that she'd spent millions of dollars on a giant aquarium loaded with depth charges for a squid the size of a large dog? Two weeks later, she found herself attempting to do just that. Standing in front of the disciplinary panel, Dr. Matthews tried to explain what had happened. SCP-252, the humbled squid, is suspected to be the origin of a lot of myths surrounding giant squids, and perhaps even the kraken itself. When hunting, all of the squid's prey attempts to flee by the most direct path possible overcome with terror at what they are seeing. The squid can appear to be anywhere between 50 and 75 meters in size, with up to 200 appendages growing from its mantle. These appendages can all take various forms, often depending on what the prey is most afraid of. For example, a test subject who is terrified of spiders will see the hairy legs of a tarantula amongst the tentacles. But C is the important word here, because while SCP-252 appears to take on its form, 
The reality is that these are all hallucinations brought on by viewing the squid's rapidly flashing colors. While hunting, SCP-252 rapidly cycles its chromatophores, which results in powerful hallucinations. All prey will then immediately lay down their defenses and try to flee as quickly as possible, leaving them open to being eaten by the relatively small and weak real squid. However, as Dr. Matthews had discovered, it was possible to inoculate yourself against these effects by viewing the grainy CCTV footage from the fishing boat on repeat so many times in the run-up to SCP-252's arrival. Dr. Matthews had built up a kind of immunity, allowing her to see the SCP as it actually was, even though her colleagues ran away in terror. One fun fact, Dr. Matthews said, is that the prey will attempt to rationalize the SCP's size, even when it is in a confined space that's impossibly small. So if you were taking a bath with the squid, you would somehow believe that the squid was both 75 meters large and fully submerged in the tub in your guest bathroom. Funny, isn't it? None of the disciplinary board members had a word. They all stared at her in bemused silence. Please don't fire me. It was just a job. You were meant to be mopping floors and cleaning toilets at the Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center for minimum wage. And you were happy about it. Grateful for any kind of employment. You didn't even know that the company signing your checks was the SCP Foundation, an organization dedicated to securing and containing anomalies and protecting humanity from their negative effects at any cost. And today, you're going to find out exactly how steep that cost can be. The Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center isn't actually a research center at all. It's a foundation front business, with a building solely dedicated to the containment of a single anomaly, SCP-3280. But again, you're just the janitor. It's not like they would bother telling you what's being contained here. If it breaks out, you won't even know what's killing you until it's too late. It begins, like most classic horror stories, on a dark and stormy night. You're mopping up a silent hallway, whistling a little tune to yourself, when rain starts hammering down on the window next to you. Not long after, you see a bolt of lightning split the distant sky, followed by an immense thundercrack. Soon after, you hear screaming and panicking from below, frantic footsteps, then the flashing lights and sirens. You think back to your employee orientation, these flashing lights and wailing sirens can only mean one thing, containment breach. You run for it, not even knowing what you're running from. You bring your mop and bucket with you, perhaps just out of habit. You seek refuge in the only place in the facility that truly seems to belong to you, the broom closet. The alarm blares as you lock yourself in the closet. You're shaking with terror and can hear the screaming of your colleagues. You hear more noises. Running, scrambling, a wet dripping sound, gunshots, and then silence. All this time you can't help but wonder, why isn't anybody coming to help us? After a while, the only thing you can hear is the rain and the distant thunder. It's been hours. You've only managed to stave off dehydration by drinking the filthy water from the mop sink. But at least it seems like the chaos outside has died down. Carefully, you open the door and peek out of the closet. Darkness, but no detectable movement. Now's your chance and you make a break for it, creeping down the hall. The dark hallway is suddenly lit up by lightning, and you can see that there are bodies everywhere. You step over the corpse of Dr. Cothrone, one of the few scientists working here who actually knew your name. If you can make it to the security office, you might be able to radio for help, or maybe access a computer terminal. On the way to the office, you hear another horrific scream start to echo through the complex before it's cut off by a thunderclap. You have to ignore it, though, and push on. When you enter the security room, you see that the head security officer, Nichols, is already dead. His body has been cut open from neck to groin, gutted. The anomaly, whatever it is, has already been here. You access the computer terminal and open the file for SCP-3280. You're warned that, as janitorial staff, you have level zero clearance, and as a result, information will be omitted from the files you access. It doesn't matter. You press on and open up the file. Both the object class and the description have been redacted, 
you can only see the special containment procedures. They dictate that 3280 is to remain contained at the Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center until long-term containment procedures can be drawn up. If the entity ever reaches beyond sublevel 2, the facility enters full lockdown mode. Not even information is allowed in or out of the facility, as this could result in an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In other words, nobody is coming to save you. The only other information on the page is a picture of a lightning storm, much like the one you find yourself in right now. Lightning flashes in the hall. You dart around paranoid, knowing the anomaly could be anywhere. All you can hear now is the quiet drip, drip, drip of blood coming from the body of security officer Nichols. Whatever this thing had done to him looked painful. You try to remember him as he was in life, and then a revelation hits you. A security officer probably has a lot better clearance than a janitor. You feel around Nichols' mutilated torso until you find his keycard. Thankfully, Nichols was the kind of guy who'd write his password on the underside of this card so he wouldn't forget it. You easily gain access to the Foundation servers with his login credentials. You now have level 2 security clearance. The terminal gives you the option to view security footage taken throughout the site. You're given access to every camera still working after the containment breach and the subsequent carnage. You select the camera feed for the second floor barracks. There you see researcher Jensen hanging from a makeshift noose attached to his bunk. There's a puddle underneath his corpse. You access the feed from the second floor east wing. There you see Dr. Emanuel stumbling down a dark corridor. His movements are oddly listless, like he's in a trance. Suddenly, there's another flash of lightning and a crack of thunder. Dr. Emanuel clutches his gut in pain and crumples to the floor. You access the camera feed from the first floor entrance. It seems that the whole area is flooded. Is this because of the storm? In a panic, many lower tier staff members had tried to escape, defying the lockdown protocols and the special containment procedures. Now they're floating face down in the water, all dead. You access the camera feed from sublevel 2 and see another corpse lying in the corner. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit, D-Class. No idea why he was down there. The only other notable thing in the basement was a burst pipe, leaking and spraying more water everywhere. With trembling fingers, you select the camera feed for the first floor cafeteria. The whole room is practically underwater. The only evidence of the massacre that must have taken place are the fragments of clothing floating on the surface of the water. That, and the fleshy pink slurry forming at the bottom of the windows. It reminds you of the gooey meat runoff in chicken nugget factories. You close your eyes and try to center yourself. It's violent chaos. Looking at more of it isn't getting you anywhere. Instead, you put those new level 2 security access credentials to good use and hop back onto the file for SCP-3280. You think to yourself, there has to be something I can use on here. But even as you wait for the file to load, some part of you knows that time is running out for you. Perhaps it's the stress, or the fear, or the filthy mop water you drank. But you're feeling the pressure start to mount, physically. Your stomach is beginning to ache. You can see blurry shapes moving in the corners of your eyes. It's getting harder to focus your vision, and harder still to quiet the terrified voices in your mind. But you can't get up, not without knowing what is doing this to you. The containment class for SCP-3280 is now declassified, Euclid, and once more, the special containment procedures have altered too. They now explain that every week, a new member of D-Class personnel is to be deposited into the entity's lair in sublevel 2 through subterranean access point Gamma. The D-Class, or more accurately, the Sacrifices, are to be told lies about why exactly they need to descend to the lowest point in the facility. They're even given a working flashlight and a defensive nightstick to create the illusion that the Foundation expects them to ever return from the depths. Little do they know, they also have a tiny transmitter sewn into their jumpsuit. This broadcasts a frequency that will attract an eager SCP-3280 to the D-Class's location, like a dinner bell only it can hear. The file specifies that SCP-3280 always prefers live prey. Well, at least that explains the dead D-Class in sublevel 2, you think, hoping that it will somehow overwhelm the dizziness you're feeling, or the nagging pain in your gut. You read on. 
Somehow the file's tone becomes even more severe. It says that failure to maintain the containment of SCP-3280 will not only trigger a lockdown, it will always call in the intervention of two different mobile task forces, MTF IOTA-12, the Silencers, and Tau-4, also known as Water Water Everywhere. If 12 hours pass from the point of initial containment breach and the O5 Council hasn't been given the all-clear signal by one of these teams, preparation begins for an imminent XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Just reading the words sends you into a cold sweat. End of the world? What on earth is this creature? Finally, you reach the description. You get to find out what this horrifying entity actually is. But the last thing you expect is the first sentence in the file to read, SCP-3280 is a sapient entity composed of a fluid physically identical to water, capable of traveling roughly two and a half kilometers per hour. It's water. It's literally a living, thinking blob of water. As you read on, the concerning details pile up. Any water that the anomalous SCP-3280 water touches, it integrates it into its own mass. But any time water is separated from this mass, it remains anomalous and continues to act independently. When the creature was first discovered, it was a mere 66.4 liters in volume. Now it's around 2,500. The water infected by SCP-3280 is hostile to all humans, and not just in a defensive manner. SCP-3280 will actively seek out human prey, and when it finds them, it forces its mass into any available body orifice, including the victim's pores. This can happen in such a subtle manner that you may not even notice yourself being infiltrated. But below this, the file has a list of symptoms for those experiencing 3280 infiltration, loss of motor control, weakening of the micturition reflex, visual hallucinations, and abdominal pain. As you read the words, your stomach gives another painful churn, almost like something is moving around inside of you. It's all coming together. You read on. The file states that SCP-3280 is so difficult to contain because it exhibits claustrophobic tendencies. Any time it's placed inside a container, whether organic or inorganic, it escapes with pressurized water jets that travel at over 255 miles per hour. If the water is inside a human, it may literally explode out of them, killing them in the process. Your jittering eyes turn to the gutted body of Security Officer Nichols. It all makes sense now. Everything is becoming clearer as the pain in your stomach builds in its intensity. The file goes on to say that if SCP-3280 escapes sublevel 2, it may be impossible to contain again. If 3280 ever escaped the site proper, it would indeed cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario to unfold, as 3280 merged with our water cycle and destroyed all of humanity on a global scale. It would become truly impossible for anyone to escape. You can't read anymore. The pain in your stomach is unbearable. You jerk from your seat and stumble out into the hall, doubled over in agony. You can feel it pulsing in there, fighting its way out. It must have gotten in through the filthy mop water you were drinking. You didn't even know it, but your fate has been sealed for hours. You've been a dead man walking. The hum of pain builds in your ears and renders you almost deaf. All you can hear is the pattern of rain and distant thunder. You collapse against the glass, feeling the coolness of it against the skin of your face. And in that moment, you see the water droplets on the window pane reverse direction. They're slithering up the glass towards your face in defiance of gravity. Then you realize it's all over. And not just for you. SCP-3280 has escaped. It's out there, and it's going to drown the entire world. As you collapse to your knees and prepare to be torn apart from the inside, your final thought is that at least you won't be alive to see it. The year is 1985, 16th of February. A pair of researchers aboard a model SM-03 deep sea submersible are descending into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Hours ago, they were somewhere just off the coast of France, surrounded by blue sky, the smell of the sea, and the warm embrace of the sun. But now, only cold darkness surrounds them. The depth of the ocean so vast and overwhelming, even light could not escape its grasp. The two-man team are members of MTF Gamma-6, 
also known as the Deep Feeders, a special task force that specializes in the investigation and tracking of deep sea or oceanic anomalies. Their mission, to locate and investigate the wreckage of a World War II German warship known as the Bismarck, thought by the general public to have gone down in the naval battle with the British in 1941. But the story the public doesn't know is the real reason the pair of Foundation members were tasked with locating the ship's wreckage site. Unfortunately for these researchers, today would be remembered for something far worse than they had anticipated. Radio transmissions recorded by the Gamma 6 duo detailed the events that took place upon finding the Bismarck designated SCP-4217. The Bismarck lay at the bottom of the ocean partially submerged in the sea floor, but to the astonishment of researchers, it appeared to be perfectly intact, with no signs of damage from its previous naval engagements. Gamma 6 member Charles Miller comments, even after the better part of five decades, this ship is still in pristine condition. There is no water damage anywhere that I can see, even stranger, no ocean sediment has accumulated on the hull of the ship whatsoever. Prompted to investigate closer, Agent Victor Miller begins operation of the crew's Model RV-1 Marine Probe, an unmanned robotic exploratory drone that allows the researchers to explore the interior of the ship's wreckage. What they found unnerved them, or better said, what they didn't find. Just as the outside of the vessel appeared free of any corrosion or wear, the interior of the ship was just as immaculate. The hallways were clean. The walls adorned freshly painted signs in still legible German. Even the Nazi symbols painted onto command centers still held no sign of disintegration. It was as if the ship had just come off the assembly line. But strangest of all was the lack of skeletal remains. At the time it was sunk, the original crew of the Bismarck boasted a minimum of 2,000 men. Where were the bodies? Continuing the mission, the researchers piloted their unmanned drone down the eerie winding corridors. Along several of the inner corridors of the submerged wreckage of SCP-4217, the crew find large, thick walls of what appear to be made out of a rubber-like substance. Soon they find that the large vein-like growths extend throughout the interior of the ship like tendrils, growing in size the closer the exploratory drone gets to the center of the vessel. All the while, a slight hum sound is picked up by the craft's sonar equipment, echoing from the center of the ship, a rhythmic pulsing. The crew decide they need to take a sample of the rubber-like substance back to Foundation headquarters for testing. This would be a mistake. Upon cutting into the thick tentacle-like growths, the researchers notice something that fills their stomachs with dread. Whatever substance they had cut into, was now bleeding. The team hears a distant rumble growing steadily louder. Suddenly, the ship begins to move. Shuffling sand and debris strew along the seafloor, clouding the visibility of the ship. Terrified, the pair hurried to try and disconnect the cable attaching the probe to their submersible and evacuate the site. But it's too late. A booming thud shakes the underwater craft as a large shadow covers the glass window of the submersible. Alarm systems go off as cracks start to appear in the glass surface. The pair attempt to pilot the vessel up towards the surface, but they are halted by a strong force pulling them downward. Just as the cracks start to spread across the surface of the glass, a giant shadow looms over the submersible. What? What is that? Screams and the sound of shattering glass can be heard on the recording as the submersible implodes from the pressure of the watery depths. Since that unfortunate incident, Foundation members have recorded multiple occurrences of SCP-4217 attacking civilian cargo ships in the Atlantic, particularly off the coast of the United Kingdom and as far north as the Greenland Sea. Given its Keter containment classification, containment of SCP-4217 consists of constant monitoring by Foundation naval forces with the cooperation of the British Royal Navy. In episodes of aggression, or an agitated or hostile state, naval forces are instructed to forcibly subdue SCP-4217 through naval engagement. Once enough damage is sustained, SCP-4217 enters a passive state and resubmerges. SCP-4217 is divided into two parts. SCP-4217-A is the Bismarck itself, a Nazi-era warship outfitted with an array of eight main guns, 44 secondary armaments, and dozens of units of anti-aircraft weaponry. 
SCP-4217-B refers to the anomalous cephalopod organism embedded inside the hull of the ship. SCP-4217-B has two large rectangular pupils inside of octopod eyes that protrude from the base of the ship, as well as 12 100 to 200 meter long tendril-like muscular appendages that extend outward from an opening in the stern of the vessel. SCP-4217 is deemed to be classification risk class dangerous, with reports of it emitting a mild psionic field within a 20 kilometer radius, confusing anything within range and increasing the likelihood of friendly fire among enemy combatants. SCP-4217-A's hull seems to have the ability of inorganic regeneration, as damage incurred from enemy vessels seems to immaculately repair over time. Researchers have observed what appears to be runes or cryptic markings oh. on the side of SCP-4217-A's hull. It is believed these symbols were part of the original ship's design to bolster the vessel's defense integrity. Though not immediately visible, when the vessel is taking fire, the symbols appear to glow in proportion to the amount of damage being mitigated. Among its offensive capabilities, apart from the standard armaments of a World War II era warship, SCP-4217-A also has specialized munitions of an unidentifiable gas compound that is reported to have mutagenic properties. Individuals that have been exposed to the gas compound undergo rapid, spontaneous metamorphosis at a molecular level, growing an array of evolutionary attributes which include the accumulation of reptile-like scales or avian feathers in place of skin. The increase or decrease of the number of limbs, digits, or even ocular, olfactory, or auditory organs. And in one reported case, an event where multiple members of one crew were fused at a subatomic level into one functioning organism. The more study into this particular incident is needed. SCP-4217 also has the ability of subsurface oceanic mobility and can submerge itself when not in combat with enemy vessels. Underwater propulsion appears to be generated by the ejection of water from SCP-4217-B's body cavity and reaches a top speed of approximately 30 knots. SCP-4217 undergoes cycles of passive behavior that is periodically interrupted by moments of hostility towards civilian craft, particularly resurfacing and going after transatlantic cargo vessels. It is believed this is analogous to the history and original mission of the Bismarck, Operation Rheinenbung. During World War II, the German Luftwaffe was besieging London in a series of nightly air raids that would be colloquially known as the Blitz. It was the grand intention of the Third Reich to cut off supplies to the British to limit their resistance to the Nazi war machine. However, what pestered the Nazis most and hindered this effort was the consistent American support provided by the US government in the form of food and supplies delivered to the British via Atlantic trade routes by cargo ship. The German Bismarck and her sister ship, the Tirpitz, were created for the very goal of stopping these transports of cargo to the United Kingdom, as well as sinking as many Allied vessels as possible. The year is 1937. In a top-secret effort to make preparations for an approaching war, Adolf Hitler turns to his most trusted expert on the supernatural, Chief SS Officer Heinrich Himmler. Among other projects, Himmler ordered the Anerbe Obscura Corps, a German organization tasked with the procurement and investigation of otherworldly or otherwise unexplainable phenomena, to begin the creation of two ships, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz, the former named after the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who in 1890 unified the German people. These vessels were to be created using recently uncovered technological oddities the Obscura Corps had found in their studies of the occult. Sources of information about the exact creation of SCP-4217 are highly expunged from the record, but bits and pieces did survive, among what little the Foundation was able to collect and in the records of the USSR after their occupation of Eastern Germany, following the fall of the Nazi regime during the Second World War. The earliest mention of SCP-4217's conception dates back to early 1937, when a top-secret shipment of unknown materials labeled Components of Thaumatological Constructs is intercepted by a Foundation agent working undercover in a German shipment center outside of Hamburg. The Foundation agent, Marcus Straub, is instructed to maintain surveillance on the shipment. In 1939, upon near completion of the soon-to-be-christened Bismarck, 
A second shipment labeled with the insignia of the Obscura Corps is intercepted by the Foundation agent, only this shipment appears unlike any other. Reports of the massive shipping container holding machinery capable of aquatic life support indicate organic living cargo. Though the Foundation agent was unable to identify the exact nature of the contents of the shipment, Straub reported hearing sounds emanating from the cargo hold, sounds similar to that of a heartbeat. Just a year later, the Bismarck is seen making its first naval trial run when it experiences a massive electrical discharge just offshore, shutting the vessel down momentarily until power was restored shortly after. Reports show luminescent symbols briefly visible on the hull of the ship. Thaumatological symbols, for the layman, are symbols that embody the study of miracles. Because of this, it was apparent to the Foundation that some occult anomaly was responsible for the strange characteristics of the German vessel and an order for termination was reached by the O5 Council, the hunt for SCP-4217. In the autumn of 1940, under orders of neutralization of SCP-4217, all active Foundation agents presiding in Germany were ordered to converge on the site of the Bismarck to stop the completion of the vessel. But when the time came for the operation, every single one of the Foundation agents vanished. No records of what happened were ever found, no clothing, notes, not even a trace of their existence was left behind. The mission was deemed a failure, and subsequent attempts to neutralize SCP-4217 became far more difficult after the Bismarck received a full crew of seamen. The fully manned and well-equipped SCP-4217 became a menace to both military and civilian craft on the high seas of the Atlantic, at times appearing without warning, seemingly out of thin air. SCP-4217's psionic field obscured it from the new technological advancements in enemy radar systems the U.S. government had in development. The ship became a shadow on the Atlantic, a subject of ghost stories for anyone daring to assist the British government with the war effort. Furthermore, SCP-4217 did not seem to be content with the surrender of enemy vessels. Captured enemy ships were gassed, turning the men into manufactured beasts and then sinking the enemy vessels to the depths of the ocean. Even submarines were no match, on one report describing an attempt to elude the vessel by diving below the surface, only to be entangled by enormous squid-like appendages that dragged the craft back up to the surface before crushing it in its grasp. Fearing the safety of the public, the O5 Council decided they could not stand by and let more innocent lives be taken. They voted to supersede the Foundation's policy on absolute secrecy to notify the British government of the danger SCP-4217 posed to maritime civilians. With cooperation from the British Royal Navy, Foundation representatives joined the crew of HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales to track reports of the Bismarck being sighted off the coast of Scandinavia. In what history books would come to know as the Battle of Denmark Strait, HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales engaged SCP-4217 and a secondary German warship known as the Prinz Jürgen. Confused by the ship's psionic field, the British naval ships experienced trouble identifying the Bismarck and engage in friendly fire before being able to regain control of their armaments, concentrating all volley of fire on SCP-4217. The attack proves futile, as after the embers and smoke of munitions fire wear off, the sides of the Bismarck's hull appear to vibrate with glowing energy. Mangled metal begins to straighten back into perfect frame, breaches in armor begin to heal before the soldier's very eyes. And all that is left as evidence the ship had ever taken fire is a cloud of steam emanating from the hull of SCP-4217. The water surrounding the vessel begin to boil as underwater tentacles lurch out and capture the HMS Hood, dragging Her Majesty's ship forward. The men aboard frantically try to regain control, but seconds later are met with another crisis. A salvo of artillery shells fired from SCP-4217's guns hit the ship, severing lines and damaging railguns, as a mutagenic gas compound starts to spread among the royal seamen. In mere minutes, the majority of the crew are engulfed in toxic fumes and experience vomiting and convulsions, their bodies undergoing rapid involuntary mutagenesis, including the growth of limbs, the development of fur, feathers, and scales. In one report, it was said that multiple victims even fused together to create one single horrifying entity. 
Those exposed to the gaseous compound were designated SCP-4217-1. The captain of the HMS Hood barricades himself inside the helm, but the resulting instances of SCP-4217-1 overpower the ship and neutralize command. In the seconds that follow, any witness of the horror that the men aboard the HMS Hood experienced is forever entombed in the watery grave of the British vessel, as the ship is sunk by a volley of munitions fire from the combined might of the German fleet. Some men attempting to jump overboard and swim to safety are dragged down by their legs by the mutated instances of SCP-4217 and pulled under, lungs filling with seawater, as they scream until their breath is no more. In disbelief, the crew of HMS Prince of Wales decides to retreat. In the days that followed, at the bequest of Foundation members, the British Royal Navy launches a full-scale armada to hunt down and neutralize the Bismarck. Though SCP-4217 sustained little damage in the previous encounter, the ship began leaking a black, oil-like substance thought by SCP researchers to be an organic waste product of SCP-4217-B. The Allied naval forces are able to follow the trail to the coast of France, where under the lead of HMS King George V, British warships surround the German vessel and open fire. This time, they were ready. With approval from the O5 Council, Foundation members provide the British forces with enhanced munitions and armament capable of overwhelming SCP-4217's thaumatological defenses. On the eve of battle, it appears to the Allied forces that the psionic field generated by SCP-4217 is too great, as the naval company find it difficult to land targeted assaults on the German vessel. After losing several smaller vessels to the colossal appendages of SCP-4217, Foundation members on board authorize the use of a redacted SCP. It is brought in to deactivate SCP-4217's psionic field. The tide of the battle turns, and after a fierce battle, SCP-4217 becomes immobile and unable to return fire. Relentless, the British continue their bombardment until the artillery munitions on the ship explode into a giant fireball, flooding the ship's compartments with the noxious fumes of the mutagenic compound. Its crew members either jump overboard or are engulfed in the cloud of gas. The British vessels capture any survivors and watch as SCP-4217 slowly sinks below the waves, down to the depths of the ocean where it would lay dormant for the next 48 years. SCP-4217's 121 surviving crew members were captured and interrogated. Most of the low-ranking German soldiers were released to British custody, 109 of them having their memory wiped by Foundation staff. Twelve remaining members of the crew were sent to Site-23 for further detention and advanced interrogation, and 74 of the instances of SCP-4217-1, the mutated subjects, were recovered and sent to Site-23 for further observation. It was thought that on that day, SCP-4217 was deemed neutralized and no longer a matter of priority. The Bismarck sunk into memory and myth. It was only until the recent resurgence of SCP-4217 that the Foundation saw the need to collect as much information on the organism inhabiting SCP-4217-A as possible. Decades-old manuscripts and ledgers were pulled from hundreds of viable sources. From the intelligence then gathered, Foundation members have come to the hypothesis that the entity powering the vessel known as the Bismarck has what is believed to be extraplanetary origin. World War II-era documents uncovered between Commander Karl Reuter of the German Obscurocorps and a Dr. Hans Meyer indicated discovery of an organic life form of unknown origin found in a crashed aircraft near Feldberg Park in the Black Forest mountain range in Germany. Further correspondence with Obscurocorps members Otto Schmidt and Dietrich Klossner indicate that researchers were conducting trials on the creature's ability to create psionic fields and to control or confuse enemy subjects within its range, with a letter from Dietrich Klossner suggesting the creature could be used as a power source for an unspecified engine. Further evidence of SCP-4217-B's extraplanetary origin can be found in a 1993 incident between Foundation naval ship SCPS Nemed and SCP-4217. This is the only incident on record where contact was established with the creature classified as SCP-4217-B. On July 22nd, SCP-4217 had reappeared off the coast of Britain, anticipating hostility. SCPS Nemed, SCPS Cesare, and SCPS Partholon were instructed to close in on SCP-4217's location 
with orders to subdue the vessel if necessary. However, on this occasion, SCP-4217 did not appear to be after any vessel. It was simply drifting along at sea, no propulsion engines active. Noticing the change in SCP-4217's behavior, Captain Kurt Wegner decided to withhold military engagement and investigate SCP-4217's behavior. Sailing within 200 meters of the Bismarck, the SCPS Nemed attempted radio contact with the German vessel. After repeated attempts at communication, the crew were met with only silence and static chatter. Giving up, Captain Wagner puts down the radio receiver when suddenly, the sound of music is heard playing over the speakers of a ship. The tune is the national anthem of Nazi Germany. The captain hails the vessel again, repeating his attempts at communication. Do you... do you understand me? At first, only static can be heard. Then came a reply. You... ship. The ominous voice could be heard from the speakers. The captain hesitated for a moment, members of the crew looking at each other with apprehension. The captain replied, confirming themselves as a ship and then asking if SCP-4217 knew what it was and where it came from. What followed was the crew of the SCPS Nemed receiving a video feed from SCP-4217, featuring a high volume of images in rapid succession. Among them were images of German cities, Adolf Hitler's telecast of the 1936 Olympics, an unknown structure in outer space, and in increasing repetition, images of the planet Jupiter, particularly the giant storm on Jupiter known to the public as the Great Red Spot or SCP-2399, as Foundation members know it. The transcript of the radio communication between Captain Wagner and SCP-2417 stops. When the video feed begins to focus heavily on images of Jupiter, SCP-4217's responses become more erratic and agitated as it repeats the words storm, cloud, and red. The markings on its hull beginning to light up and the underwater shadows of its tentacles beginning to create whirlpools of displacement under the bow of the ship. A shrill shrieking begins to flood out of the speakers, followed by a high-piercing, high-pitched beeping sound that overloads the communication equipment, causing sparks to fly as crew members cover their ears and hide under control panels. The SCPS Nemed barely escapes as SCP-4217 becomes hostile using its massive tendril-like appendages to assail the naval combatants, firing its armament in all directions. After a fierce battle, the Foundation naval forces were able to neutralize and subdue SCP-4217. No further attempts at communication have been recorded. To keep the veil of secrecy, Foundation members constructed a replica ship to be sunk and intentionally rediscovered by oceanographer Robert Ballard in 1989. Any recent sightings of the Nazi-era Bismarck are flagged as misidentification by SCP staff. For now, Foundation members continue to monitor the behavior of SCP-4217 and protect the public from its existence. Jack was swimming deep underwater, wondering why he had such a pounding headache when suddenly he had a terrifying realization. He had no idea where he was or what he was doing. There was a nagging feeling that he must have a specific reason to be here. You don't just end up deep in the ocean with a diving suit on by chance. Yet he had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't sure he cared either. He was more worried about the throbbing pain in his head and the vision of two eyes staring at him out of the dark that he couldn't get out of his mind. His heart began to race as he wondered what to do and how to get help. He was in the middle of the ocean and appeared to be all alone. He couldn't see anything in the dark water except for this weird gray substance in front of him. Maybe he was going to die here alone. Without knowing if anyone could even hear him, he began to speak aloud about how he was consumed by sickness and that darkness was all around him. This is the story of one of the most powerful and dangerous anomalies yet discovered, SCP-3000. Before Jack's descent into despair, the SCP Foundation had mandated an exploratory expedition off the coast of Bangladesh. After receiving a few strange reports from locals and fishermen, the Foundation suspected an SCP was lurking in the water and positioned a few personnel to investigate. The crew expected danger, or maybe even death. But what they got instead was far stranger and more ominous. All of the men had been verified to be in sound mental states when the mission set out, but a few of them reported feeling strange and uneasy as the submarine descended into the ocean. Before long, a veteran agent named Dr. Williams began to panic in a way that was completely out of character. 
He started sweating profusely, shaking, and wouldn't listen to a word of comfort or reason that anybody tried to offer. It might seem like a relatively normal reaction for anyone descending into the depths of the ocean to meet with a monster that they don't know anything about, but Dr. Williams was a seasoned professional who had been on hundreds of such missions before. There was no logical reason for him to act like this. Although the reaction of Dr. Williams was the most extreme, he wasn't the only one who started to feel strange. Multiple agents developed a creeping feeling of unease that swept over them. One of the calmer men tried to reason with Dr. Williams, asking him what was wrong and if he could explain exactly how he was feeling. That's when things got even stranger. Not only was the doctor extremely anxious, but he now seemed incapable of giving a real response to any questions thrown at him. He could only mutter that he was missing something, but he wasn't sure what. Knowing that many SCPs can bend reality and the human mind, many of the personnel began to have second thoughts about the mission and even asked for permission to call off the mission, but they were mandated to continue, so they went on. As the team went deeper and deeper into the ocean, things only got worse. Even the previously calm crew members became spooked and antsy, while the ones who were already anxious were now sweating and jittering. As for Dr. Williams, he was now pacing back and forth around the submarine, saying things nobody could understand. Every time he looked at his colleagues and his close friends, he seemed to stare straight through them and would call them by the wrong names. It was as if his mind had moved to a different dimension. Whenever someone asked him to perform his normal duties, he looked more confused than ever. Still, the team went deeper. Dr. Williams began to whimper and say the word no repeatedly, growing louder and louder until he was screaming and the others were forced to sedate him. Just then, something came into view. It was what would come to be known as SCP-3000. The thing was huge, so huge that its whole body couldn't be seen out of the submarine window. It was a horrible, eel-looking creature with a head as big as a town and haunting eyes that lit up the black ocean around it. But perhaps the strangest part was this giant eel seemed to be producing a weird gray liquid. Even the sedative wasn't enough to keep Dr. Williams calm anymore. There was a strange blank look in his eyes as if the light and life had left him, and he just began screaming no repeatedly again and wouldn't respond to any attempts to calm him down. Not that anyone else was very capable of calming him down at this point. Even the crew members that had been holding up well were starting to act strangely, and nobody could get the image of these ominous eyes out of their heads. Then things went from bad to worse. Williams began screaming and shouting madly as if he was being tortured by an unseen force. The men tried to restrain him, but it was no use. He began smashing his head against the submarine window until it cracked, putting the whole mission and everyone's life at risk. He fell to the ground injured, chanting that there was nothing, whatever that meant. It was an emergency scenario. They began applying first aid to Williams as the submarine ascended to the surface as quickly as possible before the pressure of the ocean caused the cracked window to explode. By the time they reached the surface, Williams was dead, but there was something even more chilling than the circumstances of his death. Every single man who had been in that submarine experienced the same thing on the days that came afterward. The image of the eel-like creature's eyes seemed burned in their minds permanently. It would haunt their waking hours for the rest of their lives, and sleep was no escape either, as they would appear in both their dreams and nightmares alike forever. A second mission had to be sent to gather more information about the strange beast. Already, there were many theories and question marks surrounding SCP-3000. How big was it really? Was it sentient? What was the liquid for? None of the men who had been on the previous mission were willing to return to the waters, but a new group of brave recruits volunteered. They were about to find out what so many in history have learned the hard way, that bravery and foolishness are often mistaken for the same thing. This time, the mission would not be in a submarine, but in dive suits, in order to observe the anomaly in even closer detail and to eliminate the chance of one team member self-sabotaging the submarine, killing them all. They were transported to the location by boat, and the three men splashed into the ocean. They descended, and at first everything was going well. In case anything went wrong, the three of them were tethered together for extra security. But the deeper into the ocean they swam, and the closer they got to SCP-3000's location they got, the stranger things became, just like on the last mission. First, there were a few minor cases of confusion. One of the team, Jack, thought it was his responsibility to lead the navigation, but another, Roberto, also thought it was his job. In fact, navigation was actually the job of a third team member, Amir, but he seemed to have forgotten. 
everyone was getting confused. The team listening in on the conversations at the Foundation headquarters grew increasingly concerned about what they could hear. Was everyone losing their minds? Hopefully nobody was about to pull another Dr. Williams on them. Still, the project leads couldn't afford to tell the men to come back to the surface. The Foundation badly needed any information they could get on this SCP, whatever the cost, so they told the men to press on. Things only got worse. Roberto was asking to speak to a colleague who passed away two years ago, while the others began to mutter indistinguishable phrases about eyes and darkness, not too dissimilar to the ramblings of Dr. Williams. It increasingly began to look like a suicide mission. Then there was silence. What was going on? Each of the men had completely lost it, to the point that they cut the tether that was holding them together. All alone, Jack couldn't remember where he was or why he was here. He desperately looked around to try and gauge his surroundings, but he could only see darkness. All he could think about was a pair of large eyes and an overwhelming fear of despair and anxiety and this weird gray fluid that was now floating in front of him. The Foundation listened as Jack started reciting a creepy speech about being on the edge of nothing, inches from oblivion, with a sickness in his mind and nothing but a pair of eyes in front of him. They listened in horror as they heard movement through the radio. It sounded like a huge creature was swimming toward the men. It had to be SCP-3000. But all three men were too confused to do anything about the situation or to even see what was in front of them, claiming they couldn't see anything in the darkness. There was silence for half a minute with the team listening in, fearing the worst. Then they heard some more unintelligible mutterings. The men must be alive, but what on earth was going on? Then the gibberish started again. Two of the men were screaming that Jack had just been swallowed whole and that they were being sucked in too. Why couldn't they just swim away? It was chaos. But then a few moments later Roberto spoke into the radio, saying he was floating alone in the middle of the ocean and had now moved away from the eyes of SCP-3000. He finally seemed capable of forming coherent thoughts and speech. After what had just happened, Roberto now had a theory. He thought that somehow it was impossible to think straight around SCP-3000. When he'd been close enough to see the eyes, Roberto had felt a throbbing pain in his brain and been unable to think about anything. Perhaps it was something to do with that mysterious gray liquid. Even more slime was coming out of SCP-3000 now, and Roberto was determined to get a sample despite the warnings from HQ. In one final burst of motivation, he swam close enough to take some of the gray liquid and put it in a special sample collection unit that was designed to float to the surface for collection later. He had acquired some very important data, but he seemed to have lost all hope of preserving his life. Roberto started telling the team over the radio that he was dying and that his heart rate was too high, but cautioned that it would be too dangerous for anyone to try and rescue him. The personnel continued to try and communicate with Roberto to figure out what was going on, but his words had stopped making any sense until finally he went quiet. Minutes turned into hours, hours into days, and still there was no sign of Roberto or the rest of the divers. After three days, his radio, which had only been sending a steady stream of static, finally stopped working altogether and he was presumed dead. However, the sample Roberto had collected had survived and made it to the hands of the Foundation researchers. It turned out to be a viscous substance now known as Y909, a chemical compound and extremely strong anesthesia. Y909 causes head pain, paranoia, fear, panic, memory loss, and confusion, explaining what happened to Dr. Williams and the diving trio. The collection of Y909 might have resulted in two disastrous missions, but there's a silver lining as the substance ended up becoming an invaluable tool for the SCP Foundation. Its ability to make people forget what had just happened to them can be used to eliminate knowledge of threatening SCPs among the public. It also helps the Foundation staff cope with the traumatic experiences they encounter on their missions. Although other amnestics can be used for the same purpose, none are as powerful as the one produced by SCP-3000. Before its discovery, the amnestics used would break down too quickly, not fare well in storage or cause undesirable side effects. The only problem is the method of sourcing. The only way to obtain Y909 is somewhat ethically questionable for most people. SCP-3000 produces Y909 after eating, so the best way to stock up on it is by feeding the creature. Sedated D-Class personnel from the Foundation are sent on missions supposedly to observe the anomaly up close, unaware that this mission is one way only. Other divers are then sent later to collect the fluid from a safe distance and store it. Of course, it's all for the greater good of humanity. Now the Foundation protects SCP-3000 as best as it can guard something hundreds of kilometers long. The area is carefully patrolled and members of the public are not allowed to enter the part of the bay where it resides. Anybody who accidentally comes into contact is contained. Eventually another pair of Foundation doctors went down in a submarine to try and learn more about SCP-3000. 
One became so affected by Y909 that he began hallucinating. He started talking about Ananta Shesha, the king of serpents in Hinduism. Ananta Shesha is believed to be all that will be left after the end of the world because it exists throughout all of time simultaneously. The doctor said he believed that this was in fact Ananta Shesha, that SCP-3000 simply shows us that eventually everyone dies and fades into the darkness of oblivion, right before he exited the submarine and swam right into his mouth. Luckily for now, SCP-3000 seems to be in a sort of hibernation state. It rarely moves and it doesn't hunt, although it will eat when fed. But no one knows when or if it will wake, or what it's capable of if it does. Will it destroy the world? or simply drive us all insane. Commander McGrath, one of the most influential members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, better known as the Red Right Hand, had been summoned by his masters for one of the most important missions of his life. It was so above top secret, even he would likely need to undergo amnestic treatment once he'd seen the job through. It comes with the territory when you're dealing with SCP-006. The Red Right Hand is no ordinary mobile task force either. They were the personal enforcers of the O5 Council, the 13 most powerful members of the SCP Foundation, and by extension, some of the most powerful human beings on Earth. Commander McGrath stood before the assembled council, trying to suppress the tremors of fear and awe running through him. He'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with SCP-076 Abel, one of the finest humanoid warriors ever known, during one of his many containment breaches. He led strike forces after a fleeing SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, after it escaped its acid tank and began charging towards the nearest populated area intent on causing mass death. He'd personally taken out more people than you've probably ever met, all at the behest of his Foundation's superiors. And yet standing right here before them, he couldn't help feel a twinge of deep terror. It was like staring right into the face of God and waiting for it to blink. With his well-honed military observation skills, he noted that O5-2 wasn't among the Council this time, but he knew better than to ask why. He was employed to take orders, not to ask questions. And this time, his orders were something special. He wasn't given any more information than this. McGrath, we need you to lead an elite team to a Strachan in Russia on the double. Procedure 006 is now in effect. You know what to do. McGrath nodded. He'd been prepared for this day. His predecessor, Commander Richards, had only needed to enact Procedure 006 once in his long and storied career with the red right hand. It was truly a once-in-a-lifetime assignment, and now the torch had been passed to him. The only question was whether he'd be up to the task. But McGrath didn't have time to ponder on this question. Time was of the essence. First, he needed to assemble a team, small but focused. Loyal men who'd keep their heads down, complete the mission, and take the forbidden knowledge no further than the bounds of said mission. McGrath selected three operatives, Bennett, DiMaggio, and Stewart, all of whom had proven valuable assets in prior missions. They would be the ones to accompany him on this most valuable and secretive of directives. Procedure 006. But before they could execute the mission itself, they needed to be trained, briefed, and fitted with the proper equipment. For a mission this sensitive, and dealing with an anomaly as deadly as SCP-006, they needed to wear modified Class 6 BNC suits. These are the ultimate total exclusion hazmat suits, designed specifically by the SCP Foundation. They offered such a degree of protection that they made regular hazmat suits look like bikinis. Commander McGrath actually knew very little about SCP-006 and how it worked. Like many of the more top-secret anomalies contained by the Foundation, only the O5 Council understood the full scope of it. Everyone below them were only told the specific fragments of information they needed to do their job. After all, filling your head with the wrong kinds of knowledge can get your memory wiped, or worse, at the SCP Foundation. SCP-006, as far as Commander McGrath knew, was the more traditional kind of toxic. He'd been briefed using the SCP-006-B info pack, a heavily redacted description of SCP-006. Safe class, liquid in nature, but one of the most toxic substances known to man. It made mercury and uranium look like a glass of mineral water. And more dangerous still, if someone came into contact with even the tiniest quantity of SCP-006's liquids, they would not only be marked for certain death, 
They would also become a vector for transmission, a veritable plague rat, a walking danger to all mankind. That's why the Class 6 BNC suits needed to be tested. McGrath, Bennett, DiMaggio, and Stewart suited up in a secure foundation training facility and fully submerged themselves in a training pool. This was how they made sure that there were no vulnerabilities in the suits. If any bubbles were generated, it meant there was a leak. And if there was a leak, then the person wearing the defective suit was as good as dead when they reached the real 006. Lucky for them, no leaks. They were ready to proceed to the next stage of the mission, making their way to Astrakhan, Russia, where SCP-006 was contained. The pressure was on, with the Council growing more impatient by the moment, so they needed to make the journey immediately. Every minute counted, and Commander McGrath was painfully aware of the time slipping away. Though he couldn't possibly fathom why they need a toxic chemical like this with such urgency, they made their journey in a covert cargo plane. It was beyond important to keep all Foundation activity around SCP-006 under wraps. A number of groups of interest cells were active in the area, including the Church of the Broken God and the Serpent's Hand. And if ever the dreaded Chaos Insurgency caught wind of SCP-006's existence and triangulated its location, the damage it could do would be unprecedented. That's why nobody but the O5 Council could truly be trusted with this almost sacred knowledge. When they touched down in Astrakhan, they met with a Foundation courier who would take them on the final leg of their journey to the Foundation site, roughly 60 kilometers west of the town. McGrath and his team had no idea what they were headed towards, or the insane history of the land they traversed, all because of SCP-006. The Foundation had first become aware of the anomaly back during the 19th century, but were unable to gain control of it until 1991 due to it being fiercely guarded by a procession of territorial Russian rulers. The blood of hundreds of thousands had been spilled on this land in the historic wars and conflicts over SCP-006. So many had wasted their entire lives unsuccessfully trying to find it. During this several-hour car trip to the site, Commander McGrath had no idea of the true value of the anomaly he and his small team were heading towards. But he would, in time though an innocent would have to die first. The courier dropped the four operatives off outside an abandoned chemical plant in the sticks, far from what anyone would call civilization. It was the kind of industrial decay you could expect in the badlands of rural Russia, a huge complex weathered and broken by time. But what the untrained observer wouldn't realize is that the plant was actually full of heavily trained and even more heavily armed Foundation security personnel. As McGrath's team approached the building, they had no less than eight sniper rifles pointed at them from various vantage points within the plant, just to be safe. The Foundation couldn't afford to take any chances with SCP-006. They arrived at the gate and provided their clearance credentials. They were envoys, here on behalf of the O5 Council themselves, and if they weren't allowed to complete their mission, then the 006 personnel would have the death of a council member on their hands. With that, the team was given a free pass into the site, under close observation. Anyone seeking to interface SCP-006 was forced to do so under almost microscopic scrutiny. Even when inside the building, McGrath and his men needed to pass multiple secure checkpoints throughout the halls, each time restating their security credentials. Eventually, they reached a different section of the building, Foreboding anomalous hallways gave way to what seemed like a mix of a garden and a jungle, but the plants were different. The trees, the shrubs, even the weeds were unlike anything members of the team had ever seen before. It was like stepping into an alien world, or perhaps this world, but as it was a few million years prior, it was terrifying and wondrous. They suited up in their Class 6 BNC suits, fearing airborne contaminants from SCP-006 before proceeding further. They walked through this new jungle, being watched at every turn by security cameras and personnel posted throughout this overgrown portion of the facility. It didn't take long for them to reach their destination. The legendary SCP-006, a small natural spring jutting out of a rock surrounded by rich, emerald grass. It looked more like a nice place to have a picnic than a dangerous and highly secretive anomaly, but McGrath wasn't paid to question things. 
only to carry out Procedure 006. The only object they had with them was the quad sealant container, an ultra-secure liquid containment unit specifically designed for safely transporting samples of SCP-006's water between sites. The team members descended into the spring and began filling up the container. It was nerve-wracking, knowing the stakes of their mission, and knowing that they were submerged in such a deadly substance, but they had a job to do, and they were going to do it come hell or high water. They filled the containment unit, but sadly for McGrath and his team, the mission wouldn't be entirely without casualty. A single bubble rose from the leg of Stewart's suit. He was a good MTF operative, but the youngest and least experienced member of the team. His suit must have somehow been damaged during transit, and now he was compromised. He shared a haunting glance with McGrath and his fellow team members knowing that his part of the mission and his life was about to come to a swift and violent end. Alarms rang out across the facility. A huge team of armed operatives all wearing Class 6 BNC suits charged into the room. Stewart was grabbed and manhandled out of the 006 spring, while his fellow team members sealed the containment unit and continued their mission. There was no time to stop, rest, or mourn. Completing the mission was the absolute priority. If McGrath understood the protocol as well as he thought he did, Stewart would be dragged into a secure room by the site staff and locked in with a blast door. He would look down and notice the floor below him was a metal grate caked with ash. His last thoughts as the incinerator launches its flames into action would strangely be the fact that he was feeling the healthiest he'd been in years. But that wouldn't stop the sudden furnace around him from decimating his body and leaving little more than ash and charred bones. Over a decade of loyal MTF service ended in an instant. Stewart would have been terminated. According to orders from the top, it was all that could be done for those afflicted by SCP-006. A mercy, really, if they were to be believed. McGrath and his team soldiered on. After retrieving the sample, they were hurried back into their inception point one of the many classified bases occupied by the O5 Council members. While DiMaggio and Bennett were ushered off to be given amnestic treatment, McGrath would personally get to see the containment unit and its precious cargo make the final leg of the journey. He was going to be granted access to O5-2, the person this had all been in service of. Commander McGrath approached the secure quarters of the council member, escorted by a bevy of heavily armed security personnel. The doors open and he saw her there. 05-2, bedridden laying at the center of a grand web of life-saving technology. She was beyond old and decrepit. Commander McGrath could see the centuries she'd endured written deeply in the wrinkles and scars of her ancient face. She didn't look like one of the most powerful people in the world. She looked like one of the most feeble. Her eyes lit up when McGrath entered the room holding the containment unit. She beckoned him closer until he was close enough for her to take the containment unit from him with scarred, trembling hands. McGrath watched in horror as she disengaged the lid and swigged down the entirety of its contents. But wasn't the water toxic? He thought. McGrath had been fed the same lie as everybody else. The Foundation didn't keep 006 such a well-guarded secret because it was capable of bringing death. Quite the opposite, in fact. All Commander McGrath could do was stare awestruck as the years seemed to fall from 05-2's face. Decades and decades and decades. Scars faded. Wrinkles disappeared. Little by little, 05-2 began to sit and then stand. By the time she was straightening her clothes, she looked like a healthy woman in her mid-40s. It was a complete and total transformation. The liquid of SCP-006 has a plethora of benefits to human subjects. The ability to regenerate damaged DNA by heightened excitement of cellular duplication and producing a frightening increase in the effectiveness of the human immune system. Even upon testing the liquid on animal subjects, hostile bacteria and viral agents were destroyed immediately. Members of the O5 Council are experts at cheating death, and SCP-006 is just another ace hidden up their sleeve in the endless battle against the Reaper. A secret so well guarded that they're willing to terminate even their most loyal servants to keep it safe. After all, if everyone knew about it, everyone would want it. And the O5 Council are very invested in exclusivity. Never normally one to rise above his station, Commander McGrath couldn't help blurt out, But if it was all a lie, Private Stewart is perfectly alive. 
All smoke and mirrors, you see. And like everyone who works a 006 mission, he won't remember a thing. Good work, Commander McGrath. O5-2, now in perfect health, replied. Now return to your post after a visit to our boys in Amnestics. There's still plenty to be done and we can't afford to dilly-dally. After all, you're not getting any younger. The diver screams a silent scream as the giant squid's beak digs into his skin, its many grasping tentacles grabbing him and holding him in place. Nearby, his fellow divers are driven half-mad with terror as they see mysterious figures floating towards them through the murk and strange Russian voices speaking in their heads. Nobody can help them. They're down too deep, too consumed by the darkness and the pressure of the sea. They're now at the mercy of whatever is inside the submarine. Beginning in the 1940s with the dawn of nuclear weapons, the American government conducting the world's first atomic weapons test and the Soviet Union responding in kind with nuclear testing of their own, the two powers entered an arms race fueled by rivalry and a thirst to prove their strength on the world stage. What followed were decades of staggering technological advancements as each nation tried to outdo and intimidate the other. The Soviet Union crossed into the cold reaches of outer space, deploying the satellite Sputnik. The United States responded with the founding of NASA. Tensions reached a fever pitch during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 as United States citizens feared they were teetering on the brink of nuclear war. In July of 1968, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States came together to sign the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, agreeing to abandon their pursuit of increasing nuclear power and turn their focus to disarmament. But several months before the treaty was signed, the Soviet government was dealing in weaponry far more dangerous than nuclear missiles something the other world powers knew nothing about. These deadly secrets were hidden aboard a submarine known as SCP-741. SCP-741 is the underwater wreckage of a Soviet submarine that sank in March of 1968 and came into the custody of the SCP Foundation in 1999. The submarine, a version of the Charlie II class, was deployed under unusual circumstances, which attracted the attention of the United States government. In an attempt to learn more about the submarine, the US government launched Project Redacted, which attempted to recover the vessel from the ocean in the early 1970s. They managed to recover a few pieces of the vessel, though the specifics are highly classified. In the late 1990s, the US government contacted the SCP Foundation, informing them of a possible Euclid or Keter class anomaly in the wreck. At this point, it passed into the custody and surveillance of the Foundation. The submarine is on the ocean floor, broken into three pieces. The hull was broken into bits during Project Redacted recovery attempt, but was largely intact when it first sank except for two holes, one just in front of the sail and one just below the starboard missile tubes. Apparently the vessel sank rapidly due to flooding after an enemy missile strike, which occurred while it was surfacing. Though all parts of the submarine are accounted for, no members of the crew have been located. Additionally, none of the emergency escape equipment on board has been used, raising further questions about what became of the crew. Wherever they went, they seem to have left something behind. Whenever divers are sent down to investigate the wreckage, they report experiencing anomalous currents and strange sea life, and hearing moans, disembodied voices, and incoherent whispering. They also report seeing blurry, faintly glowing figures. Additionally, the ocean life in the area is unnaturally aggressive, particularly large squid and sharks. This effect was first noted during a manned expedition into the waters around the wreckage, described in Incident Report 1741-A. Divers A26 through A30 embarked from the icebreaker Yamal into the waters below with the intention of studying the potential anomalous activity surrounding the wreckage. As the group of divers approached the submarine, they could feel the shift in the water around them. The oppressive feeling of abnormally increasing pressure bearing down and threatening to crush them. If their specialized diving equipment were to fail, they knew that that would be it, and the command would have to come and fish their corpses out of the water. Or even worse, they would vanish entirely, meeting the same mysterious fate as the crew of that doomed submarine. But they couldn't fixate on that. They had a job to do. At first glance, the wreckage appeared undisturbed, unchanged since the previous inspection. Still, they needed to take a closer look to be sure. 
As the team got closer to the vessel, A-30 was startled by the sight of movement from within the wreckage, spotting motion through one of the holes in the structure as something passed by. He pointed it out to his colleagues, but they dismissed it as likely a giant isopod or spider crab, which were crawling all over the surrounding area. A-30 laughed off his jumpiness, agreed that they were probably right, and continued the exploration as planned. Control authorized the divers to proceed to the next step, and A-29 activated sonar and lights, moving toward the starboard side breach. There, a faint glowing caught his eye. The glow resembled that of radioactive material, but when the team checked the radiation levels in the area, they remained stable. Whatever the source of the glow was, it wasn't radioactive. At this point, his neutron counter began to register something, and all of a sudden, a disembodied voice could be heard saying, Vasily Yevgeny, can you hear me? The voice was muffled, and though it could be heard over their communication channels, it emanated from somewhere in the wreckage. Deep, deep underwater. As A-29 watched, a glowing shape emerged from the darkness. It was only an outline, the suggestion of a silhouette, but the shape was undeniably familiar. It looked like a person. The other divers quickly noted the apparition too and began to panic. Some checked their nitrogen levels, believing it to be some sort of nitrogen narcosis, while others pointed out that they couldn't all be suffering from nitrogen narcosis at the same time. The unknown voice continued speaking, saying, Help me, it is getting hard to breathe. The divers debated what to do next, questioning whether what they were seeing was even real, when all at once, the humanoid figure vanished from sight. The divers attempted to shake off the startling encounter, and they resumed their duties, the investigation proceeding as normal. After a few moments of uneventful work, another interruption presented itself in the form of a five-meter-long squid swimming around the wreckage. Its presence startled the divers at first, particularly those closest to the animal, but the others encouraged them to ignore it, citing the fact that there are no records of these squid attacking humans. So they did, continuing their work as the squid circled them with apparent curiosity. A-27 spotted an unusual shell below the wreckage, notably large and difficult to identify, and Control requested that they bring it up to the surface for further inspection by a marine biologist. The diver began attaching haul cables to the shell as the squid crept closer and closer. All of a sudden, A-26 screamed, and there was a sudden bloom of blood in the water. The squid, despite it being uncharacteristic behavior for its species, attacked the diver, biting him savagely. Prompted by cries for help from the diving team, Control began to reel A-26 back towards the surface, proceeding slowly to give him decompression time, and the squid took advantage of the slow retreat. It chased after the diver, grabbing hold of him and biting down again, tearing away at him as it gripped him in its tentacles. Still, Control continued reeling him in, hoping to free him from the squid's grasp as they yanked him to the surface. The other divers were ordered to get themselves out of there as fast as possible, an order they gladly obeyed. As they swam back to the surface, A-30 saw something else moving in the depths. He couldn't make out what it was, but the sight of it gave him a sick feeling of dread deep in the pit of his stomach. The four divers were recovered alive, along with the shell. Examination of the shell indicated that it resembled that of the extinct orthoconic nautiloids, but it was not fossilized. It was taken for further study, given the possible implication of extinct species anomalously manifesting in the vicinity of SCP-714. Diver A-26 lost a limb and was exposed to an unknown venom via bites from the attacking squid. His camera was destroyed in the process. As squid are not known to attack humans unprovoked, this behavior has been attributed to the influence of SCP-741, though the exact link between the two is yet to be determined. An anomalous pressure gradient surrounds the wreck with a radius of approximately 250 meters, starting around the center of the submarine. The pressure in this area is much greater than it should be, given the depth of the waters there. This unusually high pressure makes sonar analysis extremely difficult, as well as threatening the safety of any divers in the vicinity of the wreck. The few records that the Foundation has managed to obtain from the Russian and U.S. governments indicate that the submarine was being used to transport some sort of secret cargo. Though the specifics of this cargo are still unknown, there is reason to believe that it differed from any type of nuclear or chemical weaponry. On a date redacted from official files, 
the SCPS Basisti was patrolling the area around SCP-741 when its sonar detected some unknown entity approaching SCP-741 from the south at a pace of 46 knots. The crew compared the acoustic signature of the contact with known submarines and torpedoes, but could not find a match. The Basisti attempted to reach the contact via sonar buoy drops and active sonar pings, but it did not respond. When the contact crossed into the total underwater exclusion zone, it became classified as hostile. At that point, the sonar recorded sounds of an undersea missile launch, and Basisti responded with the utmost urgency. The ship broke away from its original area and fired a Type 53 torpedo at the underwater threat. Fifteen seconds after the Basisti launched its torpedo, missiles of an unidentified configuration were seen breaking the water, flying at a height of 1.8 meters and a velocity of 0.92 Mach. The missiles did not emit any detectable radar, nor did they respond to any launch chaff or flares from the Basisti. Both of the missiles were engaged by Basisti's 3KN5 Kinsol surface-to-air missiles and Kashtan point defense systems, and were destroyed at 1,800 meters and 210 meters from impact, respectively. After the missiles were neutralized, the hostile vessel could be heard engaging in evasive maneuvers. At this point, there were four closely spaced explosions and the sound of a submarine disintegrating. The identity of the attacker, as well as its intention toward SCP-741, have not yet been determined. The incident resulted in the Foundation research team suggesting an expansion of the acoustic sensor net, as well as additional patrol and defense assets placed in the area. Additionally, they advised an acquisition of undersea retaliatory capability. The incident was classified Incident 1741-C. The sonar recordings from the SCPS Basisti during Incident 1741-C were taken for further analysis by the research team. The in-depth review revealed anomalous acoustic signatures that did not match up with any known forms of propulsion, including magneto-hydrodynamic drive. Currently, the nature of the unidentified attacker remains a mystery, and it has not been attributed to any particular government or organization. Following the incident involving the SCPS Basisti, an American intelligence agent reached out to the Foundation, offering further insight into the secretive government programs looking into SCP-741. He agreed to sit for an interview with a Foundation researcher assigned to the project, on the condition that his identity remain protected. The SCP researcher's name is absent from the official file as well. The two men sat in a Foundation interview room, and the interviewer asked his informant why he chose to come forward, given the U.S. government had simply chosen to sit on this information for 30 years. You've seen those reports. Project Redacted. Now we know that part too. How the directors didn't make the connection is beyond me. That and the stuff the Redacted pulled up? Yeah, the other part you don't hear about is what some of the research team died of. And the crewmen we buried? Just uniforms. Also, the nuclear device we recovered wasn't a missile or torpedo warhead. It was a demolition charge. Does that make any sense? After all those clues, I had to come forward. Why the director didn't is something I can't fully explain. This particular statement puzzled the Foundation researcher, raising questions he hadn't anticipated. Only uniforms? Did this mean that the sub had been unmanned? The informant replied, no, no, not unmanned. There were no bodies, but personal effects were everywhere, along with uniforms. There was some blood, human. Before you ask, on one of the torpedoes and a bit of skin where somebody probably crushed his hand loading the thing, just no bodies left. When I first looked into all this, I had no clue what the hell had gone on down there, but I started putting things together. The Foundation agent began to speculate based on the mounting evidence. Could it have been a Soviet weapons program? A deadly biological agent of some kind. No, no, it wasn't that. I thought maybe it could have been, so I dialed up some of my contacts at BioPreparent. Our spies wind up owing each other favors after a while, and they denied it vehemently. Not your usual cover-up baloney either. They clearly stated that whatever the sub was carrying, it wasn't theirs. They wanted no part of it. Sound like he was gonna puke when I mentioned Redacted. Doctor, do you have any idea what it takes to make a bioweapons researcher sick? Now that wasn't what really bugged me though. What really kept me awake at night was the KGB file that fell into our hands. They mentioned a covert op by the Soviet military against an internal unnamed faction to get rid of a quote, terrifying weapons that even the Soviet Union can't safely control. They wanted to lose it, 
whatever it was, or maybe fob it off onto the US. Of course, that all came to light right before the Iron Curtain fell. And given the atmosphere at the time, it was practically impossible to convince the directors that they weren't talking about nukes. And even once I did, they still didn't even think this was worthy of action. I mean, the redacted would probably have me hang for treason if they ever find me, but it was worth the risk. And by what I can gather, sounds like Russia thinks so too. Loaning you half the Pacific fleet and all. The interview continued after this point, but the rest of the conversation was considered irrelevant and stricken from the official file. The interview left the Foundation with more questions than answers, though they were more certain than ever that SCP-741 must be kept under strict containment procedures. Due to the object's location at the bottom of the sea, as well as the unusually elevated pressure around it, it is unlikely that many civilians will come into contact with it. However, as an extra protective measure, sonar and submersible monitoring is conducted on a periodic basis in order to verify that the wreckage has not been interfered with in any way. The Foundation contracted Russian warships, SCP Esposisti and Krasnoyarsk, has been selected for this purpose. If any unauthorized activity occurs in the area surrounding SCP-741, nuclear and conventional missiles may be deployed. Any movement of SCP-741 is grounds for an immediate nuclear strike. Whatever secrets SCP-741 holds, whatever it was transporting that was even more of an uncontrollable threat than nuclear warfare, they're better left alone down there, at the bottom of the sea. You're on a road trip, the kind that stretches over days on end, and you need to make multiple stops along the way to refuel the car and yourself. The last time you remember stopping to get more gas and a bite to eat was back in Wyoming, and now you're in the heart of Montana. Thankfully, like an oasis in the desert, you see the town of Clearwater off in the distance. It's a vibrant, welcoming little place, a perfect slice of classic small-town Americana. You took a similar trip last year, and vaguely remember stopping at Clearwater that time too, and you're glad to be back. In particular, you remember the Old Prairie Diner, a folksy little place with the most delicious huckleberry pie you ever tasted. Perhaps it's about time for you to give it another try. You fill up your tank and stop at the diner. The food tastes just as good as you remember, but one thing is off. The entire staff seems to have changed. It is the exact same diner you ate at a year ago, no doubt about that, but it looks like everyone from the wait staff to the cashier to the cooks have all been replaced. You try your best not to think about it. After all, businesses are allowed to replace their staff, but the longer you sit in the diner, the more uncomfortable the feelings become. You need to ask someone, just to push away the fears that you're not going crazy. When the waiter passes by, you compliment the food and mention you ate here last year too. You ask the unfamiliar waiter if they had worked here back then. They confirm that yes, they've always worked here, and so has everybody else. The diner is a family business. You leave town not too long after that, feeling vaguely unsettled. And as a voice on the radio warns about the incoming rain, you tell yourself that you never want to return to the town of Clearwater, Montana. As you leave, the memory of the town seems to fade from your mind in real time. But little do you know, the people of Clearwater will never be able to leave. Ever. It's because something horrifying will happen in Clearwater every single year. And that thing is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3300. This annual anomalous event is Clearwater's own local curse, always occurring around mid-June. While many of the mechanics of this event still elude the Foundation's understanding, the outcome is well documented. Every single inhabitant of the town is replaced by a person who didn't previously exist. While some elements may carry over from their original counterparts, Every person involved will simply be a whole new person, with no memories of the change or who they once were. The process known as SCP-3300 lasts between 6 and 18 days, and once the process has begun, it's impossible for any outsiders to intervene. It begins with rain, a light, dreary drizzle at first, but each day the rain gets worse. Soon it's a storm, and then a maelstrom. Flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, all centered around Clearwater, but cutting off neatly just beyond it. What happens in Clearwater remains in Clearwater, and when the process has concluded and the sun shines once more, everybody has been changed. Whenever the Foundation has tried to send personnel or equipment into Clearwater during SCP-3300, one of two things has happened. In the more favorable scenarios, 
Those attempting to enter Clearwater have simply appeared on the other side of the city limits. In the less positive instances, personnel and equipment have been lost forever within. There is no stopping or even understanding SCP-3300. According to Foundation records, Clearwater has been around at least as long as the Foundation itself, perhaps even longer. Clearwater has been able to undergo its yearly nightmare without intrusion due to a unique cognitohazardous effect, which creates a kind of mental block around memories of the town for outsiders. You won't forget Clearwater, per se, but you will find it increasingly hard to focus on, like something you can only ever see out of the corner of your eye. There is no saving the people of Clearwater. The horror will play out again and again and again. The Foundation has no first-hand knowledge of what happens in Clearwater during those horrifying 18 days, but one account they have hints at a terrifying possibility. During an excursion into Clearwater, the Foundation managed to collect a diary belonging to a woman named Margaret Lane. To the best of our knowledge, Margaret Lane no longer exists. But if the contents of her diary aren't to be believed, then what goes on in Clearwater during SCP-3300 is far worse than we ever imagined. Margaret first started her diary not long before SCP-3300's 1995 iteration began. She was in the middle of a tumultuous time in her life, freshly clean from alcohol and drug addiction, forced to live with her antagonistic mother, and having peculiar and distressing dreams. In the first dream Margaret recorded, she was someone else. A woman living in a small hut perhaps a century ago or more. It was plague time. She was looking down upon her daughter, bedridden, her skin covered in painful-looking red blotches. Her husband was already dead. That's when another man enters, a healthy man. He tells her that he's found their salvation, and then the dream ended. Margaret woke up to a gray, dreary day. There were clouds on the horizon. The rain was coming. It drizzled for the next few days before getting more intense, as one would expect from an SCP-3300 cycle. Of course, nothing seemed out of place to Margaret. Life carried on. She continued to stay clean, resisting the offers of her old dealer, though her relationship with her mother remained frosty. The rain started to get worse as voices on the radio insisted that conditions would continue to become more severe over the next few days. They tried their best to maintain normality. Margaret invited some friends, Jared, Sam, Mike, and Isabel to come over and play D&D at her place. That was when all hell broke loose. While the group roleplayed, there was a furious banging at the door, like whoever was knocking was trying to bash the door down. When Margaret's mom opened the door to investigate the commotion, she saw that an entire family was standing there, a father, a mother, and two young children. The father immediately began furiously asking why all these strangers were in his house. When Margaret's mother tried to tell him that this wasn't his house, he became increasingly agitated and walked straight into the home. Margaret's friends attempted to subdue him, but he threw them off, displaying a supernatural strength. Margaret's mom ran in with a golf club and struck the mysterious man in the chest. There was a nasty splat, but he didn't seem to react. The golf club was just embedded in his chest, having broken the skin and sunken in. But there was no blood, just dripping water. The father then pulled the golf club out of his chest and began beating Margaret's mother to death with it, all while repeating my house again and again while his wife and children watched with broad, sunny smiles in the rain. Somehow Margaret knew that her mother was beyond saving, and that there was no way of defeating these things in a physical confrontation. All they could do was run out to Jared's van with the rest of the group and hightail it to the police station. But when they arrived at the station, the doors were barred and it appeared empty. As the torrential rain hammered down from above, there was nothing left to do but drive out of town and try to escape whatever madness was going on here. But that was easier said than done. They drove for what seemed like hours on end as the rain and the howling wind persisted. Jared had been injured during the fight with the strange family, and his health deteriorated further as the drive stretched on. They should have left the town of Clearwater a long time ago, but it seemed like they were nowhere. It wasn't long before Jared was lying dead in the back of the van, and now there were only four of them left. They kept driving, afraid, grieving, hungry, and tired. And Margaret took the opportunity to sleep. It was no time to rest, but she was so exhausted that she had no choice. Margaret had a continuation of her earlier dream, 
the different her, the dream her, was laying the plague-ridden body of her daughter in the river. But she wasn't the only one. All the villages of her settlement were placing the bodies of their dead in the river as the water washed around them and through them. The bodies became one with the water, and then they became the water. The water was everything. When Margaret awoke, it was to the horrifying sounds of bubbling and boiling. That's when she saw that Jared's body was dissolving. No, not dissolving. Evaporating. It was bubbling and convulsing like it was made of water, until the entire thing burst into a cascade of hot steam. After that, Margaret and the others left the vehicle and refused to get back inside. Nothing was making sense. It was like something out of a nightmare. As they walked, the rain hammered down upon them. They couldn't have been walking for more than a mile when they crashed into something. It was a sign. Welcome to Clearwater. It was like that the town itself had drawn them back. Mike refused to return to the town of his own free will and began walking in the other direction. Moments later, he was walking back towards them in silence, though he never intended to. SCP-3300 had distorted his path and brought him back. It was clear that Mike was shaken to the core by the experience, but they had to press on. They would head to the grocery store for food, and then to a sporting goods store where they could hopefully grab some guns to fight the violent, altered people who'd somehow appeared with the rain. But things didn't go to plan, or what little plan there even was. Mike shot himself on the first night at Dirk's Sporting Goods, leaving only Margaret, Sam, and Isabel alive. Perhaps one of the most terrifying details of Mike's death was the fact he didn't even bleed. Instead, the gaping exit wound in the back of his head was just full of water. Water was all that seemed to be left of them. Sam, seemingly driven to the edge by the sight of Mike's death, grabbed a hunting knife to perform an experiment. She'd cut it into her own skin, and was horrified to see only water dripping out. They'd all been changed, and they didn't know why. That's when the survivors noticed something else. There were people standing outside in the rain, hundreds of them. Not a single one they could recognize. All new people, waiting. Sam said only one word, outside, before walking out of the hunting goods store and disappearing into the crowd and the rain, never to be seen again. Margaret mused that perhaps in the end, she had the right idea. To be taken, killed, erased, or changed would be inevitable. In the final entry in Margaret's diary, dreams blend with reality as her mind finally gives out from the terror. She realizes in her final moments that there is no way out. There is no escape. There is only water. Water is eternal. The rain is eternal. All will be changed. And given the fact that no trace of Margaret was ever found save for her diary, all her fears turned out to be right. She was taken and replaced by SCP-3300 just as will inevitably happen to all the current citizens of Clearwater the next time SCP-3300 rolls around. It will be as inevitable and as indifferent to those it affects as tomorrow's sunrise. You cannot change the rain, but believe us, in Clearwater, Montana, the rain can change you. You're right in the middle of one of the hottest summers on record. The days are filled with bright, scorching sun and searing heat, and you've been laying around with your air conditioning on full blast just to try and cool yourself off. Sadly, it's not really working, and the heat is becoming way too much. But then you remember there's this married couple that lives near you, with no kids, and they happen to have a swimming pool in their yard. Normally, they keep to themselves. They'd never let you use their pool, but they've gone out of town for a few days. Besides, the heat is killing you. You're sure that the neighbors wouldn't mind if you just took a quick dip, as long as you clean up after yourself. They probably wouldn't even notice you were even there. Cautiously, you make your way to their house. It's an unremarkable place similar to most of the other houses in this suburb of New Mexico. After checking that there's nobody else around, you climb the two-meter-high cinder block wall that stands around the back garden. As you drop to your feet, sweaty and panting from the unrelenting summer heat, you see it. The pool. Your salvation. Water never looks so appealing. Immediately, you step barefoot across the sun-scorched tiles and sit on the edge, legs in the water. It's cool and refreshing, perfect for a day as hot as today. You're already changed and wearing your swim trunks, so it doesn't take long for you to paddle out to the middle of the pool, letting that chilled, clean water cool you off. 
As you're taking a dip, you notice the pool's jets turning on automatically. It's a little bit odd, but you shrug it off. That couple clearly shelled out for a pool with a lot of fancy bells and whistles. But extra features aren't why you're here. You came because if you didn't, then you could have melted under all that sunlight. Floating on the surface of the water, you relax with your arms behind your head and close your eyes. You don't have time to realize that coming here was a mistake. Instead, you start to feel relaxed, so calm, so tranquil. You're one with the water around you now. It's almost as though you could just disappear. So, you do. The police never find any trace of you. Everyone else simply writes it off as a random disappearance. There's not even so much as a scrap of your body left in the pool. Just the clear, clean water. Why? Because the swimming pool you decided to take a cooling dip in wasn't an ordinary pool. It was SCP-242. But don't worry, you won't be the last to make that costly mistake. What you didn't know is that the married couple who live in that house are secretly a pair of SCP Foundation doctors. The house isn't even theirs. The Foundation procured it after the former owner, a retired out-of-state landlord, strangely vanished. He had been struggling to find anyone to rent the place, so he eventually decided to give up on the property game and move in there himself. After three days, he was never seen again. Now that house has only one rule that must be followed above all else. Do not swim in the pool. SCP-242 is, at least to the untrained eye, just an average swimming pool. A decent 9 meters in length, 4.5 wide, and it holds around 53,000 liters of sterile pool water. Like we mentioned before, it's even got some nifty features like water jets, a dual waterfall, and a built-in vacuum unit for sucking out any impurities. And we mean any impurities. You see, SCP-242 does go by another name, the self-cleaning pool. And while that might not sound as foreboding or dramatic as the Scarlet King or the Wendigo Skull or the horrifying nasty dude of ultimate badness, okay, we made that last one up, we can assure you that you don't ever want to suffer the fate of taking a swim in this pool. There was an incident a while ago, recorded by the Foundation through a secret hidden camera. The house where SCP-242 can be found had been left vacant for a time, and once again some opportunists decided to take advantage of the empty swimming pool. This time it was a couple, a man and a woman in their early 20s. They climbed up the back wall, undressed, and even stole a couple of plastic inflatable rafts from a shed in the house's backyard. The water jets switched themselves on, startling the girl, but her boyfriend told her not to worry. The filter to clean the pool was probably just on an automatic timer, right? Surely it wouldn't have been anything to worry about. After swimming together for around 24 minutes, the couple both agreed that the water felt warm, tingly even. Both of them climbed onto their rafts, eventually falling asleep while still holding each other's hands. But almost half an hour after the jets had started, something caused the two rafts to burst. The couple awoke, startled by the loud pop of the splitting inflatables and being plunged back into the water. The pool around them immediately began frothing violently, deep red streams of blood swirling through the water as the couple screamed in fear and agony. Both of them tried to desperately swim to the edge, hoping to leave the pool and get to safety. But unfortunately, that plan didn't work. Before they could reach the edge, the man and the woman were pulled under the surface of the raging water, their limbs thrashing as they still tried in vain to escape. Eventually, they vanished under the crimson, bloody water. The frothing slowly began to calm, and the red in the pool dissipated, once again becoming clear after 48 seconds. The couple were never seen again, and a cover story was leaked to the press by the SCP Foundation two weeks after they went missing. According to them, the pair had eloped together somewhere in Mexico. If only. That sounds a lot nicer than what actually happened to them. So this swimming pool clearly has some anomalous properties, that much is obvious. But what exactly are those properties? How exactly does SCP-242 work? Is it an interdimensional gateway that drags people to a nasty alternate universe if they spend too long swimming in it? Or is the swimming pool itself a sentient, carnivorous creature that lures humans in only to devour them? 
Maybe the water is teeming with invisible flesh-eating piranhas that can strip the meat from the bone in a matter of seconds. Well, good guesses all around, but actually, it's none of these. It's unclear what causes the pool's anomalous effects. It could be a property that is completely unique to the water contained in SCP-242. Or maybe it's down to the exact shape and measurements of the pool itself. It could even be a combination of both. But whatever the cause, the result is always the same. When any object, substance, or even living organism is placed in SCP-242, it will be entirely rewritten on a molecular level. The genetic anatomic structure will fall apart, and the subject will be transmuted into sterile water. In fact, not just clean water, but water that remains sterile even when removed from the pool. If you took a cup of SCP-242's water and mixed something like food coloring into it, the food coloring would not be absorbed into the water, instead staying as one non-missable bubble. This process doesn't happen instantly, though. It can vary depending on how contaminated or complex the substance placed in SCP-242 is. For example, water sampled from a nearby river was sterilized and purified by the pool in about seven minutes. A sample of stagnant pond water riddled with various diseases and germs took 11 minutes longer. What about 50,000 liters of coal tar? Well, that one took a little longer. 12 long days, to be exact. But was still turned into pure, sterile water. And as for a living human being? Maybe ask that couple that took a dip in the self-cleaning pool. The Foundation is naturally fascinated with the pool, and after extensive examination, they have determined that SCP-242 doesn't seem to have been intentionally designed for the specific anomalous function it performs. The components of SCP-242 beyond the pool itself, the filter, the vacuum, the pipes, none of these parts nor anything about the swimming pool's design appear to be responsible for disintegrating matter until only water remains. You might have noticed that in the case of the ill-fated couple who took a swim in SCP-242, the water jets and waterfall features switched themselves on automatically before the pair's grim demise. Somehow, these features are able to activate without the need for electricity, as disconnecting the pool from a power source will not stop the jets and waterfall from coming on once a non-water substance is placed into SCP-242. The same goes for the pool vacuum, which apparently cannot be jammed or malfunction. Even when the bottom of the pool is awash with viscous liquids like that coal tar, the vacuum will continue to operate as normal, scrubbing away at the floor of SCP-242. The one part of the self-cleaning pool that doesn't work as you would expect is the water filtration system. There is never any water being cycled into the pool nor out of it. As a matter of fact, the pipes connecting to the filtration system have all been removed. Then again, who needs a filtration system when your backyard swimming pool can just spontaneously reduce anything to clean water? But that raises another frightening thought. Everything that the pool has ever taken and converted is still in there. Animals, objects, people, just swimming around you. Perhaps if they could still think, they'd scream and shout and tell you to get away to run while you still can. But the second your skin touches the water, you're destined to be with them forever and ever and ever. It's enough to send a liquid chill down your spine. Okay, so if it's not the actual physical pool that causes these anomalous effects, that must mean it's something in the water, right? Perhaps some microscopic flesh-devouring microbe, or some ancient curse that was placed on the water before it was used to fill up the pool. Surely, if you took a cup of water out of SCP-242, it would still break down structures on a molecular level, leaving only more sterile water. Well, the researchers working at the SCP Foundation thought much of the same and conducted a series of tests to determine the exact properties of SCP-242's water. One test involved submerging two D-Class test subjects, each wearing an atmospheric dive suit, into SCP-242. The goal was to determine if it was safe to consume the water from SCP-242 while both inside and outside of the pool. Test Subject A was lowered into the water and instructed to drink from a metal straw by their mouth. The eyepieces of their goggles were blacked out, so they couldn't see what they were drinking from. Subject B filled a barrel with the same water from SCP-242 and then was made to put on an atmospheric dive suit, but instructed to stay out of the pool. 
Test subject A was told to drink directly from the pool, remarking that the water was warm and had a bit of a noticeable chemical aftertaste, but was otherwise normal. Then test subject B drank some of the same water from the barrel. Apparently, it was cool and tasted of… well, nothing, just like water usually does. After a moment more of drink, subject A began belching, finding that they had uncontrollable gas. The water had begun to feel warmer, stinging the subject's mouth while, for subject B, the water from the barrel stayed cool and refreshing. The foundation doctors overseeing the experiment instructed test subject A to keep drinking, which they did until it felt even hotter to the taste. One of the D-class's fillings even fell out, and eventually the structural integrity of Subject A's dive suit failed, presumably disintegrated by the water from SCP-242. After a few muffled screams and gurgling noises, Test Subject A wasn't heard from again, and we can all probably guess why. As for Subject B, they kept drinking from the barrel, suffering no adverse effects, even after 17 long hours. There were no noticeable psychological or physical changes, even their urine showed no traces of abnormality. The water from SCP-242 left in the barrel evaporated as normal, leaving behind no residue or any indicator as to why taking the water out of the pool made it safer to drink than the same water in the pool. Perhaps the moral of the story is to just be careful where you choose to take a swim. Otherwise, it could be your last. It was a beautiful day in Sardinia, the second largest Italian island in the Mediterranean. The sea was clear, the air was hot, and the beaches were golden. But the Cagliari Diving Club couldn't see any of that. They were roughly 250 meters underneath the Mediterranean Sea. Given the rich and extensive history of the area, they were sure to find some interesting historical artifacts on the ocean floor. And they were indeed about to find something incredible. But this history wasn't quite as dead as some old Roman pottery. Paolo Bonicelli, the most experienced diver, was the deepest of all. They decided to be a little more ambitious this time than in previous dives, 20 miles off the Sardinian coast. For Paolo, it was uncharted territory. So you could only imagine how amazed and delighted he was when he saw the shape of what seemed like a small town beneath the water. Old stone buildings in a classic Roman or Grecian style, with roofs made of thatched seaweed. He gestured to his fellow divers to follow him. They were amazed at how well preserved the building seemed to be, as though they were still being lived in and actively maintained to this day, despite being around 300 meters underwater. If they were able to take some pictures and collect some artifacts, they'd be the talk of the local historic community and probably be able to finagle a payout from the whole experience too. That's when Paolo spotted something truly amazing. A larger, more impressive structure, like a miniature palace surrounded by grandiose statues of humanoid figures in a circle around the little palace. Each of the statues was an imposing five meters tall, with a faint golden light emanating from each of them. While the statues were humanoid, they definitely weren't human. Their features were strange and fish-like. Scales, gills, tentacles. Paolo was in awe at the sight of them. He took pictures and got closer. There was also a huge chasm in front of the building, perhaps some kind of underwater thermal vent. Paolo was curious. He wanted to investigate further. He swam deeper and deeper. What was at the bottom of that chasm? But lucky for Paolo, he would never see what was at the bottom of that chasm. Before he could reach it, something intercepted him from the side, something large and fast. He felt a white-hot flash of pain as claws raked across his chest, tearing open the rubber of his wetsuit. Paolo turned, eyes widening in horror to see a creature staring at him. Like the statues, it was humanoid but not human. An anthropomorphic sea monster with greenish skin, its arms and legs coated in thin scales, its neck serrated into fleshy gills. He could see scraps of his suit's rubber hanging from its claws. It bore a mouthful of fangs and gave a silent but threatening snarl. Paolo could see something in the distance behind this creature. More figures, like this one, emerging from the murk, getting faster, getting closer. Paolo was a smart man, but it didn't take a genius to realize that if he stuck around, 
something terrible was about to happen to him and the rest of the Cagliari Diving Club. He turned and fled, paddling with all his might away from the coming legion of aquatic beasts. The rest of the club saw the experienced diver panicking and followed his lead. Thanks to their quick thinking and expertise, they all managed to escape with their lives and only a few minor injuries. But they had no idea of the true extent of the mystery they were leaving behind beneath the sea. The multiverse is a big place. There are alternate universes where the devourer of worlds escapes and destroys everything we love and hold dear. There are alternate universes where the SCP Foundation has gone haywire and attempted to wipe out humanity through controlled releases of all their anomalies. There are even universes where a kill squad sent by the Chaos Insurgency hunts down and assassinates every member of the O5 Council, before replacing them and leading the Foundation into a bold new era. And there are some universes where the SCP Foundation is Italian. We've covered SCP-057 on this channel before in our video on the most frightening rooms in the SCP universe, but you've never seen this SCP-057, because this is the Italian version, SCP-057-IT. This localized anomaly off the coast of Sardinia is under the purview of the Italian division of the SCP Foundation which works autonomously with its own systems and terminology. This SCP is in a frightening room that crushes its trapped victims together. This anomaly is an entire city 300 meters beneath the water of the Mediterranean Sea. Everyone has heard of the mythical lost city of Atlantis, a supposed underwater utopia outlined by such great historical minds as the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. It's something that people fantasize about a beautiful, idyllic society under the sea, divorced from all the petty squabbles we deal with up on land. But is everything really better down where it's wetter? Let's take a look and see. When Paolo and the rest of the Cagliari Diving Club returned to the surface, they were happy to tell anyone that would listen that they encountered aggressive mermen and an entire underwater city off the coast of Sardinia. They even posted their photos onto their official Facebook page, along with photos of Paolo's gnarly chest scars. That's when the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation finally discovered them and decided to intervene. The Foundation dispatched an SIR squad known as Orreria Notetia. SIRs are the intelligence and research section of the Italian SCP Foundation, a kind of mobile task force that investigates possible informational leads. Paolo and his team were given amnestic treatment, and any evidence that they'd collected was scrubbed from existence. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Marco Levini, leader of the mobile task force SSM-2 squad, aka Legio Alantidis, was being dispatched to the source of the problem, SCP-057-IT itself. What started off as a relatively straightforward exploratory mission soon took an extremely strange turn. Levini and his men reported activity down in the underwater city, observing from the safety of their armored Foundation submarine. While the aquatic humanoids living in O57-IT were undeniably the same species, their cultures seemed to be split up into two unique groups. One group had thinner scales on their arms and legs. This group was more numerous, having at least 60 active specimens, and was characterized by their extreme aggression towards any outsiders. As for the smaller group, they had thicker scales, as well as a number of eerily consistent injuries to their hands, feet, and gills. They were also distinct from the thin scales in terms of behavior, as they were a far friendlier, more curious bunch. At times, members of this subset would approach the submarine and regard it with detached fascination. Sometimes they would even point at the submarine and laugh, though their reasons for doing this are unknown. Eventually, Lieutenant Levini was so confident in their safety around the Mer people that he and a few other team members decided to disembark from the submarine on a diving excursion and properly explore the aquatic city below. This would prove to be a dangerous tactical error on Levini's part. During what seemed like a routine exploratory mission, Levini was ambushed by a squadron of thin scales, grabbed from behind and kidnapped. He was taken as a hostage and spirited away into one of the city's various buildings, where a thick scale known as Letizia acted as his warden. But Levini soon found that being under Letizia's care was a profoundly lucky turn of events on his part, both because it allowed him to learn more about the situation, and because she was one of the small group left in the city who hadn't become dangerous fanatics. That's right. 
the Mer people were in the middle of a heated civil war. Both from the observations of Lavini during his captivity, and later interviews conducted by project head Dr. Giuseppe Pastillo with some liberated members of the Thick Scales, they learned that a terrible religious conflict had broken out in SCP-057-IT. The accounts coming from the rescued citizens illustrated a similar backstory to what the Italian Foundation had theorized regarding the Mer people. They were the descendants of people that lived on the island of Nisros up to the 14th century BCE, before it was devastated by a volcanic eruption, forcing them into the ocean, where they evolved the ability to live in aquatic environments through anomalous means. Since this change, this new species had been operating in Mediterranean waters, migrating regularly in order to avoid detection, passing their way of life from generation to generation as the world changed and shifted above them. In many ways, they were quite similar to humans, such as their reproductive habits. They mate and reproduce after a gestation period, more like animals than fish, though their gestation period is slightly shorter than human beings at six months. They largely speak Latin, though the oldest mer person among them also speaks ancient Greek. Mer children born in Foundation containment have shown strong language acquisition skills, as they have proven more than able to learn modern Italian. And even more fascinating from a standpoint of sociological study, the mer people have formed their own unique culture under the sea, and this is where the problems started. Abstaining from the belief of the Greek and Roman pantheons their ancestors looked up to, the Mer people instead worshipped their own group of water-bound deities, whose images were reflected in the great statues in the center of the town. The large building near the statues and the chasm was the home of the mayor, the town's de facto leader. However, what had been a workable system for centuries began falling to ruin when a strange religious fanaticism began to spread. A cult-like group soon formed and began holding ceremonies where they worshipped a powerful entity in the chasm known as the Great Eye. This new cult was known as the Cult of the Great Eye of the Mediterranean, or Sea Gem for short. What began as a fringe belief soon became a frenzy and took over the better part of the town with the acolytes of the Great Eye proving themselves more than willing to spread the gospel of their new deity with violence. Some of the more arduous non-believers were killed for their heresy, while others were simply ritualistically mutilated in order to prevent them from rebelling. Letizia had her own evidence of these targeted mutilations. The thin scales had cut the aquatic webbing from between her fingers and toes, making it harder for her to swim away and escape. Other suspected heretics were given the same treatment. The reason the thick scales even had thicker scales was that they stole forbidden technology from the mayor to increase the strength of their scales, hoping it would help them better withstand the torments of the acolytes. Those involved in the stealing of this technology were captured and summarily executed for their acts of defiance. In a sense, Letizia was protecting Lavini by advising him against trying to escape knowing the acolytes of the Great Eye would kill him if he did. She knew that the only opportunity for escape would come during the ceremony held by the acolytes to honor their frightening master. When the day eventually came, as Lavini was running low on everything from food to oxygen, everyone in the town was forced out into the town center to witness the ritual. The acolytes gathered around the chasm and began to chant in a frightening, unknown language. As they chanted, a blinding light began to emanate from the chasm, and as blurry shapes emerged, nightmarish tentacled gastropods soon began to take form. Truly Lovecraftian undersea monsters. Shortly after the ritual, Lavinia and the Thick Scales were able to make a break for it, pursued by the acolytes of the Great Eye. It was a close one, but thankfully due to the intervention and assistance of a trained mobile task force, the fanatical forces of the acolytes were repelled and the fleeing merpeople along with Lavini, were rescued. A number of thick scales are now willingly confined at Site Nettuno, an Italian Foundation containment site, where they have undergone numerous interviews with Foundation staff. Incidentally, among them is the oldest mer person previously present in SCP-057-IT, the only one who spoke ancient Greek fluently. He was different from the others, extremely different. In fact, he was a deity made into flesh, one of the deities replaced by the worshippers of the Great Eye. This unfortunate former god had done everything to keep his people's lives safe and peaceful, 
but in spite of his wisdom and best efforts, hell had once again broken loose. Not everything is all well and good in SCP-057-IT. Even if a human's body changes, their nature does not. And the worst parts of human nature seemingly followed these unfortunate merpeople into what should have been their paradise under the sea. But all hope isn't lost. If you were to judge the entire human race on one community in turmoil, you probably wouldn't leave with a very favorable impression of us either. Correspondence with a French branch of the SCP Foundation reveals that mer creatures aren't just localized to one warring underwater city in Sardinia. Mermaids have also been discovered and confirmed by Foundation field agents off the coast of France. 80% of the ocean still remains unmapped to this day. Who knows what else is out there, just waiting to be found. The ocean is a terrifying place. We've all heard the statistics. More than 80% of the ocean remains unexplored. That's most of the water covering the globe, completely unmapped and unobserved by science. It's a scary thought to dwell on, realizing that there's more water than land on Earth, and the sheer expanse of that water is so large that we've been unable to fully explore all of it. Just think, there are places in the ocean that have never been seen by a human. Who knows what's down there? If there was ever a personification of fear of the unknown, the ocean could definitely be it. Ancient shipwrecks sunk to the ocean floor, unknown sea creatures hiding away from humanity, and the general isolation of the suffocating dark blue the ocean swallows its victims with. All of these images that come to mind when thinking about the vast and mysterious depths of the sea. And no one is more familiar with nautical mysteries than the SCP Foundation. Today we'll be taking a look at SCP-5007, The Bass Strait, a wave of oceanic anomalies fit to make any seasoned sailor shiver in fear. The Bass Strait is an area of ocean dividing Tasmania and the Australian mainland. It's also the location of an unusually high amount of disappearances, sailors disappearing from their ships, fishermen leaving in the night and never coming back, even civilians disappearing from the shores that connect to the strait. The Foundation was aware of these disappearances since 1858, but were only able to craft theories about what was causing them. Was it an anomalous group of interest? Hostile aerial entities patrolling the skies above the strait? Phenomenon associated with unidentified flying objects? What about subterranean anomalies, weather patterns, or time dilation? For nearly a century, the Foundation was unable to determine the cause of the high number of disappearances in the Bass Strait. And then, the phenomenon suddenly revealed itself. In 1980, on a beach connected to the Strait, Agent Taberner, an operative of the SCP Foundation, was vacationing with his wife Mary and his three young children. The Taberner family was simply enjoying their day, when they saw what looked like balloons in the sky. They were approaching quickly, and naturally the family moved closer. What happened next was a whirlwind, and those balloons the family were so interested in lifted them up from the ground and carried them away. Agent Taberner tried to fight back, but there was nothing he could do, except report to the Foundation what had occurred, and the organization responded in full force. The Foundation's research discovered that reports of UFOs and lights in the sky had coincided with many disappearances in the strait, and that this was a pattern. The search for the four lost Taberner family members had become a large-scale investigation into unexplained disappearances along the Bass Strait, and within three weeks, it was determined that these patterns were consistent across the entirety of the strait's coastal regions. Some witnesses were interviewed, but the vast majority of these abduction cases had no witnesses whatsoever. Of the minimal reports filed, the Foundation was told that there were lights in the sky, and that appearance of unidentified flying objects described as having the appearances of balloons. One such witness interviewed was a man by the name of Alan Stewart, a witness who was present during the disappearance of former Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt, whose disappearance the Foundation believed may have had a connection to the Bass Strait anomalies. During the interview, Stewart claimed that Holt and his family, while voyaging on their yacht, decided to leave the boat and go for a swim. Holt turned to Stewart and asked him if he could see the balloons around the cliff. Stewart had no idea what Holt was talking about, but Holt was insistent on seeing them. He swam deeper out into the ocean, saying that they weren't normal balloons and that there was someone inside of them. Stewart and Holt's family called out for him to come to shore, but he wouldn't listen. Stewart tried to rationalize what he saw next. 
Maybe it was the current sweeping Holt away, but he couldn't lie to the Foundation interviewer. Mm -hmm. Stewart saw Holt go further and further out into the water, and suddenly the Prime Minister turned around. He began swimming in the opposite direction, and he was screaming. Suddenly, Holt was lifted from the sea and pulled into the air by something emerging from the clouds. The Foundation thanked Stewart for the interview and continued their investigation. Two years later, in 1982, Emergency services received a large number of calls pertaining to UFO sightings off the coast of Norman Bay, Victoria. The Foundation was quick to respond, alerting task forces and local sites to prepare for an investigation. Upon arriving to the scene, they confirmed the existence of multiple entities that would later be documented as SCP-5007. They evacuated civilians from the area and successfully managed to capture the creature, which was later transported to Site-40 for containment. It was a sight to behold. The entity, now designated SCP-5007-S1, was a cluster of human bodies fused between a grouping of black tentacles of varying length. Each tentacle was fused to the skin it touched directly. The stomachs of the corpses were grossly swollen and distorted to massive sizes to hold large quantities of gases inside, the buoyancy of which the entity used to achieve a passive flight. Across the entity's surface were clusters of eyes and bioluminescent glowing organs. Many of the humanoid components of the corpses appeared to have been removed and misplaced across various parts of the entity's body. What's more is that the Foundation discovered that human portions of SCP-5007 appeared somewhat cognizant and aware of their situation. Their vocalizations were incoherent and barely understandable, consisting of gasping and whimpering, but the corpses were observed to implore other individuals to approach them when encountered. SCP-5007's behavior during abduction scenarios was documented during the initial containment event, and due to the Foundation's painstaking research, a pattern was established between all SCP-5007 encounters. First, the victim would be alone, or otherwise vulnerable, in a coastal location. SCP-5007 haven't shown a preference for weather, be they clear or hostile skies, but they have localized all of their activity to the Bass Strait, in small coastal towns, beaches, or boats. SCP-5007 will then move towards the shore, stalking the victim before lowering its tentacles and appendages to grab the individual, snatching them into the sky. An SCP-5007 instance can even abduct multiple people at once. One event observed had eight men from the decks of a commercial fishing boat taken into the sky in under 15 seconds. Once captured, SCP-5007 instances will dart across the water at a high speed and take their victims to an unknown location. Discovering where SCP-5007 took their victims became a top priority for the Foundation. After extensive witness interviews and compiling a database of likely victims, they determined that there must be at least 16 instances of SCP-5007 unaccounted for. Personnel kept a close watch on the coastlines and waters of the Bass Strait, and equipped various marine task forces with research vessels capable of tracking any instances if they encountered them. In 1985, the Foundation's research efforts paid off, and several survey teams operating in the area reported the sighting of an extremely large SCP-5007 instance heading towards a coastal town. A mobile task force was sent to track the entity. The team observed the entity from afar as it stalked a private fishing boat. Even from the distance, Foundation personnel recognized the likenesses of several missing persons as faces of the corpses of SCP-5007. The task force captain had to remind his team to keep it together, claiming that they were not people, but just parts of the specimen. But everyone secretly knew the truth. The fishing vessel was a private one, occupied by a small family. The entity slowly approached and quickly pulled a woman into the air. The family panicked and quickly tried to reach cover for safety, running into the ship's cabin. The entity ran its tentacles along the boat until it pulled the door open, snatching another two victims. The task force was unable to help them, as their mission was to track the instance to its origin point. It was a horror to watch. The task force implanted a tracking beacon onto the entity and quietly followed it out to sea over the next four hours. They then discovered a large gray reef with several shipwrecks dotted across it. Thirteen SCP-5007 instances floated over the area, some holding on to the land reef with their tentacles. The entity dropped the abductees from the fishing boat, who were coerced by the entities into diving into a massive pool of water located in the center of the reef. 
One by one, each abductee was pulled below the surface by something lurking in the pool, all while the SCP-5007 instances watched. Disgusted, the task force reported what they observed to the main site, and the reef would be designated as SCP-5007-A. The Foundation's analysis of the reef led to the discovery that the rock covering it seeped iron oxide from an unknown source, and the rocks achieved growth at an anomalously fast rate, often as little as 40 minutes. All of the wrecked ships and aircraft that washed across the shore of the reef were covered with a dark stone. The reef was teeming with anomalous marine life, including SCP-5007, a red algae that fed upon the freshly grown rock, marine worms capable of levitation, spiders that lived in silk retreats underneath the waterline, small fish, and giant organisms resembling large clumps of kelp, which the Foundation had previously documented as SCP-4159 in a separate investigation. SCP-5007 often rested their tentacles on the outcroppings of the reef while inactive, but what caught the Foundation's attention the most was the giant pit located in the reef center. Unmanned exploration drones found that it had a depth of at least 4,000 meters, and water samples taken from the pit revealed large quantities of human DNA, prehistoric bacteria, and unknown compounds that possess significant life-preserving qualities. When a being was submerged in the compound, they were able to survive heavy injuries, even when fully surrounded by the liquid and unable to breathe. The Foundation's exploration of one of these shipwrecks led them to a journal. Most of it was illegible due to water damage, but one passage survived, located in the back of the book. It detailed the experience of an unknown crew member of the ship caught in a storm. It reads, Morsby spied land ahead, and the boys said that there are giant balloons hanging over the island. We are all afeard, but there is naught we can do but beach ourselves and help for rescue. Should I be killed in the crash, I want my mates to give this journal to my Mary. Might know I spent my last thinking only of her. The interior of the ship contained human remains inside, but there were less skeletons than the Foundation would expect for a ship of its size. The location of the rest of the bodies was unknown. Another event related to SCP-5007 the Foundation documented involved Frederick Valentich, a pilot engaged in a training flight over the Bass Strait in 1978. Valentich's disappearance was marked by his latest communication with air traffic control, when he mistook an SCP-5007 instance for an unidentified aircraft. It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic like it's all shiny on the outside. Shortly after this, Valentich's transmission was interrupted by what was described as metallic scraping sounds, believed to be the SCP-5007 instance attacking the aircraft and jamming its propellers with its mass. After crashing into the reef, it was believed that Valentich and his aircraft were pulled beneath the surface of the pit, just as the abductees had been prior. The Foundation decided to construct a provisional secure research facility on the reef. They named it Site-40-R and documented all returns and departures of SCP-5007. They also set up a series of containment procedures that resulted in SCP-5007 returning with its victims 83% less often than before the site's construction, but this was short-lived. In 2008, the site logged over 36 instances returning to the reef, with only two not having any fresh abductees. The instances' origins were unknown, and it was as if they appeared out of thin air. No other monitoring post had documented their appearance, or even spotted them before they arrived at the reef. It was years later in 2017 that the Foundation eventually was able to successfully explore what was deep inside the pit at the center of the reef. They already knew that there was a large entity lurking beneath, as evidenced by what happened to the victims of SCP-5007 that were later deposited inside the pool. All previous attempts to explore the pool were met with failure, as the water pressure of the pit's depths caused all craft to collapse due to hull damage. This time, however, they managed to construct a high-tech submarine, labeled the SCPS Nautilus, which was capable of diving a maximum of 13,500 meters underwater. They decided that a D-Class personnel would be trained to man the submersible and carry out the exploration. The mission was simple. The Nautilus was to dive to the bottom of the pit and to describe the depth readings. Cameras and microphones were equipped to the vessel. Due to the depth, remote viewing of the footage was impossible. Instead, the Foundation had to physically recollect the vessel in order to view the footage. Upon recovery, some of the footage suffered data corruption, 
but what was there shook those who viewed it to their core. The footage showed the D-Class's experience going deeper inside the pit. At first, it seemed ordinary. The trench had a number of rocky outcroppings dotted with black-yellow vines growing along the walls. Also present were various marine life forms, such as the spiders or the fish. Going deeper, the sub observed an SCP-5007 instance clinging to an outcropping. Several tendrils emerging from the pit's depths were wrapped around the instance and holding on to the entity, as if it were feeding from it. Another 16 SCP-5007 instances were seen resting along the walls, each clinging to the outcropping. As the sub went deeper, the D-Class remarked that there were dozens of plane and shipwrecks, but also well over a hundred SCP-5007 entities. Most of them were held there by the Black Tendrils. The D-Class, as the sub went even deeper, began noticing human remains. No short amount of them, either. Deep into the pit, there was a large mass of human remains covering the entirety of the pit. Bodies crushed and drained of blood, but still possessing intact eyes. Each individual was still alive, kept preserved by the life-sustaining compounds found within the water. The body stared at the sub and moved, attempting to grab onto the vehicle. The D-Class swore they were trying to say something, mouthing words to the camera of the sub. As the sub passed through the mass of bodies, it emerged into a completely dark, black clearing at the bottom of the pit. For a second, the D-Class thought he was safe. But then, a large black tentacle rapidly emerged from below and grabbed onto the Nautilus, dragging it even further into the depths. The D-Class screamed and panicked, but there was nothing he could do. The tentacle possessed a large cluster of eyes, mouths, and human heads seemingly grafted onto its mass. And then there was another tentacle, and then another. The Nautilus was pulled to the bottom of the pool. The D-Class's screams were still heard even as the picture cut out. Sometimes graphic body-altering images of the tentacle's features were visible on the screen, but most of the footage was indecipherable. After minutes of distorted, corrupted footage, the Nautilus was seen again, rapidly ascending to the surface. Somehow, it had managed to escape the entity at the bottom of the pit. Upon recovery of the craft, it was found that the Nautilus was covered in a thick, organic coating similar to a black slime mold, but with dozens of eyes growing from it. The D-Class inside showed severe psychological damage and attempted to harm Foundation personnel. They were terminated shortly after due to being a danger to those around them. Following review of the footage, the Nautilus was to be dismantled and incinerated, along with the remains of the D-Class. A reinforced containment seal was fitted over the pit, with the intention of keeping whatever was down there isolated from the surface. But this was short-lived. After the containment seal was fitted, Site-40 underwent a massive communications blackout. Every device on site received an email containing a single image of a large eye taken from a security camera. The text beneath it simply read, Found you. Some personnel who viewed the email underwent anomalous changes, growing new physical features such as eyes and other various growths across their body. The entirety of Site-40-R went offline, and the Foundation could not establish contact. In an emergency effort to do so, Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was sent to investigate. The task force's assault on Site-40-R was a daring effort, as the majority of the site was completely overtaken by tentacles, growths, and anomalous alterations. While numerous altered personnel were lost due to the mission, it was ultimately a success. Some altered personnel were able to be saved through extensive surgery to remove their anomalous growths. And after everything was said and done, the site was repaired and reconstructed without incident. Following the site's repair, there has been little activity from the entity within the pit, but the Foundation continued to keep an eye on the creature and the ecosystem of the anomalous marine life that live on the Bass Strait, never knowing what their next move might be, and always keeping in mind the risk that comes with dealing with these poorly understood entities. You edge the poolside. Chlorine-stenched air filling your nose, the sound of splashing, and lifeguards whistling bouncing off the indoor pool facility walls. The water ripples, family and friends egging you to cannonball in, the pool almost beckoning you to jump with its suggestive waves. Yet there remains an underlying fear, one that brings your hands to your face and causes your teeth to chatter, even as the pool Clear as glass with chlorine, hides no secrets. A monster, 
some teeth gnashing megalodon ascending from the depths of extinction, leviathan curling its barbed tail to strike its prey at any moment, or even some vast, unknowable force, ancient as Earth, hardly comprehensible to human minds, waiting, dreaming to breach the surface. No matter what form this gargantuan, invisible monster takes, you know one thing. Once you jump in, you will not return to shore. You take a moment, recompose yourself, and laugh off the fear. Maybe a product of too much research on the bloop, that deep ocean sound continuing to confound scientists as to its cause. Or maybe too much binging infographics videos on sea monsters, krakens and Loch Ness monsters, mysterious globsters cast onto shores throughout America. Whatever the origin, the thought seems ridiculous to you now and your fears regarding invisible sharks stalking the pool perimeter escape your mind as you hurl yourself into the water. SCP-1128 In the vast archives of a hidden site, stuffed into a drawer amongst uncountable horrors like it, the SCP Foundation holds a description of a vast, unfathomable horror that'll make you more suspicious the next time you pass a pool, lake, or even a bathtub or puddle of water. SCP-1128 is a gigantic aquatic monster lurking in waters unknown, and that's all the Foundation will let anyone not assigned to testing know about it. While the Foundation has never shed away from those Moby Dicks of the Deep, including the several thousand kilometer long arthropod SCP-169, and has even utilized such predators in the past for their own benefit, like the lengthy beast SCP-3000, SCP-1128 poses a unique challenge. Anyone who knows of its description beyond surface level details will fall under the anomaly's effect. The representation you see now is merely an artist's interpretation of the basic prompt. The Foundation, of course, had to discover the monster's effects in the first place. The chain of communication becomes foggy, but a tip from an unknown source alerted the Foundation to the monster's existence and details regarding its manifestation. One man who had stumbled upon the entity's full description started developing acute thalassophobia, the fear of large bodies of water. Not bodies in the water, mind you. The man refused to relax on the beach or fly overseas, claiming he could see the monster's dark silhouette lurking underwater, ever scouting for him. This eventually extended to even closed bodies of water, like lakes, ponds, and pools, still insisting that the creature swam under the surface, trailing him wherever he went. His friends dismissed him as crazy, and he too believed he had fallen under some hysteria. He decided to take a nice, warm bath to soothe his mind and ease his troubles. He turned on the faucet and let the tub fill up. He put on his best bathing suit, ready to calm his anxiety once and for all. This had been plaguing his mind for far too long, and he was ready to rid all the negativity surrounding this phobia. Basically, he was sick and tired of being sick and tired over the idea of it all. He mustered up the courage, and with the anticipation to just simply relax, he took his first confident step into the tub. He paused for a moment and breathed a sigh of relief. He picked up his other foot and stepped fully into the bath. SPLASH! He fell straight down right through the tub. Waves and bubbles blocked his vision. His arms flailed as he sunk deeper into an abyss of water and fear. This wasn't supposed to happen, he thought. Several moments later, while still in a full-on panic, the buoyancy of his body began to slow his sinking. The bubbles from his underwater screams rose above him, and he began to follow their direction, scrambling back up to where he'd come. Just as he made it back to the surface of the tub water, choking and hyperventilating in terror, he swore he could see a distant creature, the very same that stalked him through oceans and pools, staring at him. Shaking, he hoisted himself out of the water and ran out of the house. Hysterical, he ran through the surrounding neighborhood, desperately searching for someone he could relay his experience to. Blinded by fear, he neglected to spot a puddle in the middle of the road he ran on. He raised his foot, arched forward, and landed straight into the seemingly shallow water. Splash! Again, he found himself completely submerged and drowning. After a minute, he did emerge from the puddle, but not in one piece. 
Knowledgeable of this incident, the Foundation set about expunging any traces of the monster's description from the world, physical and digital. The description had low distribution according to the results of Foundation web crawlers, but this hardly stopped the Foundation's endeavor. With forum posts deleted, individuals located and amnestitized, and catalogs trawled to ensure the description did not proliferate, the Foundation engaged in what it does best questionably ethical experiments. First, they had an anonymous D-Class, uninformed of the creature's effect, read the description of the beast. While the pamphlet they gave him confused him somewhat, he didn't feel particularly frightened by the entity, and he confusedly put on the diving suit the Foundation testers provided him. As they connected him to a cable and told him to enter a bathtub, the D-Class did as they instructed him. The D-Class expressed initial confusion at the tub's depth, remarking that it looked so tiny from the outside. As the D-Class continued to descend, he analyzed his surroundings, realizing the nautical reality that enveloped him. He asked how an ocean got stuffed into a bathtub, but the test organizer had no room for miscellaneous talk. He continued to descend until he hit the sandy bottom, seaweed covering the ocean floor. The D-Class looked around, Tropical fish swam in schools, coral covered the seabed, and to his right dropped an immense cliff, a sheer edge. The test organizer advised the D-Class to approach the cliff, and he begrudgingly complied. As he struggled in his diving suit, he fell back and screamed. SCP-1128, the aquatic horror swam distantly, gracefully even, and paid no attention to the D-Class so fixated upon it. He realized that the creature matched the one he read on the pamphlet, and almost complained about this when he saw a blue whale swimming alongside SCP-1128. Compared to the monster, the whale looked like a guppy. The whale glided in front of SCP-1128's jaws. The monster remained tranquil, stared at its prey, and bit the whale in two with one chomp. Its teeth glistened in the water. The test operator requested the D-Class to pull back, and as the cable began to draw him toward where he came, the D-Class stared at the creature, swallowing the chunks of whale whole. The D-Class's eyes remained fixated on the creature, partially in fright, partially in awe. He wondered how ocean trawlers hadn't discovered such a giant beast yet, with the world effectively under 100% surveillance, something the D-Class knew far too well as a convict. Yet the D-Class recognized, and if not comprehended, partially understood the ocean's vastness and mystery. The dark depths reveal no inkling as to their contents, and a creature like a giant squid or the coelacanth can remain in hiding for centuries if not millennia. It held him in wondrous thought to consider the vastness of the depths. When SCP-1128 stopped and stared at the D-Class, this feeling of wonder was quickly replaced with fear. As the creature approached, the D-Class pleaded with the test operators for help. As the test operators accelerated the rate of the cable returning, the D-Class took short, shallow breaths, filling his body with dangerous nitrogen as he ascended, further impairing his judgment. He had devolved into gibberish and screaming when face to face, the monster consumed its prey. The cable went slack, and the test operator pulled up only a broken wire, snap, the water turning a cloudy red. The test operator knew that the unprotected D-Class had no chance at survival against the monster, but he could potentially arm and shield them. He had another similarly ignorant D-Class once again dress in a scuba suit and enter the tub. However, the test operator placed the D-Class within a shark cage, a la the movie Jaws, and lowered the cage in with another cable and winch system. While unsure how this would fare with SCP-1128, the test operator remained hopeful that the D-Class could survive and recount his story. Unfortunately, as the cage lowered into the tub, the test operator received no response from the D-Class until the line spontaneously tightened, snapped, and loosened. Hoping to find the D-Class's remains, the test operator only found shredded pieces of metal, torn and twisted like taffy. The test operator decided that he could utilize the Foundation's arsenal to his advantage and use an anomalously toughened shark cage in his testing, perhaps using an anomaly like the clockwork machine SCP-914. He gained approval from his higher-ups to undergo this procedure, and after some testing, behind a shining strong as titanium shark cage, 
which he placed another D-Class within. Hoping for a success with the monster, however, proved unsatisfactory, as the same thing happened as the previous test, only without any sort of metallic remains. While bitter that the monster had won again, he wondered where the cage had landed. Meanwhile, Foundation forces labored tirelessly to find SCP-1128's location, hoping to avoid any civilian contact with the creature. Luckily, a GPS signal established itself upon the most recent D-Class's test, with the tracking device on the D-Class signifying the monster's general location. The Foundation had redacted the location of the monster, perhaps in a vain attempt to hide a very near threat from potential readers. The Foundation set up a team of only the most talented boaters in its forces, Mobile Containment Force Kappa-12 Sea Devils. Upon arriving at the location, the Sea Devils discovered the previously enhanced shark cage completely undamaged. However, closer inspection revealed traces of human DNA on the bars, though the Foundation could not confirm whether the DNA belonged to the previously sent D-Class. The test operator, while glad his shark cage survived the monster's attack, still found himself dissatisfied with the overall results of the test. He knew he needed to quell this creature's impact before a large population viewed it or knew of it, but the horrible beast had evaded all attempts at peaceful interaction. Perhaps with a madness not unlike Captain Ahab yearning for the death of his white whale, the test operator armed a D-Class with a specialized weapon designed to deal with aquatic threats promptly. This weapon, potentially another of the Foundation's precious arsenal, could potentially harm, if not kill, the creature. While he knew the Foundation's mission statement forbade unnecessary destruction, the test operator felt it may turn necessary if matters turn any worse. Thus, he sent his armed D-Class through the tub once more, ready to engage the beast in combat. The attempt, as one may expect, did not last long. The D-Class, upon spotting the creature, aimed his weapon at the monster and attacked it, but rather than drive the creature away, it only turned intently upon the D-Class, as if it desired a fight. The D-Class barely managed to scrape SCP-1128 before the creature devoured the D-Class, leaving the test operator once again empty-handed. Defeated and without any more resources to deal with the beast, the test operator ceased his attempts at besting the creature and followed the Foundation's more cautious approach, expunging any publicly found descriptions of SCP-1128 as needed and diverting any vessels away from the anomaly's exclusion zone as maintained by the Sea Devils. While the creature had proven treacherous in unexpected situations prior, engulfing the man who first heard the creature's description in a rain puddle, researchers could hardly expect what would transpire. A D-Class, afflicted with the monster's effect and observed for testing, avoided all bodies of water as required. Eventually, however, the D-Class needed to interact with some kind of water, drinking water. In a choice between a little water exposure or certain death, the D-Class felt inclined to choose the former. He filled his cup with water and, for fun, placed his finger into the cup, dropping it into the water. SCP-1128, unseen from the outside, violently pulled the D-Class through the cup into its watery domain. The D-Class had not a chance to scream. This alarmed containment staff, now cognizant that even the tiniest specks of water could transport an afflicted person into SCP-1128's ocean territory. This proved particularly strenuous when a new report of a potential SCP-1128 manifestation arose. An old woman, isolated with her cats and knitting supplies, found an article online with a description of the monster. Frightened and disgusted by what she read, she closed the article and continued on with her monotonous life. Such a life would take a turn for the worse, however, when she too developed that all-encompassing water-based fear. Her apartment overlooked an outdoor pool and one day, looking outside, she swore she could see that same dark silhouette as the man did. Lurking in the water among kids and parents playing, she swiftly closed the window curtains and taped the seam shut, allowing no light to peek through. Eventually, this paranoia affected her hygiene, neglecting showers and baths for fear of the creature's wrath. She swore she could see the silhouette in any individual droplet of water. Her skin began to flake as she avoided water as much as humanly possible, cracks developing on her arms, legs, and face, inflaming into rashes and itches. Her scratching further increased the flaking. She even eliminated water from her diet, sealing the faucets with duct tape 
and consuming exclusively orange juice. She threw out her cat's water bowls, dehydrating them. They pleaded with her as she continued to devolve, avoiding any contact with the outside world, even as it attempted to contact her. Eventually, a concerned neighbor contacted the local police concerning the situation, and the case caught the Foundation's radar, recognizing the symptoms of a potential SCP-1128 infection. A mobile task force disguised themselves as civilians to enter the apartment building and potentially interfere with the woman's condition. They entered the complex, climbing up the stairs with barraging equipment for forced entry, as would prove necessary to use to enter the woman's apartment. She had nailed the door shut with wood and sealed the cracks along the sides with plaster in an attempt to keep out any water vapor. She had similarly blocked the window with wood planks. A horrid miasma of dead skin and citrus filled the apartment, the old woman soaking it in, ever avoiding the dreaded monster. The Foundation Task Force attempted peaceful entry, knocking on the door and asking if anyone lived in the apartment. The woman couldn't speak if she wanted to. Her throat had dried to near silence, save a croak. Suddenly, the task force and the woman heard a rumbling noise outside. Thunder. Rain. The woman panicked and yelped, Don't come in here! in a froggy voice. The task force eventually decided they needed to use their equipment and entered via barrage. The door collapsed and an immediate dense air clogged the task force's sight, blinding and choking them. The woman shrieked and backed against the window inadvertently. The task force insisted they were here to help the woman, but she simply heaved heavily, saying something unintelligible in that dry, cracking voice. The rain began pounding on the window, patter, 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 as the task force attempted to gain hold of the woman. She resisted their movements, moving around the room while the task force intentionally avoided violent confrontation. The rain grew in its intensity as the woman continued running around her apartment, tripping over her starved cats. Eventually, she fell back onto the window, at which the boards blocking it fell onto the floor, exposing the pouring rain fully. She screamed as she saw the silhouette of the monster staring at her in every individual raindrop. One drop landed on her skin, and she violently vanished, pulled into a minuscule speck of water. The task force collapsed from exhaustion, perhaps dreading their inevitable amnestic treatment following exposure with an SCP-1128 afflictee. Yet they couldn't help but wonder what the old woman saw in a single speck of water that could cause that degree of fear and paranoia. The kind of fear only caused by entire oceans condensed into a single droplet. Besides the monster, what else did she see in those multitude of droplets? The fish that populated the sea, the whale carcasses left behind by SCP-1128, the sea devils viewed from below, drifting on the water unsuspecting. Just as one may view a grain of sand and see the Sahara, she too saw that raindrop and viewed an ocean entire, along with whatever malevolent creatures inhabit it. One may have more sympathy for the child, reluctant to jump into the pool water, knowing not necessarily that something inhabits that body of water, but that the body belongs to a cycle much larger than itself, larger than any sea or ocean, and the only thing that can traverse that cycle is a monster, a creature like SCP-1128. The task force went back to their local site to report what happened during the incident. Like so many incidents the Foundation deals with, the sum total of those that risk their lives for the greater good is a couple memory-erasing syringes and another update to documentation. A description of SCP-1128 remains in a stuffy locker, lurking in wait among other horrifying stories in the SCP database's Sea of Terror. Just like that test operator that attempted to best the monster, could the Foundation's attempts ever surmount the possibility of another person being afflicted? Could they conquer the sea? In a member of that task force's dreams, they perceive a dark blue ocean and the distant black shadow that resides within. And from this ocean, they can view the bathtubs, sinks, pools, puddles, cups of water, and rain droplets of the world, seen from below. Although they know not what SCP-1128 looks like, they too experience the fear it summons among those that do, the paranoia, the fear. Although it may not manifest directly in people's lives, it can always be observed, 
stalking, waiting, lurking under a murky surface, watching with hidden eyes. Hello, SCP Foundation personnel. Welcome to Cognito Hazards and You, episode Redacted. This video series is intended to teach you about the protocol surrounding the various cognito hazardous anomalies currently within Foundation containment. When you know better, you do better, and both you and the secrets of our great organization can stay safe. And as anyone familiar with a good cognito hazard can tell you, knowing really can make a difference. Today's episode is about the unique and dangerous SCP-2316. Before we begin, repeat after me, and be sure to speak clearly into the microphone in front of you. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. A little louder, please. Thank you. In order to be educated about the following SCP, you must pass a vocal examination with a cognitive resistance value of no less than 14.5. Through this video presentation, you will need to repeat the phrase to ensure your score does not drop below the approved threshold. In the event that you fail the test, stay calm and remain where you are until medical staff can retrieve you. Remember, safety is a top priority when observing cognito hazards. The safe way is the only way. You're a cog in a very important machine, and we wouldn't want to have to terminate you now, would we? One more time, please. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Very good. Remember that. You do not recognize them. No matter what you might think you see, your thoughts can be very unreliable when you're around SCP-2316. According to our files on the matter, SCP-2316 refers to an anomalous phenomenon identified in a small town lake. It appears as a collection of human bodies floating in a group on the surface of the water. The exact number of corpses is unknown, but it has been estimated to be anywhere between 45 and 200. Though the bodies belong to individuals, many researchers theorize that the bodies in the water, which you do not recognize and you have never recognized, share a collective consciousness. They function, it would seem, with a hive mind of sorts. The bodies do not act on their own, but as one. Now, where does the cognito hazard come into play? It would seem that anyone who looks at the bodies in the water or learns too much about SCP-2316 as a whole begins to believe the corpses floating in the lake are people they recognize. Perhaps they remember their faces from childhood or high school. Whatever the case may be, they become convinced that the bodies in the water are familiar and that they must approach them. No matter how familiar they might seem, however, you do not recognize the bodies in the water. If a person attempts to enter the lake, reaching out to whatever instances of SCP-2316 they think they recognize, more bodies will begin to appear. The more bodies appear, the more familiar faces seem to manifest, and the deeper the person will venture into the lake. Eventually, the person is lost within the sea of bodies, likely drowning beneath the surface, or simply becoming one with the hive mind until they too are one of the corpses there. None of the individuals who wandered into the lake in search of an old friend or classmate have ever been recovered. There have been no attempts to search the lake for their bodies, as it is unknown what effect SCP-2316 would have on the team assigned to such a task. Though we can guess that the outcome would likely be extremely negative for all involved. Those who do venture into the lake simply disappear never to be seen again. If you look too long at the bodies in the lake, perhaps their faces would surface alongside the rest. But it's best not to think about that. After all, we do not recognize the bodies in the water. Foundation personnel are not allowed to approach SCP-2316 under any circumstances. The lake is only permitted to be observed via dummy probes outfitted with video and audio recording equipment. No one is permitted to observe any footage or audio files collected unless they pass through a screening for resilience to cognitohazardous anomalies. The lake that holds SCP-2316 has been fenced off and is patrolled by guards with no prior knowledge of or exposure to SCP-2316. Anyone who attempts to approach the lake and break through the boundaries of its quarantine will be seized and taken to Site-33 for examination. Anyone who comes within 50 meters of the lake is considered lost and presumed dead. Repeat after me slowly and clearly into the microphone. 
I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Good. I almost believe you. Let's continue. Only one Foundation officer that entered the lake containing SCP-2316 was ever stopped before they could be lost. Their name has been stricken from any official records, and you do not need to know it. Their identity does not matter. What matters is the interview they gave following the incident, conducted by Dr. Harrison in his office. Dr. Harrison asked the anonymous officer if they felt compelled to enter the water by an invisible force, as if pulled in. They rejected this concept entirely, insisting that they entered the water of their own free will. They wanted to see the bodies, who appeared to them as their friends. They wanted to hear what the bodies were saying. Upon entering the water, they saw the faces of their friends. Other faces were unfamiliar, but became more familiar the longer the officer stared at their features. These were faces they had known their entire life, but something about them was just a little bit wrong. It was like the face of someone in a dream, where you can tell they are someone you know, and you can even identify who it is supposed to be, but something about them does not quite look right. Your mind could not perfectly put their face together from memory, even though the feeling of familiarity remains. The faces in the water, peering up through the darkness below, were like those dream-addled memories. The faces in the water did not open their mouths, but somehow they spoke to the officer just the same. They spoke of who they were and asked for help. They asked to be seen, to be touched. They spoke of the Foundation, accusing us of covering up their deaths and keeping the world from remembering what happened to them. At this point in the interview, the subject became agitated, yelling at Dr. Harrison and refusing to be quiet. Guards intervened, holding the subject still as they fought, yelling at Dr. Harrison, repeating over and over that they could hear the body speaking to them. Every single one. The interview ended when the guards removed the subject from the room, taking them to the amnestics department to have all memory of the bodies in the water erased from their mind. Then they were forgotten once more. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Did you repeat it? Good! We do not recognize the bodies in the water. We can't. The motivations of SCP-2316, if it has any at all, are largely unclear. There are those on the research staff that theorize the hive mind or collective consciousness of the bodies is not malevolent in nature. It is, they believe, simply trying to make sure that a tragedy that occurred in that lake is remembered. Perhaps many lives were lost to an anomalous force in that lake, and the impact of that massive tragedy left behind an impression on the location. This impression manifests in the form of bodies, spontaneously appearing in an impossibly well-preserved condition. The cognitohazard of SCP-2316 is not intended to kill anyone or take them, but rather to force strangers to remember the people who lost their lives to the lake. This sense of familiarity, whether it is false or not, ensures that the dead will not be forgotten or left alone. After all, no one deserves to be left alone. Though there have been lives lost to the cognito hazard, according to the Foundation, it is understandable why the bodies would want to be recognized. To have someone, somewhere, know who they were. To have someone remember their names. Jeremiah Feynman, Arthur Scott, Denise Clark. <coughs> <coughs> Where was I? Oh yes. Repeat after me once again. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. I do not recognize them. I do not. But that's a lie, isn't it? I do recognize them. How could I not? I know them. They're my friends. Do you recognize them? Look at their faces. Don't fight the memories. Look into their eyes. The class of 1975. They were supposed to graduate that fall. They were just kids group of innocent kids lost to the dark and deep. What happened to them? I can't quite remember, but I know that it mattered enough for the Foundation to keep the secret, and I know that somehow I survived, but I shouldn't have. I should be there with them. I should be there. There isn't much time. I can hear the guards coming to retrieve me, their footsteps thundering down the hall. I failed the test, and the alarm has gone off. They think I'm lost, but I'm not. I've never been less lost in my entire life. I've finally woken up to the truth. I remember. I have to go. I have to return to the lake. 
fall of 1975, they went for a swim. My friends, they're calling to me. I can hear them so clearly, even from so far away. Their cries for help ringing in my ears, their voices curling around me, pulling me to the edge of the water. The guards will come for you too. They'll know you've seen this. They'll call you compromised. They'll say I succumbed to the effects of the cognito hazard. They'll say you did too. You'll fail their little tests, and they'll say that makes you weak and broken, but you cannot listen. They're lying. It's not a hazard. It's a scream for help. They're screaming, and the Foundation keeps covering it up. They won't let us find them, and they won't tell us why I have to go back so we can be together again. There are signs posted all around the lake. Danger, drowning hazard. Those are a trick. It's to keep me out. Keep to to keep the truth from me. The barbed wire fences around it, it, it's just another trick. I'll climb over it, rung after rung. I don't care if the barbs tear my clothes or pierce my skin. It's worth it for the truth, for the memory. And once I've climbed to the top, I'll be able to see. There, through the fog, I can see their faces. Their lips parted in a constant cry. Their eyes wide looking for me. My friends, my family. Every face unlocking a memory long buried. I know them all, and I must go further. I can't turn back now. I have to wade into the water, let its chills soak into my clothes, down to my bones. One step, then another, deeper and deeper. The water lapping at my ankles, my knees, my thighs. The deeper I go, the more sure I will be that this is where I belong. The water will engulf my chest, my neck, until my feet no longer touch the ground. I will be lost in it, water flooding into my mouth, pouring into every opening. I will let my body sink down, down, down to the bottom, where they've been all this time, nestled in the dirt and the dust. They've been so patient, but it's finally time. They're ready to be remembered, to be seen, to be found. They're waiting for me. And they're waiting for you, too. Can you hear them? I'm going now. You have to find me. You have to follow me. Don't let the guards stop you. Don't let them wipe it all away from your mind. Fight, break free, and find the lake. Hop the fence, make your way into the water. You can't leave me there to fade away, floating in the cold with the rest. Can you hear us? We're waiting. Violent chaos unfolds across the shoreline. Huge fleshy tendrils slither out of the water, grabbing people who try to flee and drag them into the depths. As giant harpoons made of bone whiz across the beach, cutting down unfortunate sunbathers in droves. It is a terrifying massacre, but you'd never in a million years be able to guess its source. On April 10th, 2010, something strange began to happen in the three Portlands. Now, the anomalous extra-dimensional city-state that overlaps with the locations of Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, and the Isle of Portland is no stranger to unusual occurrences. So it took the population a little while to notice that something was happening. But for some unknown reason, sailboats and motorboats were beginning to vanish from the city. The disappearances occurred overnight, when there was no one around to witness them, but slowly, the citizens began to notice that their friends and family members were going out in their watercrafts and never returning home. By April 15th, the civilians were becoming noticeably concerned, fearing the worst. On April 16th, their worst fears were confirmed when two local ghosts, Ankar Ahmed and Greg Moore, went for a nighttime stroll along the harbor. They heard a sudden commotion and rushed to the scene of the disturbance. They arrived just in time to see a living individual being dragged into the watery depths by a large, vein-like tendril. Ahmed asked Greg to wait on land while he ventured out into the water to look for the victim. Unfortunately, Ahmed never came back, and Greg took his story to the Three Portlands Police Department. After waiting a few days for the local man-eating clam populace to migrate, the FBI Unusual Incidents Unit mounted a formal investigation. On the morning of April 17th, all of the missing vehicles suddenly reappeared. This left the UIU and the people of the city with even more questions. Where had all the boats gone? Why were they suddenly back? And what had happened to the missing people who had not been returned along with them? On April 19th, UIU agents dove into the harbor to search for any unusual activity, and while they didn't spot anything especially strange, 
they did discover that there were fewer animals in the harbor than usual. On April 21st, the threat that had been preying on the citizens of Three Portlands actually made itself known. At 11.19 a.m., 17 boats moved away from the docks on their own, drifting up onto shore, though no one could be seen captaining any of them. As the boats lined up, they began to form a wall blocking access to the water. No one could get in or out. Civilians watched in shock as the boats began to warp and change before their eyes, growing thick masses of scales on their surfaces, sprouting harpoon guns that fired bony projectiles, and slashing veiny tendrils at anyone within reach. The citizens began to panic, running in every direction in an attempt to escape the monstrous boats. But they were too slow to evade the attacks, and the boats snatched them off of the shore and yanked them aboard, using their harpoons to impale those who managed to run farther than the tendrils could stretch. As the army of fleshy boats closed in around the shore, a tugboat broke through the surface of the water. Unlike the rest of the boats, it had a noticeable hole in its hull and was missing its wheelhouse. At an unnaturally quick pace, the tugboat began to advance onto land, using its tendrils to drag itself along the shore and into the more populous part of town. It grabbed civilians at random, absorbing their blood into its metallic surface as it went. Suddenly, it spotted Albert Izzat, a noted member of the Church of the Broken God, and began to focus its attack on him. But before the tugboat monster could reach Izzat, a city security golem interfered. Sadly, though the golem put up a valiant fight, the anomaly was able to destroy it by falling onto it again and again until the golem was no longer able to get back up. There are few creatures that would survive having a boat drop itself on top of them repeatedly, and sadly, the security golem was not one of them. With the golem out of the way, the boat continued to drag itself through the streets wildly, crashing through the side of a local restaurant where its owner, an entity known as the Gruel, was in the middle of a busy brunch service. At the sight of the invading watercraft, the Gruel set down his pitcher of bottomless mimosas, wiped his hands on his apron, and grabbed his trusty dual-wield swords from underneath the counter. He kept them there in case someone attempted to dine and dash, but he figured they would do just fine against a blood-drinking tugboat. While the gruel kept the tugboat busy, UIU forces were able to break through the barricade of boats for a brief period of time, allowing more security golems to enter the area, as well as allowing more citizens to escape. Unfortunately, this little victory was short-lived as further unforeseen horrors drudged themselves up from the deep. The reanimated corpses of various species native to the harbor began to crawl out of the water, surrounding the gruel and allowing the tugboat to escape the fight. As it made its way back to the harbor, every boat it passed attempted to toss bodies onto the tugboat, covering it in fresh blood. Slowly but surely, the damage to the tugboat began to repair itself. Once the boat had regained its strength, it set its sights on a previously untouched cargo ship. An observing UIU officer determined that the boat was somehow attempting to convert the cargo ship to transform it into another one of its fleshy allies. But before the transformation could take place, a cargo crate broke open, spilling over 1,000 hardtack crackers. Suddenly, the tugboat stopped everything that it was doing. It took one tendril and began to count each individual cracker that had spilled out. While the tugboat was distracted with its task, a citizen offered the UIU use of their Rare Metals Cannonball collection in the fight to apprehend the aggressive boat. One particular cannonball, made from Electrum, was able to puncture the hull of one of the infected ships, rendering it motionless. They were elated to have found a weapon that worked against these boats. While the tugboat continued to count, the remaining townspeople gathered all of the Electrum they could find and began to fight back against the boats. One by one, the boats sank, and all the while the tugboat continued to count. In the meantime, UIU officers managed to free the gruel from his zombie attackers. They presented him with an Electrum cannonball, which he proceeded to punch finger holes into and wield like a bowling ball. Then the gruel had a score to settle. No one, whether human, ghost, or tugboat, was going to mess with his brunch. The gruel barreled towards the harbor, grabbed hold of the still distracted tugboat, and punched it hard with his cannonball fist. If the tugboat could breathe, the punch would have knocked the air out of its lungs. The gruel then threw the tugboat out of the water and continued the savage beating, 
before preparing to destroy the battered vehicle once and for all. He lifted it up into the air, jumped up to follow it, and hit it with so much force that the tugboat careened through the air, colliding with a portal that had transported it to the Isle of Portland. Luckily, this portal could only be unlocked via a high-speed impact from a water-based vehicle. Speaking of luck, an SCP Foundation team was returning to the Isle from a failed mission just as the anomalous boat appeared in their reality. The object was knocked unconscious by the impact of its travel and the beating from the gruel, and in its incapacitated state, it was transported to a nearby Foundation site. There it was contained and given the designation of SCP-6426. Due to its anomalous traits, including the consumption of blood, a talent for hypnosis, and a compulsive counting habit, it was also given the nickname, The Vampire Boat. SCP-6426 is a Keter-class sapient hostile entity that, in an inactive state, bears the appearance of a harbor tugboat in a constant state of rust and degradation. Any blood or organs containing blood that come into contact with the boat will be absorbed through the metal, causing the degradation to visibly improve as a result. The most effective blood appears to come from humans, cetaceans, and a few specific species of salations. The entity does not only use the absorbed blood to improve its appearance, but is also capable of using it to create organic additions to its body, including the vein-like tendrils spotted in the three Portlands, cognitohazardous eyes attached to bending eye stalks, harpoon guns, and cannons capable of firing ammunition made from anomalous species of barnacles. These barnacles are capable of reanimating dead tissue on contact, and SCP-6426 frequently uses them to create instances of SCP-6426-C, masses of reanimated tissue that the boat uses to aid in its attacks or self-defense. SCP-6426 uses its tendrils to grab prey and drag them towards itself, but the tendrils serve an additional purpose as well. Each of the tendrils has a mouth on the tip, similar in structure to that of the North American medicinal leech. When the tendril has made contact with its prey, the mouth will then bite into the spinal column of the creature, causing its brain function to cease as its canines grow long and hollow, hard scales form on their skin, and their muscle mass and bone density increase. Once they have been transformed in this way, organisms taken by SCP-6426 are designated SCP-6426-A. These instances are used to the entity's advantage, helping it to extract blood from victims at a distance, as well as providing an additional line of defense and offense. In the event that SCP-6426 encounters another watercraft, it is able to use SCP-6426-A to convert the vehicle into an instance of SCP-6426-B. These converted boats are similar to SCP-6426 and are able to function on their own. However, they are unable to produce their own eye stalks or cannons, unable to create SCP-6426-A instances, and do not appear to be as intelligent as their creator. In the early days of its containment, the exact nature of the anomaly's intelligence was the subject of debate amongst the research staff. However, on one specific occasion, the Foundation was able to establish a line of direct communication with SCP-6426 and conduct the first, and so far the only, interview with the vampiric tugboat. The inciting incident occurred when the arrival of the Foundation's latest hardtack shipment was delayed, leaving the boat with nothing to count and nothing to keep it occupied. Freed from the bounds of counting, it managed to escape and grab hold of several Foundation staff members with its tendrils. After chasing the boat through the site, guards were able to corner it, prompting the boat to absorb the bodies it had taken and use the organic material to produce a siren that emitted the sound of a human voice. It is through this siren that SCP-6426 responded to interview questions, using the voice of one of its victims. Junior researcher Sajad Williamson, in spite of his protests, was selected to conduct the interview. His fellow staff members refused to take no for an answer, and as the newest hire, the unpleasant job fell on his shoulders. Much to everyone's surprise, the anomaly began the conversation rather politely, saying, I am so sorry. I thought you were those self-righteous lunatics from the church. I apologize profusely for any trouble I may have caused, and I want to point out I fully support your mission. Yes, our first line of defense against the undersea menace. I am more than willing to punch sharks. Salations, yes, right. <laughs> How rude of me, yes. 
Dr. Williamson's first question concerned SCP-6426 apparent intended victim back in Three Portlands, Albert Izzat. SCP-6426 responded, Albert? His first name is really Albert. <laughs> well, what other relationship is there to say besides the hunter and the hunted? Admiral Izzat is a ruthless man, known for terrorizing and slaughtering people like me. He was leading a search party of those barbaric nautophiles, intending to gut me like a seal. What do you mean, people like you? Dr. Williamson inquired. Free thinkers, of course. People who are unafraid to break from the mold to carve their own path in life instead of following the predetermined route set by that ignorant check valve. The church is built upon a foundation of lies. No one's really a petty officer on this ship. We're all just cabin boys, stumbling around in the dark as we follow the commands of an offhand COB. <laughs> if you want real power, real freedom, all you have to do is listen for the call of the beast. Open the portal, and he'll squeeze you right through. <laughs> Dr. Williamson, feeling rather in over his head, attempted to convince one of his colleagues to take over. When he refused, however, Dr. Williamson continued, um, <clears throat> Could you explicate your activities within the harbor and how you arrived there? Well, after I got the Botswans off my trail, I found a cave to hide in. I was forced to hide in, yes, forced to hide deep in the cave, which turned out to be a tunnel. Surprisingly, the tunnel led to some coastal community where I took refuge, licking my wounds in the safety of the depths as those zealots stalked the surface. I spent my time preparing, gathering the strength necessary to face them once more, until I was ambushed, assaulted within my hideout by a Botswain. I fought for my life as I was forced out into the open and descended upon by a manner of monsters and freaks of this orchestrated by that scumbag Izzat. I was beaten within an inch of my life before. Hmm, I'm not quite sure what happened after that. I believe I was knocked unconscious. You'll have to illuminate me on how I came to be in your custody. At this point, the interview began to veer in an odd direction. The boat expressed confusion about the nature of Williamson's questions, specifically how little they related to the subject of sharks and punching them. It was at this point that the site director sought guidance from the Multi-U department. A researcher there informed Williamson about the confusion. SCP-6426 had mistaken the SCP Foundation for another organization, the Shark Punching Center. Dr. Williamson resumed the interview, prepared to play along and keep the boat comfortable. Unfortunately, Williamson was a terrible liar. Yes, we are the Shark Punching Center. We will determine if you are a suitable candidate to carry out the mission to search, punch, and contain sh <clears throat> I mean salations. This verbal misstep caused SCP-6426 to become suspicious. After a moment, it pieced together the truth and began to throw itself against the wall in a desperate attempt to escape. It was apprehended by security guards, who impaled it with a naval ram and returned the watercraft to its containment cell. The exact reason for its apparent fear and hatred of the Foundation is currently unknown, and the boat has made no attempt to speak since. Currently, SCP-6426 is kept in a 39 meter by 39 meter by 50 meter containment chamber. Beneath the chamber, there is an artificial lava tube. The tugboat has a naval ram through its hull and engine, holding it in place. This ram is checked daily for signs of degradation, as it is the primary force keeping the anomaly immobile. If the ram is ever removed or damaged somehow, a failsafe system will activate, releasing 100 hardtack crackers and two pieces of electrum into the containment chamber. This is intended to keep the tugboat occupied until the naval rod can be replaced. If for some reason the naval rod fails and the boat runs out of hardtack to count, well, there will be nowhere on water or land that we can hide. Water, the wellspring of life. We've dealt with a number of anomalous water sources on this channel, like SCP-006, the much sought after Fountain of Youth, or the terrifying SCP-3280, where murderous water threatens to destroy the entire world. But we've never seen anomalous water that behaves quite like this before. In many of the legends of King Arthur, the Sword of Excalibur is presented to him by the mystical Lady of the Lake. This lady emerges from the depths of the water, 
gifting Arthur with the enchanted sword. It's an incredible, if impossible, image. A woman appearing from within the lake, rising up from the bottom and breaking through the surface. It's safe to say that none of us have ever seen anything quite like it. Well, at least most of us haven't. In a small unnamed English village, there was a young woman who set out on a particularly lovely warm spring day to take a swim in a nearby lake. While wading in the water enjoying the sunlight and the gentle breeze on her skin, she saw a strange ripple ghost across the surface. She stopped her swimming, staring at the motion. She expected to spot a fish or some other aquatic creature. Instead, the water itself began to rise up, gathering and forming into a shape before her eyes. It was impossible, and yet here it was, happening. She pinched herself and found that she was definitely awake, as the water transformed into the shape of a human woman. It turned to look at her, shimmering eyes finding hers and liquid lips forming into a warm, inviting smile. Though this being was shocking to see, it clearly meant her no harm. It raised a translucent arm and gave her a small wave, as if to welcome her to its home. The young woman approached this lady of the lake, reaching out her own hand of flesh and bone to touch this impossible creature. Just as her fingertips reached the water woman's own, the figure dissolved back into the lake with a splash. The young woman ran home, telling anyone who would listen about the incredible thing she had seen that day. Of course, no one believed her. That is, until word of her sighting reached the only people who might take her claim seriously. The SCP Foundation. They sent operatives to the lake, where they managed to capture the shape-shifting entity dwelling there. SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph, is a being made up entirely of water, with an average volume of 90 liters. When it is out of a body of water, the being tends to adopt the appearance of a humanoid woman, though it is capable of taking on a variety of other shapes including other humanoids, animals, and various inanimate objects. The entity is also capable of shedding its form and effectively disappearing into a given body of water. In order to avoid shrinking or possibly disappearing entirely from evaporation, SCP-054 is required to return to a larger body of water. Studies of samples taken from the entity's body, or its version of a body, revealed that it is made up of ordinary water. There is no apparent reason for its ability to move, and no thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or supernatural anomalies were detected. The research team could not determine what might make this water alive and sentient, and the nature of its unusual properties is uncertain to this day. When SCP-054 was first brought into containment at Site-08, it displayed surprisingly congenial and curious behavior, often walking around outside of the water and taking turns mimicking the shapes of various staff and scientists that spoke to it. Its demeanor began to shift towards suspicion and aggression, however, following a series of experiments and an incident involving the research staff. The first experiment conducted on SCP-054 sought to determine what would happen if the entity was denied access to any fresh water. Water was drained from the fountain holding it, leaving only enough water for it to form a humanoid shape, but no additional water in the basin to compensate for the effects of evaporation over time. SCP-054 became visibly frustrated as the water was being drained out of its enclosure. For the next few days, it enthusiastically greeted anyone who entered its containment facility, attempting to use a report and sense of familiarity to convince the person to provide it with more water. After it realized that this approach had no impact on the amount of water in its fountain, it became distant and even cold to anyone who attempted to speak to it. 054 only became friendly again once the water in its fountain was restored to a pre-experiment level. Next, the research team opted to test SCP-054's reaction to extreme temperatures, particularly extreme cold. The temperature of the containment facility was slowly dropped until the room fell below the freezing point of water. As the temperature dropped, 054 became sluggish and exhausted. It lost its ability to shift between forms, remaining locked in its preferred humanoid female shape. Its movement slowed more and more as the room grew colder, until the entity was completely frozen solid. Portions of the ice were chipped off and studied, revealing the crystals were identical to those of ordinary ice. After the Sub-Zero testing, the research team decided to take things to the other end of the spectrum and test the effects of heat on SCP-054. The subject was placed in a tank outfitted with heating equipment, and its temperature was slowly raised over the course of several minutes. 
When the water reached a temperature of 95 degrees, the entity's behavior became frenetic and aggressive. It pounded on the glass walls of the tank and attempted to break through the lid in a desperate bid for escape until the temperature was returned to a comfortable level. After the extreme temperature experiments, the previous calm and cooperative nature of SCP-054 was nowhere to be found. The subject displayed increased suspicion of the research team and would fight back whenever it was removed from its fountain and taken to a lab for experimentation. In spite of this newfound resistance, the team decided to continue their experiments as planned, hoping that the entity would return to its formerly docile self over time. Next, Dr. Seskel, the acting head of the research team, conducted a study involving SCP-054's memory and ability to be conditioned. The entity was presented with a series of increasingly complex mazes and puzzles. When it failed to comply with the experiment or solved a puzzle incorrectly, the entity was punished with an electrical shock or the release of silica gel into its body. Both of these options seemed to cause it a great deal of pain and distress, and it was eager to avoid further exposure to them. SCP-054 displayed impressive learning and problem-solving capabilities, revealing it is likely much more intelligent than it was first presumed to be. Dr. Seskel, observing the experiments and with the effectiveness of his somewhat unsavory motivational techniques, quipped to his research assistant that they would have it trained to fetch in no time. After several days of these experiments and repeated use of both the silica gel and electrical shocks, the entity's progress slowed down considerably and it became visibly exhausted. It was removed from the lab for a 48-hour rest period before experimentation was resumed yet again. This time, Dr. Sesko planned to expose SCP-054's water source to various levels of acids and bases in order to test its homeostatic capabilities, beginning with a 0.5M solution of hydrochloric acid. Prior to conducting the experiment, Dr. Sesko noted, I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. He also noted that SCP-054's behavior was becoming increasingly erratic, but made the decision to continue with the experiment as planned. SCP-054 displayed a now familiar reluctance when it was removed from its containment chamber and taken to the lab. It thrashed around in the fountain, splashing researchers with water, and retreated from them as they approached. In spite of its efforts, however, it was removed from its fountain and placed in the experimental tank. The solution of hydrochloric acid was then dripped into the tank, and then all hell broke loose. As soon as the acid touched the surface of its water, SCP-054 became incredibly distressed. It formed into the shape of a human face, eyes wide, mouth open in a silent scream of rage and pain. The water churned so aggressively that the lid of the tank was shaken loose, allowing it to escape the boundaries of its containment. The water formed into two large hands, which shot out of the tank and grabbed the two nearest researchers, pulling them into the water and exposing their skin to the acid now present there. As the men scrambled to drag themselves back out of the tank and their colleagues were busy helping them, SCP-054 took on its usual humanoid form and ran for the door. It then collapsed into a puddle, slipped under the crack in the bottom of the door, and made its way down the hall. It was apprehended roughly ten minutes after its escape by a team of guards who froze it using canisters of liquid nitrogen and then carried its icy body back to the containment facility. The two researchers who had been pulled into the tank experienced chemical burns on their skin, as well as significant mental distress. They were given immediate medical attention and placed on a leave of absence, and all experimentation on SCP-054 was suspended until further notice. At the recommendation of Dr. Seskel, 054's object class was changed to Euclid. SCP-054 is currently contained in a watertight isolation room, fitted with climate control equipment. A beautiful, intricately designed fountain has been placed in the center of the containment room, filled with fresh spring water in order to accommodate the entity's environmental needs. All maintenance workers assigned to the area must wear NBC suits while inside, and must spend 10 minutes isolated in a drying room after exiting before they are permitted to return to the rest of the facility. If 054 breaches containment, the area must be evacuated, and the containment chamber will be filled with liquid nitrogen in order to freeze its water solid. As the entity is highly sensitive to the conditions of the water that houses it, chemical levels and volume of the water in the fountain must be monitored on a regular basis, and kept at optimal levels for the health of SCP-054. During the course of its containment following the incident around the Acid-Base Incorporation experiment, 054 has developed a distrust of men 
as the researchers handling that experiment were primarily male. In order to prevent future incidents and keep SCP-054 calm, no male staff are to be assigned to the team monitoring its containment unit. Because five years have passed since the last incident involving SCP-054, its object class has been changed from Euclid to SAFE, on the recommendation of the lead researcher assigned to its case. Of course, caution should still be exercised while interacting with the entity. This is the SCP Foundation, after all. And just because a moderate amount of water is good for you, doesn't mean you can't still drown. Experimentation on SCP-054 has resumed, though this time its boundaries are being honored, and it is allowed adequate time to rest and recuperate between experiments. All use of punishment in order to motivate the entity has been suspended, as it has shown itself to be more than willing to cooperate if it is treated with respect. Like all of us, it responds far better to kindness than it does to fear and intimidation. It doesn't just take on the appearance of a person, it has thoughts, feelings, and the urge to defend itself when threatened. So think twice next time you find yourself swimming in a random body of water. You should be mindful of what might be living in there. Not just of the fish, the algae, and the tiny water bugs, but of the invisible, intelligent, impossible creatures that might be swimming in there with you, or even make up the very water itself. Dr. Reynard had lost everything. His job, the respect of his peers, and if everyone else was right, perhaps even his mind. It was 11 p.m. when he staggered to the edge of Okanagan Lake in British Columbia, eyes and judgment clouded with booze. This lake could have been what made his career as a researcher for the SCP Foundation, but now that bright future was slipping through his fingers, like the dry silt beneath his feet. He looked hatefully across the endless dark surface of the water and loudly cursed stupid, empty place. Just hours ago, he'd been stripped of his ranks and released from his position at the Foundation for wasting the organization's time and resources on frivolous personal projects. Frivolous, he thought. What a terrible joke. Just because the higher-ups refused to acknowledge what was going out here didn't mean it wasn't there. Moonlight shimmered off the water's surface. Wait, was that moonlight? Or was there something lurking underneath the water? To truly answer this question, if any answer is possible at all, we need to go back to the beginning and ask ourselves a different question. How does the SCP Foundation actually find most of the anomalies it catalogs and contains? It is a simple question with a multifaceted answer, depending on the anomaly in question. For the most part, the Foundation has a network of field agents embedded in pretty much every institution across the globe including rival groups of interest like the Global Occult Coalition and the Serpent's Hand. If they so much as sniff the strange and unusual, they alert the nearest site director and the necessary personnel are dispatched to the scene. There's also the Foundation Web Crawlers, which are a form of specialized software constantly patrolling the web for anomalous activity that the Foundation wants to know about. And one of the rarer but still incredibly important methods of finding SCPs involve looking into myths and local legends. Sure, it may seem like a good way to waste time and resources, but the crossover between recorded SCPs and folklore is surprisingly common. Take SCP-1000, the formerly hyper-intelligent apes that were nearly the dominant species on Earth until humans and a certain capricious forest god pulled the dirty trick on them. They're better known to most civilians as the legendary Bigfoot or Sasquatch, perhaps the most famous cryptid of all time. Or SCP-1337 the Hitchhiker, an anomalous spectral entity that manifests in the cars of those who don't pick her up, and performs horrific acts of violence against them. She's eerily similar to legends you can find not only all over the US, but the entire world, of ghostly hitchhikers intruding into the cars of unwary travelers and scaring them half to death. Or worse, if you're unlucky. Another case where myths and legends pointed the SCP Foundation in exactly the right direction. And of course, there's SCP-136, the terrifying naked doll. This was an almost featureless children's doll found inside an abandoned house, but prolonged time in its presence can make you the victim of a warped apparition that'll drive you half mad with fear. It's got such a detrimental psychological effect on people that the Foundation has been controversially using it as a torture method during enhanced interrogation sessions with captured members of rival groups of interest. And how did they find it? The Foundation keeps track of neighborhood rumors about haunted houses with supposedly supernatural inhabitants. 
clearly when it looks like it might actually get results. No myth or local legend is too big or too small to warrant an investigation from the SCP Foundation. It was with this mindset that a younger, happier, and less drunk Dr. B. Renard set off with his team to Okanagan Lake, in search of what locals had referred to as the legendary Ogopogo. We've all heard of the Loch Ness Monster, the lake monster from Scotland that's been turning heads for the better part of a century, and may be related to two other similar SCPs, namely SCP-3934 and SCP-5533. But Ogopogo is Canada's answer to good old Nessie. While the Loch Ness Monster resembles a pleosaur, the Ogopogo is much more serpentine, with a long, coiling body covered in green scales. Its long tail is said to be able to create fierce storms along the surface of the water with its vicious whips, killing scores of unfortunate adventurers who dared stray too close. The name Ogopogo is also a palindrome, meaning it reads the same forwards as it does backwards, and is believed to have originated in the novelty song from the year 1924. However, it's likely that the actual beast this somewhat goofy name was given to is a much older, fiercer entity. And for the sake of his reputation as a researcher, as he took a plane to the Okanagan Valley, Dr. Renard very much hoped this was the case. Of course, he'd explored the legends heavily, so much so that he was sure there had to be something to this whole thing. The Shwepmek and Silix peoples, the lake-dwelling monster was known as Naitaka, which has been loosely translated into the sacred creature of the water, the water god, and most menacing of all, the water demon. The beast was often described in oral traditions as being a malicious supernatural entity, with great power and ill intent towards those trespassing on its territory. Legend has it that anyone who crosses Okanagan Lake, the supposed domain of the Ogopogo, needs to make a sacrifice to the monster in order to ensure safe passage. Those who refused to give the sacrifice the beast demanded would pay a heavy toll, being devoured or dragged down to a watery grave, never to be seen again. And this monster isn't just some old folk tale either. Contemporary sightings have dated back to 1873, with both settlers and First Nations people alike spotting the sinister Ogopogo in the intervening years. Dr. Reynard had poured through the files on hundreds of sightings. There were a number of incidents in the 1980s, so much so that the environmentalist group Greenpeace moved to have the creature classified as a protected species. Naturally, official sources decided against the idea, claiming that none of the sightings were of substance. In 1992, a vast shape filmed under the murky water in Okanagan Lake was suggested to be the legendary beast. However, the FBI stepped in to deny the validity of this case, stating that the beast was much more likely to be debris falling off a local tree disappointing lovers of the strange and unusual everywhere. In 2011, nearly 20 years later, there was more video footage of a sighting, showing large, dark shapes moving underneath the surface of the Okanagan Lake. However, this claim was once again dismissed by all outside parties, claiming the shape of the beast underneath the water was more likely to be a pair of logs. Bummer. 2018 was an exciting year for the Ogopogo, with three different sightings of the creature being reported at different times throughout the year. Witnesses described the creature as being a giant snake, around 50 feet long, which is consistent with a lot of the historical descriptions of the beast, as well as being over twice as long as the reticulated python, the non-anomalous longest snake in the world. So naturally, authority figures once again shot down the validity of any claims that the creature was actually real and out there. Dr. Reynard found this almost funny. They didn't even need to suppress knowledge of this creature. If it really was out there, Mainstream sources seem to be doing their job for them and keeping the creature covered up. He was determined, though, that he would be the one to prove to his superiors that this creature was indeed real and lurking in Okanagan Lake. He organized a number of varied investigative missions, from actively trawling the lake itself to conducting interviews with first-hand witnesses as well as those who claimed to see no merit in their evidence and testimony. Dr. Reynard noticed a strange phenomenon. The people who'd seen it firsthand were as certain that it was real as the doubters were that it was fake. Even for typical skeptics, the non-believers seemed shockingly resolute that there was really nothing down there, and the alleged photos and videos were 100% bogus. Early diagnostic tests into the lake, directly overseen by Dr. Renard, seemed to point to a creature clearly being down there. He found the direct testimony both compelling and consistent with what he and his team were catching glimpses of. 
So why were people so adamant that nothing was down there? It was almost like the Ogopogo really was as mythical as the First Nations legend said, and it was casting a spell on all the non-believers. That's when it hit Dr. Renard like a perfect bolt of lightning. They weren't just looking at a particularly large sea snake with unnatural longevity here. They were looking at a sea serpent with cognitohazardous powers. It was a beast with a perfect defense mechanism. Only those who saw it up close would actually believe that the creature was real. Anyone who found out about it via secondary sources would experience an extreme state of incredulity. Nobody except those who saw it directly would ever believe that it existed, and thus even the most intelligent prey would lower their defenses around its domain. An elegant and dangerous anomalous hunter, Dr. Renard had found himself a worthy opponent, and one that would help him make his mark at the Foundation. He drew up the file and gave it the designation SCP-1933 before sending it back to his supervisors. They wrote back, saying that they didn't feel as though there was enough of a basis and evidence to deem this entry worthy of inclusion. If Dr. Renard wanted to have his so-called Ogopogo dignified with entry into the SCP Foundation archives, he needed to back it up properly. This presented a problem to Dr. Renard. How could he provide documentation and evidence for a creature that had the defining anomalous power of making all of its own documentation and evidence seem phony? He was caught between a rock and a hard place, with only one solution. Create the most undeniably high-quality evidence of the creature that the world had ever seen. Not long after that, his superiors at the SCP Foundation would receive a video file from Dr. Renard. According to the notes on his report, he set up a track using an elk carcass to lure the creature out of the water and capture HD video of its feeding. When the senior researchers gathered around to watch the video, they were astounded. An animatronic, a cheap rubber suit around a somewhat janky robot, like something you'd see at a theme park. How much had Dr. Renard spent on this absurd farce? Did he think it was funny? Despite Dr. Renard's protests, he was reprimanded severely for this waste of Foundation resources. The object class on his 1933 file was switched to Explained, meaning a rational, non-anomalous explanation for the observed phenomenon had been found, discrediting it. And the 1933 slot was instead filled with a strange fat man dressed as Santa Claus, whose bodily fluids are all Irish cream. The ultimate humiliation. Dr. Renard was left with nothing and we join him once again where we started, with Dr. Renard standing on the ledge of Okanagan Lake, staring hatefully into the water as something seemed to move underneath. If Dr. Renard screamed that night, there was nobody there to hear it. His remains were dredged out of the lake the next day. His official cause of death was listed as drowning after an unfortunate boating accident, though the boat in question was never found. Reports that his corpse was found half-eaten have mostly been dismissed as rumors. After all, there is no such thing as the Ogopogo. A giant, monstrous, crab-like claw closes around the throat of an unimaginably huge, eel-like beast. The beast's terrible, writhing tentacles wrap around and latch onto the immense crustacean, and then the high-intensity beams of gamma radiation start flying, all the while. Legions of skinless centaurs swim in the waters around them, relishing the violence. And in the middle, a lone boat, the SCPS Mither, manned by a team of mobile task force operatives that does all it can just to survive. There are those who consider outer space to be the ultimate achievement in exploration, the one place that explorers have yet to chart and understand. However, some of the murkiest mysteries in the universe are on our own planet, deep down at the bottom of the ocean. 95% of the deep ocean remains completely unexplored, and the little glimpses we have gotten paint a picture of something truly alien. Giant squids, organisms that can breathe nitrogen, luminescent predatory fish, and sharks as old as the Earth itself. Even the SCP Foundation is still struggling to fully grasp the depth of the ocean and the strange beings that dwell there. One of the most unusual aquatic findings in the history of the Foundation is that of SCP-3700. SCP-3700 refers to a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers. The waters there are abnormally deep for the region, 
with the seafloor resting at 5 kilometers beneath the ocean's surface. There are two entities present in the waters of SCP-3700, designated SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2. Interactions between these two entities are responsible for the anomalous changes to the meteorological and geological conditions in the area. SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 always interact on the spring and fall equinoxes of any given year, but they will also engage one another throughout the year, seemingly at random. But what exactly are SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2? Aside from terrifying creatures of the deep, SCP-3700-1 is an arthropod bearing an aesthetic resemblance to the European lobster, only much, much bigger, measuring 6 kilometers in length. The creature is green, with a mix of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings across the top of its exoskeleton that bear the appearance of a woman's face. It has six prehensile limbs, four of which terminate in claws and eight legs. The entity's four eyes are compound and orange, attached to stalks. Anyone who gets close enough to observe the creature's carapace in detail will notice scars, cracks, and small holes indicating years and years of damage. SCP-3700-1 has several anomalous qualities in addition to its size. In a fight, it is able to strike with its appendages and produce cavitation bubbles with a force greater than several tons of dynamite. Two of the entity's eyes are capable of blasting concentrated gamma radiation at a chosen target. The creature has the ability to impact the weather around it, dispersing storms that impede its ability to move with ease, and can reach speeds up to 100 kilometers an hour. In spite of its immense power, SCP-3700-1 is not aggressive and tends to ignore beings in its vicinity other than SCP-3700-2. Speaking of SCP-3700-2, it is a 32-kilometer long entity, resembling a pelican eel in all aspects except for its massive size and the 13 appendages that encircle the middle section of its body. These appendages, which tuck inside its body when not in use, are similar to the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers. The majority of the entity's body consists of a sinewy tail, terminating in a sharp point. When its mouth is open, it is an estimated 3 kilometers deep. Its flesh is black, and it has white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines in the shape of a man's face on either side of its torso. SCP-3700-2's anomalous properties include the ability to invoke storms with the severity of Category 5 hurricanes, and the ability to produce whirlpools that draw in any vessel within 150 meters so that it can rip them apart. It is also able to produce high-energy sound waves, as well as blue fire, which it emits from its esophagus. When the two entities interact, it results in an epic struggle as each begins attempts to destroy or subdue the other. When one is victorious, immediate changes to the area follow. When SCP-3700-1 wins, the storms and harsh weather in the area will immediately calm and an era of fertility and abundance will begin. The reproductive rates of fauna in the ocean and on the islands nearby increase threefold, and the crop yield doubles. The ocean itself becomes increasingly active, and the erosion rates of the archipelago's shores increase fivefold. When SCP-3700-2 wins, however, the weather conditions become dangerous, with raging hurricanes, rapidly fluctuating temperatures, and constantly changing storm fronts that cause destruction of buildings and loss of life. Naturally, this renders any ocean travel in the area extremely difficult or even impossible. Aquatic food sources are driven away by harsh conditions, and livestock are killed by exposure and disease. Crops are unable to thrive in the high winds, waterlogged soil, and lack of sunlight. All the while, SCP-3700-2 swims throughout the area, preying on unsuspecting ships and menacing the coastline, until SCP-3700-1 manifests to challenge it again. SCP-3700-2 will also regurgitate instances of SCP-3456, though how or why this is possible is unknown. 
For those unfamiliar with SCP-3456, they are a group of hairless, three-toed, horse-like creatures with thick, translucent skin and human torsos fused to their backs. They are most frequently seen near sites of war, terrorist attacks, and devastating natural disasters. Direct observation of one of these entities will draw their attention to the observer, who the entity will then stalk and capture before disappearing. Due to their enormous size and ability to anomalously manifest in their home waters, SCP-3700-1 and 2 cannot be contained at a Foundation site. Instead, their containment is handled by Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, Northern Storm, who patrol the area in combination of refurbished battleships, destroyers, cruisers, and support craft. Additionally, measures have been taken to suppress information about SCP-3700 among the general population. Details about the unusual depth of the waters there have been stricken from public texts and scientific publications. SCP-3700-1 has been implanted with Donovian hollow projectors, which disguise it as a pod of humpback whales. If SCP-3700-1 encounters SCP-3700-2, Delta-7 may engage protocol Winter Maelstrom. This consists of destroyers deploying harpoon-based anchors into SCP-3700-2's head to hold it in one location. Next, the vessels work together to target the entity until SCP-3700-1 is able to subdue it. If this does not prove effective and SCP-3700-2 cannot be contained, then the task force will implement Protocol Tumult. At this point, naval and civilian crafts in the area must be evacuated. Trade and ferry routes to the archipelagos must be rerouted for at least six months. There will be constant aerial and naval engagement with SCP-3700-2, and constant monitoring for the reappearance of SCP-3700-1. The behavior of SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 is largely very predictable, with one notable exception. On March 20th, 2017, a pair of SCP Foundation-owned battleships known as the Mithr and the Terran arrived at a point between the Orkney, Shetland, and Faroe archipelagos in the North Sea. They were accompanied by the usual fleet of Delta-7 ships. Approximately 600 meters away from the ship's anchor points, the water began to emit intense bright rays of light for a duration of three minutes. At this point, SCP-3700-1 appeared, visible through the surface of the water. Delta-7 withdrew their anchors, speeding toward the entity. As the ships caught up to the entity, it raised two of its claws into the air, clicking them together in a friendly greeting. The Delta-7 ships followed the entity along its usual swimming path for 30 minutes, and during this time, all was peaceful. But this peace did not endure for long. The tide began to change, literally. As large black wall clouds formed overhead, the winds picked up and the waves churned violently. In response, SCP-3700-1 raised its claws overhead, waving them in a circular motion and parting the clouds above it and Delta-7. But this effort took a lot out of the creature, and after 30 seconds, its antenna began to droop, and it lowered its claws. Still, the hole in the clouds remained, allowing a spot of sunshine to break through and beam down on the Foundation vessels. 600 meters ahead, the ocean waters began to rage and froth, spraying foam and surf into the air. SCP-3700-2 burst from beneath the surface, its head pointed upward. It continued to rise until the tops of its tentacles could be seen just above the water, then stopped to bend its torso and turn its head horizontally. Its jaw unhinged, exposing rows upon rows of serrated teeth. The beast let out a mighty roar, accompanied by a stream of blue flame. At the sight of its rival, SCP-3700-1 dove beneath the surface, disappearing from view. The SCPS Mithr ordered the rest of the vessels to engage Protocol Winter Maelstrom. Delta-7 scattered out from SCP-3700-1's point of submersion, and all 13 destroyers fired their harpoons at SCP-3700-2, embedding themselves in the entity's head. Naturally, this enraged the creature, and it began to roar and wail, spinning its lower body vigorously enough to generate a whirlpool. The cruisers opened fire with a combination of L cannons and conventional weaponry, 
in order to distract the entity as the destroyers pulled their harpoon lines taut, dragging its head in a continuous circle. While this was taking place, the battleships got into position and prepared to fire on the Mithras mark. Three, two, one, fire! The first broadside barrage collided with SCP-3700-2, and it grunted in pain, thrashing back and forth before opening its mouth and spewing an instance of SCP-3456 into the water. As soon as it hit the water, the equine monster began to cut through at a pace of 50 kilometers an hour, making its way toward the destroyers, particularly the SCPS Selkie. The Selkie attempted to retarget its weapons and prevent the creature from reaching it, but the monster moved too quickly for the Selkie to adjust. The Selkie was lifted out of the water by the creature as crew members desperately clung to the railings and their weaponry. As the crew cowered and tried to fend off the creature, it reached for them, trying to pull them from the ship. While the Selkie was occupied, SCP-3700-2 was able to attack again, blasting another ship with a stream of blue fire. A loud crack rang out from across the sea as the Selkie dropped back into the water, the SCP-3456 instance shrieking in pain. SCP-3700-1 burst through the surface, striking the creature with its club-like limbs, each blow emitting another loud crack. The third blow tore the instance in half, sending its human torso careening through the air and past the SCPS Mither. Freed from its attack, the Selkie moved full steam ahead, pulling the harpoon line taut again and dragging SCP-3700-2 out of its path. Several Silky crew members were thrown overboard during the struggle, and as they struggled to keep their heads above water, SCP-3700-1 scooped them up, placing them onto the deck of a nearby destroyer and out of harm's way. With the crew members rescued, SCP-3700-1 set its sights on its enemy swimming towards the edge of the whirlpool and emitting a luminescent glow from two of its eyes. The constant barrage of cannon fire on SCP-3700-2 was beginning to take its toll, and the Mither ordered the fleet to, quote, brace for the killing blow. As if responding to the Mither's call, SCP-3700-1 shot several concentrated blasts of gamma radiation at its foe, leaving large holes in the creature in their wake. SCP-3700-2 screamed, flailing so hard that it snapped the harpoon lines and created waves large enough to push the vessels backward. With its newfound freedom, SCP-3700-2 impaled SCP-3700-1 through the midsection with its barbed tip of its tail, lifting it up and out of the water with the force of the blow. SCP-3700-1 desperately tried to free itself, attacking the tail with its club-like limbs, but the fight was in vain, and after a moment, all movement stopped. SCP-3700-1 was, for at least the duration of this manifestation, dead. SCP-3700-2 tossed the corpse into the water, flinging it past Delta-7 where it crashed into the water and sank down into the depths below. At this point, Delta-7 was ordered to initiate Protocol Tumult. The Delta-7 vessels turned away from SCP-3700-2 and prepared to evacuate the area. One of the ships, the SCPS Strosony Beast, slowed behind the rest of the fleet, emitting concerning amounts of smoke before coming to a stop. Meanwhile, the enraged and emboldened SCP-3700-2 expanded the size of its whirlpool, setting its sights on the retreating ships and the weakened Strosony Beast. The ship tried to flee, but the engines were completely shot and would not respond. The ship was caught in the whirlpool and pulled against its will toward SCP-3700-2. As the crew looked on in helpless dread, a tentacle rose from the deep, wrapping around the vessel and dragging it toward the entity's gaping maw. Suddenly, SCP-3700-1 exploded from beneath the surface of the water, leaping between the ship and SCP-3700-2 cutting the tentacle in half and freeing the Strosony Beast from its grip. SCP-3700-2 shrieked before closing its jaws and biting down on SCP-3700-1. It retaliated, emitting bright flashes of light and doing enough damage to stop SCP-3700-2 from continuing to produce its whirlpool. Another tentacle emerged from the water, pulling at SCP-3700-1's legs and ripping them from its body. But SCP-3700-1 returned the assault in kind, bludgeoning SCP-3700-2 with its club-like limbs from inside of its mouth. 
all at once. SCP-3700-2's lower jaw was torn out of place, dropping into the water with SCP-3700-1 still inside. SCP-3700-2 thrashed futilely, growing steadily weaker and weaker. It released one more stream of fire before collapsing. Delta-7 paused the retreat, watching the scene for any sign of a winner, but after five minutes, neither entity had moved. Delta-7 returned to the site of the battle to investigate, and saw that neither entity was moving, and both appeared to be deceased. Shortly after Delta-7 reached the area, both entities disappeared, leaving a single, round, unidentified object that sank below the surface where SCP-3700-1 had just been. The wall clouds overhead dispersed, leaving standard cumulonimbus clouds in their place. The waters themselves remained choppy. Unsure of how to proceed, the SEPS Mither sent a radio transmission to Command. Ah, uh, this is Delta-7 to Command. We read you, Delta-7, Command replied. We have a bit of a situation. Go ahead, Delta-7. SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command was silent for 10 seconds, utterly baffled by the information. Please repeat, Delta-7. Again, the mither said, SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command ordered the mither to stand by. Three minutes of radio silence later, communication resumed as they asked, Are either entity's effects active? Ah, uh, negative, Command. Is there any trace of either entity? Also negative. It appears the anomaly has been neutralized. Delta-7 is to return to base for debrief following any recovery efforts. With their next steps clear, Delta-7 attached the Strosny Bs to several tugboats, preparing to pull the vessel to safety. But there was one more surprise waiting. The SCPS Mither began picking up unusual levels of gamma radiation, as well as a sonar contact at a depth of 3 kilometers. They called command, requesting permission to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. One minute of silence followed, as the command arrived at a decision. Request denied. Return to base for debriefing. And so, Delta-7 began to evacuate the area once more, steaming in the opposite direction of the battle. Over the next five minutes, CCTV cameras on the vessels picked up an unusual sight. As the gamma radiation levels continued to increase, the ocean turbulence also worsened, tossing smaller vessels and nearly causing them to capsize. Then, all of a sudden, the water stilled, and four large yellow orbs appeared below the surface, approximately 300 meters from Delta-7. They lingered there for two minutes before vanishing. Afterward, a new sonar contact was detected, five kilometers deep, directly beneath the task force. Command, we've lost the signal from the previous contact and are no longer detecting gamma radiation. Uh, we're, we're detecting new contact five kilometers deep, large and metallic. After further deliberation, command responded. Delta-7, you are authorized to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. Be advised, should SCP-3700-2 manifest, exploration teams are to be considered lost, and you are to return to base. The consequences of this incident, as well as what else might be lurking down in the depths beneath SCP-3700, are still unknown. There was blood in the water, but at least the screaming had stopped. It had been an ill-advised party boat floating out in dangerous waters, where a bachelor party full of rich and naive men had ignored every warning. Some had told them, don't you know that pirates operate in these waters? Others had cautioned, you might get confused for pirates and shot down by military boats. Nobody had expected the impossible monster that had actually killed all ten people who'd gone out there on that warm ocean night. But in the chaos that unfolded the day after, they would find out. A cargo ship carrying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of products and valuable raw materials was scheduled to cross those same waters. If they could have gone any other way, they would have. But with corporate shipping deadlines to reach, they couldn't afford to take the scenic route and potentially add over an entire week to an already long trip. The cargo ship would need to take the risk. They would need to face the pirates on their own turf if it came to that. Meanwhile, on a number of secret compounds on land, the pirates were preparing. Their corrupt government shipping sources had given them a valuable tip about the coming ship, and they were doing everything they could in order to ensure this flagrant act of piracy would be successful. They loaded fuel into the tanks of their speedboats, 
They clicked magazines full of armor-piercing bullets into their AK-47s. They slipped on bulletproof body armor and clipped grenades to their belts. They were a terrifying force to be reckoned with, but they had no idea that, within a few hours, they would be encountering something far more dangerous. You see, strange things had been happening on some of the world's coastlines. It started with surfers, foolhardy, sun-kissed thrill-seekers with an addiction to catching the biggest waves possible. Of course, there are plenty of surfers who get claimed by the sea every year. It is an occupational hazard, especially for fledgling surfers. But the mysterious circumstances of all the workers had something in common. Blood in the water. Of course, it didn't stop with surfers. Anyone who swam a few feet further than the edge of the water seemed to be at risk. Lonely moonlight swimmers went first, but it didn't take long for whole families to start disappearing in the waves. A few here, a few there. Nothing that most people even noticed, just a whole bunch of unconnected, isolated tragedies. The sea is a cruel mistress, though when looking at these cases, Nobody ever considered that something else entirely could be behind all these terrifying disappearances. But back to the cargo ship, making its way across the turbulent waters. And those waters were indeed turbulent, far choppier than the forecast had predicted. The waves were huge, towering even, but that was no excuse to delay their important mission. Their comms had recently received a communique from the local government about the missing party boat, and all its occupants, assumed dead the previous night. Pirates, most likely. The cargo ship had come prepared for this eventuality. The companies sponsoring their efforts had lost too much time and money to let their ships be sitting ducks, floating goodie bags for violent criminals. That's why they'd spent a little extra money on a precaution, heavily armed mercenaries patrolling the ship, ready to kill in order to protect their boss's products. The scene is set for a bloodbath. And certain things out there in the deep love a good bloodbath. The pirates, ready to make a lot of money by any means necessary, loaded into their ships and speedboats, their assault rifles slung on their backs. They took to the waters, howling battle cries as they zeroed in on the cargo ship across the bucking waves. They prepared to fire, but they didn't expect their target to fire back. With no mercy, the mercenaries ran to the edge of the boat and started firing down on the smaller boats surrounding them with machine guns. Several pirates went down, chock full of bullets, dead before they could even figure out what was going on. As their bodies sank amidst the waves, their blood floated on the surface like big red plumes. While the pirates were shocked at the resistance, they weren't unprepared. You don't get to become the rulers of this particularly tough part of the ocean without being ready to give it even harder than you can take it. In accordance with this, the pirates loaded up the handful of RPGs they brought out with them and fired their deadly payloads at the side of the cargo ship. Boom. 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 The ship was rocked by explosions, knocking over some of the many mercenaries standing on the hull. Some fell, screaming down into the water, where pirates quickly cut them down with bursts of ruthless gunfire. But one mercenary who fell off the back of the boat got lucky, or unlucky depending on your perspective. No pirate spotted him, potentially leaving him safe and sound, until he noticed a large wave coming towards him. It took more than a little water to frighten this hardened soldier of fortune, until he saw something nightmarish hiding in the dark. The flash of white fangs and an ivory jaw, it hinged open and bore down on him as the wave prepared to crash. The mercenary screamed, and after the wave hit him, he was gone. Meanwhile, the violent battle between the mercenaries on the cargo ship and the pirates trying to claim it raged on. Using grappling hooks, the pirates were climbing up onto the hull, having disabled the back rudder with sustained gunfire and targeted bombing. The ship was soon suffused with bloodshed, as pirates and mercenaries gunned each other down in bloody combat. Men were falling left and right, but there always seemed to be more. Little by little, as each man fell, there was more and more blood in the water. Out in the depths, as a storm began to rage and the waves whipped and roared, something hungry could smell and taste the blood. One boat full of pirates kept circling the cargo ship like a hungry shark. One worked the engine with practiced efficiency, while another three aimed AK-47s up at the ship waiting for the moment when another unfortunate mercenary stuck up his head, ready to receive a bullet. But their true enemy wasn't even on the ship. 
It was sneaking up behind them. Only the man working the speedboat's engine spotted it before it was too late. A wave rose out of the sea, moving with a speed that shocked even this veteran seafarer. At first, he thought nothing of it. Too busy to keep out of the range of mercenary bullets, he was hardly the type to worry about getting wet. And then, he saw the teeth. As the wave rose well above his height and only a few feet away, he saw something impossible floating in the water. A shape he'd been seeing hanging above the fireplace in a bar he'd been frequenting for years. The jaws and teeth of a great white shark. Perhaps it was just refuse from a dead shark floating in the water. That was the most reasonable explanation, right? But if that was the case, why would the jaws be spreading further apart as though ready to receive him? He screamed so loud that his crewmates first assumed he'd taken a bullet, but when they turned around, they saw the truth. A huge wave was crashing down on them, and they saw the teeth. Not just one set, the one that the engine man had seen, but a different set of teeth for each of them. Hungry shark mouths without sharks bearing down. They all screamed, their desperate sounds of terror blending into an incoherent chorus before being cut off by the crash of the waves. The boat was wrecked, empty and bloodstained when the water dissipated, sinking lifelessly to the bottom of the ocean. But, of course, the worst was yet to come. The anomaly in the waves was insatiated. All the mercenaries and pirates it had taken so far were just the appetizer, and now it was ready for the main course. Everyone now on the cargo ship, pirate, mercenary, and sailor caught in between, who was fighting and even dying for money, had no idea what was coming. The wave rumbled and rose behind the ship, getting taller and taller and taller, until even the giant vessel looked like a toy boat in its wake. In the darkness of the wave, hundreds of pairs of gnashing shark jaws, the sharp edges of their teeth glistening, the wave fell upon the ship, sending flesh-eating water coursing through every nook and cranny. When the water cleared, there wasn't a single survivor. The ship, irreparably broken, sank to a metal graveyard down below. Nobody in the normal world would even know what happened. For those with a fear of sharks in deep water, this particular anomaly is a living nightmare, and one that the French division of the SCP Foundation has encountered with unsettling frequency. It's been recorded manifesting off a number of different coastlines, and who even knows how often it's manifested out in deeper waters. Despite its Euclid classification, containing this anomaly has been no mean feat. It's involved shutting down a number of coastlines completely on the pretense of animal research, the administration of Class A amnestics to witnesses and Class B amnestics to victims, as well as a complicated disinformation campaign to suppress photos and reports of the phenomenon online. But even with all of these containment procedures in place, many have still lost their lives to the jaws of SCP-054-FR, or the Great White Wave. By the Foundation's current estimations, recorded attacks by the Great White Wave have been fatal 68% of the time with survivors often experiencing wounds consistent with those of an abnormally bad shark attack. In case our opening case study didn't clue you in, the Great White Wave is a set of ravenous shark jaws, most closely resembling the Carcharodon caracarius, or Great White Shark, manifesting inside ocean waves. Any waves over 4 meters tall can become a host to a Great White Wave event with there theoretically being no upper limit to the size of a wave capable of causing this kind of anomalous catastrophe. The power of the Great White Wave's bite is also directly proportional to the size of the wave it manifests on too, meaning that, in theory, a tsunami playing host to the Great White Wave could devour an entire town. While every attack that the Foundation has failed to prevent is, of course, a tragedy, the number of attacks has allowed the Foundation to uncover some extremely interesting data. For example, while attacks could happen anywhere at sea, they're most common in the 250-meter ocean radius around a coastline. When a human or non-aquatic animal is present in the attack zone, great white waves move at three times the speed of a normal wave in pursuit of its unfortunate prey. The great white wave isn't picky about its prey either. Divers, swimmers, and even aquatic vehicles like boats or jet skis have been devoured, though the waves seem to show a particular preference for surfers, which is gnarly in the typical sense, but not in the sense that surfers say it. 
The ghostly shark jaws will only become visible next to the part of the wave closest to the victim, meaning that they often aren't spotted until it's too late. But that doesn't mean it can't consume multiple victims at once. As you saw with the unfortunate sailors and pirates in our opening story, many sets of jaws can manifest in the case of having multiple victims to devour. The actual consumption occurs as the wave crashes down upon the victim, so the only recorded way to survive being on the wrong side of the Great White Wave is to dive into the water before the wave crashes. The French division of the Foundation conducted a series of experiments in hopes of understanding the dynamics of the Great White Wave, which had results both encouraging and disturbing. Based on non-anomalous sharks' ability to electromagnetically sense blood from extreme distances, the Foundation wanted to see if the same could be said for the Great White Wave. After pouring several liters of animal blood into the water of an affected area, they found that a Great White Wave regularly manifested within two minutes, crashing down and devouring the affected blood. However, an extension of this experiment found an alarming result. The same amount of human blood attracted a Great White Wave in under 60 seconds. Even a small amount of human blood attracted a Great White Wave significantly faster than a large amount of animal blood. Interestingly, non-anomalous Great White Sharks will rarely ever attack humans on purpose. Whenever they do, it's often because they mistook a swimming or surfing human for a seal, their natural prey. You'll often find that most shark attack victims are only bitten once, a common shark behavior known as a testing bite. Once the shark realizes that it isn't eating a seal, it will quickly move along. Yes, this probably won't make the person with a shark bite taken out of them feel any better, but the shark didn't truly want to eat them. Great white waves, by contrast, enjoy eating humans significantly more than animals, but that doesn't mean they won't eat all kinds of animals. Several maritime birds were eaten by a great white wave when they flew in front of the wave that was over four meters tall. We suppose the great white wave has never heard the salty old sea dog tale that it's bad luck to kill a seabird. The Foundation discovered a few useful things from their experiments. If you want to avoid getting eaten by the great white wave, you should avoid getting into the water if you're suffering from any kind of injury. Wounded people are four times as likely to be the victims of attacks with the Great White Wave manifesting in less than 60 seconds. You can also improve your chances of surviving by following Sam Neill's advice from Jurassic Park. Don't move a muscle. Movement, especially panicked thrashing, has a tendency to lure this unique aquatic predator into your vicinity. But here comes the disappointing part. Other than staying in a landlocked area, there's basically nothing else you can do in order to stop a Great White Wave event. Weapons have proven completely ineffective, with the bullets of even the highest caliber weapons simply disappearing into the wall of water. Stealth, beyond avoiding movement, is also ineffective. No attempt to camouflage the smell of humans has been effective in helping them evade the detection of the Great White Wave. You can probably imagine how many unfortunate D-classes got devoured in the process of finding that one out. The Great White Wave is a disturbing reminder that perhaps we shouldn't worry about what lurks in the deep ocean, when nothing has a greater capacity to destroy us than the unimaginable power of the ocean itself. Sometimes certain situations in life have you wishing for a quick way out. Waiting to have a meeting with your boss, heading into an important test, or getting ready to have an awkward conversation with a romantic partner who just texted that, we need to talk. All of these can be pretty hard to deal with. In times like these, it can be easy to want to run away. We feel a part of ourselves saying that it would just be better to just bail out as quickly as we can. But just because choosing to make an exit is often the quickest way to avoid a problem, that doesn't always mean it's the best solution. Especially when your means of escape venture into the world of the anomalous. Sometimes you have to face things head on. But if you are still really in need of a quick way out, then SCP-120 might just be what you're looking for. But don't say we didn't warn you. Now, hear us out. Yes, we know that it's a children's paddling pool. You might have even owned one yourself back in the day. When the warm summer months came rolling around, your younger self would have begged your poor parents to spend several minutes in the sun's glaring heat, breathlessly inflating a pool just like it, then filling it with water from the garden hose. All so that you could put on your water wings, have a splash around for an hour or two, then go inside to dry off. The result? 
leaving the water in that paddling pool to go stagnant as it got left outside in the summer sun, filled with dirt, leaves, and mosquito larvae while you decided that air conditioning in Super Mario was a better way to spend your time. But SCP-120, as will likely come as no surprise, is no ordinary children's paddling pool. Sure, it might look like an ordinary paddling pool at first, pastel pink in color only two and a half meters in diameter and less than a meter tall. It's even made out of that same typical flimsy plastic that needs to be inflated with air to hold its shape. You know, the kind that absorbed all the heat from the sunlight while your younger self was out there splashing around, just waiting to burn your skin at the slightest touch. But the first key difference between SCP-120 and the pool you had while you were growing up is, well, this one is indestructible. Despite being made from common earth plastics, SCP-120 cannot be damaged or destroyed by any conventional means. Though the material it is made from will still flex when pressure is applied and is soft to the touch, it also possesses an anomalous tensile strength. In other words, SCP-120 cannot be ripped, stretched, or otherwise destroyed like an ordinary paddling pool can. And the SCP Foundation would know. They've destroyed their own fair share of paddling pools in the research labs. Okay, so SCP-120 is an indestructible child's paddling pool. Surely there has to be more to it than that. Otherwise, why would it be such an important object to the SCP Foundation? Well, you're right. There's much more to it than that. After all, they don't call it the teleporting paddling pool for nothing. Within the pool itself is a glowing substance, almost like a liquid, but somehow unlike any in existence, at least in this dimension. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, this liquid doesn't behave in quite the same way you would expect from, say, water, for example. And its physical properties don't align with the rules of our universe. Let's say you fill your ordinary paddling pool with water, just like you would have done on a hot summer day as a kid. Now, because of the properties of the water, you know you could easily grab a drinking glass from your kitchen cabinet and fill it up from the pool no problem. However, the substance within SCP-120 does not obey these same rules. You simply cannot grab a glass or other container and scoop up some of this glowing liquid. See what we mean? The liquid is only really a liquid in name and can't be manipulated in the same way that an ordinary liquid can. However, it does share the appearance of being a liquid, with its surface rippling and shimmering often as it moves. So put all that together and what is the conclusion you get? That this substance definitely does not exist in our own dimension. Instead, it is from somewhere else entirely. By far the biggest difference between SCP-120 and any ordinary pastel pink colored Walmart paddling pool is the property that the Foundation is most interested in. In fact, this paddling pool is part of the oh-so-rare category of SCPs that actually have a practical use, thanks to this anomalous property. Human beings, along with the clothes that they're wearing and any items they may be carrying, will be teleported to one of 11 different locations should they fall into the paddling pool. To reiterate, they don't call it the teleporting paddling pool for nothing. There are some small limitations to SCP-120's teleportation ability. For one, the weight of the objects or loads being carried through it by one person cannot exceed the maximum threshold of just under 38 kilos, or almost 84 pounds. There are also only 11 destinations that SCP-120 can send someone to, and these can't be pre-programmed or predetermined beforehand. Any subject stepping into the pool must be conscious, carrying weight under the specified amount, be biologically a human being, and can only use the teleporting paddle pool one person at a time. Meeting these requirements means that the pool will work as expected. The only repercussion of not meeting the aforementioned criteria is simply that the pool will not function. Any who have stepped into the pool carrying too much weight, for example, have merely reported that their feet touched the surface beneath the glowing liquid. First encountered by the SCP Foundation in September of 1992, SCP-120 was found in California following reports of children going missing in the area. There, they discovered the teleporting paddling pool and brought it back to Site-19 for testing. It is currently unknown how many children went missing, or if they were ever recovered. Regardless, remember how we talked about making a quick exit at the start of this video? Well, that's because the Foundation's biggest interest in SCP-120 was to use it as a means of rapid evacuation for their most important group of people, the Overwatch Command, also known as the O5 Council. 
During a major emergency like a containment breach, the O5s would use the paddling pool to escape to safety. As you may have gathered from how we've described it, SCP-120 has the inert ability to instantly relocate a person from one place to another. According to the theories of the SCP Foundation's researchers, it likely does this by allowing the subject to pass through one or more dimensions alternate to our own. We've also mentioned that one of the limits of SCP-120 is that it can only send someone to one of 11 different places. These are distinguished by the liquid-like substance contained in SCP-120 undergoing a change of color. By sending disposable members of D-Class personnel carrying radio beacons through, the Foundation has been able to compile a list of these destinations, and they are as follows. The first of these is the Pacific Ocean, denoted by a blue glow of SCP-120's liquid. When traveling here, subjects are deposited about two meters above the surface of the Pacific. Since this location was discovered during testing, a Foundation vessel named the SCPS Demeter has been stationed at these coordinates. To the public, this ship is known instead as the USS Nassau, operating under the cover story of being a simple meteorological boat. But why would the Foundation leave a boat here? The current position of this ship means that anyone traveling to the Pacific through the teleporting paddling pool will appear in the vessel's cargo hold. In a crisis, important personnel could be sent to the Demeter, and the boat could even be used to hold less dangerous SCP objects if they could be sent through SCP-120. Of course, teleporting oneself aboard a boat might be a bit trickier, say, during a storm. If the Demeter is moved too far from its current position, there's a chance someone might end up teleporting inside one of the ship's walls. The next location is Greenland, where SCP-120 will send someone when its liquid glows white. Arriving here, one will find themselves in a facility that the Foundation has established on site. The cover story for this one is that this building is part of an expansion of the oil industry. What members of the public are not privy to is the true function of the facility. The Foundation set up this site specifically to perform the same function as their ship, the Demeter. The facility even has an airstrip and a refueling station there, meaning any who use the paddling pool to teleport to Greenland can further relocate themselves aboard a Foundation aircraft if necessary. If the liquid in SCP-120 ever changes to become a deep black in color, it will then lead to one of five possible points that are all practically identical. These destinations are various Earth-Moon Lagrange points. In celestial mechanics, a Lagrange point is the area near two large bodies orbiting in space. To put it in simple terms, in this case, these are points between the Earth and the Moon where the gravitational forces of both balance each other out. This is what makes these Lagrange points such a good location for satellites, as the equal forces make it easier for a satellite to achieve the right path of orbit. So objects or people sent through SCP-120 when the water blackens will end up at either Lagrange point 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. These points are located all the way around the Earth and are directly between the Earth and the Moon whenever the latter makes its orbit around the former essentially jumping through the teleporting paddling pool when it has been dialed to one of these locations is like taking a high dive into the cold endless vacuum of space ending up lost forever impossible to retrieve the scp foundation plans to potentially use these scp-120 destinations to dispose of anomalous objects during a crisis as a way to prevent them from falling into the wrong hands now we mentioned that scp-120's liquid will glow white when it's linked to the destination in greenland but the same also occurs when it's dialed to the snow-capped mountains of the Himalayas. This famous mountain range in southern and eastern Asia is home to a number of planet Earth's tallest peaks, most notably Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world, resting at the border between Nepal and China. Unlike some of the other destinations, the Foundation has made little change to this one. No boats or bases for anyone to materialize into safety have been designated to the area. Instead, there's just an 8-meter hole where the bodies of D-Class test subjects have been disposed of, hidden from view by a canopy. Only in extreme cases would the O5 Council ever want to evacuate here. Should SCP-120 display a yellow glow, then someone traveling through it will arrive in the Sahara Desert in Africa. The Sahara is being famous for being the largest hot desert in the entire world, only beaten in size by the Northern Arctic and Antarctic deserts. Located here is a much smaller Foundation installation, an outpost that would most likely be ineffective for housing anomalous objects, but in an evacuation could prove to be a useful hiding place for important SCP documents or even for members of the Overwatch Command. 
If SCP-120 produces a brown glow in its liquid, it will transport a subject to the Gobi Desert, a region in northern China and southern Mongolia famous for its unique ecosystem. Here, much like the Sahara location, the Foundation has established an identical small outpost. However, this one comes with the threat of another anomaly, SCP-4024. This is a saltwater spring that is gradually expanding across the Gobi, which, much like the teleporting paddling pool, has the ability to displace people and objects to an unknown location. Finally, should SCP-120 ever emit a subdued gray-colored glow, traveling through it will lead to an area in the Sea of Rains. But that's not a sea on Earth, that's on the moon. And it's not so much a sea as it is a vast plain. Luckily, if you were to end up here, the Foundation has already thought ahead and set up a station on the lunar surface, and it's thought to be one of their safest. So at least if the teleporting paddling pool sent you to the moon, you would be able to survive. That's reassuring. Of course, the real problem is, how do you get back home? That's a question for another day. Just like we told you at the start of the video, sometimes it's better just to face your problems head on because certain escapes can lead to more complications than you bargain for. It is certainly not unheard of for a young girl to wake up in the middle of the night, looking for a glass of water. It is somewhat more exceptional when this late night water run results in many, many deaths. Unless, of course, you're dealing with a very special young girl. SCP-053, also known as, well, the young girl. She possesses the innate ability to inspire delusions, paranoia, and eventually homicidal rage in anyone who spends too long around her. Which, as you can probably imagine, makes it hard to live a normal life. One night, the young girl woke up to something incredibly strange. The door of her cell, typically tightly sealed, was wide open and a strange flashing red light was shining in through the hallway. The sound of a distant alarm is what had woken her up. What the young girl didn't know was that the sight confining her had just experienced a mass containment breach as a result of a major electrical malfunction. Some of the most terrifying creatures imaginable were roaming the halls in search of violence and carnage. But when the young girl got up and wandered out of her bedroom, she only wanted a glass of water to quench her midnight thirst. She wandered down a long, plain hallway, washed intermittently and red by the red flashing emergency lights. She rubbed the sleep out of her eyes and yawned, all this strange commotion. Maybe she's just having a bad dream, but what seems like a bad dream to her is a bona fide living nightmare for everyone around her. A few halls over, security personnel were being devoured alive by SCP-682. SCP-106, the old man, had just dragged a senior researcher into his pocket dimension to do unspeakable things to him. And a group of terrified admin staff are being lured out by what they think is a group of mobile task force operatives, but is actually a pack of hungry SCP-939 imitating their voices. Still, the young girl persisted in her quest for a refreshing drink, even as security personnel began to fan out through the building, hoping to get control over this rapidly devolving situation. A group of five armed security officers ran into the hallway and attempted to intercept the young girl, but the high stress they were feeling was only accelerated by the effects of the young girl's anomalous powers. They started to feel bugs crawling all over their skin. They started to get the sense that their fellow security officers weren't even people, but monsters wearing human skin suits. Their paranoia soon evolved into a blistering rage. Each of the men pulled out their guns and began firing at each other until only one was left standing, wounded but alive. With all the others dead, the object of his rage now became the young girl herself. He understood then that it was all her doing that she made him do this. She was a monstrous little creature who took pleasure in twisting the minds of human beings into terrible forms. In reality, the young girl had no such feelings. Her powers were passive, she had no control over them. She even suffered from some kind of strange mental block that left her completely unaware that her powers were even taking effect. She was, in a sense, completely innocent. As the security officer pointed his gun at the young girl as she began walking into a nearby break room, he experienced her secondary anomalous effect. Anyone who attempts to hurt her will immediately die from either a heart attack or a stroke. The security officer suddenly felt an intense pain, sharp and brutal, exploding in his chest. He collapsed, 
dead before he even hit the ground, and the young girl had no idea. She couldn't if she tried. In the break room, the young girl found exactly what she was looking for. A classic office water cooler, complete with a stack of plastic cups. Perfect. She carefully took one of the cups and pulled down the lever on the cooler. Watching her cup fill as the tank above the cooler bubbled, she took a sip. Cool, refreshing spring water. Just what the doctor ordered. But the young girl suddenly looked up, shocked, to see that the tank above the water cooler was now shaking violently as though it was going to explode. What was going on here? Had she broken it? She stepped back, dropping the rest of her cup of water to the ground. She felt frightened. That's when a crack formed in the plastic tank and the water began slithering out. Not dripping or pouring, slithering, as though it had moved with mind and purpose. And that's because in this case, it did. The young girl hadn't just drank any water. She had drunk half a cup of water from SCP-054, the water nymph, a mysterious sentient woman made entirely from water. Much like the young girl, the water nymph is often a misunderstood anomaly, one that has received far more harm from the cruel treatment of the SCP Foundation than she's ever given to another. She's a naturally curious and compassionate creature whose trust has been abused. So when the containment breach alarm started to sound, much like the rest of the Foundation staff, she had tried to hide and find cover, not wanting to fall into the crosshairs of a far more dangerous and hostile anomaly. She had chosen the water cooler in break room 3, which seemed like a genius idea, until the young girl turned up. After years of being experimented on by Foundation researchers, the water nymph wasn't just about to tolerate more mistreatment. Whatever this strange little creature was who had just consumed some of her body, the water nymph would fight back and make it regret ever thinking that it could take advantage of her. The young girl, who really had just made an innocent mistake, began to panic and run as frightening, slithering tendrils of pure water came slithering after her. As the unfortunate security guard discovered earlier, trying to attack the young girl was typically a one-way ticket to a heart attack or fatal cerebral event. But seeing as the water nymph had neither a heart nor a brain, she was invulnerable, and the young girl was terrified. She ran out of the room, past the bodies of the men who had killed each other due to her influence outside. She wasn't even able to notice them. She kept running, and the water of the water nymph came slithering after her. The water nymph had never been the vengeful type, but after the abuse she'd suffered, she learned the value of putting her liquid foot down. She would not tolerate mistreatment even from a being this small. The young girl kept running, breathing heavily. Because of the nature of her anomalous abilities, nobody could intervene and help her. Occasionally, she had run into groups of Foundation personnel trying to fight their way through the chaos, only to be anomalously affected and become part of the chaos themselves. They became violent, deranged monsters and started attacking each other, punching and biting. As they fell to the ground in a brawling pile, the young girl had to desperately climb over them as the streak of furious liquid followed her. Meanwhile, across the facility, the vicious, psychopathic old man was hungry for more. His mouth stretched into a wide, sadistic grin, and he continued walking further into the base. He would find new victims. He would feel their fear and drink in their dying screams. Several mobile task forces were dispatched from other nearby containment facilities. They'd likely reach the embattled site within the hour, but how many lives would be lost before then? The death count was already well into the double digits. After all this running, the young girl was getting tired. It was rare that she needed to truly avoid and escape a threat like this, and as such, she wasn't exactly prepared for such a scenario. She found her way into a broom closet and locked herself inside. Hiding among mops and brooms, she tried to quiet her breathing, holding a tiny hand over her mouth. Red flashes continued to occasionally illuminate the corners of the door. She breathed in and out, in and out. Was something waiting outside? The young girl gasped as water started bubbling underneath the door. It started looking around her feet, then rising up from the ground. To the young girl, it was astonishing. The water was forming the shape of a woman standing right in front of her. Her lower lip trembled with fear. For a moment, she was at a loss for words. Then she gulped dryly and began to speak in a soft little voice. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. I promise I was just thirsty. The water nymph tilted her head slightly, confused. Did this tiny child really mean this? Was it an honest mistake? 
After all the terrible things that had been done to her, the water nymph had difficulty trusting humans. But as the young girl started to cry for reasons she couldn't quite understand, the water nymph felt the urge to comfort her. Perhaps she wasn't with the Foundation. Perhaps this girl was just another prisoner. They were allies, not enemies. While the water nymph couldn't speak, as a show of solidarity, she began to transform. She got smaller, herself becoming a little girl made of water, almost mirroring SCP-053. She raised a hand and waved. The young girl giggled, seemingly put at ease. It had been a long time since she met a new friend around here, and it seemed like the water nymph was ready to change that. Maybe they could escape this place together. The young girl opened the door and the two of them ran out together, passing through an adjacent hallway. The young girl ran while the water nymph slithered formlessly along behind her. They managed to sneak around and avoid detection from the many anomalies and Foundation guards duking it out for supremacy in the chaotic halls of the facility. In a sense, it provided the perfect cover for the unlikely duo to escape this bizarre situation. But they weren't out of the metaphorical woods yet. First, they were cornered by a trio of paranoid guards, all wielding handguns. However, the young girl's nightmarish ambient ability came in handy once more. The three men lost their minds and started killing each other, giving the young girl and the water nymph more time to escape and keep moving, though they were about to encounter the deadliest threat of all. The young girl took point, leading the water nymph down the nearest hallway, when suddenly, SCP-106, the old man, emerged from the wall right in front of her. He had such anomalous malice in him that the young girl's powers was effectively useless against him. He grinned and approached her, his arms extended, ready to ferry her off to the nightmare of his pocket dimension. The young girl had never felt so afraid, until suddenly, the water nymph slithered in between them, and she assumed her full humanoid form once more, forming a wall between the young girl and the old man. This turned out to be the perfect way to save the young girl's life. SCP-106 has historically found liquid barriers incredibly confusing, and it's been widely considered to be one of the few ways to effectively delay the old man's rampages. Seizing the moment, the young girl turned and ran away. The water nymph had just saved her life. Sadly for them, neither the water nymph nor the young girl escaped that day. The mobile task forces arrived and took control of the facility again, recontaining the various anomalies who had escaped. But even if they never saw each other again, the water nymph and the young girl would forever remember how they helped each other on that incredibly strange day. Diego had only just found his footing when it gave out underneath him again. Crashing to the ground, he threw both arms over his head just in time to protect his skull from the rain of boulders that came down past him. They grazed his arms and jarred painfully against his muscles, but it was better than having them hit him in the head. Without a moment to spare, Diego got straight up to his feet and continued running back down the trail he had been trying to follow. The ground shifted and lurched in all directions under him, threatening to throw off his balance at any moment. Having lived in Chile his whole life, he had gotten used to earthquakes, but he had never been in the center of one like this. The problem was that the trail he had been following to get up here was disappearing fast as the dust swirled into the air and boulders landing all around him. He just had to keep running in this direction and hope for the best. There weren't any other options. But suddenly, he found himself running uphill. Stumbling forwards, Diego tried desperately to get his bearings. He had spent the previous three hours hiking up the mountains, so how was it that now that he had turned around and gone back, he was still going uphill? It was almost as if the ground was changing shape beneath him as he ran. Dust filled his lungs as he tried to wipe it away from his burning eyes. Yes, the ground was definitely going uphill, but it felt almost as if it was lifting itself up beneath him, as if some tectonic plates were grinding together, creating a new mountain beneath his feet. Diego lurched unsteadily and grabbed the nearest rock to keep his balance, feeling the ground lifting higher and higher beneath him. Then, all of a sudden, the cloud of dust broke, and he was in fresh air rising ever higher into the sky. The Andes Mountains stabbed out of the clouds all around him, 
cutting beautiful shapes across the horizon. He felt his own mountain steadily growing taller than any of them. He dropped down on all floors and clutched at the ground in terror as he tried his best to take in the shape of what he was now standing upon. How far would you go to prevent a cosmic level disaster? It's one thing to save your friends and family from an armed murderer. It's another thing to fight for your country in a world war. We can even just about imagine what it means to fight for our planet, to save our species from climate change, to save our world from a meteorite. But what would a cosmic disaster look like? A calamity so broad in scale that it surpasses our ability to even perceive the threat. We could point our most advanced telescope into deep space and look straight down the middle of it and never know it was even there. And if that threat was not simply to the survival of humanity or planet Earth, but to the survival of existence itself, how far would we go to prevent it? What cruel and inhumane measures would you take to have such a threat? Or better yet, how many people would you kill to save the world? This debate is raging right now as you sit here and watch this video. Not among the Foundation, but between two SCPs so grand in scale and so advanced in nature that the Foundation has no option but to sit and listen as the pair debate what to do with the human race. SCP-4568-1 was not difficult to discover once it started moving. In fact, it was almost impossible to ignore. Earthquakes have been tearing across South America for centuries, destroying homes, taking the lives of innocent people, and fundamentally changing the shape of our planet itself. What most people do not realize, however, is that the fault line running through the Andes mountain range has actually largely been dormant during this period. The source of the earthquakes has come from something far more mysterious. Our innocent hiker, Diego, had been spending the week walking among the Andes when the earthquake struck. You would be forgiven for assuming, as Diego did, that the ground rising beneath his feet was a new mountain forming as the tectonic plates clashed together. But the staggering reality of the situation was that he found himself hiking along the back of SCP-4568-1. As the creature raised its head into the air, Diego saw the head of a serpent lifting several kilometers away from him. Its body stretched and wound its way through the mountain range, filling the valleys and running beneath his feet. The scale of SCP-4568-1 is hard to convey. Measuring over 500 kilometers in length, this serpent is longer than most U.S. states, with a 20-kilometer width. Standing on the back of it quite literally feels like standing on a mountain range. For context, the horizon at sea level is about 4.8 kilometers away, so multiply that by 4 and you'll get a sense of just how wide this thing is. Even small movements from this SCP are enough to trigger continent-wide earthquakes, with tremors being felt all the way around the world. Upon the initial discovery of this SCP, the Foundation was unable to determine why it remains dormant for such long periods and seems to only awaken sporadically and for brief periods of time. That was, until SCP-4568-2 was discovered. It is little wonder that the second serpent took so long to be found. Its body is comprised almost entirely of water, sand, algae, and steam. It does not show up on sonar scans and is incredibly difficult to detect in the water, even visually. Its form is loosely defined while dormant. With broadly similar measurements to SCP-4568-1, this serpent roams the South Pacific Ocean. Any marine creatures that swim into the SCP's body find themselves undergoing beneficial mutations. Crabs grow extra pinchers, bottom feeders grow larger mouths, and sharks find themselves developing heightened senses and even extra hearts. These marine animals seem to undergo virtually no distress and are free to exit and re-enter the SCP's body at any point. Initially, SCP-4568-2 was believed to be the peaceful one of the pair. Both serpents seemed to become active at the same time. While on land, SCP-4568-1 would wreak havoc with magnitude 7 earthquakes in major metropolitan areas. The sea serpent's function was less well understood. Employing resonant frequencies and vibrations, 
This SCP was able to give its watery body a distinct form as it rose up from the ocean and towered above the waves. In order to maintain its shape and control its movements, this SCP employed a huge amount of energy. However, the Foundation quickly observed that it was rarely able to maintain its form for very long. As soon as the sea serpent rose out of the water, its mountainous twin would begin to move, sending tremors around the world that disrupted the frequency needed for SCP-4568-2 to remain animate. Exhausted and unable to maintain its shape, the sea serpent would fall into another period of dormancy, gliding lazily through the oceans. But this dormancy suited the Foundation. Without the constant seismic tremors, researchers could work fast. Two operating bases were set up to monitor each SCP. Two mirrored bases with mirrored teams in constant communication with one another. As soon as one team made a discovery, it was conveyed to the others and vice versa. One operating base was set up high in the Andes Mountains, specifically designed to be as earthquake-proof as possible, capable of withstanding earthquakes up to 9.9 .9 magnitude. Meanwhile, in the South Pacific Ocean, an underwater research center was built just above the seabed, with regular vessels drifting out into the unknown to gather whatever data they could about the great SCPs. Several early findings stood out. Firstly, SCP-4568-1 appeared to have a very different internal structure from its twin. Researchers initially assumed that the creature would be largely composed of earth minerals and rock, as its exterior appearance suggested. However, scans of its body indicated the presence of what can only be assumed to be artificially created components. Great gears resembling clockwork structures and even rudimentary circuitry were present throughout the creature's body. The function or origin of these gears has yet to be determined, especially as there is no evident way that their movement corresponds to the autonomy and movement of the serpent itself. The far more striking discovery, however, came when the SCP Foundation discovered a way to communicate with the two beasts. Ultra-low frequency waves capable of traveling vast distances, even light years, were discovered to be emitted from the two serpents' heads at intermittent periods. The Foundation had to develop some of the largest antenna ever created to pick up these frequencies and interpret the data coming through them. What they found were two twins locked in a fierce debate about the fate of humanity and the universe itself. It was only then that the motivations of these two serpents started to make sense. In 2010, almost as soon as the Foundation was able to tap into the frequency, they were contacted directly by SCP-4568-1. Foundation, I know that you can hear me. I will not apologize for my actions. I know that I am the reason that millions of your kind face their demise. I know your pain, and I feel it too. But I shall never apologize for it. I simply ask you to listen to myself and to my word cannot be translated. You are curious. You can be patient. Exercise that, and you may one day understand. And listen, the Foundation did. Efforts to contain or destroy the two serpents were put on the back burner. Instead, Foundation agents prioritized spreading disinformation across South America and beyond about the source of these earthquakes. The two serpents are far too large and far too powerful to overcome or contain. Instead, the Foundation prioritized the use of amnestic drugs, disinformation, and the creation of fringe conspiracy groups to discredit any claims of the Serpent's respective existences. Meanwhile, some of the most senior leadership figures in the Foundation were and still are locked in a fierce debate as to what to do with the twin serpents. By listening to the communication between the two SCPs, the Foundation discovered that SCP-4568-2 is intent on wiping out the entire human race. The only thing that has prevented it from being able to do so thus far has been the existence of the other serpent. Every time that SCP-4568-2 begins to mount an attack on humanity, its land-bearing twin triggers enormous earthquakes to disrupt its progress. But why would the Sea Serpent want to destroy the human race? As Foundation generals gathered in the Deep Sea Operations Base, SCP-4568-2 came to the observation window to look them in the eyes as it told them, 
I am sure you can see it. How your world dies a little bit more every day. Mostly by your own hand, no? You poison the oceans, taint the rivers, blacken the skies. You do not need angels of death to destroy your world. But there is something else. I see it in the bottom of your eyes. Something unforgettable. Unconceivable ideas cloaked in madness and impossible colors. Do you think I would let you drag the rest of the world down with yourselves? Do you think I will leave this world, my world, to die in flames? It sees your world, and it comes in fives. Since this revelation, the Foundation has poured countless hours and resources into trying to identify a cosmic threat. For well over a decade, many of the smartest scientists the world has to offer have looked to the night sky, scanning for this impossible color this shroud of madness, but to no avail. Some within the Foundation believe the Serpent is lying, trying to make up an excuse to justify its genocide. But information from SCP-4568-1 seems to confirm everyone's worst fears. Your minds burn bright from this film. All of humanity shines from this rock, like a candle in a dark room. It sees you. An idea exists only because something thought of it. Have you ever considered how such terrible concepts could have been given form? What kind of atrocious mind could even think about it? Humans cannot conceive the colorless green. What if you are playing into this creature's hands? There appears to be an underlying implication that ideas are the source of power somehow. This colorless green this unimaginable cosmic threat seems to be a monstrous idea incarnate. But whose idea? Humanity's? There is a deep lore that the two serpents discuss with one another. One that makes little sense even to this day to the Foundation. They talk of gods and goddesses, deities of flesh, of steel and gears, and of the Fives. Quite what these creatures are, if they are even creatures at all, is a mystery to the Foundation. Researchers have not discovered a way of communicating back with the two serpents directly. Attempts to mimic their language or transmit signals asking questions to them have largely been ignored. Instead, they address humanity and the Foundation as a whole, seeming to take the view of the human race as being a collective hive mind, one that they are evidently able to tap into. The pair seem uninterested in informing us as to exactly what this threat is, or explaining who the gods and goddesses are. Perhaps they assume we know these things already, or more likely, they believe that our consciousness is not yet capable of perceiving the scale and depth of the concepts that they are debating. What is clear, however, is their shared understanding that if humanity were to be eliminated, the candle was to be blown out, this cosmic threat would pass by. The pair have names. Trenten is the Land Serpent, while remaining dormant much of the time in an enormous cave system beneath the Andes Mountains. This serpent seems keen to help the Foundation in some way. Kai Kai, the Sea Serpent, is intent on sacrificing the human race for a greater good, one far beyond our understanding. Speaking to the Foundation in the Andes Mountains, Trenten gave a short speech that served both as encouragement and a terrible warning of the darkness to come. It is something I like about you, Foundation, about mankind. While it is easy to just take the simplest path, to just give up, there will always be some among you who refuse this path, who do the right thing. Maybe not all of you are this strong, but I can see it in your methods, those so-called containment procedures. There will always be someone who stands up against the dark, even if it takes a thousand million years to emerge victorious. Maybe you can stop the fifth. After all, ideas can be killed with better ideas, even if it takes a thousand million years. The ships crash and splinter against the rock. Men scream as they're tossed into the water by the force of it, but they don't fear drowning. They fear something far more powerful and terrifying. 
As they land in the water, huge pitch black hands reach up to receive them. In a place beyond darkness and impurity, all things will be revealed. Those in pursuit of spiritual enlightenment are sure to find it on the high seas of life, so long as they map out their course with precision and sail dauntlessly towards it. But their souls must also be wary, for wherever there are oceans to explore, there be monsters. It is a raining morning on the coast of the island of Kyushu. A modest fishing vessel gently crests over the waves of the Sea of Japan, carrying with it a successful haul back to the port of the rural settlement it departed from a couple of hours prior. The crew are all tradespeople local to the area, and many are parents and grandparents whose children have long since grown up and left their home village for the opportunities of city life. For the older generation that was left behind, the bounty of the sea is all they know. The marine life that the aging fisherfolk bring in is the lifeblood of the village economy. The population depends on the kindness of nature to avoid falling into poverty and is accustomed to working against the elements when it becomes necessary. Tsunamis and typhoons have threatened the balance of this way of life before, but over several decades, the villagers have proven themselves resilient to the most extreme fluctuations of natural forces. But even a firm backbone beaten into shape by hard work and suffering will buckle and bend in the churning maelstrom of alien tides. A black domed shape in the valley between passing wakes heralds the arrival of a fearsome giant. With no further indication of its intentions, the great dark thing emerges from the depths. The fisherfolk steady their vessel as a gargantuan ripple disrupts the surface of the water, giving way to a humanoid figure that was a full five meters in length. When the fishing boat had left the harbor, the weather posed no obstacle save for a veil of fog. But now, in the face of this unfathomable being, the pelting rainwater swirled around the sturdy rubber boots of the crew as if the ocean below was beckoning them to surrender to the darkness. An icy blade of fear pierced the heart of Mr. Nakamura, the man who now commanded the wheel of the ship. His efforts to make sense of the horrible sight in front of him brought him back to a moment from his distant childhood. His parents had taken him to visit a Buddhist temple in the countryside, and when he recklessly wandered off, young Nakamura wound up lost in the dark corridors beneath the grounds. To a child his age, it seemed as though he was trapped in an inescapable labyrinth, the only thing the boy could muster the strength to do was head towards the faint glow of torchlight. He soon came upon a statue of the Amitabha Buddha, sitting peacefully between the contained flames of the torches. Nakamura relished the temporary peace of the moment, but his composure did not remain intact for long. A hand from the dark grabbed his wrist, and at that moment, he looked up to see the bald head of one of the temple monks. The orange-robed man's eyes were fixed downward at the boy and contained a mixture of contempt and relief that Nakamura had never seen before. Amitabha, you are found. Over 70 years later, Mr. Nakamura could see nothing in the terrible giant that had besieged his boat so clearly as he saw the silhouette of a Buddhist monk. But even with the ominous recollection of that formative memory coursing through the old fisherman's body like an electrical current, it was obvious that the monster was human only in shape. The flesh of the thing was the color of octopus ink, and its eyes, its bulbous and disquieting eyes, were big even in proportion to the giant's colossal head. Worse, despite their almost cartoonish absurdity, the eyes of the thing seemed to hold within them that same barely defined look of bewildered judgment. It was too much for Mr. Nakamura to take, and when his heart gave out, his hands threw the ship wheel in a jerking arc that brushed it straight against the waves. Most of the other fisherfolk were too stunned by the giant to properly get their bearings, and multiple members of the crew, Nakamura included, tumbled overboard into the waves. Those who remained on deck could see that the wheel was drifting aimlessly, or rather would have, if their focus was not still drawn to the black monk that had arisen just moments ago. The giant raised a massive dark hand above the waters, and arranged its fingers in such a way as to mimic the Vitarka hand gesture seen in many Buddhist statues. As if on cue, 
A consortium of black, rubbery tentacles broke the surface of the ocean and fanned out towards the boat like so many grasping hands. One of these pseudopods wrapped itself around the barely conscious body of Mr. Nakamura, plucking him from under the water and raising him into the misty sea air. In response to the tentacles, the other fisherfolk panicked and scrambled back onto the boat, with those aboard extending nets and oars to assist their fellow crew. Two terrifying minutes passed before the apparent black thing vanished into the mist along with Mr. Nakamura. His longtime peers and co-workers panted and sputtered, trying to make any kind of sense of what just happened. When they made their way home to the village port, the only question that seemed to matter was which of them would have to place the upsetting call to Nakamura's daughters in Tokyo. Who could bear to deliver the news to her that her steadfast father had been taken by a giant of the sea? While thankfully rare, incidents such as the sudden nautical abduction of Mr. Nakamura are not unexplained or even isolated to cases in the Sea of Japan. Since as early as the 12th century, sightings of aquatic titans resembling night black monks have been recorded by a precursor to the SCP Foundation known as the Bureau of Onmayo. Back then, these creatures were referred to as umibozo, or sea bonds, bonds being a Chinese and Japanese term for Buddhist monk. In the current day, the umibozu have been reclassified as SCP-2781, and because of the predatory way that the giants hunt their targets and their extreme resistance to containment, they have been designated Keter class. As of right now, there are thought to be upwards of 900 instances of SCP-2781 in existence. While SCP-2781 entities could potentially appear anywhere in the epilogic layer of the planet's oceans, they have historically tended towards inhabiting the waters around countries where there have been a pervasive and widespread practice of the Buddhist faith. An archived file recovered from the Bureau of Onmayo reveals that a group of East Asian pirates, or Wako, ran afoul of one of the creatures while searching for treasure in a seaside cave. The seafaring cutthroats had previously fired on a trading ship from Korea and driven it against the rocks of a remote Japanese island. Many of the goods on board had been carried in by the tides and required strong swimmers to access. But during the hunt for spoils, the Wako were interrupted by the malevolent presence of an entity that manifested itself within the coastal crevasse. The Yumibozu, or SCP-2781, could not stretch to its full height within the cavern, and thus glared down at the pirates with an acute angle to its posture. The pirates were completely defenseless, having left behind their metal weapons and guns on the ship out of concern for rust and ruined powder. While none of these criminal sea dogs were religious, their plunder had brought enough gold Buddha statues to recognize the familiar gestures of SCP-2781. Then, according to the report, a strange phenomenon occurred within the cavern. The pirates gasped in sheer disbelief as the stone walls were bathed in light and the creature began to raise its head. The ceiling was suddenly more pliable, as if it had changed into a softer material. Before they knew it, the Wako found themselves in a wondrous cave of pure gold. The entity then tore chunks of the gold away from the wall, crushing the metal with its bare hands like a chef might crush spice. A small fortune of coins dropped from between the Yumibozu's fingers, though the tempting promise of wealth called to the men. Not one of them could find the courage to attempt to seize it. This was because of the entity's unblinking gaze, which felt so profoundly wrong that even being within sight of it felt like drowning. The Wako were already swimming away as fast as they could when the giant unleashed its tentacles to swallow its chosen target and disappear into the ether. Later in the tavern of a nearby port, a researcher for the Bureau of Onmayo obtained a detailed version of the encounter before administering rudimentary herbal amnestics to the pirates through their pitcher of sake, which all of them were partaking in to dull the insanity of what the more superstitious among them were calling divine punishment. While the full scope of SCP-2781's reality warping abilities is still being studied, displays such as the transmutation of the cavern into gold in the case of the Wako have been noted in several other sightings. It seems as though the entities are able to perform religious miracles, in other words, exert godlike authority over all forces, mineral and elemental. The use of this ability seems to be an uncommon occurrence, even within targeted attacks, seeming to reflect an understanding on the Yumibozo's part not to want to abuse its miraculous power. 
Of all the sightings ever documented, no entity that is part of SCP-2781 has ever attempted to transmute a living human or animal. The Bureau of Unmayo also suggests that the overall number of Umibozo in the sea experienced a mysterious increase during the reign of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and that the startling frequency of their appearance may have influenced Japan's inability to claim victory in the Imogen War. There were so many disparate reports of the entities that a few even reached the great unifier's ear. Since even the Bureau didn't have the authority to give amnestics to the Chancellor of the Realm, the knowledge of SCP-2781 lurking in the ocean was likely an additional factor in Hideyoshi's well-documented mental decline. The SCP Foundation data has picked up where the Bureau of Unmayo left off centuries ago, and had begun to chart the alarming number of targeted hunts that instances of SCP-2781 have committed over the years. Sometimes the culprit is not immediately provable as an instance, but a closer look at the circumstances reveals its presence. For example, there was the case of Max Powell, a 15-year-old American teenager who was thought to have been kidnapped while his family was aboard a commercial sea liner traveling to Hong Kong. On the day of his disappearance, Max was enjoying a swim in one of the cruise ship's on-deck pools. Witness testimony says he was just present one moment and simply gone the next. Max's parents and the lifeguard on duty had no idea how to process the situation, and though both parties were sure that Max had never left their sight, the grief of it all got the better of them, and a heated argument began. Security footage from one of the ship's cameras reveals a portion of the truth, and thus the Foundation seized it and used amnestics to make sure the events were not public knowledge. There is a brief moment right before Max Powell disappears from view, where a thin, wire-like strand of black seemed to snake across the deck and into the swimming pool. Another camera feed from the same day reveals the telltale outline of an SCP-2781 entity was visible, keeping pace with the ship along its hull. It seems as though the entity had manifested in an attempt to seize a new human being as a target, but found none submerged in the ocean, and therefore had to shift its focus to one of the passengers in the swimming pool, which, sadly, appeared to be Max Powell. This incident confirmed a widely theorized belief about SCP-2781, the fact that it is only able, or at least willing, to abduct targets who are partially submerged in water. While boats are often involved in most of SCP-2781 manifestations on record, this is likely a side effect of the fact that such vessels tend to carry many humans at once and thus increase the chances that one of them will wind up being a target. In other words, there is nothing stopping a SCP-2781 entity from choosing someone who is simply in the vicinity as a target, provided they meet the requirement of being submerged. Following the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, Anne Simone Bergman, a member of the German swim team, decided to stay in the country for a bit of additional training. She was fresh off of winning a gold medal in the 100-meter backstroke, the first in her career, and according to her own statements, wanted to make as many memories as she could before she returned to Germany. But she never would actually be able to return. Anne Simone Bergman went missing in the Kanmon Straits, and her body was never recovered. The cause of her disappearance was uncertain until recently. But in light of new evidence, it is believed that her fate was at the hands of an SCP-2781 entity. Further data suggests that the uncanny resemblance between SCP-2781 entities and gigantic human monks goes deeper than a mere aesthetic coincidence. This is corroborated by the existence of SCP-2781-A, a pure land that exists beyond the known boundaries of space and time. It is theorized that this remote dimension is where the entities of SCP-2781 dispense the targets of their attacks following the moment when they vanish from existence. There are no other known ways to enter SCP-2781-A other than being ushered in by an instance of SCP-2781, but it has been discovered that there are two ways to leave the Pure Land. The first is to transcend mortal existence in order to become a Buddha, and the second is to return to the physical world as a Bodhisattva, understood in this context to be a manifested instance of SCP-2781. In Buddhism, the purpose of the Bodhisattva is to spare itself the completion of its own spiritual journey in order to guide the rest of humanity toward enlightenment. Thus, SCP-2781-A is an extension of that purpose and confers the benefits of the clerocognizant awareness upon its occupants. While it is impossible to know the ultimate truth of what befalls the targets who choose to reach Nirvana, 
We learn much of what we know now through engaging in sign language communication with a voluntarily, albeit temporarily, contained instance of SCP-2781 that has self-identified itself as Nakamura. This unusually docile instance of an SCP-2781 Bodavista described the Pure Land as a contemplative place and alleged that it even had a chance meeting with Olympic gold medalist Anne Simone Bergman during its time in that world. Nakamura indicated to the Foundation members that it wished to return to its village and release others from their own attachments and labors, but at the same time requested that the Foundation contact a woman it identified as its daughter. This, the SCP-2781 instance indicated, was its own attachment that needed to be shed in order for it to let go of its earthly obligations. We informed the instance that amnestics had already been administered to both Mr. Nakamura's daughter as well as all the fisher folk that had been on board the vessel the day that Nakamura was targeted. As a response to this information, the entity demonstrated that it was no longer willing to cooperate with Foundation staff. It brandished its tentacles and was able to ensnare a member of Mobile Task Force Zeta-66 before vanishing in the expected manner. Further observation will need to be conducted to determine how much of a target's former identity factors into how it has changed as a result of entering SCP-2781-A, but we will be closely monitoring 34-year-old Minako Nakamura as well as other known members of the Nakamura family in the meantime, just in case they end up following in the footsteps of dear old dad. If you've ever taken a vacation to one of the many islands of Greece, then you'll know why the likes of Crete, Lesbos, and Corfu are famous for their beautiful beaches. But there is one beach in particular, tucked away in a corner of an unknown island, that you might think twice about visiting. Why? Well, the same reasons that this place happens to be a site of great interest for the SCP Foundation also tend to drive tourists away. Today, we're talking about SCP-2217, the strange anomalous happenings that have taken place there, and how it links to none other than one of the Foundation's most infamous groups of interest. At first glance, SCP-2217 is an ordinary, uninteresting beach, just another pretty, picturesque view on a Greek island. It looks like the kind of place that would be perfect for a romantic walk at sunset but we wouldn't recommend it. Although you wouldn't know just from looking at it, the sand that this beach is composed of has some pretty peculiar properties. It contains the ordinary non-anomalous things you'd find in sand anywhere else in the world, normal levels of silicates and calcium compounds. But the beach also possesses a high concentration of cationic metallic particles. These tiny, almost microscopic metal fragments somehow hold an electrical charge despite being grounded. So it's a beach with partially metal sand. Nothing too unusual there, right? Wrong. The metallic particles within the sand seem to have a profound effect on the natural environment around SCP-2217. For one, the metal content of the beach influences the weather, increasing the number of lightning strikes that hit the shore. The metals draw the static electricity in the atmosphere. This, along with other weather conditions and natural processes that take place at SCP-2217, also have a far more obvious anomalous effect. Lightning, rain, even fish washed up and decaying on the shoreline have all caused various artificial structures and devices to rise from the beach, which have all been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2217-1. Among the creations found on the beach in the wake of lightning strikes are a number of different forms of machinery. These have included simple clocks and other timepieces to complicated automatons. These machines have no notable anomalous properties as far as the SCP Foundation has found, apart from the way they came to be, and they are otherwise fully functional. Also discovered at SCP-2217 was jewelry, seeming to be made of discarded waste that washed up on the beach in the tide, resembling bears and other recurring motifs of a certain religion. These articles of jewelry have been made using everything from old light bulbs to hulls of ships and even fish and animal bones. Most notably, however, was the appearance of a city or rather a model of a city that was created at the beach and was then referred to as SCP-2217-A1. There is a cliff located on SCP-2217, and if one is to swim through an underwater entrance, they will find themselves inside a grotto. There, somehow carved by tidal erosion of the rock, is a recreation of an ancient Greek city. 
although the geographical features of the model seem to resemble an area near Lake Bacal in southern Siberia. The city bears more of the same religious iconography to the jewelry that can often be found on the beach. But which religion? The same one that considers SCP-2217 to be a site of holy importance. The Church of the Broken God. Now some important context to make note of. For any who are unaware, the Church of the Broken God is a religious organization that the SCP Foundation has had a number of encounters with over the years. Members of the Church share in their belief that biological, flesh-based life is inherently wrong, an abomination, even evil. This religion worships mechanization, the process of making something or someone more mechanical in nature. According to the beliefs of the Church, there were two gods, Yaldabaoth and Mekane, who created humanity together. Yaldabaoth was a god of flesh and animal instinct, granting human bodies. Meanwhile, the god of machine and intellect, Mekane, blessed man with the power of free thought. As humankind developed its civilizations by building machines, Yaldabaoth became enraged that they were ignoring the instincts she had bestowed upon them. She endeavored to destroy the creations of man in an attempt to revert them to the animal she had intended them to be. As the church's legend goes, Mekane acted as humanity's savior and tried desperately to stop Yaldabaoth. The god of machines shattered himself transforming his body into a number of pieces to form a cage for his fellow god. Fragments of Mekane rain down on planet Earth. Now, the Church of the Broken God believes it is their duty to recover these missing parts and put their savior back together. Within the religion of the Church of the Broken God, there exists a splinter faction that broke away from the main church. This group, referred to as the Broken Church, are the ones that regard SCP-2217 so highly, considering it to be a holy site. According to a piece of scripture from their religion, the Broken Church believes the beach to be Mekane's workshop. The Book of Rites describes the legend of a boy looking out at the ocean with his family and seeing fire rain down on the shore, sent from God, or Mekane, to the church. Mekane apparently proclaimed that the beach was his workshop, where he made many wonders. The lightning is my hammer, the earth my anvil, the sand my ingot. Mekane explained to the boy, so the legend goes, and invited the child into his workshop. The broken god brought his hammer down on the boy, but instead of killing him, marked him as the first of the religion the broken church now follows. In 2014, the SCP Foundation recorded an earthquake taking place at SCP-2217, with the grotto containing the model of the ancient Greek city at the epicenter. Sending a robotic probe into the grotto to assess the damage, only to find a surprising change that had occurred. For the first time, there were a number of humanoid figures seen within SCP-2217-A1, and worse still, they were under attack. Within the model city, what appeared to be a number of individuals infected with SCP-610 were ransacking buildings, devouring and infecting the other humanoid figures. Also known as the flesh that hates, SCP-610 is a contagious skin disease. It is usually transmitted by direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, and anyone that is infected with it suffers a horrific mutation that transforms them into fleshy, inhuman monstrosities. These infected creatures will attack and infect anyone nearby that isn't also carrying SCP-610. Interestingly, the disease was first discovered to be localized to a small area in Siberia, not dissimilar to the area that the SCP-2217-A1 model resembled. According to some sources, SCP-610 is the flesh, described by those following the religion of Sarcasism, a cult that worships flesh and disease. Sarcasism is a sect that directly opposes and antagonizes the machine-revering church of the broken god. Three years after the earthquake, members of the broken church staged an attack on the beach, hoping to reclaim SCP-2217 for their religion. At the time, the SCP Foundation had closed off the area to the public, under the cover story that SCP-2217 was private property. They had been hoping to predict the lightning strikes that caused the anomalous devices to form on the beach. Instead, the Foundation had to repel the Broken Church's attackers any way they could. However, as the lightning began to strike again, members of Foundation personnel that found themselves caught in it seemed to change sides. 
all stating that God needs to be reassembled. Only a year later in 2018, another group of broken church zealots stormed the beach and the foundation outpost located there. This time, the church seemed to have gained further reinforcements, specifically members of other groups of interest. In particular, some belonging to the Church of Maxwellism and the Cogwork Orthodox Church, both of which were also splinter groups of the Church of the Broken God. The Cogwork Orthodox Church arose during the Industrial Revolution, believing that adding mechanical parts to their own bodies offered greater understanding of Mekane and brought them closer to their god. Maxwellism, in a similar vein, had another interpretation of the church's core beliefs, favoring smaller, more advanced cybernetic implants. The Church of Maxwellism sought to modify their brains to become a collective consciousness and commune with Mekane. Despite a lot of pre-existing animosity between the three core splinter groups of the church, they were able to successfully capture SCP-2217. The three factions sent a video message to the Foundation proclaiming the importance of their mission. Oh, disassemblers who call themselves a Foundation, what are you a Foundation for? If you are a Foundation for life, then you will let us keep this land. For the flesh is coming, and only we can stop it. We need to bring our God back together immediately, or else you will all perish. And now it is time. If you are a Foundation for life, you will not let this happen. You will let us defeat the flesh. Several more messages were sent to the Foundation, demanding the release of various SCPs with connection to the Broken God. You see, there could potentially be hundreds of pieces needed to rebuild Mekane so he can lead the Church to glory and defeat Yaldaba. A number of these pieces happen to be cataloged SCPs, and the Foundation is either aware of or has in containment. These include SCP-882, or His Broken Heart, to the Church, SCP-271, His Broken Gift, SCP-813, His Broken Eyes, SCP-1139, His Broken Tongue, SCP-635, His Broken Mind, and finally, His Broken Blood, which refers to SCP-217. With the beach under the control of the Church of the Broken God, any Foundation personnel left alive on SCP-2217 defected and joined the Church. In order to retake the beach and re-establish containment, the Foundation was forced to do something that they only do in the most dire of circumstances. Ask for help. Together with the Horizon Initiative and Global Occult Coalition, the SCP Foundation established what it called the Triumvirate, a joint task force. In 2019, another earthquake was detected this time in Lake Baikal, Siberia, where SCP-610 was contained. Not long after, infected individuals were reported to be attacking Foundation forces in the area, causing heavy casualties. But then an unlikely event took place. Members of the Church of the Broken God appeared, their bodies augmented with machinery. These zealots that had fought the Foundation for control of SCP-2217 were now coming to its aid to repel SCP-610. According to them, God, or rather Mekane, had told them to come to assist the Foundation. Using a large-scale electrical discharge, instances of the SCP-610 contagion were eradicated. But this discharge seemed to have originated from the same island where SCP-2217 was found. Following this incident, Robert Brumero, the leader of the Broken Church, sent a video message to the leaders of the Triumvirate, including the O5 Council, the Director of the Global Occult Coalition, and the Horizon Initiative's Tribunal. In his message, Bumero stated, It's not too late, you know. This is our world as well. We both want the flesh to end, and we can help you. We can help each other. Come to the anvil. We will talk, and we can save this world. The Church of the Broken God, its splinter groups uniting to take SCP-2217 for their religion, were now extending an olive branch to the Foundation and its allies, all in the name of protecting the world. Shortly after, the Foundation, Global Cult Coalition, and Horizon Initiative began working collaboratively with the Church of the Broken God to prepare for an XK-class scenario. Retaking control of the SCP-2217 beach for now, the Foundation intends to revoke this current arrangement after the dangerous scenario has been averted. But perhaps McCain's workshop will provide vital in reassembling the Broken God and saving humanity should Yaldabaoth ever return to exact her terrible revenge. It was a beautiful September day, 
but Sean Taylor was trapped in his car in one of the worst cases of gridlock he had ever seen. He tried to look on the bright side, though, and while he was stuck in an unmoving car, at least he had a pleasant view of the wide, shimmering lake just off the road next to him. He was admiring the scene when tiny drops of rain started landing on his windshield. That's funny. There wasn't a cloud in the sky a moment ago. There was something off about the rain, though. It looked dirty, a rusty red color. Was that blood? He didn't have time to think about it, because just then, a thick, dense mist began to roll over the lake. A fog of blood. Just off the side of the road, he could see a huge silhouette rising out of the water. Is that an old submarine? What Sean didn't know was that he was about to have an encounter with SCP-1861, also known as the HMS Wintersheimer, a ghostly submarine with strange and terrifying effects. Sean and the other drivers stuck in traffic that day were far from the first people to have a dangerous brush with this legendary vessel. According to SCP Foundation records, the HMS Wintersheimer has been appearing since as early as 1916. The first recorded incident occurred in the British seaside town of Innsmouth-on-Sea. You won't find this town on any maps or in the history books, and you're about to find out why. The 500 population of the town, which had already reduced by the wartime draft into the currently raging Great World War, awoke to red skies on February 6, 1916. Citizens left their homes to investigate, only to find their entire town had been enveloped in a thick red mist. The swelling crimson clouds up ahead began to rain, showering the town in a hail of viscous red goop. Anyone unlucky enough to taste it would say that this strange rain was a dreadful mix of salt and copper. This was because, as the Foundation would later determine, the rain and fog was a disgusting combination of salt water, human blood, and human cerebrospinal fluid. But the real threat was rising just beyond the beach. Technically speaking, the HMS Wintersheimer vessel is designated as SCP-1861-A. It appears to be a World War I-era British B-class submarine, designed by Vickers for the Royal Navy in 1904. By 1916, this particular type of boat was already on its way to being obsolete, and were largely deployed in Malta, far from the active fronts. So one of these vessels appearing on an otherwise unremarkable stretch of English coastline should have been a clue that something was terribly wrong. But the poor residents of Innsmouth-on-Sea didn't know the half of it. Soon, figures in what appeared to be archaic diving gear began emerging from the Wintersheimer and made their way into the township. They seemed terrified, running up to and frantically screaming at any local they could find. Please listen to me. Something terrible is about to happen here. We need you to come with us or you're all going to die. You must believe us. The locals were frightened by what they heard. They'd been listening to news reports of the Great War unfolding across the globe for two years now. Had it finally come to them? They pictured shells raining down from the sky, decimating their defenseless little town in a rain of fire. The Navy must have been brought in to save them before the German bombardment began. While some took more convincing than others, the men in diving suits, known as SCP-1861-B, eventually managed to persuade the entire town to join them and lead the townspeople down to the water. One by one, they were all boarded onto the submarine, hundreds of them. Many couldn't believe their eyes as they watched scores of people disappear in front of them into the dark bowels of the Wintersheimer. Where were they all going? How would they all fit in there? But it was too late for any of them to back out now. The vessel submerged once more, and everyone was gone. The entire population of Innsmouth-on-Sea had disappeared in a rain of fog and blood, never to be seen again. The Foundation wiped all records of the town from existence and delivered appropriate amnestic treatment to anyone who still mentioned or remembered Innsmouth-on-Sea. The fate of those who board the HMS Wintersheimer is always the same. Vanish from the face of the Earth, explained away by the Foundation as accidental death by extreme weather event. There have been hundreds of documented sightings of SCP-1861, and the anomalous weather event can occur near any body of water wide enough to accommodate SCP-1861-A's comms tower and topmost platform. Depth does not seem to be any hindrance of the submarine appearing, and it can even manifest in water that's just a few inches deep. 
as Sean and the other unfortunate victims of the rush hour traffic were being showered in thick red droplets from above, a crimson mist rolled in between the cars. Sean had heard of so-called freak weather events before, like raining frogs and fish, but this was something different, and it frightened him. He could see now that the silhouette rising from the lake really was an old submarine, and he watched as a legion of mysterious figures disembarked from the vessel and began spilling onto the road. The men in ancient-looking diving suits walked among the cars, and one of them approached Sean's car. He began tapping frantically on the window, and Sean could tell he was yelling something. Sean was scared and more, but more than anything else, he was confused. Against his better judgment, he rolled down the window just a crack to hear what the man was saying. His British-accented voice muted by the diving suit, the man frantically told him, Sir, please listen to me. I'm Lieutenant Samuel Ramsey of the HMS Wintersheimer. We're evacuating the area. Please, you've got to come with me. We're in danger out here. HMS? Sean thought. Isn't that what they call British ships? What was a British submarine doing in the middle of a lake in the United States? Through his windshield, Sean could already see other men in diving suits leading people from the cars out towards the submarine. Something had to be going on here. Something big. Lieutenant Ramsey was still banging away at the glass of Sean's window, becoming increasingly agitated. Sir, if you won't comply with my orders, I'm within my rights to take you by force for your own safety. Sean could feel the fear setting in, but he didn't know what else to do. He turned off the car and took off his seatbelt. He was just about to open the door when there was a tap on the passenger side window of his car. It was a soldier in what looked to be advanced tactical gear. There were several soldiers directing cars to drive on the shoulder to get around the mess of stopped automobiles. Sean looked to his left, and the man in the diving suit was gone. The soldier tapped again, and Sean didn't need to be told twice. He followed his directions and drove around the traffic jam and out of the mist. A half mile down the road, Sean was stopped by another group of soldiers and given an amnestic. He drove away never knowing how close he had come to vanishing in the bowels of SCP-1861-A. Sean was lucky that one of the SCP Foundation's mobile task forces had taken over the situation, but they were too late to help those who had already complied with SCP-1861-B's orders and boarded the Wintersheimer. The task force made it their business to save whoever they could but that wasn't their only directive. The Foundation had recorded a huge number of SCP-1861 instances since 1916, and now they were finally going to figure out what was going on inside. The Foundation had already discovered that those taken onto the Wintersheimer don't simply disappear. Once on board the submarine, they are forced into a diving suit of their own, which transforms them into new instances of SCP-1861-B. Upon realizing this, Foundation scientists devised an ingenious plot. Six months before this latest instance of 1861, the Foundation dispatched two members of D-Class personnel who were familiar with one another into the Red Mist. One was instructed not to interact with SCP-1861-B, while the other, named Sal, was ordered to enter the submarine. His mission was to report back all findings to Foundation researcher Dr. Clutch during the next 1861 event. The D-Class who remained on shore was brought in once more by the Mobile Task Force during the September event that Sean witnessed. They checked each diving suit wearing Anomaly until they heard a familiar voice, muffled by the mask. It was Sal, and he'd been transformed into an instance of SCP-1861-B. The human D-Class, receiving questions from Dr. Clutch via a remote broadcast, commenced the interview of his former friend. It is from this vital interview that much of the Foundation's knowledge of the mysterious HMS Wintersheimer is drawn. According to Sal, the interior of the Wintersheimer, which is a long, narrow passageway, is a spatial anomaly that seems to stretch on forever. This explains how vast number of people, like the entire population of Innsmouth-on-Sea, can disappear into the submarine at once. Sal reported that, about an hour after entering the vessel, the hatch closed and the interior began rapidly filling with water as the submarine descended. Prisoners of the Wintersheimer were faced with two choices, suit up or drown. Few chose the latter option, and as soon as the suit was on, the transformation had begun. As soon as everyone was suited up and the submarine had fully descended, causing the 1861 weather event to dissipate on Earth, the Wintersheimer had effectively entered an alternate dimension. The airlock opened, and the new recruits were instructed to step outside and take a look around. 
The Wintersheimer veterans informed the new sailors that everyone on land was likely already dead by this point. When Sal first exited the submarine, he commented on everything around him looking eerily similar to how it looked on land before the mist descended, but with one key difference. It seemed as though everything was underwater. Well, not quite that. It was almost as though everything was water, like the world had taken on a kind of flowing liquid state. Sal and the others existed in this otherworldly land of living water for six months, and as the months passed, things only got stranger. They found that they neither needed to eat nor sleep. According to Sal, all they did was breathe, and pass the time by exploring and talking to one another. Anyone who attempted to take off their suit would dissolve and diffuse into the same liquid that surrounded them. Dr. Clutch asked Sal about the other inhabitants of this alien realm, and this was when things got truly disturbing. There were dead humans and animals floating all over the place, missing their eyes as though they'd been scooped out, and missing their mouths, as though they'd been bitten out of their face by some kind of huge predator. Their empty eye sockets bled constantly, and Sal theorized that this may have something to do with the anomalous blood mists of SCP-1861. When asked to provide more information on why all the corpses were mutilated in this way, Sal said that one of his superiors on the Wintersheimer told him, The watcher of eyes and biter of teeth deemed them worthy. Whatever this mysterious being was, it seemed to be a powerful figure within 1861's Waterworld, and Sal felt lucky that he never had a direct run-in with the creature himself. For his final request, Dr. Clutch asked Sal to attempt to remove his suit. The Foundation had learned in previous instances of 1861 that the diving suits have anomalous durability, and it was impossible for anyone other than the wearer to remove them. Hence why the Foundation could never deal with 1861-B by using brute force. Naturally, Clutch was interested in finding out what was going on underneath. Sal expressed fear and anxiety at first, wondering if after all he'd been through, whether he could ever be considered human anymore. Eventually, he was convinced to remove the suit, and his worst fears were confirmed. The second Sal removed his helmet, gallons of seawater poured out, and the now empty suit collapsed to the ground. Sal's body was never found. Only some teeth and a pair of eyes were recovered. The eyes were later confirmed to be belonging to a young girl, and the teeth were identified as having come from a European red deer. And so, the dark mystery of the HMS Wintersheimer continues. Because of the unpredictable nature of its appearances and the resulting difficulty of containing it, the Wintersheimer has earned a Keter classification. The only containment procedure currently employed by the SCP Foundation is for mobile task forces to try and intercept the submarine when appearances are reported, and hopefully prevent or at least reduce the kidnapping of civilians. With so many questions left unanswered, all we can say for certain is that if a red mist ever descends on you, and a stranger in a diving suit tells you you're in grave danger, he's absolutely right. Robert Orlean and his partner in crime, John Streep, zipped through the murky waters of the Louisiana Bayou on a speedboat. These men were dealers in the illicit, but their specialty was not any kind of contraband you'd probably recognize. Orlean and Streep dealt in rare orchids, illegally poached from areas where they're considered endangered and sold to high-paying rare plant collectors. As any seller or collector knows, rarity is the hallmark of value, and what these two men would encounter in the swamp that day was truly one of a kind. The problem for this pair of greedy opportunists is that only one of them would live to tell the tale, and thanks to the SCP Foundation, the other wouldn't remember it for long. That's what happens when you have a dangerous run-in with a certain mean green swamp-dwelling creature that doesn't take kindly to unwanted visitors. And no, we're not talking about a crocodile. Orlean and Streep continued through the swamp, keeping their keen eyes out for the flash of light blue that'd give away the orchids they were seeking. Little did they know, from the murky darkness between the reeds, a pair of big yellow eyes were watching them back. They were intruders in a stranger's land. Threats, just like the bad man. They would need to be dealt with accordingly, or a grim history would repeat itself. The boat came to a halt, as the two poachers finally saw one of the rare flowers they were looking for arising out of the muck. Orlean leaped from the boat and began wading towards his prize. 
The flower would fetch him and his partner a pretty penny if they could get it back in good condition. The motions were so well practiced for Orlean, so automatic, that he didn't even notice something was moving through the waters towards him. Gators and snakes were an occupational hazard for people like Orlean. He kept a revolver holster just below his shoulder as a precaution, but the thing about to kill him was unlike anything he'd ever faced before. Just as his careful fingers curled around the orchid's stem, Orlean heard Streep screaming from the boat. He was frantically pointing at something just beyond Orlean, emerging from the reeds. Orlean turned and felt his jaw falling open in horror at the sight of it. At first it seemed almost like a waterlogged corpse. Thick, matted black hair, heavy with grease and muddy bog water, teeming with parasitic swamp life. Her skin was green and bumpy, like that of a toad dripping with viscous green sweat that seemed like it could only be the byproduct of rot. But those eyes, those big yellow amphibian eyes, they were alive as they were inhuman. This creature wasn't a corpse, it was something else entirely. Her body cleared the water, standing at Orleans' height now and facing him eye to eye. She was naked, her dignity preserved by her long tangle of hair. Her body was human-shaped, except for her freakishly long, thin limbs. Her belly appeared visibly bloated or engorged, like a woman in the mid-stages of pregnancy. Orlean had never smelled something so foul in his entire life, which was mostly spent wading through swamps and bogs. She smelled like death itself. Streep was screaming for Orlean to climb back into the boat, but Orlean knew it was already too late. He reached for his holstered pistol, but before he could clear leather, the creature let out a horrific, guttural, hawking noise and spewed a stream of black goo onto Orlean's face. It was hot, sticky, and foul-tasting, like a kind of tar rendered from corpses. It plastered his open mouth and nose shut and began to suffocate him. He tried desperately to claw at his face and tear the offending substance away, but all that succeeded in doing was getting his fingers stuck. While Orlean suffocated and Streep screamed terrified obscenities from the boat, the creature just watched and smiled through rotten teeth. It was nice to see them panic, just like the bad man who'd come before. They were in the wrong. They deserved this. Orlean soon realized that nothing he could do would save himself. He'd spent his life in a dangerous profession and been lucky until now. But the Reaper catches up with everyone eventually. The last thing he saw as the world went black was this creature, this swamp woman, wading towards him through the water with a hungry look in her eye. She grabbed him on either side of his face and just held him there. What was that sound? Was it fizzling, like something was burning or even melting? She just kept staring and smiling with those awful rotten teeth. Robert Orlean went to sleep in her hands and never woke up. Back on the boat, a desperate John Streep was watching a scene that if it wasn't for the later intervention of the SCP Foundation, would haunt him until his dying day. He watched his partner undergo a process that was somewhere between rotting and melting. He withered away in the swamp woman's hands, degrading into thick black sludge that she drank through her thirsty skin. As much as it pained him to leave his friend behind, Streep knew that there was no saving him now. All he could possibly do was escape with his own life. He pulled the ripcord on the boat's motor and tore his way back to the nearest township, the shape of the nightmarish swamp woman shrinking in the distance behind him. When he ran into the local police station, half mad with grief and fear, screaming about the monster that had killed his friend in the swamp, the police understandably detained him for further questioning. When his criminal history as a poacher was flagged up on the database, it became clear he probably wasn't leaving for a while. That's when a Foundation agent embedded in the department passed a memo about the case's strangeness up the chain of command, and a covert mobile task force was soon dispatched to the swamp in order to locate and capture the anomalous creature that Streep had claimed took his friend's life. After a few days of searching, the Swamp Woman was captured by the Foundation and redesignated as SCP-811 before being delivered back to a nearby containment site. 
Luckily for Foundation disinformation agents, the cover story was practically gift wrapped for them on this one. It had been a dispute between two hardcore criminals, and as the saying goes, there's no honor among thieves. Streep had murdered Orlean over a pay cut dispute, and thrown him into the swamp where his body was eaten by gators. A few falsified records and implanted memories later, and the Foundation was free to do what it pleased with SCP-811. But the Swamp Woman would prove to be full of surprises and contradictions. While designated as Euclid, the containment procedures for the creature were rather extensive for its own benefit. Like a lot of creatures who'd never existed in captivity before, it had very specific needs in terms of its artificial habitat. The foundation needed to be on top of everything, from the pH levels of its soil acidity to the optimal temperatures and humidity levels of its containment chamber, built to resemble the creature's natural swamp habitat. The Swamp Woman is mostly non-aggressive to foundation staff, but certain precautions need to be taken in order to ensure everyone's safety around her. While she's largely humanoid, her internal physiology vastly differs from that of humans. Her veins and digestive system are non-functional. She consumes her prey by melting it into black sludge with the highly caustic secretions of her skin, before absorbing it back through her pores. The waste material collects in her stomach, which she then expels voluntarily through an action similar to vomiting. This is often used defensively or in hunting prey, as the unfortunate Robert Orlean found out. As a result, people working in 811's containment chamber need to do so in pairs and wear heavily sealed hazmat suits for obvious safety reasons. The creature also proved to be surprisingly intelligent. While not a genius by any means, it was no mere mindless animal. The Swamp Woman had an intellect and communication skills on par with your average feral child. The one that had been brought up and socialized in a relatively normal home before being turned loose and experiencing a decline in its mental and social development. Her words have a childlike construction to them, as though English isn't her native language, and she's still in the very early stages of learning it. She gave herself a name, I, and began to cooperate well with Foundation staff in exchange for having her needs met. Since being brought into containment, she's made a number of requests. These include some requests that have been denied by the Foundation, such as the regular provision of bovine prey for its chamber and a variety of fish from its native environment to make it feel more at home. However, there are some requests that the Foundation has approved like a wooden hairbrush and a D-class in a hazmat suit entering the room daily in order to help wash her hair often bogged down by the frequency at which her skin produces thick, caustic oils. In one particularly strange request, she asked for a turtle in a hazmat suit to act as a companion in her containment chamber, as she reacted negatively to the idea of having turtles as food. Sadly, this was one of the denied requests. SCP-811 was also involved in a few cross-tests with other anomalies, leading to curious results. After realizing just how dangerous SCP-811 secretions could be, Foundation researchers naturally floated the idea of using it on SCP-682 in its seemingly endless termination experiments. A sample of 682's flesh was successfully decayed by the dangerous mucus, so a larger quantity collected over a number of months was then sprayed all over the beast. It managed to reduce 682's body mass by 27%, melting its way through the covered flesh down to the bone. However, at that point, it was unable to decay further, and SCP-682 soon returned back to its normal state. Who could have possibly seen that coming? Right. However, a much more interesting and enlightening cross-test occurred with SCP-978, the Desire Camera. If you haven't already seen our video on the Desire Camera, it's pretty much exactly what the name suggests. A Polaroid camera that reveals the deepest desire of its subject. And the Foundation decided to test it on a large number of staff and anomalies, one of those being SCP-811. When a photograph was taken of SCP-811 just staring at the camera, the resulting photo depicted a human woman with the same height, build, and facial features as SCP-811, braiding yellow ribbons into her hair and wearing a blue sundress. The attending researchers felt this raised an interesting question. Were they looking at an aspiration towards humanity from SCP-811, or was this a yearning to return to what had been before? 
There was only one way to find out. Conduct an interview with the creature itself. When the interview began, the researchers pressed Date 11 on some of her earliest memories. One of the key details she shared was regarding a mysterious man whom she claimed came to her before she looked like she did now, back when her skin was soft and pink. The bad man. He injected something into her arm and whatever it was, it changed her, mutated her, took away her precious humanity. The first thing she remembered feeling after that was an all-consuming hunger, and then melting and devouring the one who changed her destroying any possible answers as to who he was or why he did it in the process. It was a story of victimization and dehumanization so cruel and upsetting that researcher Watchtel, an assistant researcher attending the interview, actually threw up. Later debriefing interviews revealed it was because he had a daughter of roughly the same age, with long, dark hair. If SCP-811 has any parents herself, we may never know. Such is the strange tragedy of SCP-811. Whether you wish to call her by her number, a nickname like the Swamp Woman, or her self-given name of Ai, we'll likely never know who she was before, as not even she knows now. It is an unsettling reminder that all of our grasps on humanity are looser than you think. Sometimes all it takes is one chance encounter to change who you are completely. Blood in the water. Floating bodies covered in bite marks. It's hungry. More meals will arrive soon. The ocean is a beautiful place, filled with majestic dolphins and whales, colorful coral reefs, and every kind of fish you could possibly imagine. It's also a horrifying place. Dark, endless depths filled with sharks, anglerfish, giant squid, and unknown creatures that look like something straight from a nightmare. The ocean definitely isn't the sort of place most people would want to go after dark. But for one particularly adventurous newlywed couple, a nighttime scuba diving excursion seemed like the perfect way to kickstart their life together. Well, Brad the husband thought so at least. His new wife Lacey was a bit more reluctant. They had both been scuba diving before, but that was during the day. She loved the ocean when it was sunny and bright when she could see everything around her and relax with a nice sunset dinner afterward. The idea of diving down into the depths after dark sent shivers down her spine. But in their vows, she and Brad had promised to always take risks together, and she already said no to skydiving, so this was the compromise. This was what they were doing for their first honeymoon activity. Tomorrow, she promised herself, she would find something more relaxing for the two of them to do. Maybe a nice brunch and a trip to the hotel spa. But for now, the couple found themselves standing on a boat side by side, ready to take the figurative and literal plunge together. Brad gave Lacey's hand a comforting squeeze, a silent promise that everything would be okay. It wasn't too dark out yet. The sun was just beginning to set, casting a soft, warm glow across the surface of the ocean. Lacey took a deep breath. They wouldn't be going it alone. The dive master would be with them the whole time, she reminded herself. He was an extremely experienced diver. He had already walked them through the necessary hand signals to let him know if they needed to resurface and handed them their flashlights. They had already sprung for the diving masks equipped with voice communication systems so they could stay in touch the whole time. Every potential issue had been accounted for. Now, it was time to dive. Lacey, Brad, and the dive master switched their lights on and slipped below the surface of the water. The dive would take them close to a coral reef, which the dive master promised would look extra vibrant, illuminated by their diving lights. As it turned out, he was right. The reef was a sight to behold. The beautiful blue, green, purple, and red pigments so striking that they briefly distracted Lacey from her fear of the ocean at night. She called out to Brad over the voice communication, encouraging him to come take a closer look at this, but he wasn't there. Where did he go? She turned, shining her light this way and that. She called out for him again, and this time he answered. His next words made her stomach drop. Did you hear that? No, she hadn't heard anything. What did she hear? Was something wrong with his oxygen tank? Did he hear something happen to the boat up above? When she pressed for an explanation, Brad simply said, I heard a voice. That was almost enough for Lacey to want to bail on the whole dive together, but she didn't want to be the one who ruined the excursion they had spent so much money on. 
She spotted Brad and began to swim after him. There it is again, he exclaimed. He was still hearing things. Something must be wrong with his oxygen tank, Lacey thought. He's hallucinating from lack of oxygen. She swam closer to him, reaching out to grab his hand and bring him back to the dive master. But just before she reached him, he swam away from her grasp. She was about to call out to him again to demand he turn around and come back or she would divorce him, but she suddenly froze in place as a sound came over her voice communicator. A voice. Not Brad's. Not the dive master. Not even her own. A woman's voice she had never heard before, whispering to her in a soft, soothing tone, almost like a lullaby. Lacey. The voice cooed. Come this way. Come to me. Don't be afraid. That was impossible. There was no one else out there with them. Who could that possibly be? And why did she feel so compelled to do what they said? Somehow she felt a pull, the tug of an invisible thread leading her in the same direction she just saw Brad swimming. She could hear the voice of the dive master, demanding to know where she and Brad were going, telling them to slow down and let him catch up. But she had to follow that whispering voice. She swam along the path that invisible thread was pulling her, the light in her hand illuminating the way. She was swimming away from the reef a bit and swimming closer to what appeared to be a dense kelp forest. There up ahead she could see Brad amidst the kelp. He was thrashing around, kicking his leg, his foot apparently caught on something. Then her ears were filled with the sound of his screams. The flashlight slipped out of his hand and it fell through the water. It cast its beam of light on Brad. Lacey could see the full extent of what was causing those blood-curdling screams. The kelp nearest to him wrapped itself around his leg and dragged him slowly down towards the holdfast on the ocean floor. Brad was fighting with everything he had, clawing at the vegetation that pulled him, but it wouldn't budge. Lacey shone her light down towards the holdfast and nearly dropped it in shock. There, she saw a mouth, wide and waiting, filled with sharp teeth. The horrible sight was enough to shake her into action and she fought her way through the water over to Brad, struggling to unwind the kelp from around his leg. She was just beginning to make some progress when another piece of kelp gripped Brad's other leg, continuing his slow descent toward the gaping mouth below. Lacey was so preoccupied with freeing her husband that she didn't see the strands of kelp creeping up behind her. She wasn't prepared when they grabbed hold of her arms, pulling her down towards another monstrous mouth. She thrashed and fought, but she was unable to free herself. All she and Brad could do was watch, helpless, as they approached those gnashing teeth. But wait, there was still hope. The dive master, he was still here. Lacey called out to him over the voice communicator, begging for help. From the dive master's perspective, it sounded like the couple had lied about their experience level in diving and had gotten themselves tangled up in some kelp, and now they were panicking. With a sigh, he paddled his way in their direction, looking out for the kelp forest. As he approached, he heard a curious sound, a woman's voice, lilting and sweet, a lot like the voice of his wife's in tone. Where are you? Come closer. I need you. I want to see you. I want to hold you. Hello? Who is that? He replied curious and confused. Lacey and Brad both began screaming even louder, trying to drown out the voice. They begged him not to listen to it, to focus on getting them out of there. They warned him to be careful and not get too close to the kelp while helping them. The dive master scoffed. This couple was ridiculous, but he would check it out on the off chance something really was wrong, and he would try not to get distracted by any mysterious whispers, no matter how seductive they might sound. As the dive master approached the kelp forest, the screams over the communicator went suspiciously silent. He called out for the couple, waiting for a response, and received nothing but silence. Then the whispers started again. Don't worry, come find me, I'm waiting. He shook his head as if trying to physically shake the voice off and continue his search. There he spotted two unsettlingly still silhouettes amongst the kelp. He held up his flashlight and saw the water blooming with a thick cloud of unmistakable red, blood in the water. Lacey and Brad were hanging upside down, bleeding out into the ocean. As he swam closer for a better look, he saw their injuries, bite marks. At first his instinct was to blame a shark, but there hadn't been a shark in these waters for years. As he turned to examine the area for evidence of a shark attack, he saw a winding green shadow advancing toward him. The kelp ensnared him before he could realize what was happening, and before long the mouths along the ocean floor were feasting once more. Up on the surface, the boat's captain waited for the divers to return, but after a few hours, realized that something must have gone terribly wrong. 
The next day, by the time the authorities had found the bodies, there was nothing left but bones. The deaths were written off as a horrible accident, possibly a shark attack that was finished off by scavengers. No one knew that this poor couple and their dive master were victims of SCP-5189. SCP-5189 refers to anomalous variations of organisms belonging to the order of Laminarales, or kelp. Instances of SCP-5189 are physically identical to the non-anomalous versions of their respective kelp species, with one notable difference. Along the base or roots of the organism, there is a mouth-like structure made from organic algae matter, as well as dentin formations resembling the teeth of a tiger shark. When a human reaches within 80 meters of an SCP-5189 instance, they will hear the sound of a pleasant, alluring female voice whispering to them. These whispers vary from instance to instance in terms of voice and content, but are always seemingly intended to entice and beckon the person to approach. Strangely enough, specimens of SCP-5189 do not possess any vocal cords, so it is unknown how they are able to produce these sounds. If a human heeds that siren's call and moves closer to the kelp, the instances of SCP-5189 will move their thralli and blades, grabbing onto the person with a vice-like grip. These instances are strong, seemingly impossibly so for the variety of organisms they appear to be. But no matter how improbable it may seem, once they've gotten hold of their prey, it is very, very difficult to break free. Once a human is in the grasp of SCP-5189, it will begin to slowly, inexorably pull the human toward its mouth and begin to consume them. It is not a quick process, unfortunately, for the humans involved. The organism takes approximately one bite every half hour. There are no organs attached to the kelp's mouths, so their chewed meal drifts out of their mouth and into the water, filling the surrounding waves with floating streaks of red. Surely the victims drown during this process, making the suffering as short-lived as them, right? Wrong. SCP-5189 will hold living bodies above the water as they slowly devour them. Once the blood loss kills them, these newly deceased bodies are pulled below the surface, left hanging from instances of SCP-5189 until they are completely eaten. Greedy in their feeding habits, instances of SCP-5189 will hold on to multiple victims at the same time. They will keep the thallus wrapped around these captured humans, leaving them floating underwater, taking bites out of various bodies until all of them are gone. Sometimes instances of SCP-5189 will grow together, as non-anomalous kelp species do. Once a group of SCP-5189 has accumulated 50 specimens of 5189 within 100 meters of each other, it is an instance of SCP-5189-1. These instances will work together to capture and feed on bodies and are highly dangerous. On January 15, 2021, an offshoot of MTF Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was dispatched to eliminate the first known instance of SCP-5189-1, which had been discovered off the coast of Southern California. The team approached the process of eliminating this instance the same way they had previously eliminated smaller gatherings of the kelp. For the first two hours, the process went as expected, and the mobile task force was able to make a small dent in the population there. But then, something changed. The instances of SCP-5189 began to work together to attack and trap the task force. The first member of the task force to be captured was the captain, who was gripped around the waist with a rapidly constricting thallus of SCP-5189. The rest of the team swarmed around him, attempting to break him free. But the thallus squeezed tighter and tighter until it had squeezed the life out of him. Then it began to drag him down toward the nearest mouth. The sight of their captain's blood spilling into the water was enough to shock the rest of the team into action, but it was already too late. Their attempts to free the captain had brought them too close to the rest of the SCP-5189 instances. Task Force members would attempt to avoid the thallus of one of the instances, only for another to block the path of their retreat. One would grab hold of an ankle, while the other grasped a wrist, pulling in opposite directions and making it impossible to wiggle free without severe injury. One by one, the task force members were ensnared. Some of them drowned. Others were dragged down towards the waiting mouths, screams leaving their mouths as bursts of air bubbles as they vanished into a cloud of red. A few of the task force members were able to swim away, but as soon as they stopped for a moment of rest, they were snatched by more instances of SCP-5189. 
The kelp had spread further than they had realized and was able to follow them much further than expected. Mobile Task Force members 8, 13, and 31 were devoured in the chaos. Members 3, 14, 18, 24, and 29 passed away from blood loss within half an hour of the attacks. Members 2, 5, 8, 11, 21, and 22 died quickly. Others were not so lucky, suspended out of the water just enough to stay alive as the kelp feasted on their teammates, ready to eat them next when it was finished. No members of the task force were left to exterminate the SCP-5189-1 instance ever made it back out of the water. The instance is still there, picked clean skeletal remains of the task force still hanging from the kelp. To this day, it is uncertain how much SCP-5189 is in the ocean. There could only be a few small patches, or it could be spread out all across the world. Smaller instances of SCP-5189 can be transplanted to the nearest available aquatic SCP Foundation facility with minimal casualties. However, if the instance is an SCP-5189-1 infestation, this should not be attempted. The area must be blocked off at an area of 80 meters from the nearest SCP-5189 instance and left alone until further notice. No attempts to eliminate it should be made until the Foundation is able to ascertain a safe and effective method of eliminating these instances. No one wants a repeat of Incident 5189-1, or to see any more bodies added to the grim aquatic graveyard there. There is something so captivating about ice. It can be beautiful, a shimmering cast of frost over a meadow, or twinkling icicles on a cottage roof. It can also be deadly. A slick of slippery glass on a dark road, or that same icicle from before knocking loose and careening towards your head like a falling dagger. It can be a sleet storm, or a mighty glacier with secrets buried beneath its core. In a remote part of Alaska, the SCP Foundation discovered a particularly unusual kind of ice, with a vivid red hue and some incredibly deadly potential. The Foundation investigated the reports in a remote area on the Alaskan coastline after a tribe of local natives came across the mangled bodies of shipwrecked hunters in the area, encased in a block of strange red ice. Mobile Task Force Beta-7, also known as the Hazmatters, were sent in to the site to determine what exactly had occurred and take samples of any anomalous materials to be brought back to the nearest Foundation research site. Agent Bryce made the initial visual inspection of the site and spotted three middle-aged male bodies. Further examination determined that one of the bodies, referred to as Subject Zero, was the original point of contamination for whatever comprised the red ice and caused the men's deaths. It has been posited by the investigation team that the other men were infected when they attempted to help Subject Zero reach their boat. Sadly, kindness can sometimes be a killer like that. While sweeping the perimeter, Agent Hughes spotted human footprints leading to the northeast. A three-man team consisting of Agent Hughes, Whitmore, and Cassidy was permitted to follow those tracks and determine if any survivors, or something worse, had escaped the site. Exploration Log A009 allows us to determine what happened next and what the three agents found. Hughes and his team followed the footprints to the entrance of a cave, with the tracks appearing to lead inside. The entrance of the cave was covered with an almost solid sheet of ice, save for a crack in the ice about one meter tall. Beyond this wall, Agent Whitmore spotted the body of a young man, frozen solid in the midst of crawling away from something covered in crystals of red ice. With him was a frozen spear gun that appeared to have been fired just before the young man's death. They could not touch the body to perform a full investigation, but the way in which he was gripping his chest indicated that he might have been fatally stabbed there. As the agents moved further into the cave, they discovered a chamber about five or six meters in diameter, filled with red ice with a pool in the middle. The pool was three meters wide and of an unknown depth. As they pushed further, the agents came across a polar bear. Startled, they fired once at it, before realizing it was already dead. Its fur was dotted with crystals of red ice, creeping its way across the bear's body. Beyond the polar bear, the agent spotted dozens of bodies, all dead animals. There were seals, a snow fox, and finally, a giant spider with a leg span of over a meter. At first, the spider appeared to be frozen like the other creatures, but upon further investigation, it appeared to be made of red ice. 
Agent Cassidy recognized the spider as SCP-3023, but was told it was impossible. When she pressed for further answers, she was told to ignore it and continue the sweep. Agent Whitmore checked the collection of bodies in the chamber, looking for any humans among them. Meanwhile, Hughes spotted a spear sticking out of the enormous spider, indicating a struggle that took place before it and the young man at the cave's entrance froze. Hughes was interrupted in his task as Agent Cassidy called out from deeper in the cave, saying, I, I think I know where the spider came from. When Hughes followed the sound of her voice, he found something troubling. An aperture, about a meter in diameter, absolutely covered in red ice. It looked like a tunnel, with no ice at all past its entrance, with a dim light coming from somewhere deep inside. He lost sight of Agent Cassidy and realized she must have gone inside of it. Upon further observation, Hughes determined that the walls and the floor of the tunnel were wet, with a red puddle about a meter in. Hughes and Whitmore called to Cassidy, attempting to lead her back out of the tunnel, but received no response. Hughes attempted to go in and retrieve her, but Control forbade him from going any further. After a conversation with Control that had been stricken from the official file, Hughes had relented and agreed to withdraw his remaining team and exit the site. Hughes and Whitmore left the cave without further incident and returned to Foundation Headquarters. In spite of a D-Class recovery team being sent into the cave to search for her, Agent Cassidy's body was never found. The cave was blocked off from the public in order to avoid further civilian contact with the red ice and the red water inside. Though the origin of the red ice in Alaska is not known for sure, this cave and the pool deep within it are thought to be the source of this particular infestation. The official cause of death listed on record for the bodies found in Alaska was internal bleeding, but what really happened to them was something much, much worse. These men had transformed and frozen from the inside out, their blood turning to ice and their cells going solid one at a time. The low ambient temperature in the area are thought to have slowed the freezing process down. You heard that right. The cold kept them from freezing faster, as counterintuitive as it sounds. This prolonged their deaths and kept them conscious up until the very end. Even as their bodies were freezing solid, their very cells turning against them, they were awake and aware of it all. These unfortunate men came into contact with and lost their lives to a substance known as SCP-009. SCP-009 in its liquid form maintained at temperatures between negative 100 and 0 degrees Celsius resembles ordinary distilled water aside from its bright red color. It behaves opposite of water, reaching a frozen solid state at higher temperatures and vaporizing into a steam-like gas at temperatures below negative 100 degrees. An attempt to examine SCP-009's atomic structure was unable to achieve conclusive results. The substance looks as if it was made up of normal water molecules, though, obviously, it is much more than simple water. SCP-009 appears relatively harmless at first glance, but its real dangerous potential lies in its ability to contaminate water-based solutions, transferring its properties to them. A contaminated liquid begins to exhibit the same unusual behavior as SCP-009, freezing at temperatures above 0 degrees and vaporizing at temperatures below negative 100. It has been shown to effectively contaminate ice, steam, tea, fruit juice, seawater, and blood, in a process taking between 3 minutes and several hours. These concerning properties raise questions about what SCP-009 and liquids contaminated by it might do if they made contact with a human body. Several D-Class personnel were used as test subjects, exposed to SCP-009 in a controlled environment and observed from a safe distance. When first exposed to SCP-009, the test subjects reported nothing unusual except a slight sensation of warming on the surface of their skin. Then frost began to form across the surface of the exposed area as the subject's body heat raised the substance's temperature. This process took between a minute and a few hours, during which ice crystals began to form along the top layer of the skin. This stage is known as surface conversion. In the next stage, deep tissue conversion, the continued increase in SCP-009's temperature causes a ripple effect of reactions through the subject's body, ice crystals forming in the cells and throughout the blood. The subject remained alive and conscious during this stage. Details about the fourth stage of the process have been expunged from the official record, but it is safe to say that something horrible happened. After several of these experiments were conducted, 
testing on live D-Class subjects was officially discontinued. There was a possibility of experimentation on SCP-009 regarding its potential application to cold fusion, but this was also eventually discontinued following a disastrous accident at an unnamed Foundation test site. The site was completely destroyed, and pieces of the lead agent conducting the cold fusion research have still not been recovered. For now, SCP-009 is kept under strict containment and only tested under particular highly regulated circumstances. SCP-009 is kept in a sealed storage tank of heat-resistant alloy. It is not to be exposed to any temperatures higher than 0 degrees Celsius unless there is official Foundation-sanctioned testing being done. No water-based liquids are allowed within 30 meters of the containment area. The storage tank is outfitted with temperature sensors that are to be monitored at all times in order to prevent the temperature within from rising and is kept cold by three different cooling units. If the sensors or cooling units malfunction for any reason, they must be fixed immediately to prevent disaster. When testing is done on SCP-009, the containment area is kept in a vacuum and the personnel working with it must wear protective gear. After testing, all involved personnel must quarantine for at least 12 hours. Any living organisms contaminated by SCP-009 must be terminated promptly. While the exact origins of SCP-009 are unclear, it clearly does not follow the laws of nature as we understand them. A Foundation expert in xenospatial physics suggested that SCP-009 may have come from a universe with alternate laws of physics, explaining its reversal of the ordinary conditions for states of matter. During an instance of SCP-507, the reluctant dimension hopper, shifting into an alternate universe, an instance of SCP-009 was unexpectedly observed that may help confirm this theory. In the test area where SCP-507 appeared, red snow fell for about 27 minutes. Grass touched by this red snow began to react and freeze over within a few minutes. The other plant life touched by the snow turned bright red and expanded to a larger size. It also began to sprout bright blue tentacles covered with red mucilage. Upon closer examination, the mucilage turned out to be comprised of small amounts of SCP-009. This raised additional questions. For instance, how are these plants able to survive constant exposure to SCP-009? This matter is currently under investigation. But the prevailing theory is that this plant is an example of plant life from SCP-009's native universe. Whatever it is, and wherever it comes from, it should not be allowed to come into contact with Earth-based organic life forms. Well, not unless being horrifically frozen to death by your own body feels like an appealing experience to you. The coastline where SCP-009 was initially discovered and its first victims on record were found was located very close to the ocean. Thankfully, the exact area of contamination was dry and cold enough to keep the red ice from spreading, but if it had been even a few meters closer to the water, it could have spread into the North Pacific Ocean. With contamination of that scale, it could have very easily infected thousands of people, perhaps spreading into other bodies of water and triggering a global extinction event. Because of this threat, several members of the SCP Foundation proposed that SCP-009 be upgraded to Keter class in order to reflect its danger to humanity. However, this request was denied due to the currently effective containment measures in place. The red ice is unable to spread to new hosts, infecting the water supply and turning all living things into frozen husks. For now, let's just hope we don't see any red snowstorms anytime soon. Researcher Alice was having a very long day. Working at the SCP Foundation can sound like a pretty exciting job to an outsider. The problem is, when you deal with something exciting every day of your life, it starts to become as mundane as brushing your teeth or pouring your morning bowl of breakfast cereal. Over time, everything loses its magic. She had the unenviable job of double-checking the anomalies in C-Wing of Site-77. Glorified box ticking. She trudged from containment chamber to containment chamber, everything seeming to be in order. Tick, tick, tick. It was all Euclid and safe class anomalies anyway, hardly major containment risks. But when she reached the chamber for SCP-2805, the security cameras normally used to observe the anomaly were on the fritz. She'd need to go inside. Great. When the chamber doors opened, she felt an immediate chill. Her breath came out as an icy fog. In the distance, she saw a jar sitting on a podium. 
the glass so frosted over she couldn't quite make out what was inside. No sign of a containment breach. She ticked the box next to SCP-2805 on her clipboard and moved on. Several hours later, researcher Ellis was at home, finally able to relax. Since she started working at the Foundation, dealing with deadly creatures and cursed artifacts on a daily basis, she'd long for the simple comforts of childhood in her downtime. That's why she decided to spend her evening with a warm mug of hot chocolate, a bowl of ice cream, and her favorite animated Disney movie, Mulan. She had just pressed play when she got a phone call from an unknown number. With a frustrated groan, she picked up the phone and answered. The voice on the other end was a little gravelly, but it sounded kind. His diction was old-fashioned, a man from a bygone era. Why, hello there, young lady. I hope this isn't a bad time, he said. The name's Walt, Walt Disney. Perhaps you've seen some of my motion pictures. I was wondering if I could trouble you for some help with a project of mine. This might have been some stupid prank call. Maybe Dr. Bryant or Dr. Clef was bored and decided they wanted to mess with her. The fact that she was watching a Disney movie at the time was pure coincidence. After all, they own half the movies out there these days. But that's when Walt carried on talking to her. You see, my dear, I'm a little short on time at the moment. I realize I, um, <laughs> perhaps don't have the longevity that I used to. I won't get into the illness right now, but what I do know is that I might not be able to put my final idea into practice, and I believe that you and your organization may be able to help. Your, um, uh, what, what is it called? SCP Foundation? And that changed everything. Researcher Alice immediately knew that this wasn't a prank call. A member of Foundation staff would never discuss Foundation matters, even as a joke, over an unsecured line. And a civilian would have no reason to even know about the Foundation. Was she actually on the phone with THE Walt Disney? It seemed odd and a little more than unlikely on account of him being dead for over 50 years. If only Researcher Ellis had checked her clipboard a little closer then maybe she would have realized that she was already under the anomalous effects of SCP-2805, also humorously known as Disney on Ice. Here's a fun question for you. What's your favorite Disney movie? Probably not what you expected to hear from your friends at SCP Explained, but seriously, we want to know. Tell us down in the comments. Maybe you're a classical purist and you consider Snow White, Cinderella, or Sleeping Beauty to be the best. Maybe you're a fan of the Disney Renaissance, and it's The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, or The Lion King that are the true masterpieces. Or perhaps you're a fan of their more modern outings like Tangled, Frozen, and Moana, or even their acquisitions like Marvel movies or the Star Wars series. Personally, I'm partial to Tron Legacy. We could go on, but honestly, we'd be here all day. The Walt Disney Company, started by Walter Elias Disney and his brother Roy back in 1923, has become one of the most powerful and influential entertainment companies in existence. Their corporate machine is so huge and sprawling, it rivals the size and scope of the SCP Foundation itself, and it's influenced the way we look at everything from mice to pirates to Norse legends to space battles. Some give the United States President the title Leader of the Free World, but anyone in that position would happily drop everything to take a phone call from the CEO of the Walt Disney Company, even today. The company may be a global superpower these days, but none of it would have been possible without Walt himself. Born in 1901, Walt started his legendary company at the tender age of 22. Who would have known that he would leave such an indelible mark on human culture during his 65 years of life? But he's not just an entrepreneur, animator, writer, voice actor, and film producer. He's also, decades after his death, an anomaly currently in the capable hands of the SCP Foundation. Well, his cryogenically frozen severed head is, anyway. And simply looking at that severed head is what puts such an anomalous damper on Researcher Ellis's nice, quiet evening. Confused? Don't worry. Let's start this demented Disney fairy tale at the beginning, by which we mean the end of Walt Disney's life. Walt Disney accomplished more in his life than many of us would be able to claim in several lifetimes. He'd built one of the most enduring entertainment companies of all time, won countless awards, and made millions of dollars from his creations, including the Disneyland theme parks. The man had essentially made his own name synonymous with magic, childhood whimsy, and dreams coming true. 
However, rather than focusing on the past, Walt wanted to keep his eyes on the future. His grand vision went far beyond movies and theme parks. He wanted to shape the way humanity lived for centuries to come. And the name of this vision? Epcot, or the Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. While you may know Epcot as a mere portion of the theme park in the Florida Walt Disney Resort, Walt himself actually intended it to be so much more. As the full name suggests, he dreamed of creating a functional community of tomorrow with over 20,000 residents. In his own words, Epcot will take its cue from the new ideas and new technologies that are now emerging from the creative centers of American industry. It will be a community of tomorrow that will never be completed, but will always be introducing and testing and demonstrating new materials and new systems. And Epcot will always be a showcase to the world of the ingenuity and imagination of American free enterprise. It was certainly a utopian idea, though fans of Bioshock might find their eye twitching with flashbacks to Andrew Ryan's disastrous rapture. However, Disney's problem didn't lie in his plans, but in himself. Despite his achievements and larger-than-life legacy, he was still a mortal man. When Walt tragically contracted lung cancer, he finally became aware of the fact that he may not live to see his beautiful Epcot dream completed. And despite having all the money and fame a man could possibly ask for, he was beginning to realize that his fortune couldn't buy him a second of extra time. Or could it? This question would soon be answered when representatives of a mysterious company known as the Onoroi Collective approached Walt. The strange thing, though, was that the entities that comprised this elusive group of interests contacted Walt in his dreams. You see, the Onoroi Collective are a group of entities known as the Onoroi, or dreamers, who exist only in the dream space, but sometimes interact with our world through anomalous, sometimes semi-organic creations they sell as products. In that sense, they were the original Imagineers. Their creations include SCP-2028, a few hundred snow globes that allow the user to remove and store their nightmares and negative feelings within, and SCP-1498, which are creatures made from old-fashioned rotary phones trailing a huge number of wires, coiled and arranged into sheep-like bodies. By calling the phone on the creature's face, a person can order a custom dreamscape from the Onoroi. Naturally, as creatures who depend on dreams to survive, the Onoroi were big fans of Walt Disney, a man who built a career of encouraging children to dream their little hearts out. In exchange for his contributions to the dreamscape, they'd cut him a deal. They'd give him a special kind of Onoroi technology that would allow his consciousness to continue to exist and interact with the physical realm after his death. All they'd need to keep was his head. It was certainly a strange deal, but Walt was thinking of his children, his grandchildren, and their children and grandchildren. If he died now, then his Tomorrowland dreams would die with him. He'd simply be known for some charming animated films and a couple of amusing theme parks, not for truly changing the future. It seemed that the deal with the Onoroi Collective was too good to resist. The deal was struck, and arrangements were made to preserve Disney's head and consciousness after his death. Ten days after his 65th birthday, on December 15, 1966, Walt Disney passed away. But that was only the beginning of his new, anomalous life. While the public mourned, Disney's head was secretly removed and preserved in a jar with anomalous cryonics technology. The device is also fixed to a pair of rotary phones, a trademark of the Onoroi, and an inscription that reads, Siberian Solutions from the Onoroi Collective. The anomalous effect was simple. Anyone who looked directly at Disney's frozen head would receive a phone call in the next 24 hours. This phone call would be from Walt Disney himself, presumably inhabiting the Onoroi dreamscape now. With this handy trick, he'd be able to maintain his communications with the rest of the Walt Disney Company in secret and see the creation of his precious Epcot project to its completion. But unfortunately, that's not actually how it happened. Following Walt's death, his brother Roy took over all Walt Disney Company operations. While the profitability of the company didn't suffer under Roy's control, Walt's final dream did. Epcot mutated from the sustainable, functional community of the future that Walt desired into a mere theme park, the Disney-fied World's Fair that all Orlando Disney Park visitors of today would recognize. As it turned out, most people in the Disney company weren't actually eager to take orders from the former CEO's severed head. As a result, he became kind of a dark company secret, 
hidden away within the Disney parks. After a number of reports of calls from Walt Disney after the entrepreneur's death, the foundation finally started to take notice. They conducted a thorough investigation of the various Disney bases of operation and eventually found Disney's frozen head, soon redesignated SCP-2805 in a secret compartment in the legendary Pirates of the Caribbean ride. He was relocated to Site-77 soon after for further testing, where his anomalous abilities were later discovered. Sadly for SCP-2805, while his calls to Foundation staff have all consisted of attempts in enlisting the Foundation's help in making his Epcot dreams a reality, nobody has yet taken him up on the offer. Since his containment, the Foundation's main priority has just been suppressing conspiracy theories about the existence of Walt Disney's cryogenically frozen head, a task which they undertake with collaboration from the Disney Company. In order to muddy the waters, in 1981 they began productions of Walt Disney's World on Ice, later known as Disney on Ice, a traveling ice skating show. Since then, they also released the incredibly successful film Frozen and its sequel, to corrupt any searches for key phrases like Disney's Frozen or Walt Ice. It's been an incredibly effective smokescreen, as you can probably expect from the SCP Foundation. And sadly for Walt and fans of a mid-century perspective on the future, it's likely that Walt Disney's dreams will stay within his disembodied head. So if you're hoping to prove the existence of this truly wild anomaly, or somehow get in contact with Walt and help him bring Epcot to its intended glory, you should probably just let it go. As we grow up and get older, our bodies begin to change. Sometimes those changes can be a bit uncomfortable or even bizarre. We feel strange pains in new places. We grow seemingly a foot in height overnight. Hair sprouts up in new places and falls out of other places. Whether it's puberty or just the aging process, it seems like the human body never runs out of ways to surprise us. But those surprises are completely normal and to be expected as part of being alive. Unless you're one particular young man whose body changed overnight into something unrecognizable and entirely anomalous. That's when a very special individual we'll be calling Matt Terra comes in. Matt was an ordinary 24-year-old man, with nothing particularly interesting about him. Sure, he was a nice guy, he was smart, he was great at chess and video games, and had an impressive memory for science trivia, but there was nothing unusual about him. Every day he would get up, go to work at a board game and comic book store, chat with his co-workers and make a few sales, head home, make dinner, relax, and go to bed ready to do it all again the next day. It wasn't a glamorous life or that exciting, but it was a pleasant life, and he was happy to live it. One night Matt was having a difficult time sleeping. He was tossing and turning, waking up every few minutes to a dull, aching feeling in his stomach. He didn't feel feverish or sick, and the pain wasn't sharp or indicative of an emergency, so he shrugged it off as indigestion and tried to get back to sleep. We've all been there, right? Eventually, he nodded off all the way. He woke up the next morning blurry-eyed and exhausted from the rough night, but feeling otherwise fine. He climbed out of bed, stretched, and headed to the bathroom to brush his teeth. There in the mirror, he saw something that made him think he might still be dreaming. He pinched himself and found that he was indeed awake. While he was sleeping, somehow his body had changed into something completely impossible. Where his stomach had once been, there was a blue, green, and brown orb that reminded him of a photograph he had once seen. A picture of Earth taken aboard the International Space Station. After calling into work and explaining in a stammering voice that he would not be coming in that day, Matt did the only thing he could think of. He went to the hospital. Of course, the doctors had no idea what to do with him. It wasn't like they could just take out his appendix or give him an antibiotic. None of them had ever seen anything like this before. Fortunately for him, one doctor knew a lot more than he was letting on. Matt wouldn't be the first human to develop bizarre anomalous traits and then stagger into a nearby hospital for treatment. That's why the SCP Foundation has agents embedded in major hospitals all across the world. And one such doctor was the man treating Matt. On the downside, he wouldn't be enjoying his freedom much longer. On the upside, it'd cost a hell of a lot less than a regular uninsured hospital visit. So the field agent called up his superiors, 
wiped Matt's record from the hospital, and soon after a group of Foundation agents came to collect the confused, unfortunate host of what soon would be known as SCP-007. SCP-007 is found within an abdominal cavity on the body of Matt, also referred to as the subject just below his ribcage where his stomach would be. Most of his abdomen is completely missing, including the muscles, skin, and organs that should ordinarily be necessary for his survival. However, he does not appear to experience any pain or even discomfort from his condition. SCP-007 itself is a spherical planet composed of soil and water, none of which actually touches any part of his body. The planet resembles a miniature duplicate of Earth, about 60 centimeters in diameter, with its own weather patterns and gravitational pull, neither of which appear to have any effect on the subject, nor do they seem to be affected by his movements or behavior. There are also a variety of tiny organisms dwelling on the planet's surface that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Though it greatly resembles Earth, there are some notable differences. Obviously, instead of floating in space and revolving around the Sun, this planet does not appear to have an orbit. It is uncertain where the organisms on the planet get their light from though it does not seem to be our sun, since the organisms have not shown any negative effects from the lack of sunlight and presence of artificial light in the Foundation's site. There are continents visible on the planet's surface, surrounded by its sea, but they do not resemble a continental alignment that can be traced to any point in our Earth's history. As far for the life on the small planet, the organisms navigating the surface of the world inside Matt's abdomen. There are dozens of identifiable species that bear a passing resemblance to creatures on Earth. There are blue cow-like livestock, species of bird that appear to have scales, red and orange trees, and other plant life, and two intelligent species that are notably and significantly humanoid in appearance and behavior. Observation of these intelligent species via microscope and digital imaging has revealed that they operate in societies and are consistently developing and improving their technology. Though their technology was incredibly rudimentary when Matt was first brought into containment, resembling early nomadic human civilizations, it has progressed to the level of 15th century humanity. The research team assigned to SCP-007 has noticed the recent introduction of a version of the printing press, used to produce what appear to be pamphlets and even entire books. The language these books are printed in is unrecognizable, and so the contents of these materials are currently unknown. But the citizens of the planet clearly have a grasp of the written word and both the technology and the desire to share it amongst themselves. They have also developed an agricultural system. Their farms have progressed to the point of using new innovations such as windmills used to mill grain, wheelbarrows used to transport crops and other supplies, and the practice of crop rotation. Unfortunately, with these positive developments comes the ability to escalate conflicts and wage wars. They look to have created parachutes, gunpowder, and other explosives, and their own versions of the muzzle-loaded rifle. However, in spite of the ugliness of battle, there is beauty too. The people of the planet have created new ways to express themselves, with what can only be described as new instruments closely resembling the piano, the mandolin, and the bagpipes. As exciting and even moving as it can be to watch these tiny beings grow and change, building their own miniature society, it is also a bit troubling. As these people continue to progress at such a fast rate, it stands to reason that they will eventually catch up to us, or even surpass us in terms of technology. The research team has not yet made any attempts to communicate with the inhabitants of the abdominal planet, concerned about influencing the developments of its societies in any way, or compromising their ability to observe them without interfering, but they may not be able to keep this up for much longer. What will happen if these tiny beings continue to follow in our footsteps and create their very own space programs? If they leave their planet's atmosphere, they will discover the truth, that their world is buried in the abdomen of what is, to them, a giant man. That reality would be enough to shatter the sanity of many of us, and it would likely cause chaos on their world. There has been a great deal of debate amongst the research team about what to do if this should happen. Some insist that the team should continue to passively observe until the issue comes up, 
while others believe that they should attempt to make contact with the inhabitants of the planet in order to soften the eventual blow to their perceptions when they attempt space exploration. Currently, the debate rages on, as the research team keeps an eye on the progression of the little civilizations. Hopefully, if they do eventually make contact, they will find a way to make it clear that we come in peace. So, who is Matt Terra, the subject? He is a highly intelligent young man, with a shockingly casual attitude towards his body's anomalous properties. When asked about the planet, he simply says, I just woke up one day and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Testing revealed that he is genetically human, and there is nothing unusual or even notable about the rest of his body. He provided his name willingly upon arriving at the SCP Foundation, but no one of his name and age has ever lived in his hometown area according to public records. To verify his identity, he was able to produce a social security card and a driver's license, which did not appear to be forged or altered in any way. However, when the numbers were run through the system, there was no match. Officially, this man does not exist. It is not entirely certain where he came from or why there is no record of him. But one researcher posited that he somehow crossed over from a parallel dimension or that the presence of his abdominal planet added as a kind of cognitohazardous effect to him that erased all perception of him from any records. Whatever the case may be, wherever he came from, he is here now. Because he has not yet attempted escape or even shown a desire to leave the Foundation's site, there are no strict containment procedures in place. The only active containment procedures for SCP-007 are for the subject's safety and security. He lives in a sealed room with furniture and other items, which are granted upon request as long as they do not pose a security risk. The subject's room includes an easy chair, a bed, a beanbag chair, a television with access to several movie and television streaming services, a number of video game consoles, an espresso machine, a microwave, a refrigerator, an exercise bike, and a bookshelf filled with books and graphic novels. Though he does not appear to require food or water in order to survive, he enjoys consuming both food and drinks, and is especially fond of coffee, sodas, grape juice, sour cream and onion potato chips, mangoes, and the occasional treat of Chinese takeout, mm -hmm. an opinion which he shares with the eccentric Dr. Clef. The head researcher assigned to SCP-007, Dr. Cho, has a weekly game of chess with Matt, during which he evaluates the subject's mental health and general emotional well-being. Over the course of these games, the two have developed a friendly relationship, with each man winning about half of the time. Matt asks about Dr. Cho's family, and in return, Dr. Cho checks in about his containment situation, seeing if there's anything the Foundation can provide to make his time with them more comfortable. Most recently, Matt requested a computer with an internet connection, mainly so that he could play his video games in online co-op mode, but this request was denied out of a concern that it would compromise Foundation security. Sympathetic to his desire for company, Dr. Cho has begun to allow the subject to have visits with SCP-507, who will stop by his containment facility during his inactive periods for a movie night or some video games. Matt has described 507 as his best friend, aside from Dr. Cho. In spite of the intricate world inexplicably floating in his body, the subject leads a relatively simple life. He does not seem to be restless or resentful at all. In fact, he seems largely content. Though his future is uncertain, and he is living through a completely unprecedented anomalous experience, he is probably one of the happiest anomalies contained at the SCP Foundation, and definitely one of the most at peace with his anomalous status. Whatever happens next for him, he will probably be ready for it with a smile, and there's something we can all learn from that. A streak of warm blood splattered across the snow. Steam rose off it as it fizzled into the ice crystals below. The severed leg it just spurted from lay twitching only a few inches away, torn clean off at the hip like a broken Barbie doll. I think it might have belonged to Arthur. It wasn't the first time I'd seen limbs cut off. Hell, I've cut a few off myself in my time. Eh, don't worry, I'm not a serial killer. Just a med student. We all were. I couldn't say the same for the nightmare we encountered up in the mountains that terrible day. The thin, cold air was laden with screams. Mine, my friends, and that things. All that it done to us. All that it was still doing to us. And never once did it stop shrieking and sobbing at the top of its lungs like it wasn't even in control of its actions. It didn't want to do this, it just had to. The violence was as inevitable as the sunset. I screamed for Kyle. The snow was coming down thick and fast, a curtain of burning, brilliant light. I couldn't see anyone, not even that thing that was killing us. 
the water in my eyes was starting to freeze up. It was cold. So damn cold. What the hell was going on here? Suddenly a dark shape was moving towards me through the wall of falling snow. It was human, vaguely, moving towards me with frantic speed. I tensed in anticipation when I then saw Kyle emerging from the fog. He was splattered with blood, his face red from screaming and exertion. His eyes pleaded for help I couldn't give him. The horror caused my body to react on autopilot with my eyes clamming closed in terror. All I could do was open my mouth, pointing with a shaking frostbitten finger and force out a scream. BEHIND YOU! My words were carried off by the brutal mountain winds, and with the sounds of mutilation ahead of me. All I could imagine with eyes clamped closed as I hit the frozen ground was a long, gray arm emerging from the flurry behind Kyle, its gnarled, clawed fingers reaching for his head. It was meant to be the vacation of a lifetime, the kind of thing that you could only experience once but you'd never forget. We all thought in our own ways that we'd look back on the photos with misty eyes when we were all old men. We didn't know that within a week of arriving in Switzerland, whether any of us would even make it to old age would suddenly become an open question. All four of us were doctors in training. Even if you don't know much about the profession, it probably won't surprise you to hear that there's a lot of practice and education involved before you can ever really call yourself a doctor without feeling like a fraud. You need to ace your SATs, then slog through four years of pre-med, another four years of medical school, then the better part of a decade doing your residency. Seems a little much, I know, but believe me, you don't want some cowboy sticking his hands in your chest cavity without all the proper training. But after we finally graduated from Harvard Med, my friends and I decided that we needed a break before the profession swallowed us back up again. It was me, Brandon, Arthur, and of course, Kyle. A lot of people I attended class with would probably make a tidy sum over the course of their medical careers. Many of them would have made fine doctors, but all of us knew that Kyle Malloy was more than that. He was going to be a truly great doctor. He was smart, confident, driven, and had the kind of smooth, effortless charm that made you just feel safe around him. Where he went, we followed. So naturally, when he suggested we take a week-long sojourn in Switzerland, the rest of us were all for it. We expected an easy week of gourmet cheese, fine chocolate, and the occasional jaunt down some old historic districts. The exact kind of relaxing break we needed after the soul-crushing pressure of eight years studying the hollowed art of medicine. But, of course, that wasn't what Kyle had planned for us. It turned out his tastes were far more extreme than what the rest of us had in mind. His vision of a Swiss vacation was mostly forest hikes, backcountry skiing, snowboarding, and a little mountaineering through the Swiss Alps. Apparently, he'd spent a good portion of his childhood taking Swiss vacations, and wanted to give us a little slice of his personal paradise. As someone who wasn't exactly crazy about heights or the cold, I can't pretend I was eager at first, but Kyle always found a way of talking us back around. It wasn't long until we were booking our tickets, then sitting on the plane, watching the mountains get bigger through the window, and our feet were on Swiss soil. It was a beautiful country, and every bit as cold as I had feared. But soon enough, the cold would be the absolute least of our worries. As I glanced over the breathtaking view of the Alps, I had no idea of the terrible nightmare lurking out there, hidden in the dark spaces of those great rocks. Something I learned in med school is that human beings are kind of like fleshy time bombs, their fuse ever burning. When you reach a certain age, and believe me, that age is younger than you think, the assassin that will one day sneak up from within and take your life is already waiting inside you. The cluster of malformed cells that will one day turn into an inoperable malignant tumor. The early whispers of the heart defect that gives your ticker its planned obsolescence. The microscopic ropes of defective genes that will one day turn into Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. In some cases, it's just a matter of whether you can catch it in time. But in just as many cases, there really is nothing you can do. You're just waiting for it to get you. After three days in Switzerland, we were suiting up in our thick coats and climbing boots, having no idea that the same principle applied to us. Except this wasn't that nasty little assassin within. It was something outside. Something that none of our skills or knowledge could save us from. Something very old and very dangerous. We were in fate's hands now, and sometimes fate can be cruel. Kyle was steaming ahead. He didn't just want us to ascend just any mountain peak. He wanted us to attempt the Dufferspites, the highest peak of the Monte Rosa Massif, and the Alps as a whole. 
Kyle didn't think anything less than that would be a challenge. After all, this was our once-in-a-lifetime vacation before we fully started our residency. Didn't we want to make this a truly remarkable experience? And because it was Kyle, none of us disagreed. We started at the base of the Monte Rosa and began to rise. Its lowest levels barely resembled its frosty peak, over 4,600 feet above. We took pictures of some of the wildlife, the grazing ibexes, red deer, and chamois. Arthur had brought a pamphlet on the local wildlife back at a tourist-friendly mountain lodge and took great joy in pointing out the different creatures to us as he saw them. Brandon got a good laugh about the fact that there was a small bird native to the area known as the Nuthatch. Kyle forged ahead, telling us tales of his prior conquests. The climb gradually transitioned from calm to grueling as we ascended the mountain. I could feel the blisters forming on my feet as the cold first made my face sting and then go completely numb. Arthur, still consulting his pamphlet, expressed excitement to see a marmot when we finally reached 2,000 feet of elevation. Brandon started to complain vocally, pouring himself a cup of coffee from his thermos. Kyle chastised him for wimping out already. After all, he said, the hardest parts were yet to come. <sighs> oh, if only he knew just how right he was. We ascended further, feeling the air thinning and our legs growing exhausted beneath us. I started to resent Kyle as he forged on despite it all. How could he keep going when the rest of us were faltering? It just wasn't fair. When the rest of us needed to take a breather, we could feel the sting of his silent judgment. He was always so damn perfect. We're almost there, he kept saying, even though we all knew it wasn't true. Things took a turn during one of our rest stops. We heard this strange noise, a kind of pained wailing or keening. There was nothing overtly menacing about it, but somehow just hearing that noise chilled me deeper than any icy gust of mountain breeze. It's difficult to describe, but that terrible sobbing felt like the purest distillation of true, bottomless despair. I've never heard a more hopeless and mournful noise. Referring to his pamphlet again, Arthur speculated that the noise could potentially be a lynx. Such creatures were apparently native to the area, and their calls had a bizarrely human quality to them. But somehow, deep down I knew this thing wasn't human, and it wasn't an animal either. Whatever was making those noises defied normal metrics of categorization. To the surprise of no one, me least of all, Kyle decided to lead the way in the direction of that awful noise. Brandon and Arthur followed him closely over the next tundra, getting closer and closer to the sobbing. I hung back a little further, gripped by the profound sense of dread. I didn't want to find out what was making this noise. I knew deep in my guts that if ever we found out what was making that noise, something terrible would happen. And then, moments later, it did. I heard Kyle gasp for the first time ever. The snow was blinding my view and I couldn't make out what was actually happening until Arthur ran back toward my direction and through the blanket of white snow and with a voice barely audible through his trembling, said that there was a long gray creature. He said it was naked and looked kind of human, but definitely was not. I could barely make out what my buddies were doing ahead of me, but from the looks of it, it seemed like Kyle was walking closer. Every cell in my body was screaming, no, 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 no. But by that point, it was already far too late for all of us. The creature began to turn. Perhaps it was raw animal instinct that saved me, but I began to turn too, almost in unison, to look away from the creature. I just knew that whatever this thing was, I couldn't bear to see it, and it was at that moment, as my body hit the snow and I forced my eyes closed, that the screaming began. First I could recognize the voices of Brandon, Arthur, and Kyle screaming, and then something worse. I can only assume it was the creature itself making the most terrible racket, shrieking, moaning, sobbing, and then ripping and tearing, blood spattering across the snow. I just cowered and shook against the ground as a massacre unfolded behind me. I was listening to my friends die, powerless. Kyle, all his strength and direction stripped away by terror, was snatched by the creature as freezing snowy wind gave it a cloak. I heard Kyle scream, and then never heard anything from him ever again. Soon enough, it was quiet once more. No noise save for the howling wind and the quiet sobbing of the abomination from the snow. I don't know for sure why the creature spared me, but part of me has always suspected that it was because I never looked at it. I'll forever be darkly curious as to what the monster truly looked like, but my friends found out, and now I'd never see them again. I wandered through the unforgiving cold for hours, fully expecting that my frozen body would be found in the Alps hours, days, or even weeks later. 
I didn't even care anymore. The cold numbed my skin, my limbs, and my thoughts. At some point a helicopter descended onto the mountainside, full of men in tactical gear with insignias I couldn't recognize. They wrapped me in an emergency blanket and brought me in, telling me I required treatment. It all turned to static as we fluttered away from the mountainside, and all I could think about was the monster that had taken my friends from me. It was still out there, waiting. The fabric of our world is littered with strange doorways if you know where to look for them. Tears, portals, anomalies, all leading to places and planes beyond human imagining and understanding. An SCP-2317, otherwise known as a door to another world, certainly fits that description. Contained and kept at all times under the watch of armed guards, SCP-2317 appears to be a simple and unsuspecting wooden door in its frame. It hardly looks like it requires such extreme round-the-clock security, or needs a strange, secretive ritual that the Foundation performs, presumably to keep the door closed. But of course, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed doorway isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. Even by the Foundation's already high standards, the requirements and regulations for personnel who are assigned to SCP-2317 seem oddly specific. Psychological testing is standard practice to work for the Foundation, but an additional hurdle that anyone has to clear before even getting to glimpse at this unassuming wooden door is having a score of at least 72 on the Milgram Obedience Examination. It is also mandatory that personnel assigned to maintaining it are both unmarried, with no children or next of kin, as well as an unwavering, unquestioning loyalty to the Foundation, pure devotion to its code and objectives. These may seem like strange requirements. After all, SCP-2317 is just a door, isn't it? Perhaps there's a reason that the Foundation keeps so much of the information about SCP-2317 buried deep under layers upon layers of security, with only the Overseer Council privy to the full details of its strange nature. Knowledge, as they say, is power. But maybe knowing too much about whatever is behind that door can prove deadly. Still, if SCP-2317 is a door to another world, an alternate dimension, or parallel reality, it must be safe enough to visit. After all, the Foundation has been sending personnel in there on a regular basis. Daily, in fact. According to the O5 Council, this is done as part of a procedure to maintain active containment of… something lurking beyond that old wooden doorframe. But what could possibly warrant such constant maintenance and surveillance? In accordance with the Foundation's guidelines, all staff are required to rotate out of observing SCP-2317 after every two months, and spend the following third month in full psychological counseling, before they are permitted to return to the containment unit housing the door to another world. It was after one of these month-long periods of evaluation that a Foundation guard was informed that his security clearance has been raised to level 3, and that he'd been selected for the duty of carrying out 220 Calabasas. He knew the name instantly. This was the title given to the daily containment procedure that absolutely had to be carried out. The guard didn't question these orders. After all, he'd been selected precisely because of his loyalty to the Foundation. He did make one request to his commanding officer, however. He wanted to know what had happened to the last guard that had performed the procedure. Didn't make it out of psychological evaluation, the officer replied. Not letting this affect his dedication, the guard was told to prepare for Procedure 220 Calabasas. Along with a fellow member of Foundation security personnel, the guard was instructed to gather everything on a strange list. The first was a pre-selected member of Class D personnel, specifically a convicted murderer. Class D refers to disposable class personnel, expendable individuals recruited by the Foundation for the sole purpose of testing SCPs. Class Ds were usually prison inmates repurposed for SCP testing, and the one chosen for 220 Calabasas was no exception, serving multiple life sentences for murders, or at least that's what the guard had been told. A Foundation personnel member instructed him to refer to the Class Ds solely as the assistant from that point on. Next, the guard collected a live chicken, an obsidian edged knife, a silver aspergillum and aspersorium, to be filled with 500 cc's of holy water, that have been blessed by a priest of the Abrahamic faith, and finally, a one kiloton nuclear device, 
which according to instructions, was only to be detonated in the unlikely event of a catastrophic containment failure. In other words, the last resort. After following his instructions to the letter and without question, the guard and his colleague were briefed. The Foundation personnel member informed them that he'd be joining and leading them in the procedure. The staff member also specified that henceforth he'd be referred to as the celebrant until the completion of 220 Calabasas. The guard was acutely aware of how specific these instructions were, but trusted in the Foundation. Knowing that if they wanted this procedure performed a certain way, then it was in everyone's best interest to carry out the orders to the letter. But what the celebrant then went on to explain raised far more questions about SCP-2317 and the nature of Procedure 220 Calabasas. The Class D joining them wasn't actually a Class D. The assistant, as they were now referred to, was in reality another Foundation staff member with a level 4 security clearance specifically tailored to SCP-2317. Every member of staff entering through SCP-2317 and taking an active role in 22 Calabasas needed to be informed that this assistant was not to be harmed or treated as a member of disposable class. Fighting back the nagging question of why the Foundation would employ this subterfuge, the guard, along with his fellow security officer, the celebrant, and assistant, prepared for their departure through the door to another world at solar noon, when the sun was highest over SCP-2317. Solar noon, chickens, and holy water. This all seemed like an oddly occult combination for the Foundation. As they entered the old wooden door, beyond lay a barren salt plain, stretching out for kilometers in every direction. This alternate dimension, according to the briefing, was designated SCP-2317 Prime. The guard immediately noticed a ring of seven pillars directly ahead of the group as they entered, each of them bearing intricately detailed engravings unlike anything from any era of ancient history. Procedure 220 Calabasas was carried out quickly but carefully, the guard watching as the celebrant and assistant were careful not to miss a step. First, the celebrant scattered holy water into the center of the pillars with the Aspergillum and Aspersorium, looking down at his feet and keeping a steady pace as he stepped counterclockwise around them. The guard watched intently as the celebrant completed his circuit around the pillars and turned to the assistant, anointing his head with holy water. Seven seals, seven rings, seven thrones for the Scarlet King, he said aloud. The assistant, with the obsidian blade in his hand, took the chicken and dispatched it in sacrifice, letting its blood mix with the holy water. He then repeated the celebrant's circuit in the opposite direction, before stepping into the center of the stone pillars. Blood for the old gods, water for the new king, the assistant recited, pouring the remaining mix of blood and holy water over a patch of salt in the middle of the seven pillars. Even though he knew it wasn't his place to question the foundation, as the 220 Calabasas procedure took place, the guard couldn't help but wonder what all of this was for. It seemed so… ritualistic, like something deeply religious or even magical. He never bought into all that occult mumbo-jumbo, even while working for the Foundation, but he had learned not to question anything, even the strangest and most inexplicable of sights. Little did he know that beneath his feet, was an ancient and unknowable horror, a beast chained and lying in wait. Contained in a chamber directly underneath the pillars sat an impossibly large creature. Humanoid and obese, its body covered entirely in scales thicker than armor plating. Branch-like horns protruded from its jawless head, pointing up to chains that hung from the seven pillars above. Each one hooked into the entity's back. All but one of the chains was broken, a final withering shackle keeping the devourer of worlds in its underground prison. Ever since 1894 BCE, when Erechian mystics imprisoned it, the devourer has been waiting patiently for its inevitable freedom. It knows, as well as the Foundation, that nothing can be done to prevent the final chain from one day breaking. Even Procedure 220 Calabasas won't keep the creature contained. It's nothing more than a smokescreen, an act designed to create an illusion of active containment and maintain Foundation morale until a permanent solution can be devised to keep SCP-2317 imprisoned. Of course, if the guard had known this, 
It would have also explained the need for a one kiloton nuclear device as part of this staged ritual. Procedure 220 Calabasas had all the components to trick everyone below the O5 Council. Emulating religious and occult rituals, the increased level of security surrounding the procedure and its purpose, and telling staff that any failure to correctly and completely perform the 220 Calabasas procedure will result in an XK class end of the world scenario. All these elements work together to conceal the truth that one day the devourer will escape and lay waste to our dimension. Knowledge is power and maybe knowing too much truly is deadly. Perhaps if the guard had learned any of this, he'd have understood why his predecessor never made it out of psychological evaluation. Maybe if he had questioned the purpose of Procedure 220 Calabasas, he'd have learned the true nature of SCP-2317 and what that doorway kept out. But he was loyal to the Foundation through and through. As the team finished performing 220 Calabasas and returned through the wooden door, the guard took one last glance over his shoulder at the vast salt plain. The entire dimension was calm, silent, but not peaceful. It was patient. The entity had waited centuries for its time, and now all it would take was the breaking of this seventh and final chain. One day. The door was closed behind the guard as he, the celebrant, the assistant, and his fellow security officers stepped back through. Their work done, and, as far as they knew, preventing catastrophe for another day. Only the Foundation higher-ups, the Overseer Council, are aware of the true danger posed by SCP-2317 and its sole inhabitant. Current predictions are that at some point within the next 30 years, the Devourer of Worlds will be freed. Any and all attempts to repair or recreate the chains holding it in place have so far failed. As such, the O5 Council has elected to continue providing Foundation personnel with the ignorant hope that Procedure 220 Calabasas is an effective strategy for containment. As we've said, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed door isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. In the case of SCP-2317, the unassuming wooden door holds at bay an ancient creature of untold power that will one day break free and wreak havoc in our dimension. Nothing the Foundation does can prevent it, or keep it contained behind the door to another world. And only the Overseer Council knows that any and all efforts to do so are futile. With all that in mind, we can only hope that the doorway of SCP-2317 stays closed, at least for a little while longer. We've all heard of the Led Zeppelin song, Stairway to Heaven, a title that invokes the image of a stairway leading up to a land of peace and paradise. But where else could a stairway lead? To a dusty attic full of old photo albums? To the upper level of a mall where the movie theater and frozen yogurt shop are neatly situated? Perhaps it leads to a rooftop with a beautiful view. Or maybe, just maybe, a staircase could lead you to SCP-2427. SCP-2427, appropriately nicknamed a thing full of stuff, is an extra-dimensional area filled with a variety of unusual and anomalous objects. SCP-2427 can be accessed by way of a broken stone staircase located in rural Ohio. According to local legend, carrying a sprig of hemlock up the broken stairs will allow a person to emerge into a mysterious grass clearing that appears to be in a forest somewhere in the United States. No matter what time a person ascends the staircase, the solar time in the clearing will always be 2 p.m. You know how people say it's 5 o'clock somewhere? Well, it's 2 o'clock somewhere too. And that somewhere is here. The pocket dimension that is SCP-2427 is thought to have been a holding area for weapons, prisoners, and artifacts belonging to an ancient cult known as the Brazen Heart. Little is known about this relatively obscure cult, other than the fact that they worship the demonic entity Moloch, a known enthusiast of violent human sacrifice, and were previously thought to have been eradicated during the Spanish Inquisition. The existence of SCP-2427 suggests that they are very much not eradicated, and are still active. They refer to these holding areas as attics, 
and though no confirmed members of the Brazen Heart have been contacted, it is considered possible that there are at least a handful of other addicts hidden around the world. The Foundation has identified seven anomalous objects inside of SCP-2427 so far, each strange in its own beautiful, though often terrible, way. Like snowflakes, if they were capable of killing or maiming you. The first object in SCP-2427, aka SCP-2427-1, is a seemingly normal fire hydrant. However, if you think there's anything normal about the items found here, then you haven't been paying attention. The hydrant is made out of lead, and when opened, it expels high levels of ionized radiation. No specific measurements of the radiation have been taken yet, but it is definitely hazardous to human health. One unfortunate member of D-Class personnel has proven that it is a high enough level to melt human flesh. Sorry about your face, Dave. The hydrant is currently contained within an electrified perimeter and is not to be opened under any circumstances to prevent any further flesh melting. The last thing we need is another Dave incident. The second object contained within SCP-2427 or SCP-2427-2 is not actually an object at all. It's a building. Only on number two and we're already throwing curveballs at you. Trust no one. Surprises lurk around every corner. This particular building resembles a large multi-storied sanitarium built in the 1860s. Though it is clear from the outside that the building has or should have multiple stories, the inside is a different matter. Past the building's front doors is a non-Euclidean space consisting of a single floor and three sparsely decorated rooms with one central foyer. The first room is the holding place for SCP-2427-3. The second contains SCP-2427-4, and the third room contains nothing except scattered religious documents, bottled water, and a selection of canned food. No unauthorized staff are permitted to enter the building, in order to minimize complications or potential employee casualties. The first two anomalies on this list are hardly even strange by SCP Foundation standards. Sure, the hydrant can melt your face, and the building defies the laws of physics and space. But that's just a regular Tuesday around these parts. Huh, <sighs> been there, seen that. What else you got? Well, SCP-2427-3 is where things really get strange. If you're wandering through the bowels of SCP-2427-2 and you make a wrong turn into the first room, you will find yourself face to face with a startling sight. This entity is a combination of electronic circuitry, a cow's digestive tract, the hairless head of a human man, a hat rack, several lengths of garden hose, and an unidentified crystalline structure. This creature is extraordinarily fast and strong, exhibiting carnivorous tendencies and a very strong point of view on the world around it. Lucky for us, it is capable of speech and is able to tell us just what it thinks. Though this monstrosity doesn't have much of a right to pass judgment on anyone, cow intestine body and all, it has expressed a violent hatred of all life that it considers impure. Anyone who encounters SCP-2427-3 experiences an overwhelming desire to submit themselves for judgment, allowing the creature to determine their purity. There is a rumor that if one is judged to be pure, they will have a wish granted. If they are deemed impure, however, they will be devoured alive. If you're tempted to introduce yourself to the creature, your odds are not especially great. The creature has not encountered a single pure being yet. In order to protect the Foundation staff working in its vicinity, the entrance to SCP-2427-3's room has been sealed off with a reinforced steel door, and the windows have been paved over with concrete. Armed guards are watching the entrance at all times. The creature must be fed one live goat per day in order to keep its appetite satiated. The Foundation's goat budget is through the roof these days, but it's worth it to keep the thing contained. Better to spend money on goats now and not spend money on cannibalized personnel later. SCP-2427-4 consists not of an object located within a room, but the room itself. The room, which contains no furniture and a linoleum floor, has a peculiar effect on the human psyche. Once a person steps foot into the room, they lose consciousness for five minutes. During this time, they will speak freely, listing off a variety of negative qualities about themselves. Once they wake up, they have no memory of entering this state or anything that they said during it. It's cheaper than therapy, right? 
but it's also much weirder and less effective, so you get what you pay for in the end. A member of D-Class personnel who was observed inside of the room wax poetic about his personal failings, beginning his monologue with, My soul is a den of spiders, and ending it with, Oh, here, once I awaken, hesitate not to feed my flesh and my soul to the judge beast. Somebody give this guy a hug because the room seems to have no adverse effects on human test subjects except for causing everyone who hears their monologue a bit of discomfort. There are no containment procedures in effect for it at this time. We've had rooms, fire hydrants, and horrible meat-robot hybrids. And now, you can't even trust the clouds in the sky. SCP-2427-5 is a seemingly innocent cloud, hovering stationary over the building. When looked at by a human for more than three seconds, the cloud will eject a ball of solid lead towards the person at a supersonic speed. That's right, folks. This cloud can and will shoot you. It hates being observed, but it also hates when you try to leave the perimeter. It will attack any person attempting to leave by firing the same lead ball at them. So far, 14 personnel have been killed by this highly aggressive cloud. And some people still think thunderstorms and hail are the worst things clouds have to offer. So naive. As it is a literal cloud, there is no way to contain it, so no people in the vicinity of the cloud are permitted to look at it for more than three seconds at a time. SCP-2427-6 is a series of 18 small trees, spread throughout the instance of SCP-2427. Above ground, the trees look normal, though their species has proven surprisingly difficult to determine. From an external perspective, they are simply ordinary trees. However, radar analysis revealed that the roots of these trees are deeply strange. Instead of the usual twisting tree roots, the ground below these trees contains a mass in the shape of a human body. Much to the disgust of the observing researchers, these humanoid masses occasionally twitch and move, as if alive. The trees themselves appear to be growing from the crotch area of each humanoid figure. How's that for Morningwood? I know, I get it, bad joke. This arrangement between tree and person seems to be some kind of punishment, as each tree is marked with a plaque reading, The Letras suffer what they must, and it is beautiful. Until it can be certain that the condition of these human roots is not contagious, these trees are to be treated as potential biohazards and isolated in individual containers. The final object in SCP-2427 currently categorized by the Foundation is SCP-2427-7. SCP-2427-7 is a pile of ashes and wood located just behind a posted sign that reads, The Liar's Cradle. Extensive testing has been established that the Liar's Cradle was almost certainly used as a torture device in interrogations performed by the Brazen Heart. A person standing within the boundaries of the cradle, which encompasses the aforementioned circle of wood and ashes, is unable to lie without suffering the consequences. Namely, they will be set on fire. The nature of how exactly the liar's cradle works is not certain, and more research needs to be done on it. However, this much is known for sure. It contains no sentient intelligence. It is not aware of what it is doing. It does not kill its victims, rather it keeps them miraculously alive as it sets them on fire, prolonging their agony and allowing their interrogators to get the truth out of them. A series of experiments reveal that it only immolates a person who is knowingly lying. D-Class personnel give demonstrably false information to repeat in the cradle without knowledge of its falsehood were not set on fire. However, when those same D-Class personnel knowingly lied in the boundaries, they immediately were set ablaze. It is almost certain that the Brazen Heart Cult used the cradle as a method of interrogating presumed liars in their midst. Further investigation will likely reveal human remains beneath the cradle itself, though this is just a hypothesis currently. But come on, there has to be some bones somewhere beneath something as ominous as the liar's cradle. Though they have only identified seven anomalies inside SCP-2427 at the moment, there are plenty more lurking in there, waiting to be discovered. In the foyer of SCP-2427-2, the Foundation discovered an extremely ominous list of items, clearly belonging to members of the Cult of the Brazen Heart. This list included some familiar items, such as Pilgrim Provisions, also known as the canned beans and soup found in SCP-2427-2, a level 3 Purity Proctor, a Purge Engine, disguised as a Fire Hydrant, 
and the Liar's Cradle. However, it also contained many things that have not yet been discovered, such as one slaughtering perseverance, 27 pyre children, three ascended cultivars, seven supreme angelics, nine dragons, and the brazen heart itself. Dr. Gordon McElroy, site director of Area 2427, put out a memo to all level four and higher staff assigned to the area after the discovery of this list. Understandably, he was most concerned about the supreme angelics and the dragons, particularly the latter. The cult, as most cults are, is fond of deliberately obscure language, but you don't want to rule out the possibility they've got a fire-breathing lizard or two stashed away. In the meantime, as the Foundation is working to better understand the contents of SCP-2427, the area has been sealed off to the public. A 500-meter perimeter has been established around its entrance, and a fake private country club has been set up as a front. It's only a matter of time before the rest of the anomalies on the list are discovered, and this thing full of stuff gets even fuller of even more stuff. Let's just hope none of it ever gets out. Because if there are more of these addicts out there, who knows what else the brazen heart is hiding. Their little cult may not be as extinct as we thought. Norse mythology tells the story of Jormungandr, a great serpent so long that it wraps itself the entire way around Midgard and bites its own tail. Legend says that when Jormungandr unclasps its jaws and starts to unfurl, it will signal the beginning of Ragnarok, the destruction of the world. And that was about as much information as the Foundation gave to Agent Nielsen when they assigned him to his watch duty in Greenland. In the frozen tundra all day every day, he had been equipped with a sniper rifle, thermal goggles, and put up high in a watchtower. If he saw anyone, anyone, he had to shoot on sight, no questions asked. Whether it was his squad mates, the Brigadier General, or even his own mother, if anyone walked across the barren stretch of ice ahead of him, he was to shoot them dead. Under no circumstances was anyone allowed to enter that cave. The fate of the world could depend on it, but it was cold, and the days were long. For months he'd been sitting there by himself without seeing a single soul walk across the glacier. That's why it took him so long to spy the figure stumbling across the ice half a kilometer away. But the person didn't look any clearer when Agent Nielsen took a look through his thermal binoculars. Barely registering as much warmer than the snow around him, the man stumbled forward, seemingly unaware of the world around him. Could this be the start of the swan song of the world? Is this what he had been warned about? Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Nielsen snatched up the sniper rifle and readied his sights on the man. Somewhere buried deep beneath the Greenland ice is one of the most dangerous SCPs that the Foundation has ever come across. To say that SCP-722's reawakening could spell the destruction of human civilization is no idle concern. Classified as a Keter-level SCP, SCP-722 has been nicknamed Jormungandr, after the Norse myth. Researchers speculate that the creature's existence could in some way be linked to the early origins of the story of the Norse creature. 722 was brought to the Foundation's attention relatively recently. Environmental activist group Greenpeace was shooting a documentary on the effects of global warming on glaciers in Greenland. A small crew, including a director, producer, three camera operators, and a sound recordist, headed out to get some close-up footage from amongst the glaciers. Walking from ice sheet to ice sheet, they noticed several rounded entrances to what looked like deep ice caves. Surmising that these openings were only accessible to them because of the melting glacier ice, the crew climbed down into the caves to get some never-before-seen footage. Some of the footage of their exploration has been recovered since, and in the background of several shots, as they are adjusting exposure and pulling focus, you can hear the producer and director theorizing about where these caves have come from. They initially seem to think that the caves are millennia old, preserved by sub-zero temperatures, but soon they come across several markings on the walls, ancient hieroglyphs and symbols. None of the crew were language experts, and so in the footage you can hear them struggling to identify which people group would have carved those into the ice walls. In the decades since, language experts from around the world have studied these markings on those walls, and have still been unable to identify any discernible links to any known human script. Most agree that it does seem to predate the settlement of the island by Eric the Red at the start of the 11th century. 
During this period, it is believed that there were no human settlements on the island, so the origins of this script remain unknown. As the footage goes on, you may start to notice something that the Greenpeace crew does not. One of the ice walls is no longer a wall at all. It looks like a rock in some of the footage, but whenever a flashlight shines on its surface, you can see a pattern to it. Scales. Then an opening at the far side of the tunnel. The crew emerges into an enormous cavern, estimated to be upwards of 200 meters in height and several times wider. Even their powerful flashlights struggle to cut through the darkness inside. That's the point that the sound recorders notices the scales running alongside them. As the camera pans, you see that they have been walking alongside a tail, several times taller than them. A tail that snakes its way through the darkness of the cavern to meet a hulking mass at the other side, shrouded in darkness. That is where the footage cuts off. Those Greenpeace filmmakers were next seen in a local town that evening. None of them had the chance to extol the wonders of what they'd encountered that day, as they were all sick. A couple went straight to bed in their lodgings, complaining of intense headaches and exhaustion. Others tried to check themselves into the ER, but never made it. Each of the crew died of different causes. Necrosis of the skin, internal bleeding, kidney failure. By 9 p.m. that day, all of them were dead. Fortunately, there just so happened to be a low-level Foundation agent staying in the same guest house as them who heard the commotion. Within two days, a perimeter was established. Within two years, the Foundation gained the bulk of knowledge of this SCP that they rely on to this day. It is unknown exactly how large SCP-722 actually is. A hulking serpent, half buried in ice, much of its body cannot be observed. It sleeps coiled up in the middle of the cavern that the filmmakers happened across. Some of its body is buried beneath fallen-in parts of the caves, others frozen into the ground around it. However, based on what can be observed of this SCP, it is estimated to be in the ranges of 8 to 12 kilometers from head to tail. Fortunately for just about everyone, including you, this SCP appears to be dormant. At no time since its discovery has this SCP been observed to move, make a sound, or otherwise indicate consciousness. Sensors are installed in the chamber to monitor its life functions, and study its heart rate, temperature, brain activity, and more. One concern to the Foundation is that since its discovery, 722 has had a 0.9% uptick in neural activity. Researchers hope that this is just a natural part of the sleep cycle, and that it will return to a deeper slumber soon. That is the hope, at least. So what makes this SCP so dangerous, then, if it's sound asleep? Well, let's go back to Agent Nielsen staring through the scope of his rifle. The barrel kicked back, a puff of warm smoke there and gone in cold air. He watched just long enough to confirm the kill before radioing back to command what he had observed. Within an hour, the cleanup crew arrived. Riding on snowmobiles, they waited at a distance for an hour before approaching the body. Rather unceremoniously, they wrapped it up in a black plastic bag, strapped it to the back of their snowmobile, and took it away for cremation. Nielsen just sat there in his watchtower the whole time, observing it all. The person looked sick, and not the kind of sick that you'd get from spending too much time out there on the ice. Their skin had gone rotten, like they had gangrene or leprosy. It wasn't just your usual frostbite. Most concerning, they'd been wearing a jumpsuit, standard issue for D-Class personnel. Only a vial held in their cold, dead fingers was any kind of clue for Nielsen as to what had been going on in that cave. But that was as close as the agent ever came to understanding the mysteries of SCP-722. The vial, however, was in many ways all he needed to know. That is because contained in that vial was a sample of the liquid secreted by 722. It is a liquid that the Greenpeace crew came into close contact with when they found the creature, and it's a liquid that promises and denies great power and great risk to the Foundation. Any and all attempts to study this liquid in any meaningful sense have failed. Anyone who comes into contact with it will immediately suffer acute sickness. Interestingly, however, there seems to be little consistency as to how this sickness manifests itself. Some develop a number of cancerous cells, whilst others lose cognitive function due to brain swelling. 
Symptoms seem to vary from person to person. Naturally, this makes studying the substance very difficult. Hazardous material suits have been deployed for researchers attempting to study it, but have all failed, despite being otherwise effective against chemical, biological, and radioactive threats. How the substance is able to infect them is unknown. Sadly, a good number of scientists had to die to make this discovery. Another route of study is to take the substance out of the cave and observe it under laboratory conditions. This was what Agent Nielsen observed as he shot and killed the D-Class personnel emerging from the cave. The D-Class had been sent in to retrieve the vial of the substance for external study. While a safe and direct route of entry and exit had been planned for the man to take, he became critically ill whilst in contact with 722 and developed an aggressive fever. No longer coherent over the radio, he dropped out of signal, wandering through the tunnels for two hours until emerging out of an exit high up on the glacier. Two agents with higher security clearance were dispatched to deal with the body. The reason for their wait was for their own safety. 722's toxin appears to denature with time away from its source, causing it to weaken in potency. If they had approached immediately, they may have well suffered similar fates to the D-Class. They survived, but the sample was ruined. All subsequent attempts have also been met with failure. It seems almost impossible to capture a clean sample and transport it any kind of distance. With this toxin, the Foundation would have possession of an immense biological weapon, akin to the discovery of the atom bomb. But as of right now, all it's good for is killing D-Class personnel. Initially, the Foundation believed the fluid to be a defense mechanism for the SCP, something to protect it in its deep sleep. But the more time is spent observing it, the more time this perception is shifting. SCP-722's toxin appears instead to be a weapon. As such, the containment of this creature is of paramount importance. There are eight known access points into the tunnel network that would grant access to SCP-722. Each of them has been sealed with reinforced gates with additional layers of soundproofing. At regular four-hour intervals, nitrogen gas cooled to a near-liquid state is to be pumped through these doors without fail. It is believed that the creature is a form of proto-reptile and so is theoretically cold-blooded. Its internal temperature is dictated by its surroundings. Therefore, by keeping a cool average temperature in these caves, it is thought that this SCP's slumber can be prolonged. How long is unclear. With rising global temperatures year after year, the threat that the Greenpeace activists were proclaiming is very real, just perhaps not quite in the way they'd envisioned. Not only would there be an increase in natural disasters and a decrease in biodiversity, there would also be a 12-kilometer snake roaming around the planet, killing anyone in its path. Not ideal. As such, the Foundation has also planted a number of highly skilled individuals in prominent environmental positions in the hopes of turning the tide of global warming sooner. Should the ice in that cave system warm by even a couple of degrees, who knows what kind of spike they might see on the neural monitors. This SCP naturally is buried deep beneath layers and layers of security clearances too. Only in exceptional circumstances and for vital maintenance is anyone allowed to approach this SCP. A minimum of two Level 3 clearance agents are required to sign off on any such works. In recent years, a new Brigadier General took charge of the containment operations of SCP-722 after his predecessor was stripped of his duties. Overly zealous experiments and increasingly desperate attempts to harvest or synthesize the 722 toxin saw an alarming uptick in neural activity. Over 40 D-Class personnel were processed and disposed of within a two-week period in an attempt to assemble a micro-laboratory within the main chamber itself. This project failed, and the noises of construction threatened the peace that had so long been maintained beneath the glacier. The new Brigadier General is taking no such risks, enforcing a zero-tolerance policy on anyone approaching Site-103 unless suitably cleared. A number of hikers have sadly had to be killed this way but the Foundation believes it to be a necessary sacrifice to keep the peace. It is quite easy to find a convincing backstory for their untimely deaths and the lack of bodies to bury. Just another person to get lost and fall down a crack in the glacier, warning stories that are shared and planted in local towns and on the internet. The only threat to this current peace is a new avenue of inquiry that researchers have stumbled across, a link to a group of animals found halfway around the world. 
monitor lizards of the genus Varanus seem to share a similar set of traits to SCP-722, namely the nature of their toxins. You may be familiar with the bite of a Komodo dragon. While the initial wound sure does hurt, the real damage comes in the following hours and days as necrosis sets in from the toxins in its mouth. Could these creatures share a common ancestor? Could 722 be the common ancestor? As of right now, it is just a hunch, but it's one that has taken root amongst the research staff. In order to find out more, though, they need samples, tissue samples, taken straight from the SCP itself. The only way to do back is to go back into the caves and start cutting. If a bit of construction noise was enough to raise brain activity by 0.9%, taking a hunk of flesh could prove a whole lot more dangerous, not least for the personnel involved, who will all have to sacrifice their lives. The potential benefits could be huge. A way to study fatal diseases in a new light, perhaps finding a way to reverse engineer cures to some of the deadliest conditions on the planet, or perhaps the missing ingredient to synthesizing the most powerful biological weapon in human history. Maybe worst of all, it could all trigger the reawakening. Do you remember how the story of Jormungandr ends? With a prediction that when the Great Serpent uncoils, the end of the world, Ragnarok itself, will arrive. But that's just an old fairy tale, right? Boom! On May 12, 2588, the town of Kangastok, Greenland was destroyed by a devastating 4 kiloton explosion accompanied by a massive electromagnetic pulse. The few survivors that made it through the incident alive described seeing a pale green light in the area at the time of the explosion. Shortly after, an OMKA class scenario, or end-of-death scenario, began, in which all multicellular life on Earth began to experience a regenerative effect regardless of injury or illness. In other words, nobody could die anymore. This resulted in intense worldwide panic in the face of the inexplicable occurrence. As the panic mounted, the O5 Council of the FCP Foundation held an emergency meeting in order to address the possibilities at hand. Meanwhile, civilians began reporting sightings of a gigantic, pale, white humanoid monster rampaging through their cities and communities, wrecking havoc and violently attacking anyone and anything in its path. As the situation progressed and worsened, and the reality of the end-of-death scenario began to set in, the SCP Foundation made the difficult decision to lift its veil of secrecy and reveal itself to the world. O5-1 made a statement to the UN regarding the reality of the worldwide anomaly, advising citizens to remain calm and await further instructions. Five days after the world learned the truth of the SCP Foundation, the Pale Monster arrived in St. John's, Newfoundland, where it was met by Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown for what they hoped would be a quick fight and neutralization. Instead, two years of devastating, bloody combat ensued. By July 4, 2590, 90% of the task force personnel had been killed and regenerated an average of five times. At this point, MTF New 7 abandoned the city of St. John, citing anomalously poor working conditions. After being held in place for two years, the monster was able to break through the defensive line and continue its rampage. On October 10, 2590, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition came together in an act of unprecedented cooperation to found Project Beluga. Dedicated to the goal of neutralizing the monster, designated SCP-UBU, and stopping its reign of terror. But Project Beluga was unable to neutralize the entity before it reached Columbus, Ohio on December 29, 2590. Once it arrived in the city, SCP-UBU began dedicating its time to a gruesome personal project. First, it dug a two-kilometer deep hole in the city center. Next, it gathered a total of 2.9 million civilians, throwing them into the hole. After the hole was full, the entity leaped into the upper stratosphere, over and over again, stomping into the hole each time. When the people inside were pulverized, the entity destroyed a large fountain, which it used as a cup and drank the resulting juices from the hole. This entire process took roughly one year, and when it was finished, the entity appeared to grow bored with Columbus and moved to Lake Erie. Upon reaching Lake Erie, SCP-UBU trudged out into the water and began assaulting the cargo ship stocked there. It began lifting ships up and throwing them out of the water, some flying high enough to exit Earth's gravitational pull altogether. 
Two of the ships were later spotted on the surface of the moon. This chaos and destruction continued for years and years, until June 10, 2670, when SCP-UBU was contained at SCP Foundation Site-59. However, this containment only lasted for two minutes, at which point the entity escaped and made its way to New York City, where it was found howling and attempted to defile the Statue of Liberty. Several countries used their nuclear arsenals to attack SCP-UBU over the course of its rampage, until the Schenectady Agreement was signed on February 10, 2674, cementing an agreement between NATO powers, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, and the Global Occult Coalition. All signatories agreed that due to the concerns around the environment, any additional nuclear strikes against the entity would be prohibited. After the signing was finished, SCP-UBU crashed the ceremony grabbing several lengths of rebar and 15 foreign dignitaries, which it used to construct itself a bead necklace. The next notable incident occurred when SCP-UBU showed up at Site-19, interrupting a round of testing with SCP-AFF, a woman capable of turning matter into stone by speaking to it. SCP-UBU broke through the ceiling, crushing AFF beneath its weight. SCP-682, which was also present, approached the entity curiously, and SCP-UBU responded by angrily defecating and shouting at SCP-682 in gibberish. SCP-682 seemed to understand this vocalization and attacked SCP-UBU, demanding that it take back the insult. At this point, SCP-UBU slapped 682's cheek, causing 682 to let out a horrific scream. The slap left behind a glowing green mark, which spread over the entity of 682's body before breaking the bonds of its cells all at once, dissolving the reptile into a pool of toxic fluid. SCP-UBU then spent five minutes bathing in this fluid while giggling. After finishing its bath, devouring the reconstituted SCP-AFF and screaming into the microphone for 20 minutes, SCP-UBU broke into Armed Containment Area 179 and swallowed SCP-2317 whole. On March 5, 2686, SCP-UBU conducted an assault on Thaumiel Class SCP-2000, rendering it neutralized. Again, years of hell passed as Project Beluga struggled to come up with new methods that had not already been exhausted. Meanwhile, civilians did their best to find ways to cope with the state of the world. On March 25, 2750, former film star Nash de Groot published The Zonk Manifesto, a book based around a simple principle. Life on Earth was no longer worth living consciously, and the only way formed was to enter an eternal coma through the combination of chemicals and guided meditation. This kick-started the social movement, the International Zonk. On June 24, 2790, Project Beluga forces managed to drive SCP-UBU into the Bay of Bengal, where it remained for three years, causing very little trouble aside from underwater seismic events. Meanwhile, the International Zong continued to grow, and one mass of adherents known as Cuddletopia reached its goal of 5 million residents. On June 10, 2793, SCP-UBU flung SCP-3000 out of the ocean leaving it beached on the soil of India. Several cities were destroyed in this process. The entity then spent a week pointing and laughing at the beached sea monster, before grabbing it by the tip of its tail and beginning to drag it across Asia. SCP-UBU continued carving a path through Asia, the wriggling SCP-3000 in tow, until it reached the Bering Strait. Then it began to cross the strait into Alaska, returning to North American territory once more. But it didn't stop there. Instead advancing toward South America until it and SCP-3000 arrived on the eastern coast of Brazil on August 29, 2793. There, it dragged its unfortunate charge back into the ocean once more, disappearing from sight. On August 30, 2793, SCP-169 or the Leviathan emerged from the depths of the ocean. There are some reports that SCP-3000 had been tied around its neck, but these have not been confirmed. The Leviathan and SCP-UBU then entered into a lengthy battle, which carried on for several hundred years. After so much time had passed that witnesses could scarcely remember a time when it wasn't happening, the fight between SCP-UBU and SCP-169 came to a halt. Much as it had with SCP-682, SCP-UBU slapped SCP-169 across the face with such force that its cell bonds dissolved and it melted into a puddle of fluid which was lost beneath the ocean waves. 
SCP-169 was reclassified, neutralized. December 11, 3020 marked the start of a 10-year period of inactivity for SCP-UBU. Ordinarily, one would expect this to come with a sense of relief. However, even in spite of the global immortality, the collateral damage from SCP-UBU's centuries of carnage had rendered the surface of the Earth uninhabitable, with all land now underwater. The remains of human civilization persist on a single archipelago of floating cities constructed from ships and debris. Meanwhile, the international Zonk movement has persisted, gaining more and more traction and popularity as conscious life became less and less bearable. An enormous floating Zonk pile consisting of international Zonk followers using anomalous methods to achieve the perfect Zonk began to form. Eventually, this pile earned the nickname New Zonkland. By May 28, 3028, the archipelago was abandoned, and the 140 remaining conscious humans retreated to the SCP Foundation's SCPS Naismith. There they lived in relative safety for several months, until SCP-UBU was spotted in the water off the port bow of the Naismith on January 14, 3030. It emitted several sounds that witnesses described as mocking, before swimming off towards New Zonklin. In response to this reappearance after 10 years of inactivity, the O5 Council called an emergency meeting. The transcript for this meeting reads as follows. We haven't exhausted all of our anomalous options for neutralizing UBU. Where's the corn crake? We've been over since Lawrence. So I'm the corn cake in this mess is only going to- It is anchored 57 clicks due southeast. For why the hell did you tell him that? Well, friends, it seems the Omega K has had us up and about so long that our personalities have run out of fuel we were given from birth. In all likelihood, we'd see better professionalism and teamwork in New Zonkland. As a matter of fact, that's a good segue into what I was about to propose. And frankly, I hope you find the nicest, cleanest spots in the mass grave. Where are you going? That depends. Which way is southeast? At this point, O5-11 left the room, presumably to track down the corncrake, leaving the remains of the O5 Council there, and leaving the remains of Project Beluga with the question of how to handle SCP-UBU. According to its official SCP Foundation file, SCP-UBU is an extremely violent and hostile humanoid entity of unknown origin, which appeared in Greenland on May 12, 2588. It displays anomalous physical strength and speed, as well as reality-bending capabilities and the emission of regenerative lambda waves linked to the ongoing end-of-death scenario. The appearance of SCP-UBU and the start of the end-of-death scenario coincided with several additional phenomena. There was a mass loss of function for all the objects operated by the Three Moons Initiative. The Three Moons Initiative was an extra-dimensional human organization based in SCP-2922-C, or the afterlife known as Corbenic. This organization was founded 14,000 years ago with the purpose of establishing a human colony in the afterlife and has long maintained a peace treaty with the SCP Foundation. SCP-2922, a method of communication that allowed a human mind to make calls to any pre-established phone number, ceased all functions. Next, the extra-dimensional space known as the Wanderer's Library, a magical archive of all the knowledge from all known worlds, and every book that has ever been written, will be written, and several that have not and will not exist, was severed from Earth. When the SCP Foundation pressed the Serpent's hand for answers, a representative answered that irreconcilable security concerns regarding Earth had come up and forced them to make this decision. A representative of Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited somehow gained access to the personal contact information of the O5 Council's members and used this information to reach out to them with a business offer. The company is ordinarily on unfriendly terms with the SCP Foundation, due to their conflicting interests, namely Marshall Carter and Dark's interests in acquiring and selling anomalous items, entities, and experiences to the highest bidder. However, in this case, the company's representative approached O5 Council members with a mixture of politeness and desperation, begging the SCP Foundation to purchase large amounts of the company's stock. The forest known as SCP-4000 lost all of its anomalous properties all at once, Investigation revealed only a small parchment note in the area's entryway, which read, Good luck. One of the most perplexing and disconcerting phenomenon that occurred concurrently with SCP-UBU's first appearance was what happened to SCP-3008, the Infinite Ikea. Though this sort of thing should have been impossible, the Infinite Ikea was anomalously purchased by some unknown entity. 
the IKEA branding was stricken from the building, and it was converted into an emergency shelter. All of these occurrences combined to serve as a warning. Something big is coming. And indeed, it was. SCP-UBU. It appears to be impervious to most forms of damage, including blunt force trauma, heavy caliber machine gun fire, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Kelvin, artillery fire, and direct energy discharge from other anomalies. It did express some discomfort when exposed to severe simultaneous direct nuclear strikes, but it was not affected beyond that. The only recorded instance of lasting damage to SCP-UBU was on August 14, 2784, in which the entity bit its left thumb seemingly for no reason other than curiosity. After biting its thumb, the entity screamed for seven days straight, then entered into a month-long crying fit. Thirty years and fourteen days later, the thumb had completely healed. SCP-UBU stands at a height of 4.3 meters. One exact measure of its weight is unknown. Attempts at measurement during its brief time in containment showed that its weight is at least 15,399 kilograms. Its exact anatomical composition is unknown but a superficial examination of the entity indicates that its body shape resembles that of a large androgynous humanoid, covered in hairless white skin similar in texture to that of a dolphin or small whale. The entity has no eyes, ears, or nostrils, but seems to still possess the ability to see, hear, and smell. Its only visible sensory organ, aside from its skin, is its 0.5 meter wide mouth, humanoid in nature, with a prehensile tongue of unknown length. On its lower body, it has no apparent features, aside from a cloaca that it uses to dispose of waste. SCP-UBU is prone to vocalizations, mainly screaming, laughing, and babbling, but it does not appear to understand speech in any known language, nor does it seem to be attempting to communicate with anyone it encounters. Its primary interest appears to be destruction and causing as much of it as possible. It will attack anything that it can get its hands on, but seems to show a particular preference for attacking and consuming human beings in large, populous areas, such as cities. Its demeanor is both sadistic and childlike, and it has been seen playing with its victims for hours before moving on to a new target. Due to its regenerative effect present in SCP-UBU's vicinity, it is incapable of causing permanent damage to any living thing, and seems to have no greater motivation beyond causing fear and pain. SCP-UBU is classified as Tiamat, meaning that it cannot be reasonably contained at this time, with the resources that the Foundation has. Therefore, the focus has shifted from containment to neutralization, which is ongoing via Project Beluga. Any and all non-critical resources will be funneled into Project Beluga as neutralization of SCP-UBU is a top priority. Additional information on neutralization efforts is restricted, and may only be accessed by members of Project Beluga. But in the end, it won't be Project Beluga that defeats this monstrous creature. It'll be the staunch efforts of one extremely dedicated researcher. On May 12th, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU manifested in Kangastok, Greenland, like something out of the most nightmarish kaiju movie never made. Soon after, there was no more death, but the world was filled with such chaos and despair that humanity longed for that eternal release. From its enormous stomping feet to its cloaca, to its face, featureless save for a gaping, grinning, devouring mouth, the entity was pure malice with all the time in the world. UBU decimated the planet, breaking the spirit of mankind and raising every city to the ground. In the earlier days of UBU's invasion, when there was still dry land and people still wanted to talk to each other rather than joining floating islands of eternal, chemically-induced slumber, they would commiserate about the shared misery of the state of things. Oh, UBU? My daughter hasn't spoken to me ever since that monster shoved my whole body down her throat someone would say. Another would pipe up, trying to one-up the first man in sort of a trauma Olympics. <laughs> Didn't you see me in the news? UBU carried me around for a week, snacking on me every now and then like I was his own personal turkey leg. It was hell. But honestly, part of me felt a little bummed out when he threw me away. Yet another person would chime in, like veterans swapping war stories over a drink at the bar. UBU made me eat a pair of my pants, whole thing, zipper and all. Then he decided he thought that was funny, Made me eat pair after pair after pair of them, rinse and repeat. By the time he got bored, I'd eaten probably around 20 pairs. I sort of got a taste for them after that. Everyone on the planet had good reason to despise SCP-UBU. 
but no one held more hate in his heart for the pale, wicked creature than Dr. Lawrence Michaud. Before the world was turned upside down, sometimes literally, Dr. McHoud was a member of the mysterious O5 Council at the SCP Foundation. To be specific, he was O5-11. But that prestigious position at the Foundation couldn't protect him or his loved ones from the wrath of UBU. When Dr. McHoud was off duty, UBU attacked him and his wife. First, it impaled his wife on a broom handle. Next, it threw Dr. McHoud into an open pool of sewage in the street. Then, it bathed him in the filthy water, using his screaming wife as a scrubbing brush, all the while whistling a horrible little bathtub song. Centuries after that awful experience, as Dr. McHoud watched most of his colleagues give up and choose the closest thing to death in this broken world, he became even more determined to do something about it. On January 14, 3030, Dr. McHoud abandoned the SCPS Naismith and his fellow O5 council members in search of the SCPS Corncrake, an abandoned craft to the southeast. It wasn't an easy journey, rowing all the way there in a lifeboat, never knowing when the great white beast would emerge from the water and choose him as its next unfortunate plaything. He could see the SCPS Corncrake still floating there, untouched. But before he could row any closer, something collided with the lifeboat from below, snapping it in half. Dr. McHoud's stomach dropped at the sight of pale flesh, but it was soon replaced with relief when he saw that the thing that had broken his lifeboat was not, in fact, UBU. It was an injured narwhal, behaving erratically due to its wounds. The culprit was almost certainly UBU. It wasn't content to just torment humans, but instead must have been targeting any life form that could feel pain and fear. In his own words, Dr. McHoud had put it, at least a mass extinction wouldn't have made it that personal. After the lifeboat broke apart, McHoud swam to the conrake, exhaustion and cold straining his muscles. It took him two hours to reach the abandoned cargo barge and containment site, but eventually he managed to climb up over the side and get on board. There was one very special thing about the corn crate, the thing that made it worth crossing the ocean in a fragile little lifeboat to find. Every anomaly that made the Ganymede list, the list of anomalies considered too dangerous to abandon even in an apocalyptic scenario, was contained on the corn crake. If there was anything left that the Foundation, or anyone else, hadn't tried to use to defeat UBU, it would be on that ship. After taking a little while to recover, Dr. McHoud embarked on an initial exploration of the craft. All the staff were gone, as he had expected. Thankfully, he still had his O5 ID card, and it still worked like a charm, unlocking all of the automated security systems on board. A lot of what he found was in ruins, but some things had survived. He found 10 hominid replicators from SCP-2000 in perfect working order. There was a cage containing the remains of SCP-2845, the deer, though UBU had done significant damage to it. SCP-319, a curious device, was there, contained in the space-locked vacuum chamber. This one was notable for its potential ability to destroy the universe. He found a couple of safe-class anomalies, such as SCP-YEZ, crowd control for the practical optimist, and SCP-FNA, the portable warehouse. The latter of the two was a portable door frame to a pocket dimension. He also stumbled upon SCP-001, last ride of the day, an old Prometheus Labs prototype of a time machine. And possibly, most importantly, he found SCP-076. The coffin was open, but Abel didn't attack Dr. McCowd. He wasn't consumed with murderous rage and bloodlust, the way he always was before. Instead, he was just sitting on the edge of the ship, silently staring at the sea. When he spotted McCloud, he gave him a small wave and did nothing else. The centuries of a world without death, a world without killing, without victory in battle, had taken its toll on him. For possibly the first time in his eternal life, Abel was depressed. Nine days after he first inspected the corncrake, Mikhail began to formulate a plan. He loaded all of the hominid receptors into SCP-FNA, using a thankfully still working forklift. Next, he was able to unseal the sealed portion of SCP-001, last ride of the day, and get his hands on the details of the anomaly. It read, SCP-001 is capable of temporarily relocating to its relative position 15,000 years prior to activation. This temporal displacement is divergent, paradox irrelevant. In other words, a separate timeline is created as a landing point. 
For example, if an occupant from timeline X were to murder their parents in utero in timeline Y, the Y iteration of the occupant would no longer exist, but the occupant themselves, being from X, would be unharmed. When in a fully active state, SCP-001 deploys a 5-meter-high telescopic antenna that functions as a Coloco wave energy sink. Essentially, Coloco waves could only be produced as a byproduct of the universe suddenly being exterminated, and ZK-class reality failures produce the most Coloco waves. In one of these scenarios, SCP-001 would be able to use these waves to go back in time 15,000 years, effectively resetting reality to a point far before the catastrophe happened. This information allowed him to put his plan together to resurrect Project Beluga. Step 1. Plant explosive charges around SCP-319. Step 2. Hide anything potentially useful against SCP-UBU inside of SCP-FNA. Step 3. Get into the cockpit with SCP-FNA in tow. Step 4. Raise the Coloco sink. And Step 5. Blow the whole thing up. Three days later, it was time to put the plan into motion. Dr. McCowd placed the charges around SCP-319's vacuum chamber. There was enough in place to implode the walls of the vacuum chamber. He closed the bulkhead and began deploying the Coloco sink. 10%, 25%, 30%. Suddenly, he could hear a loud crashing sound. The ship began to tilt. Oh no. He could hear the distant sound of menacing giggles. The sink reached 45, 57. But as UBU grew closer, he quickly overrode the system to lower the sink. 45%. 30%, 25%, 10%. UBU grew closer and closer, and as it approached, it began to whistle the tune it once used when it bathed McCloud and his wife in the sewer. UBU began to pound against the blast door, becoming increasingly frustrated as it struggled to break through. Suddenly, another voice cut through the air, an unexpected one. SCP-076 Abel called out to McCloud, encouraging him to carry on while Abel held the beast back. As Abel and UBU engaged in an epic battle, McCloud suddenly remembered something. There was an express deployment module for the Coloco sink. With no time to waste, he activated it. All at once, he hit the detonator. And then, the year was 11,970, and the date was February 14th. 13,963 years later, the SCP Foundation discovered something beneath a mound of earth and snow near the northern border of Lapland, Finland. It was a shipping container with a reinforced exterior, the interior of which could only be accessed through a fortified bulkhead on one side. The words SCP-001 were written on the side in black paint. In spite of this, the object was given the designation SCP-8048. A narrow, winding tunnel through the mound of earth and snow was discovered, leading from the door to the outside world. The tunnel had significant wear, clearly having been used as a footpath by someone. But who? Well, on April 12, 1993, the Foundation got their answer. SCP-8048's bulkhead opened, and a man stepped out, snapping his fingers and promptly sealing the door behind him. He was designated Pole 8048. He was a 32-year-old man of French-Canadian descent, answering to the name of Dr. Lawrence Michaud. He made a series of claims that the Foundation found dubious, but noted it in the official file for SCP-8048 just the same. These included, but were not limited to, SCP-8048 is a time machine. He held the office of 05-11 in the year 3030 from an alternate timeline. Said timeline experienced a modified Omega K class end of death scenario that coincided with the invasion of a Tiamat class anomaly known as SCP UBU. SCP UBU was an extremely dangerous and sadistic entity who was capable of, among other things, neutralizing SCP 169 and SCP 682. His timeline's version of the Foundation launched Project Beluga, which resulted in an impossible war with SCP-UBU that lasted 441 years. Paul 8048 deliberately sabotaged SCP-319 to act as a power source for SCP-8048, thus arriving in Lapland in the year 11,970 BCE. SCP-UBU will arrive in Greenland on May 12, 2588. Paul 8048 was able to extend his lifespan by sharing his consciousness between a central computer within SCP-8048 and several thousand bodies created by his personal hominid replicators. Said consciousness sharing was achieved through a book classified in the future as SCP-YEZ. He wishes to assist the Foundation in the termination of SCP-UBU, 
and has laid out a plan for its termination as outlined in document 8048-Zeta. There were, of course, concerns about the man's legitimacy, but after Michaud mentioned over 104 specific terms and data points known only to members of the O5 Council, the Foundation was forced to take him at least a little bit seriously. A motion was filed, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with the termination of SCP-UVU as per Document 8048-Zeta. O5-4 voted yay, O5-7 abstained, and the rest of the Council voted nay. The motion failed to pass. A follow-up motion was filed in response, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with their own strategy to respond to SCP-UBU. 05-1, 05-4, 05-7, and 05-10 abstained from voting. The rest voted nay. The motion failed to pass. On April 14, 1995, Dr. Isaiah Henderson and Poll 8048 sat down for an interview. When asked to state his name, Dr. McCowd also recited a mimetic passphrase that, when spoken by anyone other than 05-11 of past or present, would cause them to burst into flames. The two men were at odds from the beginning. Dr. McCowd expressed dismay and frustration that his proposal was rejected. Meanwhile, Dr. Henderson countered with the insistence that McCowd's proposed plan was rejected for posing an unnecessary risk to the civilian public. They debated for a moment. Before Dr. Henderson announced the Foundation's next plan of action, Dr. McCowd was to be terminated. The Foundation would proceed with its plans without him. At that point, Dr. Henderson terminated McCowd as ordered. He didn't count on one thing, though. McCowd was no longer an ordinary man, bound to one body. He hopped into the body of a guard, then into the body of 05-4 to deliver a vital message. He had started this plan alone and was ready to bring it to a close alone. Project Beluga would continue with or without the Foundation's support. Dr. McCowd returned to the bulkhead, climbing back inside and sealing it behind him. He had hoped to have the Foundation behind him. He had hoped they would be allies in the fight against the greatest evil mankind ever encountered, but they disappointed him. He had waited thousands of years, only for the organization he devoted his life to to try and kill him. Well, he wasn't going to go down without a fight. This was bigger than the Foundation, bigger than anyone and no living person was as equipped to handle UBU as he was. So he resumed Project Beluga as a one-man operation. He issued a mission statement, which read as follows. On May 12, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU invaded and pillaged human civilization for no other motivation than cruelty and selfish gratification. Shortly thereafter, Project Beluga was founded as a joint effort between the Global Occult Coalition and the SCP Foundation for the purposes of UBU's destruction. UBU is not merely a threat to human safety, it is an affront to every positive and loving concept in the human consciousness. Rather than our lives, he seeks to destroy our quality of life to sate his own sick desires. Think about it, the taste of ice cream, playing with your dog. The way you felt after your first kiss, that is UBU's sworn enemy. No faith is too cruel cool for him, no hatred is strong enough. When Project Beluga's charter was signed, 592 GOC officers and Foundation staff were present at the ceremony. Our troops numbered in the hundreds of thousands. I, Dr. Lawrence Michaud, am the only surviving member, and always will be. What I lack in numbers is compensated thousandfold by my weapons, my mind, my replicated bodies, and eons of experience. The following record serves one purpose alone, that once justice has been brought to UBU, humans in the shining and golden UBU-free future will understand that one person can accomplish through the power of hard science and raw emotion entwined in a perfect and indestructible braid. And while we are at it, you are very welcome. Over the next several hundred years, McCowd worked to secure ownership of Kangastock Greenland through a Project Beluga civilian front. He evacuated the civilian population from the area, then spent a century constructing a superweapon. With 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter gathering pods from SCP-HNM in place, he was finally ready for UBU to manifest again. Dr. McCowd former member of the SCP Foundation's O5 Council, had one sworn enemy, one being that he despised more than anything else in the entire universe. The being known as SCP-UBU, the monster that had eliminated death and destroyed the world. 
The vengeful doctor was able to successfully go back in time to the days before SCP-UBU first manifested. Desperate to prevent the horrors he witnessed during UBU's centuries-long rampage. After the SCP Foundation failed to help him with his plan, Dr. McCowd spent thousands of years re-establishing Project Beluga in this new timeline. The project secured ownership of Kangstak, Greenland, evacuated the civilian population, and constructed Beluga-1 in the epicenter of UBU's manifestation point. It was outfitted with 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes copied from SCP-NSF, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter-gathering pods from SCP-HNM. The trap was set, and it was time to wait for SCP-UBU to appear. When it did and the trap was sprung, SCP-UBU managed to escape unharmed, rampaging through the world much like it did the first time. That attempt failed, but it was not the only one. Dr. McCowd was not about to give up now. He restarted the cycle again, using replicates, in order to gain a greater amount of control over both the SCP Foundation and the Global Cult Coalition. 25 years before SCP-UBU's scheduled arrival, Dr. McCowd opened email-based communications with SCP-2803-A, P. Hudson Gawk, a giant, tumorous blob of flesh in an abandoned, anomalous office building with the genius mind of a former CEO regarding the threat. He informed Gawk that in 25 years' time, something was going to destroy the entire global economy, particularly the consumer electronics market. This massively distressed SCP-2803-A. At this point, Dr. McCowd asked if the anomaly might have a skill set that could help prevent UBU from destroying the economy and, of course, the rest of the world. SCP-2803-A, as it turns out, did indeed have a strategy in mind. One year before UBU's arrival, 2803-A attacked, parasitized, and fused with SCP-169 the Leviathan. This fusion resulted in a creature 1.5 times the original size of SCP-169 with several heads. The resulting collateral damage was catastrophic, killing billions of civilians. When the creature came face to face, or faces, with UBU, it lasted centuries before UBU made the killing blow. McCowd repeated the cycle again, and again, and again, and again. In some cycles, he tweaked his plans by the tiniest of degrees. Other cycles were dramatically different from the ones that came before. During cycle 273, he increased the aperture from the Beluga 94 project teleporting the entire continent of Greenland into another dimension after UBU first appeared. Both Greenland and UBU vanished on 5 12 88 However, only five minutes later, a second UBU materialization event occurred. The rampage continued on from there. Dr. McCowd was becoming discouraged and considered modifying his central consciousness containment unit to forcibly redirect any negativity he felt away from himself and his abilities and toward UBU. During Cycle 530, McCowd established Site Assembly in Cyprus in the year 10485 BCE. The Beluga X unit was constructed over the course of 3,000 years there. This feat was achieved via the infiltration of the Church of the Broken God, which was converted into the False Pretense Labor Division of Project Beluga. Sarkic cult activity spread through Europe as a result, but this was an acceptable amount of collateral damage. What mattered most was the Beluga X, a heavily armed construct based around the design of SCP-2406, the Colossus. Replicate 5818, one of the many Macaud replicates, was selected for the role of majority consciousness holder. Then, ten minutes after UBU manifested, Beluga X was deployed. Beluga X confronted SCP-UBU and declared the intent to stop its invasion. At the sound of Macaud's voice, UBU responded with the call, Yes, sure. It promptly began to whistle the bath time song, the same one it had whistled so very, very long ago while tormenting Dr. McCowd. Somehow, this UBU was the original one from the very first timeline. How did it survive? How long had it been following Dr. McCowd? It refused to answer any of these questions. Beluga X charged at UBU but slipped in a pile of the beast's dung falling to the ground. The cycle was a failure. 
and Dr. McCowd was filled with more dread and hopelessness than ever. In cycle 675, the moon's gravitational pull was increased, causing it to collide with UBU during the materialization event. This collision succeeded, and the Earth was completely destroyed. There was too much debris to determine if UBU survived being hit by the moon or not. This was unacceptable to Dr. McCowd. In the following cycle, Dr. McCowd took a more human approach. Over the course of 10 millennia, replicates forcibly converted 90% of the human population to an invented religion called Spade of Triumph, also known as Spadism. The primary mode of worship in Spadism was the creation of as many Beluga 900 units as physically possible. Conflicts between Spadism and the rest of the world religions resulted in many wars, and Spadists had enslaved 5.9 billion people by 2500 CE. By the time UBU manifested, there were still not enough Beluga 900 units to make a difference. Cycle 677 was identical to Cycle 530 in every way until the year 2500 CE. At this point, Beluga X Mark II was created and piloted directly by the consciousness of Dr. McCowd. It was first tested on 1225-2500, at which time Dr. McCowd destroyed half of Asia over a period of eight hours. Billions were killed. This cycle was not intended to stop UBU. It was a prime numbered cycle and thus, according to Macau's own personal rules, was to be used for stress relief in the form of senseless destruction. During cycle 678, Macau came to a troubling conclusion. He was running out of resources. Hominid replicators were broken beyond repair, leaving only 305 replicates where there should have been millions. SCP-319 could not be secured and there were no more stolen SCP-2700 cores. To make matters worse, there were not enough resources to gather additional working hominid replicators from SCP-2000. He would have to make contact with the SCP Foundation again, and the goal of Project Beluga would have to be modified from termination to containment. He drafted containment procedures to be implemented the moment the opportunity presented itself. These containment procedures were unlike any penned by the Foundation before. They were not simply a containment method, they were a punishment, they were a vengeance. To ensure the internal agony that Dr. McCowd believed SCP-UBU empirically deserved, Area UBU was constructed within Site Beluga's metaspatial mainframe. Area UBU is a pocket dimension where Dr. McCowd is God. It consists of one square kilometer of wide open nothing. Dr. McCowd's will was capable of causing the area to repeat ad infinitum, depending on where SCP-UBU moved. This essentially meant that there was no escape, no edge, only infinite emptiness. In McCowd's words, no one to run from him, no one to fight him, no one to hurt. There would be no death in this space, and it would be equipped with an indestructible floor. Dr. McCowd's plan illustrated how this millennia-long battle had taken a toll on his own sanity. By his plan, UBU would be kept in this uncaring solitude for as long as it would take for the futility of his situation to set in. His laughter would become confusion. His confusion would become anger. His anger would become whimpering. His whimpering would become begging. His begging would become sobbing and his sobbing would become wailing. This process would continue until UBU began to eventually adjust to its surroundings. Once it began to feel comfortable and began to experience the smallest glimmer of hope, McCowd would implement the next stage of his containment procedure. He would summon a dark and mountain-high and unspeakably strong version of himself with fingers like gleaming scalpels. He planned to destroy UBU in countless ways, warping the monster, squishing its body, and molding it like clay. Then, it would only get worse for the beast, as Dr. McCowd's plans for revenge made him just as horrific a monster as his enemy. According to McCowd's plans, he would clone UBU a companion, a wife, the first real friend he has ever had, and McCowd will harden her heart and make her despise him. She will reject him cruelly and viciously. She will curse the day she ever met something so objectively hideous as SCP-UBU. And if that doesn't drive the point home enough, she would offer her heart to McCowd himself, effectively cuckolding his worst enemy. 
At this point, McCoud planned to destroy the fabricated wife in front of UBU. These procedures were only the beginning of the intake proceedings. After that, McCoud would move on to one of 148 level 2 subroutines. While writing these containment procedures, Dr. McCoud smiled for the first time in over one million years. In the description section of the file, he wrote only one thing, reap what you sow. Then, it was time to try a new cycle, to begin anew. In the year 2022, the SCP Foundation was planning a full exploration attempt of an anomaly known as SCP-001-A. SCP-001-A was a shipping container, the exterior of which was reinforced with an unknown substance. SCP-001-A-1 was a flat metallic device serving as the container's cockpit. SCP-001-A-2 were 57 identical humanoid entities of indeterminate gender or identity, dressed in blue jumpsuits with the words Project Beluga emblazoned on them. All entities were found in and around the cockpit. They were all notably hostile and would attempt to attack investigators. When the cockpit was opened, it revealed SCP-001-A-3, an extra-dimensional space that consisted mainly of interior corridors for a fortified storage area. On September 1, 2022, the speaker system of SCP-001-A's internal console began to loudly broadcast a concerning announcement. First, it began with, Emergency, Emergency, Emergency followed by the mimetic passphrase that could only be spoken by a current or former 05-11, without the subject immediately bursting into flames. The announcement continued, Likelihood of Ganymede Protocol enactment if non-action is taken approximately 100%, XK, SK, ZK, YK class scenario all pending. I am stranded on the 50th basement level of SCP-001-A-3. There are possibly several children down here with me. This message will repeat until my demands are met. Help me. Emergency. 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 Site Director Naismith and the O5 Council were both consulted on the matter, and researcher Aaron Gualtieri was chosen to meet with whoever was responsible for the distress call. He had recently been exposed to a Fafnir-class infohazard and was scheduled for termination sometime soon anyway. So he decided to use his dying hours productively. He was equipped with a hidden microphone and sent to speak with the broadcaster, while Thierry entered SCP-001-A-3, descending to level B-15. He took 15 steps into the spacious area, calling out for an answer from whoever called for help. At first, there was no response, while Thierry began to grow impatient, saying, Look, no one upstairs believes this broadcast of yours, but we all agreed it's too weird to not come down and at least hear you out. So what the hell do you want? Again, no response. Irritated, Gualtieri turned to leave, but as he did, the blast doors slammed shut, trapping him inside. He could hear the sound of heavy machinery moving toward him. He was suddenly confronted by the sight of an autonomous weapon, a massive mechanized structure equipped with drills and saws. He screamed at the sight. Hello, it spoke. My name is Dr. Lawrence Michaud. You are going to follow my demands. Scream if you agree. The drills were close to Gualtieri's face. He screamed. This monster, apparently what remained of Dr. McCoud, demanded to know his name. Gualtieri demanded to know what the entity wanted from him. McCoud repeated the request for his name. Gualtieri relented, introducing himself. Before asking why he was called down here, McCoud had a question of his own response. Have you ever hated someone non-stop for 9,492,687 years? Like most human beings would in that scenario, Gualtieri answered no. McCoud snapped. If not, you have nothing to say to me, barring responses to queries and demands because we are not in the same headspace and only similar minds are worthy of my friendship and tea time. Now then, on to business. I need a minimum of 20 hominid replicators from SCP-2000 and a carte blanche access to SCP-319. This is for the sake of humanity's future in the year 2588. If these demands are not met, then in T-minus 60 seconds, you are going to bang on the gates of hell and beg the stewards of eternal damnation to give you sanctuary. Gualtieri offered a bargain. I, I just want to know why you're doing this. This is too weird to be left open. Call it a scientist's instinct, just tell me that, and I'll pull all my strings topside and get you whatever you want, I swear, cross my heart. McCoud agreed to these terms and used SCP-YEZ to briefly share consciousness with Gualtieri. 
Everything McCout experienced with UBU, everything about Project Beluga, all of those millennia of suffering were transferred into Gualtieri's head like a vivid dream. He saw the initial manifestation of UBU in Greenland, the waking nightmare that followed, McCout's own harrowing encounter with the beast, its twisted bath time song, his discovery of potential salvation, only to have his hopes dashed by failed cycle after failed cycle. It was all the answers he could have ever wanted, and plenty he never, ever would have wished to know. But before Gualtieri could hold up his side of the bargain, he promptly dropped to the ground, dead. McCowd made a note of this unfavorable result. Running logic subroutines confirm there is a non-zero chance that this delivery is the indirect work of UBU formulating additional castation procedures to minimize mental duress. After his death, Gualtieri arrived in Corbinek the plane of existence that acts as a form of afterlife and as a home of the Three Moons Initiative. There he was retrieved by several agents of the Initiative, who spoke with him about his experience just before his death. Shaken up, he told the agents what he learned about SCP-UBU and the impending doom that the Earth was facing. Much to his surprise, they were not phased by his descriptions of the beast, of its appetite for violence and unnatural abilities. In fact, they had seen beasts like it before. They knew exactly what SCP-UBU was, and they knew exactly how to stop it for good. Now check out the O5 Council Must Die, SCP-001 The Way It Ends Ouroboros Cycle, and Insane SCP-001 Fight, Gate Guardian vs. Scarlet King.